Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Forward. This is America, a town of a few thousand in a region of wheat and corn and dairies and little groves. The town is, in our tale, called Gopher Prairie, Minnesota. But its Main Street is the continuation of Main Streets everywhere. The story would be the same in Ohio or Montana, in Kansas or Kentucky or Illinois, and not very differently would it be told up York State or in the Carolina Hills. Main Street is the climax of civilization. That this Ford car might stand in front of the Bon Ton store, Hannibal invaded Rome, and Erasmus wrote in Oxford Cloisters. What old Jensen, the grocer, says to Ezra Stowbody, the banker, is the new law for London, Prague, and the unprofitable Isles of the Sea. Whatsoever Ezra does not know and sanction, that thing is heresy, worthless for knowing, and wicked to consider. Our railway station is the final aspiration of architecture. Sam Clark's annual hardware turnover is the envy of the four counties which constitute God's country. In the sensitive art of the Rosebud movie palace there is a message, and humor strictly moral. Such is our comfortable tradition and sure faith. Would he not betray himself, an alien cynic, who would otherwise portray Main Street, or distress the citizens by speculating whether there may not be other faiths? The end of the foreword to Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 1 On a hill by the Mississippi, where Chippewas camped two generations ago, a girl stood in relief against the cornflower blue of northern sky. She saw no Indians now. She saw flour mills and the blinking windows of skyscrapers in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Nor was she thinking of squaws and portages and the Yankee fur traders whose shadows were all about her. She was meditating upon walnut fudge, the plays of Breau, the reasons why heels run over, and the fact that the chemistry instructor had stared at the new coiffure which concealed her ears. A breeze which had crossed a thousand miles of wheatlands bellied her taffeta skirt in a line so graceful, so full of animation and moving beauty, that the heart of a chance watcher on the lower road tightened to wistfulness over her quality of suspended freedom. She lifted her arms, she leaned back against the wind, her skirt dipped and flared, a lock blew wild, a girl on a hilltop, credulous, plastic, young, drinking the air as she longed to drink life, the eternal aching comedy of expectant youth. It is... Carol Milford, fleeing for an hour from Blodgett College. The days of pioneering, of lassies and sunbonnets, and bears killed with axes in piney clearings, are deader now than Camelot, and a rebellious girl is the spirit of that bewildered empire called the American Middle West. Blodgett College is on the edge of Minneapolis. It is a bulwark of sound religion. It is still combating the recent heresies of Voltaire, Darwin, and Robert Ingersoll. Pious families in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, send their children thither, and Blodgett protects them from the wickedness of the universities. But it secretes friendly girls, young men who sing, and one lady instructress who really likes Milton and Carlyle. So the four years which Carol spent at Blodgett were not altogether wasted. The smallness of the school, the fewness of rivals, permitted her to experiment with her perilous versatility. She played tennis, gave chafing-dish parties, took a graduate seminar in the drama, went toosing and joined half a dozen societies for the practice of the arts or the tense stocking of a thing called general culture. In her class there were two or three prettier girls, but none more eager. She was noticeable equally in the classroom grind and at dances, though out of the three hundred students of Blodgett, scores recited more accurately and dozens Bostoned more smoothly. Every cell of her body was alive. Thin wrists, quince blossom skin, ingenue eyes, black hair. The other girls in her dormitory marveled at the slightness of her body when they saw her in sheer negligee, or darting out wet from a shower bath. She seemed then but half as large as they had supposed, a fragile child who must be cloaked with understanding kindness. Psychic, the girls whispered, and spiritual. Yet so radioactive were her nerves, so adventurous her trust in rather vaguely conceived sweetness and light, that she was more energetic than any of the hulking young women who, with calves bulging in heavy-ribbed woolen stockings beneath decorous blue serge bloomers, thunningly galloped across the floor of the gym in practice for the Blodgett ladies' basketball team. Even when she was tired her dark eyes were observant, she did not yet know the immense ability of the world to be casually cruel and profoundly dull, but if she should ever learn those dismaying powers, 
her eyes would never become sullen or heavy or roomily amorous. For all her enthusiasms, for all the fondness and the crushes which she inspired, Carol's acquaintances were shy of her. When she was most ardently singing hymns or planning deviltry, she yet seemed gently aloof and critical. She was credulous, perhaps, a born hero-worshipper, yet she did question and examine unceasingly. Whatever she might become, she would never be static. Her versatility ensnared her. By turns, she hoped to discover that she had an unusual voice, a talent for the piano, the ability to act, to write, to manage organizations. Always she was disappointed, but always she effervesced anew over the student volunteers who intended to become missionaries, over painting scenery for the dramatic club, over soliciting advertisements for the college magazine. She was on the peak that Sunday afternoon when she played in chapel. Out of the dusk her violin took up the organ theme, and the candlelight revealed her in a straight golden frock, her arm arched to the bow, her lips serious. Every man fell in love then with religion and Carol. Throughout senior year she anxiously related all her experiments and partial successes to a career. Daily, on the library steps, or in the hall of the main building, the co talked of, what shall we do when we finish college? Even the girls who knew that they were going to be married pretended to be considering important business positions. Even they who knew that they would have to work hinted about fabulous suitors. As for Carol, she was an orphan. Her only near relative was a vanilla-flavored sister married to an optician in St. Paul. She had used most of the money from her father's estate. She was not in love, that is, not often, nor even ever long at a time. She would earn her living. But how she was to earn it, how she was to conquer the world almost entirely for the world's own good, she did not see. Most of the girls who were not betrothed meant to be teachers. Of these there were two sorts, careless young women who admitted that they intended to leave the beastly classroom and grubby children the minute they had a chance to marry, and studious, sometimes bulbous-browed and pop-eyed maidens who at class prayer meetings requested God to guide their feet along the paths of greatest usefulness. Neither sort tempted Carol. The former seemed insincere, a favorite word of hers at this era. The earnest virgins were, she fancied, as likely to do harm as to do good by their faith in the value of parsing Caesar. At various times during senior year, Carol finally decided upon studying law, writing motion picture scenarios, professional nursing, and marrying an unidentified hero. Then she found a hobby in sociology. The sociology instructor was new. He was married and therefore taboo, but he had come from Boston. He had lived among poets and socialists and Jews and millionaire uplifters at the university settlement in New York, and he had a beautiful white strong neck. He led a giggling class through the prisons, the charity bureaus, the employment agencies of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Trailing at the end of the line, Carol was indignant at the prodding curiosity of the others, their manner of staring at the poor as at a zoo. She felt herself a great liberator. She put her hand to her mouth, her forefinger and thumb quite painfully pinching her lower lip, and frowned and enjoyed being aloof. A classmate named Stuart Snyder, a competent, bulky young man in a gray flannel shirt, a rusty black bow tie, and the green and purple class cap, grumbled to her as they walked behind the others in the muck of the South St. Paul stockyards. These college chumps make me tired. They're so top lofty. They ought to have worked on the farm the way I have. These workmen put it all over them. I just love common workmen, glowed Carol. Only you don't want to forget that common workmen don't think they're common. Well, you're right. I apologize. Carol's brows lifted in the astonishment of emotion in a glory of abasement. Her eyes mothered the world. Stuart Snyder peered at her. He rammed his large red fists into his pockets. He jerked them out. He resolutely got rid of them by clenching his hands behind him, and he stammered. I know. You get people. Most of these darn co-eds say, Carol, you could do a lot for people. Oh, oh, uh, well, you know, sympathy and everything. Uh, if you were, well, uh, say you were a lawyer's wife. Well, you'd under, understand uh, his clients. Uh, I'm going to be a lawyer. I, I admit I fall down in sympathy sometimes. I get so doggone impatient with people that can't stand the gap. Uh, you'd be good for a fellow that was too serious. Make him more, more, well, you know, uh, sympathetic. His slightly pouting lips, his mastiff eyes, were begging her to beg him to go on. She fled from the steamroller of his sentiment. She cried, Oh, see those poor sheep? Millions and millions of them. 
she darted on. Stuart was not interesting. He hadn't a shapely white neck, and he had never lived among celebrated reformers. She wanted just now to have a cell in a settlement house, like a nun, without the bother of a black robe, and be kind, and read Bernard Shaw, and enormously improve a horde of grateful poor. The supplementary reading in sociology led her to a book on village improvement, tree planting, town pageants, girls' clubs. It had pictures of greens and garden walls in France, New England, Pennsylvania. She had picked it up carelessly with a slight yawn, which she patted down with her fingertips as delicately as a cat. She dipped into the book, lounging on her window seat with her slim, lyle-stockinged legs crossed and her knees up under her chin. She stroked a satin pillow while she read. About her was the clothy exuberance of a blodget college room, cretonne-covered window seat, photographs of girls, a carbon print of the Colosseum, a chafing dish, and a dozen pillows embroidered or beaded or pyrographed. Shockingly out of place was a miniature of the dancing Bacante. It was the only trace of Carol in the room. She had inherited the rest from generations of girl students. It was as a part of all this commonplaceness that she regarded the treatise on village improvement. But she suddenly stopped fidgeting. She strode into the book. She had fled halfway through it before the three o'clock bell called her to the class in English history. She sighed. That's what I'll do after college. I'll get my hands on one of those prairie towns and make it beautiful. Be an inspiration. I suppose I'd better become a teacher then, but I, I won't be that kind of a teacher. I won't drone. Why should they have all the garden suburbs on Long Island? Nobody has done anything with the ugly towns here in the Northwest except hold revivals and build libraries to contain the Elsie books. I'll make them put in a village green and darling cottages and a quaint Main Street. Thus... She triumphed through the class, which was a typical Blodgett contest between a dreary teacher and unwilling children of twenty, won by the teacher because his opponents had to answer his questions, while their treacherous queries he could counter by demanding, "'Have you looked that up in the library? Well, then, suppose you do.'" The history instructor was a retired minister. He was sarcastic today. He begged of sporting young Mr. Charlie Holmberg, now, Charles, would it interrupt your undoubtedly fascinating pursuit of that malevolent fly if I were to ask you to tell us that you do not know anything about King John? He spent three delightful minutes in assuring himself of the fact that no one exactly remembered the date of Magna Carta. Carol did not hear him. She was completing the roof of a half-timbered town hall. She had found one man in the prairie village who did not appreciate her picture of winding streets and arcades, but she had assembled the town council and dramatically defeated him. Though she was Minnesota-born, Carol was not an intimate of the prairie villages. Her father, the smiling and shabby, the learned and teasingly kind, had come from Massachusetts, and through all her childhood he had been a judge in Mankato, which is not a prairie town, but in its garden-sheltered streets and aisles of elms is white and green New England reborn. Mankato lies between cliffs and the Minnesota River, hard by Trevor des Sioux, where the first settlers made treaties with the Indians, and the cattle rustlers once came galloping before hell for leather posses. As she climbed along the banks of the dark river, Carol listened to its fables about the wide land of yellow waters and bleached buffalo bones to the west, the southern levees and singing darkies, and palm trees toward which it was forever mysteriously gliding, and she heard again the startled bells and thick puffing of high-stacked river steamers wrecked on sand reefs sixty years ago. Along the decks she saw missionaries, gamblers in tall pot hats, and Dakota chiefs with scarlet blankets. Far off whistles at night, round the river bend, plunking paddles re-echoed by the pines and a glow on black sliding waters. Carol's family were self-sufficient in their inventive life, with Christmas a rite full of surprises and tenderness, and dressing-up parties spontaneous and joyously absurd. The beasts in the Milford Hearth mythology were not the obscene night animals who jump out of closets and eat little girls, but beneficent and bright-eyed creatures, the Tamthab, who is woolly and blue and lives in the bathroom and runs rapidly to warm small feet the fruginous oil-stove who purrs and knows stories, and the skidamarig who will play with children before breakfast if they spring out of bed and close the window at the very first line of the song about puellas, which father sings while shaving. Judge Milford's pedagogical scheme was to let the children read whatever they pleased, and in his brown library Carol absorbed Balzac and Rabelais and Thoreau and Max Muller. He gravely taught them the letters on the backs of the encyclopedias, and when polite visitors asked about the mental progress of the little ones, they were horrified to hear the children earnestly repeating, A, 
and, and, oz, oz, biz, biz, cal, cal, cha. Carol's mother died when she was nine. Her father retired from the judiciary when she was eleven and took the family to Minneapolis. There he died two years after. Her sister, a busy, proper advisory soul, older than herself, had become a stranger to her even when they lived in the same house. From those early brown and silver days and from her independence of relatives, Carol retained a willingness to be different from brisk, efficient, book-ignoring people, an instinct to observe and wonder at their bustle even when she was taking part in it. But she felt approvingly, as she discovered her career of town planning, she was now roused to being brisk and efficient herself. In a month, Carol's ambition had clouded. Her hesitancy about becoming a teacher had returned. She was not, she worried, strong enough to endure the routine, and she could not picture herself standing before grinning children and pretending to be wise and decisive. But the desire for the creation of a beautiful town remained. When she encountered an item about small-town women's clubs or a photograph of a straggling Main Street, she was homesick for it. She felt robbed of her work. It was the advice of the professor of English which led her to study professional library work in a Chicago school. Her imagination carved and colored the new plan. She saw herself persuading children to read charming fairy tales, helping young men to find books on mechanics, being ever so courteous to old men who were hunting for newspapers, the light of the library, an authority on books, invited to dinners with poets and explorers, reading a paper to an association of distinguished scholars. The last faculty reception before commencement. In five days, they would be in the cyclone of final examinations. The house of the president had been massed with poems suggestive of polite undertaking parlors, and in the library, a ten-foot room with a globe and the portraits of Whittier and Martha Washington, the student orchestra was playing Carmen and Madame Butterfly. Carol was dizzy with music and the emotions of parting. She saw the poems as a jungle the pink-shaded electric globes as an opaline haze, and the eye-glassed faculty as Olympians. She was melancholy at sight of the mousy girls with whom she had always intended to get acquainted, and the half-dozen young men who were ready to fall in love with her. But it was Stuart Snyder whom she encouraged. He was so much manlier than the others. He was an even warm brown, like his new ready-made suit with its padded shoulders. She sat with him and with two cups of coffee and a chicken patty upon a pile of presidential overshoes in the coat closet under the stairs, and as the thin music seeped in, Stuart whispered, I can't stand it, this breaking up after four years, the happiest years of life. She believed it. Oh, I know, to think that in just a few days we'll be parting and we'll never see some of the bunch again. Carol, you got to listen to me. You always duck when I try to talk seriously to you, but you've got to listen to me. I'm going to be a big lawyer, maybe a judge, and I need you, and, and I'd protect you. His arm slid behind her shoulders. The insinuating music drained her independence. She said mournfully, Would you take care of me? She touched his hand. It was warm, solid. You bet I would. We'd have, Lord, we'd have bully times in Yankton where I'm going to settle. "'but I want to do something with life. "'What's better than making a comfy home "'and bringing up some cute kids "'and knowing nice homey people?' "'It was the immemorial male reply "'to the restless woman. "'Thus to the young Sappho speak the melon vendors, "'thus the captains to Zenobia, "'and in the damp cave over gnawed bones "'the hairy suitor thus protested "'to the woman advocate of matriarchy. "'In the dialect of Blodgett College, "'but with the voice of Sappho was Carol's answer. "'Of course, I know.' I suppose that's so. Honestly, I do love children. But there's lots of women that can do housework. But I... Well, if you have a college education, you ought to use it for the world. I know. But you can use it just as well in the home. And gee, Carol, just think of a bunch of us going out on an auto picnic some nice spring evening. Yes. And sleigh riding in winter. And going fishing. <clears throat> The orchestra had crashed into the soldier's chorus, and she was protesting. No, no, you're a dear, but I want to do things. I don't understand myself, but I want everything in the world. Maybe I can't sing or write, but I know I can be an influence in library work. Just suppose I encouraged some boy and he became a great artist. I will. I will do it. Stuart, dear, I, I can't settle down to nothing but dishwashing. Two minutes later... 
two hectic minutes. They were disturbed by an embarrassed couple also seeking the idyllic seclusion of the overshoe closet. After graduation, she never saw Stuart Snyder again. She wrote to him once a week for one month. A year Carol spent in Chicago. Her study of library cataloging, recording, books of reference was easy and not too somniferous. She reveled in the art institute, in symphonies and violin recitals, and chamber music, in the theater and classic dancing. She almost gave up library work to become one of the young women who dance in cheesecloth in the moonlight. She was taken to a certified studio party with beer, cigarettes, bobbed hair, and a Russian Jewess who sang the Internationale. It cannot be reported that Carol had anything significant to say to the Bohemians. She was awkward with them and felt ignorant, and she was shocked by the free manners which she had for years desired. But she heard and remembered discussions of Freud, Romain Roland, syndicalism, the Confederation Générale du Travail, feminism versus haremism, Chinese lyrics, nationalization of mines, Christian science, and fishing in Ontario. She went home, and that was the beginning and end of her bohemian life. The second cousin of Carol's sister's husband lived in Winnetka and once invited her out to Sunday dinner. She walked back through Wilmette and Evanston, discovered new forms of suburban architecture, and remembered her desire to recreate villages. She decided that she would give up library work and, by a miracle whose nature was not very clearly revealed to her, turn a prairie town into Georgian houses and Japanese bungalows. The next day in library class she had to read a theme on the use of the cumulative index and she was taken so seriously in the discussion that she put off her career in town planning and in the autumn she was in the public library of St. Paul. Carol was not unhappy and she was not exhilarated in the St. Paul library. She slowly confessed that she was not visibly affecting lives. She did at first put into her contact with the patrons a willingness which should have moved worlds but so few of these stolid worlds want to be moved. When she was in charge of the magazine room, the readers did not ask for suggestions about elevated essays. They grunted, I want to find the Leather Goods Gazette for last February. When she was giving out books, the principal query was, Can you tell me of a good, light, exciting love story to read? My husband's going away for a week. She was fond of the other librarians, proud of their aspirations and by the chance of propinquity she read scores of books unnatural to her gay white littleness, volumes of anthropology with ditches of footnotes filled with heaps of small dusty type, Parisian imagists, Hindu recipes for curry, voyages to the Solomon Isles, theosophy with modern American improvements, treatises upon success in the real estate business. She took walks and was sensible about shoes and diet, and never did she feel that she was living. She went to dances and suppers at the houses of college acquaintances. Sometimes she one-stepped demurely. Sometimes, in dread of life's slipping past, she turned into a bacchanal. Her tender eyes excited, her throat tense as she slid down the room. During her three years of library work, several men showed diligent interest in her. The treasurer of a fur manufacturing firm, a teacher, a newspaper reporter, and a petty railroad official. None of them made her more than pause in thought. For months, no mail emerged from the mass. Then, at the Marberries, she met Dr. Will Kennicott. The End of Chapter One Chapter Two It was a frail and blue and lonely Carol who trotted to the flat of the Johnson Marberries for Sunday evening supper. Mrs. Marberry was a neighbor and friend of Carol's sister. Mr. Marberry a traveling representative of an insurance company. They made a specialty of sandwich, salad, coffee, lap suppers, and they regarded Carol as their literary and artistic representative. She was the one who could be depended upon to appreciate the Caruso phonograph record and the Chinese lantern which Mr. Marbury had brought back as his present from San Francisco. Carol found the Marberries admiring and therefore admirable. This September Sunday evening, she wore a net frock with a pale pink lining, a nap had soothed away the faint lines of tiredness beside her eyes. She was young, naive, stimulated by the coolness. She flung her coat at the chair in the hall of the flat and exploded into the green plush living room. The familiar group were trying to be conversational. She saw Mr. Marbury, a woman teacher of gymnastics in a high school, a chief clerk from the great Northern Railway offices, a young lawyer. But there was also a stranger, 
a thick, tall man of thirty-six or seven with stolid brown hair, lips used to giving orders, eyes which followed everything good-naturedly, and clothes which you could never quite remember. Mr. Marbury boomed. Carol, come over here and meet Doc Kennicott. Dr. Will Kennicott of Gopher Prairie. He does all our insurance examining up in that neck of the woods, and they do say he's some doctor. As she edged toward the stranger and murmured nothing in particular, Carol remembered that Gopher Prairie was a Minnesota wheat prairie town of something over three thousand people. Pleased to meet you, stated Dr. Kennicott. His hand was strong, the palm soft, but the back weathered, showing golden hairs against firm red skin. He looked at her as though she was an agreeable discovery. She tugged her hand free and fluttered, I must go out to the kitchen and help Mrs. Marbury. She did not speak to him again till after she had heated the rolls and passed the paper napkins. Mr. Marbury captured her with a loud, Oh, quit fussing now. Come over here and sit down and tell us how's tricks. He herded her to a sofa with Dr. Kennicott, who was rather vague about uh, the eyes, rather drooping of bulky shoulder, as though he was wondering what he was expected to do next. As their host left them, Kennicott awoke. Marbury tells me you're a high mogul in the public library. I was surprised. Didn't hardly think you were old enough. I thought you were a girl, still in college, maybe. Oh, I'm dreadfully old. I expect to take to a lipstick and to find a gray hair any morning now. Huh. You must be frightfully old. Probably too old to be my granddaughter, I guess. Thus, in the Vale of Arcady, Nymph and Satyr beguiled the hours, precisely thus, and not in honeyed pentameters, discoursed Elaine and the worn Sir Lancelot in the pleached alley. How do you like your work? asked the doctor. It's pleasant, but sometimes I feel shut off from things, the steel stacks and the everlasting cards smeared all over with red rubber stamps. Don't you get sick of the city? St. Paul, why, don't you like it? I don't know of any lovelier view than when you stand on Summit Avenue and look across Lower Town to the Mississippi Cliffs and the Upland Farms beyond. Oh, I know, but, of course, I've spent nine years around the Twin Cities, took my B.A. and M.D. over at the U., and had my internship in a hospital in Minneapolis, but still, oh, well, you don't get to know folks here where you do up home. I feel I've got something to say about running Gopher Prairie but you take it in a big city of two, three hundred thousand, and I'm just one flea on the dog's back. And then I like country driving and the hunting in the fall. Do you know Gopher Prairie at all? No, but I hear it's a very nice town. Nice? Say, honestly. Of course, I may be prejudiced, but I've seen an awful lot of towns. One time I went to Atlantic City for the American Medical Association meeting, and I spent practically a week in New York but I never saw a town that had such up-and-coming people as Gopher Prairie. Bershannon, uh, you know the famous auto manufacturer? He comes from Gopher Prairie, born and brought up there, and it's a darn pretty town. Lots of fine maples and box elders, and there's two of the dandiest lakes you ever saw right near town. And we've got seven miles of cement walks already, and building more every day. Of course, a lot of these towns still put up with plank walks, but not for us, you bet. Really? Why, was she thinking of Stuart Snyder? Gopher Prairie is going to have a great future. Some of the best dairy and wheat land in the state right near there. Some of it selling right now at one fifty an acre, and I bet it will go up to two and a quarter in ten years. Is, do you like your profession? Nothing like it. Keeps you out, and yet you have a chance to loaf in the office for a change. Oh, I don't mean that way. I mean, it's such an opportunity for sympathy. Dr. Kennicott launched into a heavy... All oh, these Dutch farmers don't want sympathy. All they need is a bath and a good dose of salts. Carol must have flinched, for instantly he was urging. What I mean is, uh, I don't want you to think I'm one of these old salts and quinine peddlers, but I mean, so many of my patients are husky farmers that I suppose I get kind of case-hardened. It seems to me that a doctor could transform a whole community, if he wanted to, if he saw it. He's usually the only man in the neighborhood who has any scientific training, isn't he? Oh, yes, that's so. But I guess most of us get rusty. We land in a rut of obstetrics and typhoid and busted legs. What we need is women like you to jump on us. It'd be you that would transform the town. Oh, no, I, I couldn't. Too flighty. I did used to think about doing just that, curiously enough, but I seem to have drifted away from the idea. Oh, I'm a fine one to be lecturing you. No, you're just the one. You have ideas without having lost feminine charm. Say... 
Don't you think there's a lot of these women that go out for all these movements and so on that sacrifice? After his remarks upon suffrage, he abruptly questioned her about herself. His kindliness and the firmness of his personality enveloped her, and she accepted him as one who had a right to know what she thought, and wore, and ate, and read. He was positive. He had grown from a sketched-in stranger to a friend whose gossip was important news. She noticed the healthy solidity of his chest. His nose, which had seemed irregular and large, was suddenly virile. She was jarred out of this serious sweetness when Marbury bounced over to them and with horrible publicity yammered, "'Say, what do you think you two are doing? Telling fortunes or making love? Let me warn you that the doc is a frisky bachelor, Carol. Come on now, folks, shake a leg. Let's have some stunts or a dance or something.' She did not have another word with Dr. Kennicott until their parting. "'Been a great pleasure to meet you, Miss Milford. "'May I see you some time when I come down again? "'I'm here quite often, taking patients to hospitals for majors and so on. "'Why, what's your address? "'You can ask Mr. Marbury next time you come down if you really want to know.' "'Want to know? "'Say, you wait.' Of the lovemaking of Carol and Will Kennicott, there is nothing to be told which may not be heard on every summer evening on every shadowy block. They were biology and mystery. Their speech was slang phrases and flares of poetry. Their silences were contentment or shaky crises when his arm took her shoulder. All the beauty of youth, first discovered when it is passing, and all the commonplaceness of a well-to-do unmarried man encountering a pretty girl at the time when she is slightly weary of her employment and sees no glory ahead, nor any man she is glad to serve. They liked each other honestly. They were both honest. She was disappointed by his devotion to making money, but she was sure that he did not lie to patients and that he did keep up with the medical magazines. What aroused her to something more than liking was his boyishness when they went tramping. They walked from St. Paul down the river to Mendota, Connecticut, more elastic-seeming in a cap and a soft crepe shirt, Carol youthful in a tam shanter of mole velvet, a blue serge suit with an absurdly and uh, agreeably broad turn-down linen collar, and frivolous ankles above athletic shoes. The high bridge crosses the Mississippi, mounting from low banks to a palisade of cliffs. Far down beneath it, on the St. Paul side, upon mudflats, is a wild settlement of chicken-infested gardens and shanties, patched together from discarded signboards, sheets of corrugated iron, and planks fished out of the river. Carol leaned over the rail of the bridge to look down at this Yangtze village. In delicious imagery fear, she shrieked that she was dizzy with the height, and it was an extremely human satisfaction to have a strong male snatch her back to safety, instead of having a logical woman teacher or librarian sniff, "'Well, if you're scared, why don't you get away from the rail, then?' From the cliffs across the river, Carol and Kennicott looked back at St. Paul on its hills, an imperial sweep from the dome of the cathedral to the dome of the state capitol. The river road led past rocky field slopes, deep glens, woods flamboyant now with September, to Mendota, white walls and a spire among trees beneath a hill, old world in its placid ease. And for this fresh land, the place is ancient. Here is the bold stone house which General Sibley, the king of fur trade, has built in 1835, with plaster of river mud and ropes of twisted grass for laths. It has an air of centuries. In its solid rooms, Carol and Kennicott found prints from other days which the house had seen, tailcoats of robin's egg blue, clumsy red river carts laden with luxurious furs, whiskered Union soldiers in slant forage caps and rattling sabres. It suggested to them a common American past, and it was memorable because they had discovered it together. They talked more trustingly, more personally, as they trudged on. They crossed the Minnesota River in a rowboat ferry. They climbed the hill to the round stone tower of Fort Snelling. They saw the junction of the Mississippi and the Minnesota, and recalled the men who had come here eighty years ago, Maine lumbermen, York traders, soldiers from the Maryland hills. It's a good country, and I'm proud of it. Let's make it all that those old boys dreamed about. The unsentimental Kennicott was moved to bow. Let's. Come on, come to Gopher Prairie. Show us. Make the town, well, make it artistic. It's mighty pretty, but I'll admit we aren't any too darn artistic. Probably the lumber yard isn't as scrumptious as all these Greek temples. But go to it. Make us change. I would like to, some day. Now, 
You'd love Gopher Prairie. We've been doing a lot with lawns and gardening the past few years, and it's so homey. The big trees and, and the best people on earth, and keen. I bet Luke Dawson. Carol but half listened to the names. She could not fancy their ever becoming important to her. I bet Luke Dawson has got more money than most of the swells on Summit Avenue. And Miss Sherwin in the high school is a regular wonder. Reads Latin like I do English. And Sam Clark, the hardware man, he's a corker. Not a better man in the state to go hunting with. And if you want culture, besides Vida Sherwin, there's Reverend Warren, the congregational preacher, and Professor Mott, the superintendent of schools, and Guy Pollock, the lawyer. They say he writes regular poetry. And, oh, and Ramey Wotherspoon, uh, he's not such an awful boob when you get to know him. And he sings swell. And, oh, and there's plenty of others. Uh, Lim Cass, only, of course, none of them have your finesse, you might call it. But they don't make him any more appreciative, and so on. Come on, we're ready for you to boss us. They sat on the bank below the parapet of the old fort, hidden from observation. He circled her shoulder with his arm, relaxed after the walk, a chill nipping her throat, conscious of his warmth and power. She leaned gratefully against him. You know, I'm in love with you, Carol. She did not answer, but she touched the back of his hand with an exploring finger. You say I'm so darn materialistic. How can I help it unless I have you to stir me up? She did not answer. She could not think. You say a doctor could cure a town the way he does a person. Well, you cure the town of whatever ails it, if anything does, and I'll be your surgical kit. She did not follow his words, only the burring resoluteness of them. She was shocked, thrilled, as he kissed her cheek and cried, There's no use saying things and saying things and saying things. Don't my arms talk to you now? Oh, please, please. She wondered if she ought to be angry, but it was a drifting thought, and she discovered that she was crying. Then they were sitting six inches apart, pretending that they had never been nearer, while she tried to be impersonal. I would like to... would like to see Gopher Prairie. Trust me, here she is. Brought some snapshots down to show you. Her cheek near his sleeve, she studied a dozen village pictures. They were streaky. She saw only trees, shrubbery, a porch indistinct in leafy shadows. But she exclaimed over the lakes, dark water reflecting wooded bluffs, a flight of ducks, a fisherman in shirt sleeves, and a wide straw hat, holding up a string of crappies. One winter picture of the edge of Plover Lake had the air of an etching, lustrous slide of ice, snow in the crevices of a boggy bank, the mound of a muskrat house, reeds in thin black lines, arches of frosty grasses. It was an impression of cool, clean vigor. How'd it be to skate there for a couple of hours, or go zinging along on a fast ice boat and skip back home for coffee and some hot weenies? he demanded. It might be fun. But here's the picture. Here's where you come in. A photograph of a forest clearing, pathetic new furrows straggling among stumps, a clumsy log cabin chinked with mud and roofed with hay. In front of it, a sagging woman with tight-drawn hair and a baby, bedraggled, smeary, glorious-eyed. Those are the kind of folks I practice among good share of the time. Nels Erdstrom, fine, clean, young Svenska. He'll have a corkin farm in ten years. But now, I operated his wife on a kitchen table with my driver giving the anesthetic. Look at that scared baby. Needs some woman with hands like yours, waiting for you. Just look at that baby's eyes. Look how he's begging. No, don't. They hurt me. Oh, it would be sweet to help him, so sweet. As his arms moved toward her, she answered all her doubts with sweet, so sweet. The end of chapter two of Main Street. Chapter three. Under the rolling clouds of the prairie, a moving mass of steel, an irritable clank and rattle beneath a prolonged roar. The sharp scent of oranges cutting the soggy smell of unbathed people and ancient baggage. Towns as planless as a scattering of pasteboard boxes on an attic floor. The stretch of faded gold stubble, broken only by clumps of willows encircling white houses and red barns. Number seven, the way train, grumbling through Minnesota, imperceptibly climbing the giant tableland that slopes in a thousand-mile rise from hot Mississippi bottoms to the Rockies. It is September, hot, very dusty. 
There is no smug Pullman attached to the train, and the day coaches of the East are replaced by free chair cars, with each seat cut into two adjustable plush chairs, the head rests covered with doubtful linen towels. Halfway down the car is a semi-partition of carved oak columns, but the aisle is of bare, splintery, grease-blackened wood. There is no porter, no pillows, no provision for beds, but all today and all tonight they will ride in this long steel box farmers with perpetually tired wives and children who seem all to be of the same age, workmen going to new jobs, traveling, salesmen with derbies and freshly shined shoes. They are parched and cramped, the lines of their hands filled with grime. They go to sleep curled in distorted attitudes, heads against the window panes, or propped on rolled coats on seat arms, and legs thrust into the aisle. They do not read. Apparently they do not think. They wait. An early wrinkled young old mother, moving as though her joints were dry, opens a suitcase in which are seen creased blouses, a pair of slippers worn through at the toes, a bottle of patent medicine, a tin cup, a paper-covered book about dreams, which the news butcher has coaxed her into buying. She brings out a graham cracker, which she feeds to a baby, lying flat on a seat and wailing hopelessly. Most of the crumbs drop on the red plush of the seat, and the woman sighs and tries to brush them away, but they leap up impishly and fall back on the plush. A soiled man and woman munch sandwiches and throw the crusts on the floor. A large brick-colored Norwegian takes off his shoes, grunts in relief, and props his feet in their thick gray socks against the seat in front of him. An old woman, whose toothless mouth shuts like a mud turtle's, and whose hair is not so much white as yellow like moldy linen, with bands of pink skull apparent between the tresses, anxiously lifts her bag, opens it, peers in, closes it, puts it under the seat, and hastily picks it up and opens it and hides it all over again. The bag is full of treasures and of memories, a leather buckle, an ancient band concert program, scraps of ribbon, lace, satin. In the aisle beside her is an extremely indignant parakeet in a cage. Two facing seats overflowing with the Slovene iron miners' family are loaded with shoes, dolls, whiskey bottles, bundles wrapped in newspapers, a sewing bag. The oldest boy takes a mouth organ out of his coat pocket, wipes the tobacco crumbs off, and plays Marching Through Georgia till every head in the car begins to ache. The news butcher comes through selling chocolate bars and lemon drops. A girl child ceaselessly trots down to the water cooler and back to her seat. The stiff paper envelope which she uses for a cup drips in the aisle as she goes, and on each trip she stumbles over the feet of a carpenter who grunts, Ouch! Look out! The dust-caked doors are open, and from the smoking car drifts back a visible blue line of stinging tobacco smoke, and with it a crackle of laughter over the story which the young man in the bright blue suit and lavender tie and light yellow shoes has just told to the squat man in garage overalls. The smell grows constantly thicker, more stale. To each of the passengers his seat was his temporary home, and most of the passengers were slatternly housekeepers, but one seat looked clean and deceptively cool. In it were an obviously prosperous man and a black-haired, fine-skinned girl whose pumps rested on an immaculate horsehide bag. They were Dr. Will Kennicott and his bride, Carol. They had been married at the end of a year of conversational courtship, and they were on their way to Gopher Prairie, after a wedding journey in the Colorado mountains. The hordes of the weight train were not altogether new to Carol. She had seen them on trips from St. Paul to Chicago. But now that they had become her own people, to bathe and encourage and adorn, she had an acute and uncomfortable interest in them. They distressed her. They were so stolid. She had always maintained that there is no American peasantry, and she sought now to defend her faith by seeing imagination and enterprise in the young Swedish farmers and in a traveling man working over his order blanks. But the older people, Yankees, as well as Norwegians, Germans, Finns, Canucks, had settled into submission to poverty. They were peasants, she groaned. Isn't there any way of waking them up? What would happen if they understood scientific agriculture? She begged of Kennicott, her hand groping for his. It had been a transforming honeymoon. She had been frightened to discover how tumultuous a feeling could be roused in her. Will had been lordly, stalwart, jolly, impressively competent in making camp tender and understanding through the hours when they had lain side by side in a tent pitched among pines high up on a lonely mountain spur. His hand swallowed hers as he started from thoughts of the practice to which he was returning. These people? Wake them up? What for? They're happy. But they're so provincial. No, that, that isn't what I mean. They're so 
Oh, so sunk in the mud. Look here, Carrie. You want to get over your silly idea that because a man's pants aren't pressed, he's a fool. These farmers are mighty keen and up and coming. I know. That's what hurts. Life seems so hard for them, these lonely farms in this gritty train. Oh, they don't mind it. Besides, things are changing. The auto, the telephone, rural free delivery. They're bringing the farmers in closer touch with the town. Takes time, you know, to change a wilderness like this was 50 years ago. But already, why, they can hop into the Ford or the Overland and get into the movies on Saturday evening quicker than you could get down to them by trolley in St. Paul. But if it's these towns we've been passing that the farmers run to for relief from their bleakness, can't you understand? Just look at them. Kennicott was amazed. Ever since childhood, he had seen these towns from trains on this same line. He grumbled. Why, what's the matter with them? Good hustling bergs. It would astonish you to know how much wheat and rye and corn and potatoes they ship in a year. But they're so ugly. I'll admit they aren't comfy like Gopher Prairie, but give them time. What's the use of giving them time unless someone has desire and training enough to plan them? Hundreds of factories trying to make attractive motor cars, but these towns left a chance. No, that can't be true. It must have taken genius to make them so scrawny. Oh, they're not so bad, was all he answered. He pretended that his hand was the cat and hers the mouse. For the first time she tolerated him rather than encouraged him. She was staring out at Schoenstrom, a hamlet of perhaps a hundred and fifty inhabitants, at which the train was stopping. A bearded German and his pucker-mouthed wife tugged their enormous imitation leather satchel from under a seat and waddled out. The station agent hoisted a dead calf aboard the baggage car. There were no other visible activities in Schoenstrom. In the quiet of the halt, Carol could hear a horse kicking his stall a carpenter shingling a roof. The business center of Schoenstrom took up one side of one block facing the railroad. It was a row of one-story shops covered with galvanized iron or with clapboards painted red and bilious yellow. The buildings were as ill-assorted, as temporary-looking, as a mining camp street in the motion pictures. The railroad station was a one-room frame box, a miry cattle pen on one side, and a crimson wheat elevator on the other. The elevator, with its cupola on the ridge of a shingled roof, resembled a broad-shouldered man with a small, vicious, pointed head. The only habitable structures to be seen were the florid red-brick Catholic church and rectory at the end of Main Street. Carol picked at Kennicott's sleeve. You wouldn't call this a not-so-bad town, would you? These Dutch burgs are kind of slow. Still, at that, uh, see that fellow coming out of the general store there, getting into the big car? I met him once. He owns about half the town, besides the store. Ross Kukul, his name is. He owns a lot of mortgages, and he gambles in farmlands. Good nut on him, that fellow. Why, they say he's worth three or four hundred thousand dollars. Got a dandy great big yellow brick house with tiled walks and a garden and everything other end of town. I can't see it from here. I've gone past it when I've driven through here. Yes, sir. Then if he has all that, there's no excuse whatever for this place. If his three hundred thousand went back into the town where it belongs... They could burn up these shacks and build a dream village, a jewel. Why did the farmers and the town people let the baron keep it? I must say, I don't quite get you sometimes, Carrie. Let him. They can't help themselves. He's a dumb old Dutchman, and probably the priest can twist him around his finger. But when it comes to picking good farming land, he's a regular whiz. I see. He's their symbol of beauty. The town erects him instead of erecting buildings. Honestly... Don't know what you're driving at. You're kind of played out after this long trip. You'll feel better when you get home and have a good bath and put on the blue negligee. That's some vampire costume, you witch. He squeezed her arm, looked at her knowingly. They moved on from the deserted stillness of the Schoenstrom station. The train creaked, banged, swayed. The air was nauseatingly thick. Kennicott turned her face from the window, rested her head on his shoulder. She was coaxed from her unhappy mood. But she came out of it unwillingly, and when Kennicott was satisfied that he had corrected all her worries and had opened a magazine of saffron detective stories, she sat upright. Here, she meditated, is the newest empire of the world, the northern Middle West, a land of dairy herds and exquisite lakes of new automobiles and tar paper shanties and silos like red towers of clumsy speech and a hope that is boundless, an empire which feeds a quarter of the world, yet its work has merely begun. They are pioneers, these sweaty wayfarers, for all their telephones and bank accounts and automatic pianos and cooperative leagues, and for all its fat richness, theirs is a pioneer land. 
what is its future? she wondered. A future of cities and factory smut where now are looping empty fields, homes universal and secure, or placid chateau ringed with sullen huts. Youth free to find knowledge and laughter, willingness to sift the sanctified lies, or creamy-skinned fat women smeared with grease and chalk, gorgeous in the skins of beasts and the bloody feathers of slain birds, playing bridge with puffy pink-nailed jeweled figures, women who, after much expenditure of labor and bad temper, still grotesquely resemble their own flatulent lapdogs. The ancient stale inequalities are something different in history, unlike the tedious maturity of other empires. What future and what hope? Carol's head ached with the riddle. She saw the prairie flat in giant patches or rolling in long hummocks. The width and bigness of it, which had expanded her spirit an hour ago, began to frighten her. It spread out so. It went on so uncontrollably she could never know it. Kennicott was closeted in his detective story. With the loneliness which comes most depressingly in the midst of many people, she tried to forget problems, to look at the prairie objectively. The grass beside the railroad had been burnt over. It was a smudge, prickly, with charred stalks of weeds. Beyond the undeviating barbed wire fences were clumps of goldenrod. Only this thin hedge shut them off from the plains shorn wheat lands of autumn. A hundred acres to a field, prickly and gray nearby, but in the blurred distance like tawny velvet stretching over dipping hillocks. The long rows of wheat shocks marched like soldiers in worn yellow tabards. The newly ploughed fields were black banners fallen on the distant slope. It was a martial immensity, vigorous, a little harsh, unsoftened by kindly gardens. The expanse was relieved by clumps of oaks with patches of short wild grass, and every mile or two was a chain of cobalt sloughs with the flicker of blackbirds' wings across them. All this working land was turned into exuberance by the light. The sunshine was dizzy on open stubble. Shadows from immense cumulus clouds were forever sliding across low mounds, and the sky was wider and loftier and more resolutely blue than the sky of cities, she declared. It's a glorious country, a land to be big in, she crooned. Then Kennicott startled her by chuckling. Do you realize the town after the next is Gopher Prairie? Home. That one word, home. It terrified her. Had she really bound herself to live inescapably in this town called Gopher Prairie? And this thick man beside her, who dared to define her future, he was a stranger. She turned in her seat, stared at him. Who was he? Why was he sitting with her? He wasn't of her kind. His neck was heavy. His speech was heavy. He was twelve or thirteen years older than she, and about him was none of the magic of shared adventures and eagerness. She could not believe that she had ever slept in his arms. That was one of the dreams which she had, but did not officially admit. She told herself how good he was, how dependable and understanding. She touched his ear, smoothed the plane of his solid jaw, and, turning away again, concentrated upon liking his town. It wouldn't be like these barren settlements. It couldn't be. Why, it had three thousand population. That was a great many people. There would be six hundred houses or more, and the lakes near it would be so lovely. She'd seen them in the photographs. They had looked charming, hadn't they? As the train left Joaquinian, she began nervously to watch for the lakes, the entrance to all her future life. But when she discovered them to the left of the track, her only impression of them was that they resembled the photographs. A mile from Gopher Prairie, the track mounts a curving low ridge, and she could see the town as a whole. With a passionate jerk, she pushed up the window, looked out, the arched fingers of her left hand trembling on the sill, her right hand at her breast and she saw that Gopher Prairie was merely an enlargement of all the hamlets which they had been passing. Only to the eyes of a Kennecott was it exceptional. The huddled, low wooden houses broke the plain scarcely more than would a hazel thicket. The fields swept up to it, past it. It was unprotected and unprotecting. There was no dignity in it, nor any hope of greatness. Only the tall red grain elevator and a few tinny church steeples rose from the mass. It was a frontier camp. It was not a place to live in, not possibly, not conceivably. The people, they'd be as drab as their houses, as flat as their fields. She couldn't stay here. She would have to wrench loose from this man and flee. She peeped at him. She was at once helpless before his mature fixity, and touched by his excitement as he sent his magazine skittering along the aisle, stooped for their bags, came up with flushed face and gloated, Here we are. She smiled loyally and looked away. The train was entering town. 
The houses on the outskirts were dusky old red mansions with wooden frills or gaunt frame shelters like grocery boxes or new bungalows with concrete foundations imitating stone. Now the train was passing the elevator, the grim storage tanks for oil, a creamery, a lumber yard, a stockyard muddy and trampled and stinking. Now they were stopping at a squat red frame station, the platform crowded with unshaven farmers and with loafers, unadventurous people with dead eyes. She was here. She could not go on. It was the end, the end of the world. She sat with closed eyes, longing to push past Kennicott, hide somewhere in the train, flee on toward the Pacific. Something large arose in her soul and commanded, Stop it. Stop being a whining baby. She stood up quickly. She said, Isn't it wonderful to be here at last? He trusted her so. She would make herself like the place, and she was going to do tremendous things. She followed Kennicott and the bobbing ends of the two bags which he carried. They were held back by the slow line of disembarking passengers. She reminded herself that she was actually at the dramatic moment of the bride's homecoming. She ought to feel exalted. She felt nothing at all except irritation at their slow progress toward the door. Kennicott stooped to peer through the windows. He shyly exulted. Look! Look! There's a bunch come down to welcome us. Sam Clark and the missus and... Dave Dyer and Jack Elder and, yes, sir, huh, Harry Haydock and Juanita and the whole crowd. Oh, I guess they see us now. Yeah, yeah, sure they see us. See him waving? She obediently bent her head to look out at them. She had hold of herself. She was ready to love them. But she was embarrassed by the hardiness of the cheering group. From the vestibule she waved to them, but she clung a second to the sleeve of the brakeman who helped her down before she had the courage to dive into the cataract of handshaking people people whom she could not tell apart. She had the impression that all the men had coarse voices, large damp hands, toothbrush mustaches, bald spots, and Masonic watch charms. She knew that they were welcoming her. Their hands, their smiles, their shouts, their affectionate eyes overcame her. She stammered, Thank you. Oh, thank you. One of the men was clamoring at Kennicott. I brought my machine down to take you home, Doc. Fine business, Sam, cried Kennicott. And to Carol, let's jump in. That big page over there. Some boat, too, believe me. Sam can show speed to any of these marmons from Minneapolis. Only when she was in the motor car did she distinguish the three people who were to accompany them. The owner, now at the wheel, was the essence of decent self-satisfaction. A baldish, largish, level-eyed man, rugged of neck, but sleek and round of face. Face like the back of a spoon bowl. He was chuckling at her. Have you got us all straight yet? Of course she has. Trust Carrie to get things straight and get them darn quick. I bet she could tell you every date in history, boasted her husband. But the man looked at her reassuringly, and with a certainty that he was a person whom she could trust, she confessed, As a matter of fact, I haven't got anybody straight. Of course you haven't, child. Well, I'm Sam Clark, dealer in hardware, sporting goods, cream separators, and almost any kind of heavy junk you can think of. You can call me Sam, anyway. I'm going to call you Carrie, seeing as you've been and gone and married this poor fish of a bum medic that we keep round here. Carol smiled lavishly and wished that she called people by their given names more easily. The fat, cranky lady back there beside you, who's pretending that she can't hear me giving her away, is Mrs. Samuel Clark. And this hungry-looking squirt up here beside me is Dave Dyer, who keeps his drugstore running by not filling your hubby's prescriptions right. In fact, you might say he's the guy that put the shun in prescription. So... Well, uh, leave us take the bonny bride home. Uh, say, Doc, I'll show you the Canderson place for 3,000 plunks. Better be thinking about building a new home for Carrie. Prettiest for all in GP, if you ask me. Contentedly, Sam Clark drove off in the heavy traffic of three Fords and the Minnie Mashy house-free bus. I shall like Mr. Clark. I can't call him Sam. They're all so friendly. She glanced at the houses, tried not to see what she saw, gave way, and... Why do these stories lie so? They always make the bride's homecoming a bower of roses. Complete trust in noble spouse. Lies about marriage. I'm not changed. And this town, oh my God, I can't go through with this junk heap. Her husband bent over her. You look like you were in a brown study. Scared? I don't expect you to think Gopher Prairie is a paradise after St. Paul. I don't expect you to be crazy about it at first. But you'll come to like it so much. Life's so free here and... Best people on earth. She whispered to him, while Mrs. Clark considerately turned away, I love you for understanding. I'm just 
I'm beastly oversensitive. Too many books. It's my lack of shoulder muscles and sense. Give me time, dear. You bet. All the time you want. She laid the back of his hand against her cheek, snuggled near him. She was ready for her new home. Kennicott had told her that, with his widowed mother as housekeeper, he had occupied an old house. But nice and roomy, well heated, best furnace I could find on the market. His mother had left Carol her love and gone back to Laquimert. It would be wonderful, she exalted, not to have to live in other people's houses, but to make her own shine. She held his hand tightly and stared ahead as the car swung round a corner and stopped in the street before a prosaic frame house in a small, parched lawn. A concrete sidewalk with a parking of grass and mud. A square, smug brown house, rather damp. A narrow concrete walk up to it. Sickly yellow leaves in a window with dried wings of box elder seeds and snags of wool from the cottonwoods. A screened porch with pillars of thin painted pine surmounted by scrolls and brackets and bumps of jigsawed wood. No shrubbery to shut off the public gaze. A lugubrious bay window to the right of the porch. Window curtains of starched cheap lace revealing a pink marble table with a conch shell and a family Bible. You'll find it old-fashioned. What do you call it? Uh, Mid-Victorian. I left it as is so you could make any changes you felt were necessary. Kennicott sounded doubtful for the first time since he had come back to his own home. It's a real home. She was moved by his humility. She gaily motioned goodbye to the clerks. He unlocked the door. He was leaving the choice of a maid to her, and there was no one else in the house. She jiggled while he turned the key and scampered in. It was next day before either of them remembered that, in their honeymoon camp, they had planned that he should carry her over the sill. In hallway and front parlor she was conscious of dinginess and lugubriousness and airlessness. But, she insisted, I'll make it all jolly. As she followed Kennicott and the bags up to their bedroom, she quavered to herself the song of the fat little gods of the hearth. I have my own home to do what I please with, to do what I please with, my den for me and my mate and my cubs, my own. She was close in her husband's arms. She clung to him, whatever of strangeness and slowness and insularity she might find in him. None of that mattered so long as she could slip her hands beneath his coat, run her fingers over the warm smoothness of the satin back of his waistcoat, seem almost to creep into his body, find in him strength, find in the courage and kindness of her man a shelter from the perplexing world. Sweet, so sweet, she whispered. The end of chapter 3 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 4 The Clarks have invited some folks to their house to meet us tonight, said Kennicott as he unpacked his suitcase. Oh, that is nice of them. You bet. I told you you'd like them, squarest people on earth. Um, Carrie, would you mind if I sneak down to the office for an hour just to see how things are? Why, no, of course not. I know you're keen to get back to work. Sure you don't mind? Not a bit. Out of my way. Let me unpack. But the advocate of freedom in marriage was as much disappointed as a drooping bride at the alacrity with which he took that freedom and escaped to the world of men's affairs. She gazed about their bedroom, and its full dismalness crawled over her. The awkwardly, knuckly L-shape of it. The black walnut bed with apples and spotty pears carved on the headboard. The imitation maple bureau with pink daubed scent bottles and a petticoated pincushion on a marble slab uncomfortably like a gravestone. The plain pine washstand and the garlanded water pitcher and bowl. The scent was of horsehair and plush and Florida water. How could people ever live with things like this? She shuddered. She saw the furniture as a circle of elderly judges condemning her to death by smothering. The tottering brocade chair squeaked, Choke her! Choke her! Smother her! The old linen smelled of the tomb. She was alone in this house, this strange still house, among the shadows of dead thoughts and haunting repressions. I hate it. I hate it, she panted. Why did I ever... She remembered that Kennicott's mother had brought these family relics from the old home in Lockie Mare. Stop it. They're perfectly comfortable things. They're comfortable. Besides, oh, they're horrible. We'll change them right away. Then. But, of course... He has to see how things are at the office. 
She made a pretense of busying herself with unpacking. The chintz line silver-fitted bag, which had seemed so desirable a luxury in St. Paul, was an extravagant vanity here. The daring black chemise of frail chiffon and lace was a hussy at which the deep-bosomed bed stiffened in disgust, and she hurled it into a bureau drawer, hid it beneath a sensible linen blouse. She gave up unpacking. She went to the window with a purely literary thought of village charm, hollyhocks and lanes and apple-cheeked cottagers. What she saw was the side of the Seventh-day Adventist church, a plain clapboard wall of a sour liver color, the ash pile back of the church, an unpainted stable and an alley in which a Ford delivery wagon had been stranded. This was the terraced garden below her boudoir. This was to be her scenery for... I mustn't, I mustn't. I'm nervous this afternoon. Am I sick? Good Lord! I hope it isn't that. Not now. How people lie! How these stories lie! They say the bride is always so blushing and proud and happy when she finds that out, but I'd... Oh, I'd hate it. I'd be scared to death. Some day, but... Oh, please, dear, nebulous Lord, not now. Bearded, sniffy old men sitting and demanding that we bear children, if they had to bear them. Oh, I wish they did have to. Not now. Not till I've got hold of this job of liking the ash pile out there. I must shut up. I'm mildly insane. I'm going out for a walk. I'll see the town by myself. My first view of the empire I'm going to conquer. She fled from the house. She stared with seriousness at every concrete crossing, every hitching post, every rake for leaves, and to each house she devoted all her speculation. What would they come to mean? How would they look six months from now? In which of them would she be dining? Which of these people whom she passed, now mere arrangements of hair and clothes, would turn into intimates, loved or dreaded, different from all the other people in the world? As she came into the small business section, she inspected a broad-beamed grocer in an alpaca coat who was bending over the apples and celery on a slanted platform in front of his store. Would she ever talk to him? What would he say if she stopped and stated, I am Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. Some day I hope to confide that a heap of extremely dubious pumpkins as a window display doesn't exhilarate me much. The grocer was Mr. Frederick F. Ludemeyer, whose market is at the corner of Main Street and Lincoln Avenue. In supposing that only she was observant, Carol was ignorant, misled by the indifference of cities. She fancied that she was slipping through the streets invisible, but when she had passed, Mr. Ludemeyer puffed into the store and coughed at his clerk. I seen a young woman. She come along the side street. I bet she is Doc Kennicott's new bride, good looker, nice legs, but she wore a hell of a plain suit, no style. I wonder, will she pay cash? I bet she goes to Howland Gould's more as she does here. What you done with the poster for fluffed oats? When Carol had walked for thirty-two minutes, she had completely covered the town, east and west, north and south, and she stood at the corner of Main Street and Washington Avenue and despaired. Main Street, with its two-story brick shops, its story-and-a-half wooden residences, its muddy expanse from concrete walk to walk, its huddle of fords and lumber wagons, was too small to absorb her. The broad, straight, unenticing gashes of the streets let in the grasping prairie on every side. She realized the vastness and the emptiness of the land. The skeleton iron windmill on the farm a few blocks away at the north end of Main Street was like the ribs of a dead cow. She thought of the coming of the northern winter, when the unprotected houses would crouch together in terror of storms galloping out of that wild waste. They were so small and weak, the little brown houses. They were shelters for sparrows, not homes for warm, laughing people. She told herself that down the street the leaves were a splendor. The maples were orange, the oaks a solid tint of raspberry, and the lawns had been nursed with love. But the thought would not hold. At best, the trees resembled a thinned woodlot. There was no park to rest the eyes, and since not Gopher Prairie but Wakiman was the county seat, there was no courthouse with its grounds. She glanced through the fly-specked windows of the most pretentious building in sight, the one place which welcomed strangers and determined their opinion of the charm and luxury of Gopher Prairie, the Minimashi House. It was a tall, lean, shabby structure, three stories of yellow-streaked wood, the corners covered with sanded pine slabs purporting to symbolize stone. In the hotel office she could see a stretch of bare, unclean floor, a line of rickety chairs with brass cuspidors between, a writing desk with advertisements in mother-of-pearl letters upon the glass-covered back. The dining room beyond was a jungle of stained tablecloths and catsup bottles. She looked no more at the Minimashi house. A man in cuffless shirt-sleeves with pink arm-garters, wearing a linen collar but no tie, 
yawned his way from Dyer's drugstore across to the hotel. He leaned against the wall, scratched a while, sighed, and in a bored way gossiped with a man tilted back in a chair. A lumber wagon, its long green box filled with large spools of barbed wire fencing, creaked down the block. A Ford, in reverse, sounded as though it were shaking to pieces, then recovered and rattled away. In the Greek candy store was the wine of a peanut roaster and the oily smell of nuts. There was no other sound nor sign of life. She wanted to run, fleeing from the encroaching prairie, demanding the security of a great city. Her dreams of creating a beautiful town were ludicrous. Oozing out from every drab wall, she felt a forbidding spirit which she could never conquer. She trailed down the street on one side, back on the other, glancing into the cross streets. It was a private, seeing Main Street tour. She was within ten minutes beholding not only the heart of a place called Gopher Prairie, but ten thousand towns from Albany to San Diego. Dyer's drugstore was a corner building of regular and unreal blocks of artificial stone. Inside the store, a greasy marble soda fountain with an electric lamp of red and green and curdled yellow mosaic shade pawed over heaps of toothbrushes and combs and packages of shaving soap, shelves of soap cartons, teething rings, garden seeds, and patent medicines in yellow packages' nostrums for consumption, for women's diseases, notorious mixtures of opium and alcohol, in the very shop to which her husband sent patients for the filling of prescriptions. From a second-story window, the sign, W.P. Kennicott, Physician and Surgeon, Guilt on Black Sand. A small wooden motion picture theater called the Rosebud Movie Palace, lithographs, announced a film called Fatty in Love. Howland Gould's Grocery. In the display window, black overripe bananas and lettuce on which a cat was sleeping. Shelves lined with red crepe paper, which was now faded and torn and concentrically spotted. Flat against the wall of the second story, the signs of lodges, the Knights of Pythias, the Maccabees, the Woodmen, the Masons. Dahl and Olison's Meat Market, a reek of blood. A jewelry shop with a tinny-looking wristwatch for women. In front of it, at the curb, a huge wooden clock, which did not go. A fly-buzzing saloon with a brilliant golden enamel whiskey sign across the front. Other saloons down the block. From them, a stink of stale beer and thick voices bellowing pigeon German or trolling out dirty songs. Vice gone feeble and unenterprising and dull, the delicacy of a mining camp minus its vigor. In front of the saloons, farm wives sitting on the seats of wagons, waiting for their husbands to become drunk and ready to start home. A tobacco shop called The Smokehouse, filled with young men shaking dice for cigarettes, racks of magazines and pictures of coy, fat prostitutes in striped bathing suits. A clothing store with a display of oxblood shade Oxfords with bulldog toes, suits which looked worn and glossless while they were still new, flabbily draped on dummies like corpses with painted cheeks. The Bonton store, Haydock and Simons, the largest shop in town, the first story front of clear glass, the plates cleverly bound at the edges with brass, the second story of pleasant tapestry brick, one window of excellent clothes for men interspersed with collars of floral peak which showed mob daisies on a saffron ground, newness and an obvious notion of neatness and service. Haydock and Simons. Haydock. She had met a Haydock at the station, Harry Haydock, an active person of thirty-five. He seemed great to her now and very like a saint. His shop was clean. Axel Egg's general store, frequented by Scandinavian farmers. In the shallow dark window space, heaps of sleazy sateens, badly woven galatias, canvas shoes designed for women with bulging ankles, steel and red glass buttons upon cards with broken edges, a cottony blanket, a granite ware frying pan reposing on a sun-faded crepe blouse. Sam Clark's hardware store, an air of frankly metallic enterprise, guns and churns and barrels of nails and beautiful shiny butcher knives. Chester Dashaway's house furnishing emporium, a vista of heavy oak rockers with leather seats, asleep in a dismal row. Billy's lunch, thick handleless cups on the wet oilcloth covered counter, an odor of onions and the smoke of hot lard, in the doorway a young man audibly sucking a toothpick. The warehouse of the buyer of cream and potatoes, the sour smell of a dairy. The Ford garage and the Buick garage, competent one-story brick and cement buildings opposite each other. Old and new cars on grease-blackened concrete floors. Tire advertisements. The roaring of a tested motor, a racket which beat at the nerves. Surly young men in khaki union overalls, the most energetic and vital places in town. A large warehouse for agricultural implements. An impressive barricade of green and gold wheels, of shafts and sulky seats, belonging to machinery of which Carol knew nothing. Potato planters, manure spreaders, silage cutters, disc harrows, breaking plows. 
A feed store, its windows opaque with the dust of bran, a patent medicine advertisement painted on its roof. Ye Art Shop, proprietor, Mrs. Mary Ellen Wilkes, Christian Science Library, open daily, free. A touching fumble at beauty, a one-room shanty of boards recently covered with rough stucco. A show window delicately rich in error. Vases starting out to imitate tree trunks, but running off into blobs of gilt. An aluminum ashtray labeled greetings from Gopher Prairie. A Christian Science magazine, a stamped sofa cushion portraying a large ribbon tied to a small poppy, the correct skeins of embroidery silk lying on the pillow. Inside the shop a glimpse of bad carbon prints of bad and famous pictures, shelves of phonograph records and camera films, wooden toys, and in the midst an anxious small woman sitting in a padded rocking chair. A barber shop and pool room. A man in shirt sleeves, presumably Del Snafflin, the proprietor, shaving a man who had a large Adam's apple. Nat Hicks' tailor shop on a side street off Main, a one-story building, a fashion plate showing human pitchforks in garments which looked as hard as steel plate. On another side street, a raw, red-brick Catholic church with a varnished yellow door. The post office, merely a partition of glass and brass shutting off the rear of a mildewed room which must once have been a shop. A tilted writing shelf against the wall rubbed black and scattered with official notices and army recruiting posters. The damp yellow brick school building in its cindery grounds. The state bank, stucco masking wood. The farmer's national bank, an iconic temple of marble, pure, exquisite solitary. A brass plate with Ezra Stowbody, president. A score of similar shops and establishments. Behind them, and mixed with them, the houses, meek cottages or large, comfortable, soundly uninteresting symbols of prosperity. In all the town not one building, save the iconic bank, which gave pleasure to Carol's eyes, not a dozen buildings which suggested that, in the fifty years of Gopher Prairie's existence, the citizens had realized that it was either desirable or possible to make this, their common home, amusing or attractive. It was not only the unsparing, unapologetic ugliness and the rigid straightness which overwhelmed her. It was the plainlessness, the flimsy temporariness of the buildings, their faded, unpleasant colors. The street was cluttered with electric light poles, telephone poles, gasoline pumps for motor cars, boxes of goods. Each man had built with the most valiant disregard of all the others. Between a large new block of two-story brick shops on one side and the fire-brick overland garage on the other was a one-story cottage turned into a millinery shop. The white temple of the farmer's bank was elbowed back by a grocery of glaring yellow brick. One store building had a patchy galvanized iron cornice. The building beside it was crowned with battlements and pyramids of brick capped with blocks of red sandstone. She escaped from Main Street, fled home. She wouldn't have cared, she insisted, if the people had been comely. She had noted a young man loafing before a shop, one unwashed hand holding the cord of an awning, a middle-aged man who had a way of staring at women as though he had been married too long and too prosaically, an old farmer, solid, wholesome, but not clean, his face like a potato fresh from the earth, None of them had shaved for three days. If they can't build shrines out here on the prairie, surely there's nothing to prevent their buying safety razors, she raged. She fought herself. I must be wrong. People do live here. It can't be as ugly as, as I know it is. I, I must be wrong. But I can't do it. I can't go through with it. She came home too seriously worried for hysteria, and when she found Kennicott waiting for her and exulting, Have a walk? Well, like the town. Great lawns and trees, huh? She was able to say, with a self-protective maturity new to her, It's very interesting. The train which brought Carol to go for Prairie also brought Miss B. Sorensen. Miss B. was a stalwart, corn-colored, laughing young woman, and she was bored by farm work. She desired the excitements of city life, and the way to enjoy city life was, she had decided, to go get a job as a hired girl in Gopher Prairie. She contentedly lugged her pasteboard telescope from the station to her cousin, Tina Malmquist, maid of all work in the residence of Mrs. Luke Dawson. "'Well, so you come to town,' said Tina. "'Yeah, I got a job,' said B. "'Well, you got a fellow now?' "'Yeah, Yem Jacobson. "'Well, I'm glad to see you. "'How much you want a week?' Six dollar. "'There ain't nobody paid that. "'Date.' Dr. Kennicott, I think he married a girl from the cities. Maybe she paid that. Well, uh, you go take a walk. Yeah, said B. So it chanced 
that Carol Kennicott and B. Sorensen were viewing Main Street at the same time. B. had never before been in a town larger than Scandia Crossing, which has 67 inhabitants. As she marched up the street, she was meditating that it didn't seem, hardly, like it was possible that there could be so many folks all in one place at the same time. My, it would take years to get acquainted with them all. And swell people, too. A fine big gentleman in a new pink shirt with a diamond and not no washed-out blue denim working shirt. A lovely lady in a longery dress, but it must be an awful hard dress to wash. And the stores! Not just three of them like there were at Scandia Crossing, but more than four whole blocks. The Bonton store, big as four barns. My! It would simply scare a person to go in there with seven or eight clerks all looking at you. And the men's suits, on figures, just like human. And actual eggs, like home, lots of Swedes and Norks in there. And a card of dandy buttons like rubies. A drugstore with a soda fountain that was just huge, awful long, and all lovely marble. And on it there was a great big lamp with the biggest shade you ever saw. All different kinds of colored glass stuck together. And the soda spouts, they were silver. And they came right out of the bottom of the lampstand. Behind the fountain there were glass shelves and bottles of new kinds of soft drinks that nobody ever heard of. Suppose a fellow took you there. A hotel, awful high, higher than Oscar Tollefson's new red barn, three stories, one right on top of another. You had to stick your head back to look clear up to the top. There was a swell traveling man in there, probably been to Chicago lots of times. Oh, the dandiest people to know here. There was a lady going by. You wouldn't hardly say she was any older than B herself. She wore a dandy new gray suit and black pumps. She looked almost like she was looking over the town, too. But you couldn't tell what she thought. B would like to be that way, kind of quiet, so nobody would get fresh, kind of, oh, elegant. A Lutheran church. Here in the city there'd be lovely sermons and church twice on Sunday, every Sunday. And a movie show. A regular theater, just for movies, with the sign, Change of Bill Every Evening. Pictures every evening. Well, there were movies in Scandia Crossing, but only once every two weeks, and it took the Sorensons an hour to drive in. Uh, Papa was such a tightwad he wouldn't get a Ford. But here she could put on her hat any evening and in three minutes walk to the movies and see lovely fellows in dress suits and Bill Hart and everything. How could they have so many stores? Why, there was one just for tobacco alone and one... A lovely one, the art shoppy it was, for pictures and vases and stuff with old, oh, the dandiest vase made so it looked just like a tree trunk. B stood on the corner of Main Street and Washington Avenue. The roar of the city began to frighten her. There were five automobiles on the street all at the same time, and one of them was a great big car that must have cost two thousand dollars. And the bus was starting for a train with five elegant-dressed fellows, and a man was pasting up red bills with lovely pictures of washing machines on them, and the jeweler was laying out bracelets and wristwatches and everything on real velvet. What did she care if she got six dollars a week, or two? It was worth while working for nothing to be allowed to stay here and think how it would be in the evening, all lighted up, and, and not with no lamps, but with electrics, and maybe a gentleman friend taking you to the movies and buying you a strawberry ice cream soda. B trudged back. Val, you like it? said Tina. Yeah, I like it. I think maybe I stay here, said B. The recently built house of Sam Clark, in which was given the party to welcome Carol, was one of the largest in Gopher Prairie. It had a clean sweep of clapboards, a solid squareness, a small tower, and a large screened porch. Inside, it was as shiny, as hard, and as cheerful as a new oak upright piano. Carol looked imploringly at Sam Clark as he rolled to the door and shouted, Welcome, little lady. The keys of the city are yourn. Beyond him, in the hallway and the living room, sitting in a vast prim circle as though they were attending a funeral, she saw the guests. They were waiting. So... They were waiting for her. The determination to be all one pretty flowerlet of appreciation leaked away. She begged of Sam. Oh, I don't dare face them. They expect so much. They'll swallow me in one mouthful, glump, like that. Why, sister, they're going to love you. Same as I would if I didn't think the dark hair would beat me up. But, oh, I don't dare. Faces to the right of me, faces in front of me, volley in wonder. She sounded hysterical to herself. She fancied that to Sam Clark she sounded insane. But he chuckled. 
Now you just cuddle under Sam's wing, and if anybody rubbers at you too long, I'll show them off. Here we go. Watch my smoke. Samuel, the lady's delight, and the bridegroom's terror. His arm about her, he led her in and bawled, Ladies and worser halves, the bride. We won't introduce her round yet, because she'll never get your bum name straight anyway. Now bust up this star chamber. They tittered politely, but they did not move from the social security of their circle, and they did not cease staring. Carol had given creative energy to dressing for the event. Her hair was demure, low on her forehead, with a parting and a coiled braid. Now she wished that she had powdered high. Her frock was an ingenue slip of lawn, with a wide gold sash and a low square neck, which gave a suggestion of throat and moulded shoulders. But as they looked her over, she was certain that it was all wrong. She wished alternately that she had worn a spinsterish high-necked dress and that she had dared to shock them with a violent brick-red scarf which she had bought in Chicago. She was led about the circle. Her voice mechanically produced safe remarks. Oh, I'm sure I'm going to like it here ever so much. And yes, we did have the best time in Colorado, mountains. And yes, I lived in St. Paul several years. Euclid P. Tinker, no, I don't remember meeting him, but I'm pretty sure I've heard of him. Kennica took her aside and whispered, Now I'll introduce you to them one at a time. Tell me about them first. Well, the nice-looking couple over there are Harry Haydock and his wife Juanita. Harry's dad owns most of the Bon Ton, but it's Harry who runs it and gives it the uh, pep. He's a hustler. Next to him is Dave Dyer, the druggist. You met him this afternoon. Mighty good duck shot. The tall husk beyond him is Jack Elder. Jackson Elder owns the planing mill and the Minimashi house and quite a share in the Farmer's National Bank. Him and his wife are good sports. Him and Sam and I go hunting together a lot. The old cheese there is Luke Dawson, richest man in town. Next to him is Nat Hicks, the tailor. Really? A tailor? Sure. Why not? Maybe we're slow, but we are democratic. I go hunting with Nat, same as I do with Jack Elder. I'm glad. I've never met a tailor socially. It must be charming to meet one and not have to think about what you owe him. And do you... Would you go hunting with your barber, too? No, but well, no use running this democracy thing into the ground. Besides, I've known Nat for years. And besides, he's a mighty good shot, and... Well, that's the way it is, see? Uh, next to Nat is Chet Dashway, great fellow for chinning. He'll talk your arm off about religion or politics or books or anything. Carol gazed with a polite approximation of interest at Mr. Dashway, a tan person with a wide mouth. Oh, I know. He's the furniture store man. She was much pleased with yourself. Ah, uh, yump, and uh, he's the undertaker. You'll like him. Come shake hands with him. Oh, no, no, he, he doesn't... Oh, he doesn't do the embalming and all that himself. Oh, I... I couldn't shake hands with an undertaker. Oh, why not? You'd be proud to shake hands with a great surgeon just after he'd been carving up people's bellies. She sought to regain her afternoon's calm of maturity. Well, yes, you're, you're right. I want... Oh, my dear, do you know how much I want to like the people you like? I want to see people as they are. Well, don't forget to see people as other folks see them as they are. They have the stuff. Did you know that Percy Bresnahan came from here, born and brought up here? Bresnahan? Yes, you know, uh, president of the Velvet Motor Company of Boston, Massachusetts, make the uh, Velvet uh, 12, biggest automobile factory in New England. I think I've heard of him. Well, sure you have. Why, he's a millionaire several times over. Well... Purse comes back here for the black bass fishing almost every summer, and he says if he could get away from business, he'd rather live here than in Boston or New York or any of those places. He doesn't mind Chet's undertaking. Oh, please, I'll, I'll like everybody. I'll be the community sunbeam. He led her to the Dawsons. Luke Dawson, lender of money on mortgages, owner of northern cutover land, was a hesitant man in unpressed, soft, gray clothes with bulging eyes and a milky face. His wife had bleached cheeks, bleached hair, bleached voice, and a bleached manner. She wore her expensive green frock with its passementary bosom, bead tassels, and gaps between the buttons down the back, as though she had bought it second-hand and was afraid of meeting the former owner. They were shy. It was Professor George Edwin Mott, superintendent of schools, a Chinese Mandarin turned brown, who held Carol's hand and made her welcome. When the Dawsons and Mr. Mott had stated that they were pleased to meet her, there seemed to be nothing else to say, but the conversation went on automatically. "'Do you like Gopher Prairie?' whimpered Mrs. Dawson. "'Oh, I'm sure I'm going to be ever so happy. "'There's so many nice people.' Mrs. Dawson looked to Mr. Mott, 
for social and intellectual aid. He lectured. There's a fine class of people. I don't like some of these retired farmers who come here to spend the last days, especially the Germans. They hate to pay school taxes. They hate to spend a cent. But the rest are a fine class of people. Did you know that Percy Bresnahan came from here? Used to go to school right at the old building? I heard he did. Yes, he's a prince. He and I went fishing together last time he was here. The Dawsons and Mr. Mott teetered upon weary feet and smiled at Carol with crystallized expressions. She went on. Tell me, Mr. Mott, have you ever tried any experiments with any of the new educational systems, the modern kindergarten methods or the Gary system? Oh, those. Most of these would-be reformers are simply notoriety seekers. I believe in manual training, but Latin and mathematics always will be the backbone of sound Americanism, no matter what these faddists advocate, heaven knows what they do want, knitting, I suppose, and classes in wiggling the ears. The Dawsons smiled their appreciation of listening to a savant. Carol waited till Kennicott should rescue her. The rest of the party waited for the miracle of being amused. Harry and Juanita Haydock, Rita Simons and Dr. Terry Gould, the young, smart set of Gopher Prairie. She was led to them. Juanita Haydock flung at her in a high, cackling, friendly voice. Well, this is so nice to have you here. We'll have some good parties, dances and everything. You'll have to join the Jolly Seventeen. We play bridge and we have a supper once a month. You play, of course. No, I, I don't. Really? In St. Paul? Oh, I've always been such a bookworm. Where well, we'll have to teach you. Bridge is half the fun of life. Juanita had become patronizing, and she glanced disrespectfully at Carol's golden sash, which she had previously admired. Harry Haydock said politely, How do you think you're going to like the old burg? Oh, I'm sure I shall like it tremendously. Best people on earth here. Great hustlers, too. Of course, I've had lots of chances to go live in Minneapolis, but we like it here. Real he-town. Did you know that Percy Bresnahan came from here? Carol perceived that she had been weakened in the biological struggle by disclosing her lack of bridge. Roused to nervous desire to regain her position, she turned on Dr. Terry Gould, the young and pool-playing competitor of her husband. Her eyes coquetted with him while she gushed. I'll learn bridge, but what I really love most is the outdoors. Can't we all get up a boating party and fish or whatever you do and have a picnic supper afterwards? Now you're talking, Dr. Gould affirmed. He looked rather too obviously at the cream, smooth slope of her shoulder. Like fishing? Fishing is my middle name. I'll teach you bridge. Like cards at all? I used to be rather good at bezique. She knew that bezique was a game of cards or a game of something else, roulette possibly, but her lie was a triumph. Juanita's handsome, high-colored, horsey face showed doubt. Harry stroked his nose and said humbly, Bezique? It used to be a great gambling game, wasn't it? While others drifted to her group, Carol snatched up the conversation. She laughed and was frivolous and rather brittle. She could not distinguish their eyes. They were a blurry theater audience before which she self-consciously enacted the comedy of being the clever little bride of Doc Kennicott. These here celebrated open spaces, that's what I'm going out for. I'll never read anything but the sporting page again. Will converted me on our Colorado trip. There were so many mousy tourists who were afraid to get out of the motor bus that I decided to be Annie Oakley, the wild western vampire, and I bought, oh, a vociferous skirt which revealed my perfectly nice ankles to the Presbyterian glare of all the lowy school ma'ams, and I leaped from peak to peak like the nimble chamois and... You may think that Herr Dr. Kennicott is a nimrod, but you ought to have seen me daring him to strip to his BVDs and go swimming in an icy mountain brook. She knew that they were thinking of becoming shocked, but Juanita Haydock was admiring at least. She swaggered on. I'm sure I'm going to ruin Will as a respectable practitioner. Is he a good doctor, Dr. Gould? Kennicott's rival gasped at this insult to professional ethics, and he took an appreciable second before he recovered his social manner. "'I'll tell you, Mrs. Kennicott,' he smiled at Kennicott, to imply that whatever he might say in the stress of being witty was not to count against him in the commercial medical warfare. "'There's some people in town that say the doc is a fair to middle diagnostician and prescription writer, but let me whisper this to you, but for heaven's sake, don't tell him I said so. Don't you ever go to him for anything more serious than a pendectomy of the left ear or a strabismus of the cardiograph?' No one, save Kennicott, knew exactly what this meant, but they laughed and Sam Clark's party assumed a glittering lemon-yellow color of brocade panels and champagne and tulle and crystal chandeliers and sporting duchesses. 
Carol saw that George Edwin Mott and the blanched Mr. and Mrs. Dawson were not yet hypnotized. They looked as though they wondered whether they ought to look as though they disapproved. She concentrated on them. But I know whom I wouldn't have dared to go to Colorado with. Mr. Dawson there. I'm sure he's a regular heartbreaker. When we were introduced, he held my hand and squeezed it frightfully. Ha, ha, ha! The entire company applauded. Mr. Dawson was beatified. He had been called many things, loan shark, skin flint, tightwad, pussyfoot, but he had never before been called a flirt. He is wicked, isn't he, Mrs. Dawson? Don't you have to lock him up? Oh, no, but maybe I'd better, attempted Mrs. Dawson, a tint on her pallid face. For fifteen minutes Carol kept it up. She asserted that she was going to stage a musical comedy, that she preferred café parfait to beefsteak, that she hoped Dr. Kennicott would never lose his ability to make love to charming women, and that she had a pair of gold stockings. They gaped for more, but she could not keep it up. She retired to a chair behind Sam Clark's bulk. The smile wrinkles solemnly flattened out in the faces of all the other collaborators in having a party, and again they stood about hoping but not expecting to be amused. Carol listened. She discovered that conversation did not exist in Gopher Prairie. Even at this affair, which brought out the young smart set, the hunting squire set, the respectable intellectual set, and the solid financial set, they sat up with gaiety as with a corpse. Juanita Haydock talked a good deal in her rattling voice, but it was invariably of personalities, the rumor that Ramey Wotherspoon was going to send for a pair of patent other shoes with grey button tops, the rheumatism of Champ Perry, the state of Guy Pollock's grip, and the dementia of Jim Howland in painting his face salmon pink. Sam Clark had been talking to Carol about motor cars, but he felt his duties as host. While he droned, his brows popped up and down. He interrupted himself. Must stir him up. He worried at his wife. Don't you think I had better stir him up? He shouldered into the center of the room and cried, Let's have some stunts, folks. Yes, let's, shrieked Juanita Haydock. Say, Dave, give us that stunt about the Norwegian catching a hen. You bet, that's a slick stunt. Do that, Dave, cheered Chet Dashaway. Mr. Dave Dyer obliged. All the guests moved their lips in anticipation of being called on for their own stunts. Ella, come on and recite Old Sweetheart of Mine for us, demanded Sam. Miss Ella Stowbody, the spinster daughter of the iconic bank, scratched her dry palms and blushed. Oh, you don't want to hear that old thing again? Sure we do, you bet, asserted Sam. My voice is in terrible shape tonight. Tot, come on. Sam loudly explained to Carol, Ella is our shark at elocuting. She's had professional training. She studied singing in oratory and dramatic art and shorthand for a year in Milwaukee. Miss Stowbody was reciting. As encore to an old sweetheart of mine, she gave a peculiarly optimistic poem regarding the value of smiles. There were four other stunts, one Jewish, one Irish, one juvenile, and Nat Hicks' parody of Mark Antony's funeral oration. During the winter... Carol was to hear Dave Dyer's hen-catching impersonation seven times, an old sweetheart of mine nine times, the Jewish story, and the funeral oration twice. But now she was ardent, and because she did so want to be happy and simple-hearted, she was as disappointed as the others when the stunts were finished, and the party instantly sank back into coma. They gave up trying to be festive. They began to talk naturally, as they did at their shops and homes. The men and women divided, as they had been tending to do all evening. Carol was deserted by the men, left to a group of matrons who steadily pattered of children, sickness, and cooks, their own shop talk. She was piqued. She remembered visions of herself as a smart married woman in a drawing room, fencing with clever men. Her dejection was relieved by speculation as to what the men were discussing in the corner between the piano and the phonograph. Did they rise from these housewifely personalities to a larger world of abstractions and affairs? She made her best curtsy to Mrs. Dawson. She twittered, I won't have my husband leaving me so soon. I'm going over and pull the wretch's ears. She rose with a jean bow. She was self-absorbed and self-approving because she had attained that quality of sentimentality. She proudly dipped across the room and, to the interest and commendation of all beholders, sat on the arm of Kennicott's chair. He was gossiping with Sam Clark, Luke Dawson, Jackson Elder, of the planing mill, Chat Dashaway, Dave Dyer, Harry Haydock, and Ezra Stowbody, president of the Ionic Bank. Ezra Stowbody was a troglodyte. He had come to Gopher Prairie in 1865. He was a distinguished bird of prey, swooping thin nose, turtle mouth, thick brows, port wine cheeks, 
floss of white hair, contemptuous eyes. He was not happy in the social changes of thirty years. Three decades ago, Dr. Westlake, Julius Flickerbaugh, the lawyer, Madam and Petey, the congregational pastor, and himself had been the arbiters. That was as it should be. The fine arts, medicine, law, religion, and finance, recognized as aristocratic. Four Yankees democratically chatting with, but ruling the Ohioans and Illinois and Swedes and Germans who had ventured to follow them. But Westlake was old, almost retired. Julius Flickerbaugh had lost much of his practice to livelier attorneys. Reverend, not the Reverend, Petey was dead, and nobody was impressed in this rotten age of automobiles by the spanking graves which Ezra still drove. The town was as heterogeneous as Chicago. Norwegians and Germans owned stores. The social leaders were common merchants. Selling nails was considered as sacred as banking. These upstarts, the Clarks, the Haydocks, had no dignity. They were sound and conservative in politics, but they talked about motor cars and pump guns and heaven only knew what newfangled fads. Mr. Stowbody felt out of place with them, but his brick house with the mansard roof was still the largest residence in town, and he held his position as squire by occasionally appearing among the younger men and reminding them by a wintry eye that without the banker none of them could carry on their vulgar businesses. As Carol defied decency by sitting down with the men, Mr. Stowbody was piping to Mr. Dawson. Uh, "'Say, Luke, uh, when wasn't Biggins first settled in Winnebago Township? Uh, wasn't it in uh, 1879?' "'Why, no, twant,' Mr. Dawson was indignant. "'He come out from Vermont in 1867. Uh, uh, wait, uh, in 1868 must have been, and took a claim on the Rum River, quite a ways above Anoka.' "'He did not,' roared Mr. Stowbody. "'He settled first in Blue Earth County, him and his father.' "'What's the point at issue?' Carol whispered to Kennicott. "'Whether this old duck Biggins had an English setter or a Llewellyn, "'they've been arguing it all evening.' "'Dave Dyer interrupted to give tidings. "'Did I tell you that uh, Clara Biggins was in town a couple days ago? "'She bought a hot water bottle, expensive one, too, two dollars and thirty cents.' "'Ah!' snarled Mr. Stowbody. "'Course. She's just like her granddad was. Never save a cent. Two dollars and... Twenty, thirty, was it? Two dollars and thirty cents for a hot water bottle? Brick, wrapped up in a flannel petticoat, just as good anyway. How's Ellis tonsils, Mr. Stowbody? yawned Chet Dashaway. While Mr. Stowbody gave a somatic and psychic study of them, Carol reflected. Are they really so terribly interested in Ellis tonsils, or even in Ellis esophagus? I wonder if I could get them away from personalities. Let's risk damnation and try. "'There hasn't been much labor trouble around here, has there, Mr. Stowbody?' she asked innocently. "'No, ma'am. Thank God we've been free from that, except maybe with hired girls and farmhands, double enough with these foreign farmers. If you don't watch these Swedes, they turn socialist or populist or some fool thing on you in a minute. Of course, if they have loans, you can make them listen to reason. I just have them come into the bank for a talk and tell them a few things. I don't mind their being Democrats so much, but I won't stand having socialists around.' But thank God we ain't got the labor trouble they have in these cities. Even Jack Elder here gets along pretty well in the planing mill, don't you, Jack? Yep, sure. Don't need so many skilled workmen in my place, and it's a lot of these cranky, wage-hogging, half-baked skilled mechanics that sort of trouble, reading a lot of this anarchist literature and union papers and all. Do you approve of union labor? Carol inquired of Mr. Elder. Me? I should say not. It's like this. I don't mind dealing with my men if they think they've got any grievances, though Lord knows what's come over workmen nowadays don't appreciate a good job. But still, if they come to me honestly as man to man, I'll talk things over with them. But I'm not going to have any outsider, any of these walking delegates or whatever fancy names they call themselves now, bunch of rich grafters living on the ignorant workmen. Not going to have any of those fellows busting in and telling me how to run my business. Mr. Elder was growing more excited more belligerent and patriotic. I stand for freedom and constitutional rights. If any man don't like my shop, he can get up and get. Same way if I don't like him, he gets, and that's all there is to it. I simply can't understand all these complications and hoop to toodles and government reports and wage scales and God knows what, all that these fellows are balling up the labor situation with when it's all perfectly simple. They like what I pay them or they get out. That's all there is to it. "'What do you think of profit-sharing?' Carol ventured. 
Mr. Elder thundered his answer while the others nodded solemnly and in tune, like a shop window of flexible toys, comic mandarins and judges and ducks and clowns set quivering by a breeze from the open door. All this profit-sharing and welfare work and insurance and old-age pension is simply poppycock, enfeebles a workman's independence, wastes a lot of honest profit. The half-baked thinker that isn't dry behind the ears yet, and all these suffragettes and God knows what all Budinskys they are that are trying to tell a businessman how to run his business, and some of these college professors are just about as bad. The whole kit and billing of them are nothing in God's world but socialism in disguise. And it's my bounden duty as a producer to resist every attack on the integrity of American industry to the last ditch. Yes, sir. Mr. Elder wiped his brow. Dave Dyer added, Sure, you bet. What they ought to do is simply to hang every one of these agitators, and that would settle the whole thing right off. Don't you think so, Doc? You bet, agreed Kennicott. The conversation was at last relieved of the plague of Carol's intrusions, and they settled down to the question of whether the Justice of the Peace had sent that hobo drunk to jail for ten days or twelve. It was a matter not readily determined. Then Dave Dyer communicated his carefree adventures on the gypsy trail. Yep, I got good time out of the flipper. About a week ago, I motored down to New Württemberg. Uh, that's 43... No, uh, let's see. It's 17 miles to Belldale, and about six and three quarters, call it seven, to Torgenquist. And it's a good 19 miles from there to New Württemberg. 17 and seven and 19, that makes... Um, let me see, 17 and seven is 24, plus 19. Well, say plus 20, that makes 44... Well, anyway, say about 43 or 4 miles from here to New Württemberg. We got started about 7.15, probably 7.20, because I had to stop and fill the radiator, and we ran along, just keeping up a good steady gait. Mr. Dyer did finally, for reasons and purposes admitted and justified, attain to New Württemberg. Once, only once, the presence of the alien Carol was recognized. Chet Dashaway leaned over and said asthmatically, Say, um... Have you been reading this serial, Two Out in Tingling Tales? Cork and yarn. Gosh, the fellow that wrote it certainly can sling baseball slang. The others tried to look literary. Harry Haydock offered, Juanita is a great hand for reading high-class stuff like Mid the Magnolias by this uh, Sarah Hetwig and Butts and Riders of Ranch Reckless books, but uh, me, he glanced about importantly, as one convinced that no other hero had ever been in so strange a plight, I'm so darn busy I don't have much time to read. I never read anything I can't check against, said Sam Clark. Thus ended the literary portion of the conversation, and for seven minutes Jackson Elder outlined reasons for believing that the pike fishing was better on the west shore of Lake Minimashi than on the east, though it was indeed quite true that on the east shore Nat Hicks had caught a pike altogether admirable. The talk went on. It did go on. Their voices were monotonous, thick, emphatic. They were harshly pompous, like men in the smoking compartments of Pullman cars, they did not bore Carol. They frightened her. She panted. They will be cordial to me because my man belongs to their tribe. God help me if I were an outsider. Smiling as changelessly as an ivory figurine, she sat quiescent, avoiding thought, glancing about the living room and hall, noting their betrayal of unimaginative commercial prosperity. Kennicott said, Dandy interior, huh? My idea of how a place ought to be furnished. Modern. She looked polite and observed the oiled floors, hardwood staircase, unused fireplace with tiles which resembled brown linoleum, cut glass vases standing upon doilies, and the barred, shut, forbidding unit bookcases that were half filled with swashbuckler novels and unread looking sets of Dickens, Kipling, O. Henry, and Albert Hubbard. She perceived that even personalities were failing to hold the party. The room filled with hesitancy as with a fog. People cleared their throats tried to choke down yawns. The men shot their cuffs, and the women stuck their combs more firmly into their black hair. Then a rattle, a daring hope in every eye, the swinging of a door, the smell of strong coffee, Dave Dyer's mewing voice in a triumphant, They eats! They began to chatter. They had something to do they could escape from themselves. They fell upon the food, chicken sandwiches, maple cake, drugstore ice cream. Even when the food was gone, they remained cheerful. They could go home any time now and go to bed. They went with a flutter of coats, chiffon scarves, and goodbyes. Carol and Kennicott walked home. "'Did you like them?' he asked. "'They were terribly sweet to me.' "'Uh, Carrie, 
You ought to be more careful about shocking folks, talking about gold stockings and about showing your ankles to school teachers and all. More mildly, you gave him a good time, but I'd watch out for that if I were you. Juanita Haydock is such a damn cat, I wouldn't give her a chance to criticize me. My poor effort to lift up the party. Was I wrong to try to amuse them? Oh, no, no, honey, I didn't mean... Well, you were the only up-and-coming person in the bunch. I just mean, well, uh, don't get on to legs and all that immoral stuff. Pretty conservative crowd. She was silent, raw with the shameful thought that the attentive circle might have been criticizing her, laughing at her. Oh, don't, uh, please don't worry, he pleaded. Silence. Gosh, I'm sorry I spoke about it. I just meant... But they were crazy about you. Sam said to me, That little lady of yours is the slickest thing that ever came to this town, he said. And Ma Dawson, I, I didn't hardly know whether she'd like you or not. She's such a dried-up old bird. But she said, Your bride is so quick and bright, I, I declare, she just wakes me up. Carol liked praise, the flavor and fatness of it. But she was so energetically being sorry for herself that she could not taste this commendation. Please, come on, cheer up. His lips said it, his anxious shoulder said it, his arm about her said it, as they halted on the obscure porch of their house. "'Do you care if they think I'm flighty, Will?' "'Me? <laughs> well, I wouldn't care if the whole world thought you were this or that or anything else. You're my—well, you're my soul.' He was an undefined mass, as solid-seeming as rock. She found his sleeve, pinched it, cried, "'I'm glad. It's sweet to be wanted.' You must tolerate my frivolousness. You're all I have. He lifted her, carried her into the house, and with her arms about his neck, she forgot Main Street. The end of chapter four. Chapter five. We'll steal the whole day and go hunting. I want you to see the country round here, Kennicott announced at breakfast. I take the car. Want you to see how swell she runs since I put in a new piston. "'but we'll take a team so we can get right out into the fields. "'Not many prairie chickens left now, "'but we might just happen to run into a small covey.' "'He fussed over his hunting kit. "'He pulled his hip boots out to full length "'and examined them for holes. "'He feverishly counted his shotgun shells, "'lecturing her on the qualities of smokeless powder. "'He drew the new hammerless shotgun "'out of its heavy tan leather case "'and made her peep through the barrels "'to see how dazzlingly free they were from rust.' The world of hunting and camping outfits and fishing tackle was unfamiliar to her, and in Kennicott's interest she found something creative and joyous. She examined the smooth stock, the carved hard rubber butt of the gun. The shells, with their brass caps and sleek green bodies and hieroglyphics on the wads, were cool and comfortably heavy in her hands. Kennicott wore a brown canvas hunting coat with vast pockets lining the inside, corduroy trousers which bulged at the wrinkles, peeled and scarred shoes, a scarecrow felt hat. In this uniform he felt virile. They clumped out to the livery buggy. They packed the kit and the box of lunch into the back, crying to each other that it was a magnificent day. Kennicott had borrowed Jackson Elder's red and white English setter, a complacent dog with a waving tail of silver hair which flickered in the sunshine. As they started, the dog yelped and leaped at the horse's heads till Kennicott took him into the buggy, where he nuzzled Carol's knees and leaned out to sneer at farm mongrels. The greys clattered out on the hard dirt road with a pleasant song of hoofs. ta 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 rat ta 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 rat It was early and fresh, the air whistling, frost bright on the goldenrod. As the sun warmed the world of stubble into a welter of yellow, they turned from the high road, through the bars of a farmer's gate, into a field, slowly bumping over the uneven earth. In a hollow of the rolling prairie they lost sight even of the country road. It was warm and placid. Locusts trilled among the dry wheat stalks, and brilliant little flies hurtled across the buggy. A buzz of content filled the air. Crows loitered and gossiped in the sky. The dog had been let out, and after a dance of excitement he settled down to a steady quartering of the field, forth and back, forth and back, his nose down. Pete Rustad owns this farm, and he told me he saw a small covey of chickens in the West Forty last week. Maybe we'll get some sport after all, Kennicott chuckled blissfully. She watched the dog in suspense, breathing quickly every time he seemed to halt. She had no desire to slaughter birds, but she did desire to belong to Kennicott's world. The dog stopped, on the point, a forepaw held up. By golly, he's hit a scent, come on, squealed Kennicott. He leaped from the buggy, twisted the reins about the whip socket, 
swung her out, caught up his gun, slipped in two shells, stalked toward the rigid dog, Carol pattering after him. The setter crawled ahead, his tail quivering, his belly close to the stubble. Carol was nervous. She expected clouds of large birds to fly up instantly. Her eyes were strained with staring, but they followed the dog for a quarter of a mile, turning, doubling, crossing two low hills, kicking through a swale of weeds, crawling between the strands of a barbed wire fence. The walking was hard on her pavement-trained feet. The earth was lumpy, the stubble prickly and lined with grass thistles, a board of stumps of clover. She dragged and floundered. She heard Kennicott gasp. Look! Three gray birds were starting up from the stubble. They were round, dumpy, like enormous bumblebees. Kennicott was sighting, moving the barrel. She was agitated. Why didn't he fire? The birds would be gone. Then a crash, another, and two birds turned somersaults in the air, plumped down. When he showed her the birds, she had no sensation of blood. These heaps of feathers were so soft and unbruised, there was about them no hint of death. She watched her conquering man tuck them into his inside pocket and trudged with him back to the buggy. They found no more prairie chickens that morning. At noon, they drove into her first farmyard, a private village, a white house with no porches save a low and quite dirty stoop at the back, a crimson barn with white trimmings, a glazed brick silo, an ex-carriage shed, now the garage of a Ford, an unpainted cow stable, a chicken house, a pig pen, a corn crib, a granary, the galvanized iron skeleton tower of a windmill. The dooryard was of packed yellow clay, treeless, barren of grass, littered with rusty plowshares and wheels of discarded cultivators. Hardened, trampled mud like lava filled the pig pen. The doors of the house were grime-rubbed, the corners and eaves were rusted with rain, and the child who stared at them from the kitchen window was smeary-faced. But beyond the barn was a clump of scarlet geraniums. The prairie breeze was sunshine in motion. The flashing metal blades of the windmill revolved with a lively hum. A horse neighed. A rooster crowed. Martins flew in and out of the cow stable. A small spare woman with flaxen hair trotted from the house. She was twanging a Swedish patois, not in monotone like English, but singing it with a lyrical whine. Pete, he say you come pretty soon hunting, doctor. My dot's fine you come. Is this the bride? Oh, <laughs> we used say last night we hope maybe we see her some day. My, such a pretty lady. Mrs. Rustad was shining with welcome. Well, well, I hope you like this country. Won't you stay for dinner, doctor? No, but I wonder if you wouldn't like to give us a glass of milk condescended Kennicott. Well, I should say I will. You wait here a second, and I run on to the milk house. She nervously hastened to a tiny red building beside the windmill. She came back with a pitcher of milk from which Carol filled the thermos bottle. As they drove off, Carol admired. She's the dearest thing I ever saw, and she adores you. You are the lord of the manor. Oh, no, much pleased. But they still do ask my advice about things. Bully people, these Scandinavian farmers, and prosperous, too. Helga Rustad, she's still scared of America, but her kids will be doctors and lawyers and governors of the state and any darn thing they want to. I wonder, Carol was plunged back into last night's Welchmerds, I wonder if these farmers aren't bigger than we are, so simple and hard-working. The town lives on them. We townies are parasites, and yet we feel superior to them. Last night I heard Mr. Haydock talking about hicks. Apparently he despises the farmers because they haven't reached the social heights of selling thread and buttons. Parasites? Us? Ha! Huh. Where'd the farmers be without the town? Who lends them money? Who? Why, we supply them with everything. Don't you find that some of the farmers think they pay too much for the services of the towns? Oh, of course. There's a lot of cranks among the farmers, same as there are among any class. Listen to some of these kickers. A fellow think that the farmers ought to run the state and the whole shooting match. Probably, if they had their way, they'd fill up the legislature with a lot of farmers in manure-covered boots, yes. And they'd come tell me I was hired on a salary now and couldn't fix my fees. That'd be fine for you, wouldn't it? But why shouldn't they? Why? That bunch of... telling me? I... Oh, for heaven's sake, let's quit arguing. All this discussing may be all right at a party, but let's forget it while we're hunting. I know. The wanderlust. Probably it's a worse affliction than wanderlust. I just wonder. She told herself that she had everything in the world, and after each self-rebuke she stumbled again on, I just wonder. 
They ate their sandwiches by a prairie slough, long grass reaching up out of clear water, mossy bogs, red-winged blackbirds, the scum a splash of gold green. Kennicott smoked a pipe while she leaned back in the buggy and let her tired spirit be absorbed in the nirvana of the incomparable sky. They lurched to the high road and awoke from their sun-soaked drowse at the sound of the clopping hoofs. They paused to look for partridges in a rim of woods, little woods, very clean and shiny and gay, silver birches and poplars with immaculate green trunks encircling a lake of sandy bottom, a splashing seclusion demure in the welter of hot prairie. Kennicott brought down a fat red squirrel, and at dusk he had a dramatic shot at a flight of ducks, whirling down from the upper air, skimming the lake, instantly vanishing. They drove home under the sunset. Mounds of straw and wheat stacks like beehives stood out in startling rose and gold, and the green tufted stubble glistened. As the vast girdle of crimson darkened, the fulfilled land became autumnal in deep reds and browns. The black road before the buggy turned to a faint lavender then was blotted to uncertain grayness. Cattle came in a long line up to the barred gates of the farmyards, and over the resting land was a dark glow. Carol had found the dignity and greatness which had failed her in Main Street. Till they had a maid, they took noon dinner and six o'clock supper at Mrs. Gurry's boarding house. Mrs. Elisha Gurry, relict of Deacon Gurry, the dealer in hay and gray, was a pointed-nosed, simpering woman with iron-gray hair drawn so tight that it resembled a soiled handkerchief covering her head. But she was unexpectedly cheerful, and her dining-room, with its thin tablecloth on a long pine table, had the decency of clean bareness. In the line of unsmiling, methodically chewing guests, like horses at a manger, Carol came to distinguish one countenance, the pale, long, spectacled face, and sandy pompadour hair of Mr. Raymond P. Wotherspoon, known as Ramy, professional bachelor, manager, and one-half the sales force in the shoe department of the Bon Ton store. "'You'll enjoy Gopher Prairie very much, Mrs. Kennicott,' petitioned Ramy. His eyes were like those of a dog waiting to be let in out of the cold. He passed the stewed apricots effusively. "'There are a great many bright, cultured people here.' Mrs. Wilkes, the Christian science reader, is a very bright woman, though I am not a scientist myself. In fact, I sing in the Episcopal choir. And Miss Sherwin of the high school, she is such a pleasing bright girl. I was fitting her to a pair of tan gaiters yesterday. I declare it really was a pleasure. Give me the butter, Carrie, was Kennicott's comment. She defied him by encouraging Ramy. Do you have amateur dramatics and so on here? Oh, yes, the, the town's just full of talent. Uh, the Knights of Pythias put on a dandy minstrel show last year. It's nice you're so enthusiastic. Oh, do you really think so? Lots of folks jolly me for trying to get up shows and so on. I tell them they have more artistic gifts than they know. Why, just yesterday I was saying to Harry Haydock, if he would read poetry, like Longfellow, or if he would join the band, I get so much pleasure out of playing the cornet, and our band leader, Del Snafflin, is such a good musician... I often say he ought to give up his barbering and become a professional musician. He could play the clarinet in Minneapolis or New York or anywhere, but but I couldn't get Harry to see it at all, and... I hear you and the doctor went out hunting yesterday. Lovely country, isn't it? And did you make some calls? The mercantile life isn't inspiring like medicine. It must be wonderful to see how patients trust you, doctor. Ha! Ah, it's me that's got to do all the trusting. Be damn sight more wonderful if they'd pay their bills grumbled Kennicott, and, to Carol, he whispered something which sounded like, "'Gentleman Hen!' But Ramy's pale eyes were watering at her. She helped him with, "'So you like to read poetry?' "'Oh, yes, so much, though, to tell the truth, I don't get much time for reading. We're always so busy at the store, and—' "'But we had the dandiest professional reciter at the Pythian Sisters' sociable last winter.' Carol thought she heard a grunt from the traveling salesman at the end of the table, and Kennicott's jerking elbow was a grunt embodied. She persisted. "'Do you get to see many plays, Mr. Wotherspoon?' He shone at her like a dim blue March moon and sighed, "'No, but I do love the movies. I'm a real fan. One trouble with books is that they're not so thoroughly safeguarded by intelligent censors as the movies are, and when you drop into the library and take out a book, you never know what you're wasting your time on.' What I like in books is a wholesome, really improving story, and sometimes, why, once I started a novel by this fellow Balzac that you read about, and it told how a lady wasn't living with her husband. I mean, she wasn't his wife. 
It went into details, disgustingly, and the English was real poor. I spoke to the library about it, and they took it off the shelves. I'm not narrow, but I must say I don't see any use in this deliberately dragging in immorality. Life itself is so full of temptation that in literature one wants only that which is pure and uplifting. What's the name of that Balzac yard? Where can I get a hold of it? giggled the traveling salesman. Ramey ignored him. But the movies, they are mostly clean, and their humor... Uh, don't you think that the most essential quality for a person is to have a sense of humor? I don't know. I really haven't much, said Carol. He shook his finger at her. Now, now, you're too modest. I'm sure we can all see that you have a perfectly corking sense of humor. Besides, Dr. Kennicott wouldn't marry a lady that didn't have. We all know how he loves his fun. You bet. I'm a jokey old bird. Come on, Carrie, let's beat it, remarked Kennicott. Ramey implored. And what is your chief artistic interest, Mrs. Kennicott? Oh, aware that the traveling salesman had murmured dentistry, she desperately hazarded architecture. That's a real nice art. I've always said, when Haydock and Simons were finishing the new front on the Bonton building, the old man came to me, you know, Harry's father, D.H., I always call him, and he asked me how I liked it, and I said to him, um, look here, D.H., I said. You see, he, he was going to leave the front plane, and I said to him, It's all very well to have modern lighting in a big display space, I said, but when you get that in, you want to have some architecture, too, I said. And he laughed, and said he guessed maybe I was right, and so he had him put on a cornice. Ten, observed the traveling salesman. Ramey bared his teeth like a belligerent mouse. Well, what if it is tin? That's not my fault. I told D.H. to make it polished granite. You make me tired. Leave us go. Come on, Carrie. Leave us go. From Kennicott. Ramey waylaid them in the hall and secretly informed Carol that she mustn't mind the traveling salesman's coarseness. He belonged to the Huapolwa. Kennicott chuckled. Well, child, how about it? Do you prefer an artistic guy like Ramey to stupid boobs like Sam Clark and me? My dear, let's go home and play pinochle and laugh and be foolish and slip up to bed and sleep without dreaming. It's beautiful to be just a solid citizeness. From the Gopher Prairie, Weekly Dauntless. One of the most charming affairs of the season was held Tuesday evening at the handsome new residence of Sam and Mrs. Clark, when many of our most prominent citizens gathered to greet the lovely new bride of our popular local physician, Dr. Will Kennicott. All present spoke of the many charms of the bride, formerly Miss Carol Milford of St. Paul. Games and stunts were the order of the day, with merry talk and conversation. At a late hour, dainty refreshments were served, and the party broke up with many expressions of pleasure at the pleasant affair. Among those present were Mesdames Kennicott, Elder, Dr. Will Kennicott, for the past several years, one of our most popular and skillful physicians and surgeons, gave the town a delightful surprise when he returned from an extended honeymoon tour in Colorado this week with his charming bride, Nee, Miss Carol Milford of St. Paul, whose family are socially prominent in Minneapolis and Mankato. Mrs. Kennicott is a lady of manifold charms, not only of striking charm of appearance, but is also a distinguished graduate of a school in the East, and has for the past year been prominently connected in an important position of responsibility with the St. Paul Public Library, in which city Dr. Will had the good fortune to meet her. The city of Gopher Prairie welcomes her to our midst and prophecies for her many happy years in the energetic city of the Twin Lakes in the future. The doctor and Mrs. Kennicott will reside for the present at the doctor's home on Poplar Street, which his charming mother has been keeping for him, who has now returned to her own home at Lac Quimer, leaving a host of friends who regret her absence and hope to see her soon with us again. She knew that if she was ever to effect any of the reforms which she had pictured, she must have a starting place. What confused her during the three or four months after her marriage was not lack of perception that she must be definite, the cheer, careless happiness of her first home. In the pride of being a housewife, she loved every detail, the brocade armchair with the weak back, even the brass watercock on the hot water reservoir, when she had become familiar with it by trying to scour it to brilliance. She found a maid, plump, radiant B. Sorensen from Scandia Crossing. B. was droll in her attempt to be at once a respectful servant and a bosom friend. They laughed together over the fact that the stove did not draw over the slipperiness of fish in the pan. Like a child playing grandma in a trailing skirt, Carol paraded uptown for her marketing, crying greetings to housewives along the way. 
Everybody bowed to her, strangers and all, and made her feel that they wanted her, that she belonged here. In city shops she was merely a customer, a hat, a voice to board a harassed clerk. Here she was Mrs. Doc Kennicott, and her preferences in grapefruit and manners were known and remembered and worth discussing, even if they weren't worth fulfilling. Shopping was a delight of brisk conferences. The very merchants, whose droning she found the dullest at the two or three parties which were given to welcome her, were the pleasantest confidence of all when they had something to talk about, lemons or cotton vial or floor oil. With that skipjack Dave Dyer, the druggist, she conducted a long mock quarrel. She pretended that he cheated her in the price of magazines and candy. He pretended that she was a detective from the Twin Cities. He hid behind the prescription counter, and when she stamped her foot he came out wailing, "'Honest, I haven't done nothing crooked today. Not yet.' She never recalled her first impression of Main Street, never had precisely the same despair at its ugliness. By the end of two shopping tours everything had changed proportions. As she never entered it, the mini Mashie house ceased to exist for her. Clark's hardware store, Dyer's drug store, the groceries of Ole Jensen and Frederick Ludelmeyer and Howland and Gould, the meat markets, the notion shop, they expanded and hid all the other structures. When she entered Mr. Ludelmeyer's store, and he wheezed, "'Good morning, Mrs. Kennicott. Well, this is a fine day!' She did not notice the dustiness of the shelves, nor the stupidity of the girl clerk, and she did not remember the mute colloquy with him on her first view of Main Street. She could not find half the kinds of food she wanted, but that made shopping more of an adventure. When she did contrive to get sweetbreads at Dahl and Olison's meat market, the triumph was so vast that she buzzed with excitement and admired the strong, wise butcher, Mr. Dahl. She appreciated the homely ease of village life. She liked the old men, farmers, G.A.R. veterans, who, when they gossiped, sometimes squatted on their heels on the sidewalk like resting Indians and reflectively spat over the curb. She found beauty in the children. She had suspected that her married friends exaggerated their passion for children, but in her work in the library children had become individuals to her, citizens of the state with their own rights and their own senses of humor. In the library she had not had much time to give them, but now she knew the luxury of stopping, gravely asking Bessie Clark whether her doll had yet recovered from its rheumatism, and agreeing with Oscar Martinson that it would be good fun to go trapping mushrats. She touched the thought. It would be sweet to have a baby of my own. I do want one. Tiny, no. Not yet. There's so much to do, and I'm still tired from the job. It's in my bones. She rested at home. She listened to the village noises common to all the world, jungle or prairie. Sounds simple and charged with magic. Dogs barking, chickens making a gurgling sound of content, children at play, a man beating a rug, wind in the cottonwood trees a locust fiddling, a footstep on the walk, jaunty voices of bee and a grocer's boy in the kitchen, a clinking anvil, a piano, not too near. Twice a week at least she drove into the country with Kennicott to hunt ducks in lakes enameled with sunset, or to call on patients who looked up to her as the squire's lady and thanked her for toys and magazines. Evenings she went with her husband to the motion pictures and was boisterously greeted by every other couple, or, till it became too cold, they sat on the porch, bawling to passers-by in motors, or to neighbors who were raking the leaves. The dust became golden in the low sun, the street was filled with the fragrance of burning leaves. But she hazily wanted someone to whom she could say what she thought. On a slow afternoon, when she fidgeted over sewing and wished that the telephone would ring, B announced Miss Vida Sherwin. Despite Vida Sherwin's lively blue eyes, if you had looked at her in detail, you would have found her face slightly lined, and not so much sallow as with the bloom rubbed off. You would have found her chest flat, and her fingers rough from needle and chalk and penholder, her blouses and plain cloth skirts undistinguished, and her hat worn too far back, betraying a dry forehead. But you never did look at Vida Sherwin in detail. You couldn't. Her electric activity veiled her. She was as energetic as a chipmunk. Her fingers fluttered. Her sympathy came out in spurts. She sat on the edge of the chair in eagerness to be near her auditor, to send her enthusiasms and optimism across. She rushed into the room, pouring out, I'm afraid you'll think the teachers have been shabby in not coming near you, but we wanted to give you a chance to get settled. I am Vida Sherwin, and I try to teach French and English and a few other things in the high school. I've been hoping to know the teachers. You see, I was a librarian. Oh, you needn't tell me. 
I know all about you. Awful how much I know, this gossipy village. We need you so much here. It's a dear, loyal town, and isn't loyalty the finest thing in the world? But it's a rough diamond, and we need you for the polishing, and we're ever so humble. She stopped for breath, then finished her compliment with a smile. If I could help you in any way— would I be committing the unpardonable sin if I whispered that I think Gopher Prairie is a tiny bit ugly? Of course it's ugly, dreadfully, though I'm probably the only person in town to whom you could safely say that, except perhaps Guy Pollock, the lawyer. Have you met him? Oh, you must. He's simply a darling. Intelligence and culture and so gentle. But I don't care so much about the ugliness. That will change. It's the spirit that gives me hope. It's sound, wholesome, but afraid. It needs live creatures like you to awaken it. I shall slave-drive you. Splendid. What shall I do? I've been wondering if it would be possible to have a good architect come here to lecture. Yes, but don't you think it would be better to work with existing agencies? Perhaps it will sound slow to you, but I was thinking, well, it would be lovely if we could get you to teach Sunday school. Carol had the empty expression of one who finds that she has been affectionately bowing to a complete stranger. Oh, yes, uh, but I'm afraid I wouldn't be much good at that. My religion is so foggy. I know. So is mine. I don't care a bit for dogma, though I do stick firmly to the belief in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and the leadership of Jesus, as you do, of course. Carol looked respectable and thought about having tea. "'And that's all you need teach in Sunday school. "'It's the personal influence. "'Then there's the library board. "'You'd be so useful on that. "'And, of course, there's our women's study club, "'the Thanatopsis Club. "'Are they doing anything? "'Or do they read papers made out of the encyclopedia?' "'Miss Sherwin shrugged. "'Perhaps, but still, they are so earnest. "'They will respond to your fresher interest. "'And the Thanatopsis does do a good social work. "'They've made the city plant ever so many trees, "'and they run the restroom for farmers' wives.' and they do take such an interest in refinement and culture so, in fact, so very unique. Carol was disappointed. By nothing very tangible, she said politely, I'll think them all over. I must have a while to look around first. Miss Sherwin darted to her, smoothed her hair, peered at her. Oh, my dear, don't you suppose I know? These first tender days of marriage, they're sacred to me. "'home and children that need you "'and depend on you to keep them alive "'and turn to you with their wrinkly little smiles "'and the hearth and... "'She hid her face from Carol "'as she made an activity of patting the cushion of her chair. "'But she went on with her former briskness. "'I mean, you must help us when you're ready. "'I'm afraid you'll think I'm conservative. "'I, I am. "'So much to conserve. "'All this treasure of American ideals, "'sturdiness and democracy and opportunity. "'Maybe not at Palm Beach.' "'But thank heaven we're free from such social distinctions in Gopher Prairie. "'I have only one good quality, "'overwhelming belief in the brains and hearts of our nation, our state, our town. "'It's so strong that sometimes I do have a tiny effect on the haughty ten thousand heirs. "'I shake them up and make them believe in ideals, yes, in themselves. "'But I get into a rut of teaching. "'I need young critical things like you to punch me up. "'Tell me, what are you reading?' "'I've been reading... We're rather rereading the damnation of Theron Ware. Do you know it? Oh, yes, it was clever, but hard. Man wanted to tear down, not build up. Cynical. Oh, I do hope I'm not a sentimentalist, but I can't see any use in this high art stuff that doesn't encourage us day laborers to plod on. Ensued a fifteen minute argument about the oldest topic in the world. It's art, but is it pretty? Carol tried to be eloquent regarding honesty of observation. Miss Sherwin stood out for sweetness and a cautious use of the uncomfortable properties of light. At the end, Carol cried, "'I don't care how much we disagree. It's a relief to have somebody talk something besides crops. Let's make Gopher Prairie rock to its foundations. Let's have afternoon tea instead of afternoon coffee.' The delighted bee helped her bring out the ancestral folding sewing table whose yellow and black top was scarred with dotted lines from a dressmaker's tracing wheel, and to set it with an embroidered lunchcloth and the mauve-glazed Japanese tea set which she had brought from St. Paul. Miss Sherwin confided her latest scheme, moral motion pictures for country districts, with light from a portable dynamo hitched to a Ford engine. B was twice called to fill the hot water pitcher and to make cinnamon toast. When Kennicott came home at five, he tried to be courtly, as befits the husband of one who has afternoon tea. 
Carol suggested that Miss Sherwin stay for supper, and that Kennicott invite Guy Pollock, the much-praised lawyer, the poetic bachelor. Yes, Pollock could come. Yes, he was over the grip which had prevented his going to Sam Clark's party. Carol regretted her impulse. The man would be an opinionated politician, heavily jocular about the bride. But at the entrance of Guy Pollock, she discovered a personality. Pollock was a man of perhaps thirty-eight, slender, still deferential. His voice was low. It was very good of you to want me, he said, and he offered no humorous remarks and did not ask her if she didn't think Gopher Prairie was the liveliest little burg in the state. She fancied that his even grayness might reveal a thousand tints of lavender and blue and silver. At supper he hinted his love for Sir Thomas Brown, Thoreau, Agnes Replier, Arthur Simons, Claude Washburn, Charles Flandrau. He presented his ideals diffidently, but he expanded in Carol's bookishness, in Miss Sherwin's voluminous praise, in Kennicott's tolerance of anyone who amused his wife. Carol wondered why Guy Pollock went on digging at routine law cases, why he remained in Gopher Prairie. She had no one whom she could ask. Neither Kennicott nor Vida Sherwin would understand that there might be reasons why a Pollock should not remain in Gopher Prairie. She enjoyed the faint mystery. She felt triumphant and rather literary. She already had a group. It would be only a while now before she provided the town with fanlights and a knowledge of Galsworthy. She was doing things. As she served the emergency dessert of coconut and sliced oranges, she cried to Pollock, Don't you think we ought to get up a dramatic club? The End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 when the first dubious November snow had filtered down, shading with white the bare clods in the ploughed fields, when the first small fire had been started in the furnace, which is the shrine of a gopher prairie home, Carol began to make the house her own. She dismissed the parlor furniture, the golden oak table with brass knobs, the moldy brocade chairs, the picture of the doctor. She went to Minneapolis to scamper through department stores and small Tenth Street shops devoted to ceramics and high thought. She had to ship her treasures, but she wanted to bring them back in her arms. Carpenters had torn out the partition between front parlor and back parlor, thrown it into a long room, on which she lavished yellow and deep blue. A Japanese obi, with an intricacy of gold thread on stiff ultramarine tissue, which she hung as a panel against the maze wall. A couch with pillows of sapphire velvet and gold bands. Chairs, which, in Gopher Prairie, seemed flippant. She hid the sacred family phonograph in the dining room and replaced its stand with a square cabinet on which was a squat blue jar between yellow candles. Kennicott decided against the fireplace. We have a new house in a couple of years anyway. She decorated only one room. The rest, Kennicott hinted, she'd better leave till he made a ten strike. The brown cube of a house stirred and awakened. It seemed to be in motion. It welcomed her back from shopping. It lost its mildewed repression. The supreme verdict was Kennicott's, Well, by golly, I was afraid the new junk wouldn't be so comfortable, but I must say this divan, or whatever you call it, is a lot better than that bumpy old sofa we had, and when I look around, well, it's worth all it cost, I guess. Everyone in town took an interest in the refurnishing. The carpenters and painters, who did not actually assist, crossed the lawn to peer through the windows and exclaim, Fine, looks swell. Dave Dyer at the drugstore, Harry Haydock, and Ramey Wotherspoon at the Bonton repeated daily, "'How's the good work coming? I hear the house is getting to be uh, real classy.' Even Mrs. Bogart. Mrs. Bogart lived across the alley from the rear of Carol's house. She was a widow and a prominent Baptist and a good influence. She had so painfully reared three sons to be Christian gentlemen that one of them had become an Omaha bartender, one a professor of Greek, and one— Cyrus N. Bogart, a boy of fourteen who was still at home, the most brazen member of the toughest gang in Boytown. Mrs. Bogart was not the acid type of good influence. She was the soft, damp, fat, sighing, indigestive, clinging, melancholy, depressingly hopeful kind. There are in every large chicken yard a number of old and indignant hens who resemble Mrs. Bogart, and when they are served at Sunday noon dinner as fricasseed chicken with thick dumplings, they keep up the resemblance. Carol had noted that Mrs. Bogart, from her side window, kept an eye upon the house. 
The Kennicotts and Mrs. Bogart did not move in the same sets, which meant precisely the same in Gopher Prairie as it did on Fifth Avenue or in Mayfair. But the good widow came calling. She wheezed in, sighed, gave Carol a pulpy hand, sighed, glanced sharply at the revelation of ankles as Carol crossed her legs, sighed, inspected the new blue chairs, smiled with a coy sighing sound, and gave voice. "'I've wanted to call on you so long, dearie. You know we're neighbors, but I thought I'd wait till you got settled. You must run in and see me. How much did that big chair cost?' Seventy-seven dollars. Sel "'Sakes alive! Well, I suppose it's all right for them that can afford it, though I do sometimes think—' Of course, as our pastor said once at Baptist Church, uh, by the way, we haven't seen you there yet, and of course your husband was raised up a Baptist, and I do hope he won't drift away from the fold. Of course, we all know there isn't anything, not cleverness or gifts of gold or anything, that can make up for humility and the inward grace, and they can say what they want to about the P.E. Church, but of course there's no church that has more history or has stayed by the true principles of Christianity better than the Baptist Church, and... "'In what church were you raised, Mrs. Kennicott?' "'Why, oh, uh, I went to Congregational as a girl in Mankato, but my college was Universalist. "'Well, uh, but of course, as the Bible says, uh, is it the Bible? Uh, "'At least I know I've heard it in church, and everybody admits it. "'It's proper for the little bride to take her husband's vessel of faith, "'so we all hope we shall see you at the Baptist church, and... Uh, well, as I was saying, of course, I agree with Reverend Zitterall in thinking that the great trouble with this nation today is lack of spiritual faith. So few going to church and people automobiling on Sunday, and heaven knows what all. But still I do think that one trouble is this terrible waste of money. People feeling that they've got to have bathtubs and telephones in their houses. I heard you were selling the old furniture cheap. Yes. Well, of course, uh, you know your own mind, but I can't help thinking when Wilsma was down here keeping house for him, she used to run in to see me real often. It was good enough furniture for her. But there, there, I mustn't croak. I just wanted to let you know that when you find you can't depend on a lot of these gadding young folks like the Haydocks and the Dyers, and heaven only knows how much money Juanita Haydock blows in, in a year, why, then you may be glad to know that slow old Auntie Bogart is always right here, and heaven knows— a portentous sigh. I hope you and your husband won't have any of the troubles with sickness and quarreling and wasting money and all that so many of these young couples do have, and, oh, but I must be running along now, dearie. It's been such a pleasure, and uh, just run in and see me any time. I hope Will is well. I thought he looked a wee mite peaked. It was twenty minutes later when Mrs. Bogart finally oozed out of the front door. Carol ran back into the living room and jerked open the windows. "'That woman has left damp fingerprints in the air,' she said. Carol was extravagant, but at least she did not try to clear herself of blame by going about whimpering, "'I know I'm terribly extravagant, but I don't seem to be able to help it.' Kennicott had never thought of giving her an allowance. His mother had never had one. As a wage-earning spinster, Carol had asserted to her fellow librarians that when she was married— she was going to have an allowance and be businesslike and modern. But it was too much trouble to explain to Kennicott's kindly stubbornness that she was a practical housekeeper as well as a flighty playmate. She bought a budget plan account book and made her budgets as exact as budgets are likely to be when they lack budgets. For the first month it was a honeymoon just to beg prettily to confess, I have an ascent in the house, dear, and to be told, You're an extravagant little rabbit. But the budget book made her realize how inexact were her finances. She became self-conscious. Occasionally she was indignant that she should always have to petition him for the money with which to buy his food. She caught herself criticizing his belief that, since his joke about trying to keep her out of the poorhouse had once been accepted as admirable humor, it should continue to be his daily bon mot. It was a nuisance to have to run down the street after him because she had forgotten to ask him for money at breakfast. But she couldn't hurt his feelings. She reflected. He liked the lordliness of giving largesse. She tried to reduce the frequency of begging by opening accounts and having the bills sent to him. She had found that staple groceries, sugar, flour, could be most cheaply purchased at Axel Egg's rustic general store. She said sweetly to Axel, "'I think I'd better open a charge account here.' "'I don't do no business except for cash,' grunted Axel. She flared. "'Do you know who I am?' "'Yeah, sure, I know. The doc is good for it. 
but that's just the rule I made. I make low prices. I do business for cash. She stared at his red, impassive face, and her fingers had the undignified desire to slap him. But her reason agreed with him. You're quite right. You shouldn't break your rule for me. Her rage had not been lost. It had been transferred to her husband. She wanted ten pounds of sugar in a hurry, but she had no money. She ran up the stairs to Kennicott's office. On the door was a sign advertising a headache cure and stating, The doctor is out, back at... Naturally, the blank space was not filled out. She stamped her foot. She ran down to the drugstore, the doctor's club. As she entered, she heard Mrs. Dyer demanding, Dave, I've got to have some money. Carol saw that her husband was there and two other men all listening in amusement. Dave Dyer snapped, How much do you want? Dollar be enough? No, it won't. I've got to get some underclothes for the kids. Why, good Lord, they got enough now to fill the closet so I couldn't find my hunting boots last time I wanted them. I don't care. They're all in rags. You've got to give me ten dollars. Carol perceived that Mrs. Dyer was accustomed to this indignity. She perceived that the men, particularly Dave, regarded it as an excellent jest. She waited. She knew what would come. It did. Dave yelped, "'Where's that ten dollars I gave you last year?' And he looked to the other men to laugh. They laughed. Cold and still, Carol walked up to Kennicott and commanded, "'I want to see you upstairs.' "'Why, something the matter?' "'Yes.' He clumped after her up the stairs into his barren office. Before he could get out a query, she stated, "'Yesterday, in front of a saloon, I heard a German farm wife beg her husband for a quarter to get a toy for the baby, and he refused. Just now I've heard Mrs. Dyer going through the same humiliation, and I, I'm in the same position. I have to beg you for money, daily. I have just been informed that I couldn't have any sugar because I hadn't the money to pay for it. Who said that? By God, I'll kill any— Tut, it wasn't his fault, it was yours, and mine. I now humbly beg you to give me the money with which to buy meals for you to eat, and hereafter to remember it. The next time I shan't beg. I shall simply starve. Do you understand? I can't go on being a slave. Her defiance, her enjoyment of the role, ran out. She was sobbing against his overcoat. How can you shame me so? And he was blubbering. Oh, doggone it, I meant to give you some, and I forgot it. I swear I won't again. By golly, I won't. He pressed fifty dollars upon her, and after that he remembered to give her money regularly, sometimes. Daily she determined, but I must have a stated amount, be businesslike, system, I must do something about it. And daily she didn't do anything about it. Mrs. Bogart had, by the simpering viciousness of her comments on the new furniture, stirred Carol to economy. She spoke judiciously to be about leftovers. She read the cookbook again, and like a child with a picture book, she studied the diagram of the beef, which gallantly continues to browse, though it is divided into cuts. But she was a deliberate and joyous spendthrift in her preparations for her first party, the housewarming. She made lists on every envelope and laundry slip in her desk. She sent orders to Minneapolis fancy grocers. She pinned patterns and sewed. She was irritated when Kennicott was jocular about these frightful big doings that are going on. She regarded the affair as an attack on Gopher Prairie's timidity and pleasure. I'll make them lively, if nothing else. I'll make them stop regarding parties as committee meetings. Kennicott usually considered himself the master of the house. At his desire, she went hunting, which was his symbol of happiness, and she ordered porridge for breakfast, which was his symbol of morality. But when he came home on the afternoon before the housewarming, he found himself a slave, an intruder, a blunderer, Carol wailed. Fix the furnace so you won't have to touch it after supper, and for heaven's sake, take that horrible old doormat off the porch and put on your nice brown and white shirt. Why did you come home so late? Would you mind hurrying? Here it is almost supper time, and those fiends are just as likely as not to come at seven instead of eight. Please hurry. She was as unreasonable as an amateur leading woman on a first night, and he was reduced to humility. When she came down to supper, when she stood in the doorway, he gasped. She was in a silver sheath, the calyx of a lily, her piled hair like black glass. She had the fragility and costliness of a Viennese goblet, and her eyes were intense. He was stirred to rise from the table and to hold the chair for her, and all through supper he ate his bread dry because he felt that she would think him common if he said, "'Will you hand me the butter?' 
She had reached the calmness of not caring whether her guests liked the party or not, and a state of satisfied suspense in regard to B's technique in serving, before Kennicott cried from the bay window in the living room, "'Here comes somebody!' and Mr. and Mrs. Luke Dawson faltered in at a quarter to eight. Then, in a shy avalanche, arrived the entire aristocracy of Gopher Prairie. All persons engaged in a profession, or earning more than twenty-five hundred dollars a year, or possessed of grandparents born in America. Even while they were removing their overshoes, they were peeping at the new decorations. Carol saw Dave Dyer secretively turn over the gold pillows to find a price tag, and heard Mr. Julius Flickerbaugh, the attorney, gasp, "'Well, I'll be switched,' as he viewed the vermilion print hanging against the Japanese obi. She was amused, but her high spirit slackened as she beheld them form in dress parade in a long, silent, uneasy circle clear round the living room. She felt that she had been magically whisked back to her first party at Sam Clark's. "'Have I got to lift them like so many pigs of iron? I don't know what I can make them happy, but I'll make them hectic.' A silver flame in the darkling circle, she whirled around, drew them with her smile, and sang, "'I want my party to be noisy and undignified.' This is the christening of my house, and I want you to help me have a bad influence on it, so that it will be a giddy house. For me, won't you all join in an old-fashioned square dance, and Mr. Dyer will call. She had a record on the phonograph. Dave Dyer was capering in the center of the floor, loose-jointed, lean, small, rusty-headed, pointed of nose, clapping his hands and shouting, Swing your partners, Alleman left. Even the millionaire Dawsons and Ezra Stowbody and Professor George Edwin Mott danced, looking only slightly foolish, and by rushing about the room and being coy and coaxing to all persons over forty-five, Carol got them into a waltz and a Virginia reel. But when she left them to disenjoy themselves in their own way, Harry Haydock put a one-step record on the phonograph. The younger people took the floor, and all the elders sneaked back to their chairs with crystallized smiles which read, "'Don't believe I'll try this one myself.' but I do enjoy watching the youngsters dance. Half of them were silent, half resumed the discussions of that afternoon in the store. As for Stowbody, hunted for something to say, hid a yawn, and offered to Lyman Cass, the owner of the flour mill, How do you folks like the new furnace limb, huh? So? No, let them alone. Don't pester them. They must like it, or they wouldn't do it, Carol warned herself. But they gazed at her so expectantly when she flickered past that she was reconvinced that in their debauches of respectability they had lost the power of play as well as the power of impersonal thought. Even the dancers were gradually crushed by the invisible force of fifty percent pure and well-behaved and negative minds, and they sat down two by two. In twenty minutes the party was again elevated to the decorum of a prayer meeting. "'We're going to do something exciting,' Carol exclaimed to her new confidant, Vida Sherwin. She saw that in the growing quiet her voice had carried across the room. Nat Hicks, Ella Stowbody, and Dave Dyer were abstracted, fingers and lips slightly moving. She knew with a cold certainty that Dave was rehearsing his stunt about the Norwegian catching the hen, Ella running over the first lines of An Old Sweetheart of Mine, and Nat thinking of his popular parody on Mark Antony's oration. "'But I will not have anybody use the word stunt in my house.' she whispered to Miss Sherwin. "'That's good, I tell you. Why not have Raymond Wotherspoon sing?' "'Ramy? Why, my dear, he's the most sentimental yearner in town.' "'See here, child, your opinions on house decorating are sound, but your opinions of people are rotten. Ramy does wag his tail, but the poor dear, longing for what he calls self-expression, and no training in anything except selling shoes, but he can sing.' "'and some day when he gets away from Harry Haydock's patronage and ridicule, "'he'll do something fine.' "'Carol apologized for her superciliousness. "'She urged Ramy and warned the planners of stunts. "'We all want you to sing. "'Mr. Wotherspoon, you're the only famous actor "'I'm going to let appear on the stage tonight.' "'While Ramy blushed and admitted, "'Oh, they don't want to hear me.' "'He was clearing his throat, "'pulling his clean handkerchief farther out of his breast pocket "'and thrusting his fingers between the buttons of his vest.' In her affection for Ramy's defender, in her desire to discover artistic talent, Carol prepared to be delighted by the recital. Ramy sang, Fly as a Bird, Thou Art My Dove, and When the Little Swallow Leaves Its Tiny Nest, all in a reasonably bad offertory tenor. Carol was shuddering with the vicarious shame which sensitive people feel when they listen to an elocutionist being humorous, or to a precocious child publicly doing badly what no child should do at all. 
She wanted to laugh at the gratified importance in Raimi's half-shut eyes. She wanted to weep over the meek ambitiousness which clouded like an aura his pale face, flap ears, and sandy pompadour. She tried to look admiring for the benefit of Miss Sherwin, that trusting admirer of all that was or conceivably could be the good, the true, and the beautiful. At the end of the third ornithological lyric, Miss Sherwin roused from her attitude of inspired vision and breathed to Carol, "'My, that was sweet. Of course, Raymond hasn't an unusually good voice, but don't you think he puts such a lot of feeling into it?' Carol lied blackly and magnificently, but without originality. "'Oh, yes, I do think he has so much feeling.' She saw that after the strain of listening in a cultured manner, the audience had collapsed, had given up their last hope of being amused. She cried, "'Now we're going to play an idiotic game which I learned in Chicago. You will have to take off your shoes for a starter. After that, you will probably break your knees and shoulder blades.' Much attention and incredulity. A few eyebrows indicating a verdict that Doc Kennicott's bride was noisy and improper. I shall choose the most vicious, like Juanita Haydock and myself, as the shepherds. The rest of you are wolves. Your shoes are the sheep. The wolves go out into the hall. The shepherds scatter the sheep through this room, then turn off all the lights, and the wolves crawl in from the hall, and in the darkness they try to get the shoes away from the shepherds, who are permitted to do anything except bite and use blackjacks. The wolves chuck the captured shoes out into the hall. No one excused. Come on. Shoes off. Everyone looked at everyone else and waited for everyone else to begin. Carol kicked off her silver slippers and ignored the universal glance at her arches. The embarrassed but loyal Vida Sherwin unbuttoned her high black shoes. Ezra Stowbody cackled, Well, you're a terror to old folks. You're like the gals I used to go horseback riding with back in the sixties. Ain't much accustomed to attending parties barefoot, but here goes. With a whoop and a gallant jerk, Ezra snatched off his elastic-sided Congress shoes. The others giggled and followed. When the sheep had been penned up in the darkness, the timorous wolves crept into the living room, squealing, halting, thrown out of their habit of stolidity by the strangeness of advancing through nothingness toward a waiting foe, a mysterious foe which expanded and grew more menacing. The wolves peered to make out landmarks. They touched gliding arms, which did not seem to be attached to a body. They quivered with a rapture of fear. Reality had vanished. A yelping squabble suddenly rose. Then Juanita Hedock's high titter and Guy Pollock's astonished, Ouch! Quit! You're scalping me! Mrs. Luke Dawson galloped backward on stiff hands and knees into the safety of the lighted hallway, moaning, I declare I never was so upset in my life. But the propriety was shaken out of her, and she delightfully continued to ejaculate, Nev, in my life, as she saw the living room door opened by invisible hands and shoes hurling through it as she heard from the darkness beyond the door a squalling, a bumping, a resolute, Here's a lot of shoes. Come on, you wolves. Ow, you would, would you? When Carol abruptly turned on the lights in the embattled living room, half of the company were sitting back against the walls where they had craftily remained throughout the engagement. But in the middle of the floor, Kennicott was wrestling with Harry Haydock, their collars torn off, their hair and their eyes, and the owlish Mr. Julius Flickerbaugh was retreating from Juanita Haydock and gulping with unaccustomed laughter. Guy Pollock's discreet brown scarf hung down his back. Young Rita Simon's net blouse had lost two buttons and betrayed more of her delicious plump shoulder than was regarded as pure in Gopher Prairie. Whether by shock, disgust, joy of combat, or physical activity, all the party were freed from their years of social decorum. George Edwin Mott giggled. Luke Dawson twisted his beard. Mrs. Clark insisted, I did too, Sam. I got a shoe. I never knew I could fight so terrible. Carol was certain that she was a great reformer. She mercifully had combs, mirrors, brushes, needle, and thread ready. She permitted them to restore the divine decency of buttons. The grinning bee brought downstairs a pile of soft, thick sheets of paper with designs of lotus blossoms, dragons, apes in cobalt and crimson and gray, and patterns of purple birds flying among sea-green trees in the valleys of nowhere. These, Carol announced, are real Chinese masquerade costumes. I got them from an importing shop in Minneapolis. You are to put them on over your clothes, and please forget that you are Minnesotans, and turn into mandarins, and coolies, and... and samurai, isn't it? And anything else you can think of. While they were shyly rustling the paper costumes, she disappeared. 
Ten minutes after, she gazed down from the stairs upon grotesquely ruddy Yankee heads above Oriental robes and cried to them, The Princess Winkie-Poo salutes her court. As they looked up, she caught their suspensive admiration. They saw an airy figure in trousers and coat of green brocade edged with gold, a high gold collar under a proud chin, black hair pierced with jade pins, a languid peacock fan in an outstretched hand, eyes uplifted to a vision of pagoda towers. When she dropped her pose and smiled down, she discovered Kennicott apoplectic with domestic pride, and gray Guy Pollock staring beseechingly. For a second she saw nothing in all the pink and brown mass of their faces save the hunger of the two men. She shook off the spell and ran down. We're going to have a real Chinese concert. The Messrs. Pollock, Kennicott, and, well, uh, Stowbody are drummers. The rest of us sing and play the fife. The fifes were combs with tissue paper. The drums were tabarets and the sewing table. Lauren Wheeler, editor of The Dauntless, led the orchestra with a ruler and a totally inaccurate sense of rhythm. The music was a reminiscence of tom-toms heard at circus fortune-telling tents or at the Minnesota State Fair, but the whole company pounded and puffed and whined in a sing-song and looked rapturous. Before they were quite tired of the concert, Carol led them in a dancing procession to the dining room to blue bowls of chow mein with lychee nuts and ginger preserved in syrup. None of them, save that city rounder Harry Haydock, had heard of any Chinese dish except chop suey. With agreeable doubt, they ventured through the bamboo shoots into the golden fried noodles of the chow mein, and Dave Dyer did a not very humorous Chinese dance with Nat Hicks, and there was hubbub and contentment. Carol relaxed and found that she was shockingly tired. She had carried them on her thin shoulders. She could not keep it up. She longed for her father, that artist at creating hysterical parties. She thought of smoking a cigarette to shock them, and dismissed the obscene thought before it was quite formed. She wondered whether they could for five minutes be coaxed to talk about something besides the winter top of Newt Stamquist's Ford and what Al Tingley had said about his mother-in-law. She sighed. Oh, let him alone. I've done enough. She crossed her trousered legs and snuggled luxuriously above her saucer of ginger. She caught Pollock's congratulatory still smile and thought well of herself for having thrown a rose light on the pallid lawyer. Repented the heretical supposition that any male save her husband existed. Jumped up to find Kennicott and whisper, Happy, my lord? No, it didn't cost much. Best party this town ever saw. Only, uh, don't uh, cross your legs in that costume. Shows your knees too plain. She was vexed. She resented his clumsiness. She returned to Guy Pollock and talked of Chinese religions. Not that she knew anything whatever about Chinese religions, but he had read a book on the subject, as on lonely evenings in his office he had read at least one book on every subject in the world. Guy's thin maturity was changing in her vision to flushed youth, and they were roaming an island in the Yellow Sea of Chatter when she realized that the guests were beginning that cough which indicated in the universal instinctive language that they desired to go home and go to bed. While they asserted that it had been the nicest party they'd ever seen, my, so clever and original, she smiled tremendously shook hands, and cried many suitable things regarding children, and being sure to wrap up warmly, and Ramey singing and Juanita Haydock's prowess at games. Then she turned wearily to Kennicott in a house filled with quiet and crumbs and shreds of Chinese costumes. He was gurgling. I tell you, Carrie, you certainly are a wonder, and guess you're right about waking folks up. Now you've showed them how. They won't go on having the same old kind of parties and stunts and everything. Uh, here, don't touch a thing. Done enough. Pop up to bed, and I'll clear up. His wise surgeon's hands stroked her shoulder, and her irritation at his clumsiness was lost in his strength. From the Weekly Dauntless One of the most delightful social events of recent months was held Wednesday evening in the housewarming of Dr. and Mrs. Kennicott, who have completely redecorated their charming home on Poplar Street, and is now extremely nifty in modern color scheme. The doctor and his bride were at home to their numerous friends, and a number of novelties and diversions were held, including a Chinese orchestra in original and genuine Oriental costumes, of which the editor was leader. Dainty refreshments were served in true Oriental style, and one and all voted a delightful time. The week after, the Chet Dashaways gave a party. The circle of mourners kept its place all evening, and Dave Dyer did the stunt of the Norwegian and the hen. The end of chapter 6.
Chapter 7 Gopher Prairie was digging in for the winter. Through late November and all December it snowed daily. The thermometer was at zero and might drop to twenty below or thirty. Winter is not a season in the North Middle West. It is an industry. Storm sheds were erected at every door. In every block, the householders, Sam Clark, the wealthy Mr. Dawson, all save asthmatic Ezra Stowbody, who extravagantly hired a boy, were seen perilously staggering up ladders, carrying storm windows, and screwing them to second-story jams. While Kennicott put up his windows, Carol danced inside the bedrooms and begged him not to swallow the screws, which he held in his mouth like an extraordinary set of external false teeth. The universal sign of winter was the town handyman, Miles Bjornstam, a tall, thick, red-mustached bachelor, opinionated, atheist, general store arguer, cynical Santa Claus. Children loved him, and he sneaked away from work to tell them improbable stories of seafaring and horse trading and bears. The children's parents either laughed at him or hated him. He was the one Democrat in town. He called both Lyman Cass, the miller, and the Finn homesteader from Lost Lake by their first names. He was known as the Red Swede and considered slightly insane. Bjornstam could do anything with his hands, solder a pan, weld an automobile spring, soothe a frightened filly, tinker a clock, carve a Gloucester schooner which magically went into a bottle. Now, for a week, he was Commissioner General of Gopher Prairie. He was the only person besides the repairman at Sam Clark's who understood plumbing. Everybody begged him to look over the furnace and the water pipes. He rushed from house to house till after bedtime, ten o'clock. Icicles from burst water pipes hung along the skirt of his brown dogskin overcoat. His plush cap, which he never took off in the house, was a pulp of ice and coal dust. His red hands were cracked to rawness. He chewed the stub of a cigar. But he was courtly to Carol. He stooped to examine the furnace flues. He straightened, glanced down at her, and hemmed, "'Got to fix your furnace, no matter what else I do.' The poorer houses of Gopher Prairie, where the services of Miles Bjornstam were a luxury, which included the shanty of Miles Bjornstam, were banked to the lower windows with earth and manure. Along the railroad, the sections of snow fence, which had been stacked all summer in romantic wooden tents occupied by roving small boys, were set up to prevent drifts from covering the track. The farmers came into town in homemade sleighs with bed quilts and hay piled in the rough boxes. Fur coats, fur caps, fur mittens, overshoes buckling almost to the knees, gray knitted scarfs ten feet long, thick woolen socks, canvas jackets lined with fluffy yellow wool like the plumage of ducklings, moccasins, red flannel wristlets for the blazing chapped wrists of boys. These protections against winter were busily dug out of mothball sprinkled drawers and tar bags in closets, and all over town small boys were squealing, Oh, there's my mittens! Oh, look at my shoe packs! There is so sharp a division between the panting summer and the stinging winter of the northern plains that they rediscovered with surprise and a feeling of heroism this armor of an arctic explorer. Winter garments surpassed even personal gossip as the topic at parties. It was good form to ask, Put on your heavies yet? There were as many distinctions in wraps as in motor cars. The lesser sort appeared in yellow and black dogskin coats, but Kennicott was lordly in a long raccoon ulster and a new seal cap. When the snow was too deep for his motor, he went off on country calls in a shiny, floral, steel-tipped cutter, only his ruddy nose and his cigar emerging from the fur. Carol herself stirred Main Street by a loose coat of nutria. Her fingertips loved the silken fur. Her liveliest activity now was organizing outdoor sports in the motor-paralyzed town. The automobile and bridge whist had not only made more evident the social divisions in Gopher Prairie, but they had also enfeebled the love of activity. It was so rich-looking to sit and drive, and so easy. Skiing and sliding were stupid and old-fashioned. In fact, the village longed for the elegance of city recreations almost as much as the cities longed for village sports. And Gopher Prairie took as much pride in neglecting coasting as St. Paul or New York in going coasting. Carol did inspire a successful skating party in mid-November. Plover Lake glistened in clear sweeps of gray-green ice ringing to the skates. On shore, the ice-tipped reeds clattered in the wind, and oak twigs with stubborn last leaves hung against a milky sky. Harry Haydock did figure eights, and Carol was certain that she had found the perfect life. But when snow had ended the skating, and she tried to get up a moonlit sliding party, the matrons hesitated to start away from their radiators and their daily bridge-whist imitations of the city. She had to nag them. They scooted down a long hill on a bobsled. They upset and got snow down their necks. They shrieked that they would do it again immediately, 
and they did not do it again at all. She badgered another group into going skiing. They shouted and threw snowballs and informed her that it was such fun and they'd have another skiing expedition right away and they jollily returned home and never thereafter left their manuals of bridge. Carol was discouraged. She was grateful when Kennicott invited her to go rabbit hunting in the woods. She waded down stilly cloisters between burnt stump and icy oak through drifts marked with a million hieroglyphics of rabbit and mouse and bird. She squealed as he leaped on a pile of brush and fired at the rabbit which ran out. He belonged there, masculine reefer and sweater and high-laced boots. That night she ate prodigiously of steak and fried potatoes. She produced electric sparks by touching his ear with her fingertip. She slept twelve hours and awoke to think how glorious was this brave land. She rose to a radiance of sun on snow. Snug in her furs she trotted uptown. Frosted shingles smoked against a sky colored like flax blossoms. Sleigh bells clinked. Shouts of greeting were loud in the thin bright air, and everywhere was a rhythmic sound of wood sawing. It was Saturday, and the neighbor's sons were getting up the winter fuel. Behind walls of corded wood in backyards, their sawbucks stood in depressions scattered with canary-yellow flakes of sawdust. The frames of their buck saws were cherry red, the blades blued steel, and the fresh cut ends of the sticks, poplar, maple, ironwood, birch, were marked with engraved rings of growth. The boys wore shoe packs, blue flannel shirts with enormous pearl buttons, and mackinaws of crimson, lemon yellow, and foxy brown. Carol cried, Fine day! to the boys. She came in a glow to Howland and Gould's grocery, her collar white with frost from her breath. She bought a can of tomatoes as though it were orient fruit, and returned home, planning to surprise Kennicott with an omelette creole for dinner. So brilliant was the snow glare that when she entered the house she saw the doorknobs, the newspaper on the table, every white surface as dazzling mauve, and her head was dizzy in the pyrotechnic dimness. When her eyes had recovered she felt expanded, drunk with health, mistress of life, the world was so luminous that she sat down at her rickety little desk in the living room to make a poem. She got no farther than, The sky is bright, the sun is warm, there ne'er will be another storm. In the mid-afternoon of this same day, Kennicott was called into the country. It was Bee's evening out, her evening for the Lutheran dance. Carol was alone from three till midnight. She wearied of reading pure love stories in the magazines and sat by a radiator, beginning to brood. Thus she chanced to discover that she had nothing to do. She had, she meditated, passed through the novelty of seeing the town and meeting people, of skating and sliding and hunting. B was competent. There was no household labor except sewing and darning and gossipy assistance to B in bed-making. She couldn't satisfy her ingenuity in planning meals. At Dahl and Olison's meat market, you didn't give orders. You woefully inquired whether there was anything today besides steak and pork and ham. The cuts of beef were not cuts, they were hacks. Lamb chops were as exotic as shark's fins. The meat dealers shipped their best to the city with its higher prices. In all the shops there was the same lack of choice. She could not find a glass-headed picture nail in town. She did not hunt for the sort of veiling she wanted. She took what she could get, and only at Howland and Gould's was there such a luxury as canned asparagus. Routine care was all she could devote to the house. Only by such fussing as the widow Bogart's could she make it fill her time. She could not have outside employment. To the village doctor's wife it was taboo. She was a woman with a working brain and no work. There were only three things which she could do. Have children, start her career of reforming, or become so definitely a part of the town that she would be fulfilled by the activities of church and study club and bridge parties. Children, yes, she wanted them, but... She was not quite ready. She had been embarrassed by Kennicott's frankness, but she agreed with him that in the insane condition of civilization, which made the rearing of citizens more costly and perilous than any other crime, it was inadvisable to have children till he had made more money. She was sorry. Perhaps he had made all the mystery of love a mechanical cautiousness, but she fled from the thought with a dubious someday. Her reforms... Her impulses toward beauty in raw Main Street, they had become indistinct. But she would set them going now. She would. She swore it with a soft fist beating the edges of the radiator. And at the end of all her vows she had no notion as to when and where the crusade was to begin. Become an authentic part of the town? She began to think with unpleasant lucidity. She reflected that she did not know whether the people liked her. 
She had gone to the women at afternoon coffees, to the merchants in their stores, with so many outpouring comments and whimsies that she hadn't given them a chance to betray their opinions of her. The men smiled, but did they like her? She was lively among the women, but was she one of them? She could not recall many times when she had been admitted to the whispering of scandal, which is the secret chamber of Gopher Prairie conversation. She was poisoned with doubt as she drooped up to bed. Next day, through her shopping, her mind sat back and observed. Dave Dyer and Sam Clark were as, as cordial as she had been fancying, but wasn't there an impersonal abruptness in the how are ya of Chet Dashaway? Howland the grocer was curt. Was that merely his usual manner? It's infuriating to have to pay attention to what people think. In St. Paul I didn't care, but here I'm spied on. They're watching me. I mustn't let it make me self-conscious, she coaxed herself, overstimulated by the drug of thought and offensively on the defensive. A thaw which stripped the snow from the sidewalks, a ringing iron night when the lakes could be heard booming, a clear, roistering morning. In Tam O'Shanter and Tweed Skirt, Carol felt herself a college junior going out to play hockey. She wanted to whoop, her legs ached to run. On the way home from shopping, she yielded as a pup would have yielded. She galloped down a block, and as she jumped from a curb across a welter of slush, she gave a student yippee. She saw that in a window three old women were gasping. Their triple glare was paralyzing. Across the street, at another window, the curtain had secretively moved. She stopped, walked on sedately, changed from the girl Carol into Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. She never again felt quite young enough and defiant enough and free enough to run and halloo in the public streets, and it was as a nice married woman that she attended the next weekly bridge of the Jolly Seventeen. The Jolly Seventeen, the membership of which ranged from fourteen to twenty-six, was the social cornice of Gopher Prairie. It was the country club, the diplomatic set, the St. Cecilia, the Ritz Oval Room, and the Club Divine. To belong to it was to be in Though its membership partly coincided with that of the Thanatopsis Study Club, the Jolly Seventeen, as a separate entity, guffawed at the Thanatopsis and considered it middle class and even highbrow. Most of the Jolly Seventeen were young married women, with their husbands as associate members. Once a week they had a woman's afternoon bridge. Once a month the husbands joined them for supper and evening bridge. Twice a year they had dances at the IOF Hall. Then the town exploded. Only at the annual balls of the firemen and of the Eastern Star was there such prodigality of chiffon scarfs and tangoing and heart-burnings, and these rival institutions were not select. Hired girls attended the firemen's ball with section hands and laborers. Ella Stowbody had once gone to a Jolly Seventeen soiree in the village hack, hitherto confined to chief mourners at funerals, and Harry Haydock and Dr. Terry Gould always appeared in the town's only specimens of evening clothes. The afternoon bridge of the Jolly Seventeen, which followed Carol's lonely doubting, was held at Juanita Haydock's new concrete bungalow, with its door of polished oak and beveled plate glass, jar of ferns in the plastered hall, and in the living room a fumed oak Morris chair, sixteen color prints, and a square varnished table with a mat made of cigar ribbons, on which was one illustrated gift edition and one pack of cards in a burnt leather case. Carol stepped into a Scirocco of furnace heat. They were already playing. Despite her flabby resolves, she had not yet learned bridge. She was winningly apologetic about it to Juanita, and ashamed that she should have to go on being apologetic. Mrs. Dave Dyer, a sallow woman with a thin prettiness devoted to experiments in religious cults, illnesses, and scandal-bearing, shook her finger at Carol and trilled, "'You're a naughty one. I don't believe you appreciate the honor when you got into the Jolly Seventeen so easy.' Mrs. Chet Dashaway nudged her neighbor at the second table. But Carol kept up the appealing bridal manner so far as possible. She twittered, "'You're perfectly right. I'm a lazy thing. I'll make Will start teaching me this very evening.' Her supplication had all the sounds of birdies in the nest, and Easter church bells, and frosted Christmas cards. Internally she snarled, "'That ought to be saccharine enough.' She sat in the smallest rocking chair, a model of Victorian modesty. But she saw, or she imagined, that the women who had gurgled at her so welcomingly when she had first come to Gopher Prairie were nodding at her brusquely. During the pause after the first game, she petitioned Mrs. Jackson Elder. "'Don't you think we ought to get up another bobsled party soon?' "'It's so cold when you get dumped in the snow,' said Mrs. Elder indifferently. "'I hate snow down my neck,' volunteered Mrs. Dave Dyer with an unpleasant look at Carol, and, turning her back, 
She bubbled at Rita Simons. Dearie, won't you run in this evening? I've got the loveliest new butterick pattern I want to show you. Carol crept back to her chair. In the fervor of discussing the game, they ignored her. She was not used to being a wallflower. She struggled to keep from oversensitiveness, from becoming unpopular by the sure method of believing that she was unpopular, but she had much reserve of patience, and at the end of the second game, when Ella Stowbody sniffily asked her, "'Are you going to send to Minneapolis for your dress for the next soiree? Heard you were,' Carol said, "'Don't know yet,' with unnecessary sharpness. She was relieved by the admiration with which the jean Fille Rita Simons looked at the steel buckles on her pumps, but she resented Mrs. Howland's tart demand. "'Don't you find that new couch of yours is too broad to be practical?' She nodded, then shook her head, and touchily left Mrs. Howland to get out of it any meaning she desired. Immediately she wanted to make peace. She was close to simpering in the sweetness with which she addressed Mrs. Howland. "'I think that is the prettiest display of beef tea your husband has in his store.' "'Oh, yes, Gopher Prairie isn't so much behind the times,' jibed Mrs. Howland. Someone giggled. Their rebuffs made her haughty. Her haughtiness irritated them to franker rebuffs. They were working up to a state of painfully righteous war when they were saved by the coming of food. Though Juanita Haydock was highly advanced in the matter of finger bowls, doilies, and bath mats, her refreshments were typical of all the afternoon coffees. Juanita's best friends, Mrs. Dyer and Mrs. Dashaway, passed large dinner plates, each with a spoon, a fork, and a coffee cup without saucer. They apologized and discussed the afternoon's game as they passed through the thicket of women's feet. Then they distributed hot buttered rolls, coffee poured from an enamelware pot, stuffed olives, potato salad, and angel's food cake. There was, even in the most strictly conforming gopher prairie circles, a certain option as to collations. The olives need not be stuffed. Doughnuts were in some houses well thought of as a substitute for the hot buttered rolls. But there was in all the town no heretic save Carol, who omitted Angel's food. They ate enormously. Carol had a suspicion that the thriftier housewives made the afternoon treat due for evening supper. She tried to get back into the current. She edged over to Mrs. McGannum, chunky, amiable, young Mrs. McGannum, with her breast and arms of a milkmaid, and her loud, delayed laugh, which burst startlingly from a sober face, was the daughter of old Dr. Westlake and the wife of Westlake's partner, Dr. McGannum. Kennicott asserted that Westlake and McGannum and their contaminated families were tricky, but Carol had found them gracious. She asked for friendliness by crying to Mrs. McGannum, "'How is the baby's throat now?' And she was attentive while Mrs. McGannum rocked and knitted and placidly described symptoms. Vida Sherwin came in after school with Miss Ethel Villette, the town librarian. Miss Sherwin's optimistic presence gave Carol more confidence. She talked. She informed the circle— I drove almost down to Wahican with Will a few days ago. Isn't the country lovely? And I do admire the Scandinavian farmers down there so, their big red barns and silos and milking machines and everything. Do you all know that lonely Lutheran church with a tin-covered spire that stands out alone on a hill? It's so bleak. Somehow it seems so brave. I do think the Scandinavians are the hardiest and best people. Oh, do you think so? protested Mrs. Jackson Elder. "'My husband says the Svenskas that work in the planing mill are perfectly terrible, "'so silent and cranky and so selfish the way they keep demanding raises. "'If they had their way, they'd simply run the business.' "'Yes, and they're simply ghastly hired girls,' wailed Mrs. Dave Dyer. "'I swear I work myself to skin and bone trying to please my hired girls when I can get them. "'I do everything in the world for them.' They can have their gentlemen friends call on them in the kitchen any time, and they get just the same to eat as we do if there's any left over, and I practically never jump on them. Juanita Haydock rattled. They're ungrateful, all that class of people. I do think the domestic problem is simply becoming awful. I don't know what the country's coming to with these Scandahoofian clodhoppers demanding every cent you can save, and so ignorant and impertinent, and on my word demanding bathtubs and everything, as if they weren't mighty good and lucky at home if they got a bath in the wash tub. They were off, riding hard. Carol thought of B and waylaid them. But isn't it possibly the fault of the mistresses if the maids are ungrateful? For generations we've given them the leavings of food and holes to live in. I don't want to boast, but I must say I don't have much trouble with B. She's so friendly. The Scandinavians are sturdy and honest. Mrs. Dave Dyer snapped. Honest? 
Do you call it honest to hold us up for every cent of pay they can get? I can't say that I've had any of them steal anything, though you might call it stealing to eat so much that a roast of beef hardly lasts three days. But just the same, I don't intend to let them think they can put anything over on me. I always make them pack and unpack their trunks downstairs right under my eyes, and then I know they aren't being tempted to dishonesty by any slackness on my part. How much do the maids get here? Carol ventured. Mrs. B.J. Gougerling, wife of the banker, stated in a shocked manner, "'Any place from three fifty to five fifty a week. "'I know positively that Mrs. Clark, "'after swearing that she wouldn't weaken "'and encourage them and their outrageous demands, "'went and paid five fifty. "'Think of it! "'Practically a dollar a day for unskilled work, "'and, of course, her food and room "'and a chance to do her own washing "'right in with the rest of the wash. "'How much do you pay, Mrs. Kennicott?' "'Yes, how much do you pay?' "'insisted half a dozen. "'Why, I pay six a week,' she feebly confessed. They gasped. Juanita protested. Don't you think it's hard on the rest of us when you pay so much? Juanita's demand was reinforced by the universal glower. Carol was angry. I don't care. A maid has one of the hardest jobs on earth. She works from ten to eighteen hours a day. She has to watch slimy dishes and dirty clothes. She tends the children and runs to the door with wet chapped hands and... Mrs. Dave Dyer broke into Carol's prayer oration with a furious... "'That's all very well, but believe me, I do those things myself when I'm without a maid, "'and that's a good share of the time for a person that isn't willing to yield and pay exorbitant wages.' "'Carol was retorting. "'But a maid does it for strangers, and all she gets out of it is the pay.' "'Their eyes were hostile. Four of them were talking at once. "'Vida Sherwin's dictatorial voice cut through, took control of the revolution. "'Tut, tut, tut, tut! What angry passions, and what an idiotic discussion! "'All of you getting too serious. Stop it!' Carol Kennicott, you're probably right, but you're too much ahead of the times. One need to quit looking so belligerent. What is this, a card party or a hen fight? Carol, you stop admiring yourself as the Joan of Arc of the hired girls, or I'll spank you. You come over here and talk libraries with Ethel Villet. Boo! If there's any more pecking, I'll take charge of the hen roost myself. They all laughed artificially, and Carol obediently talked libraries. A small town bungalow the wives of a village doctor and a village dry-goods merchant, a provincial teacher, a colloquial brawl over paying a servant a dollar more a week. Yet this insignificance echoed cellar plots and cabinet meetings and labor conferences in Persia and Prussia, Rome and Boston, and the orators who deemed themselves international leaders were but the raised voices of a billion Juanitas denouncing a million carols, with a hundred thousand Vida Sherwins trying to shoo away the storm. Carol felt guilty. She devoted herself to admiring the spinsterish Miss Villay, and immediately committed another offense against the laws of decency. "'We haven't seen you at the library yet,' Miss Villay reproved. "'Oh, I've wanted to run in so much, but I've been getting settled, and I'll probably come in so often you'll get tired of me. I hear you have such a nice library.' "'There are many who like it. We have two thousand more books than walk em in "'Isn't that fine? I'm sure you are largely responsible.' I've had some experience in St. Paul. So I have been informed, not that I entirely approve of library methods in these large cities, so careless, letting tramps and all sorts of dirty persons practically sleep in the reading rooms. I know, but the poor souls... Well, I'm sure you will agree with me in one thing. The chief task of a librarian is to get people to read. You feel so? My feeling, Mrs. Kennicott, and I am merely quoting the librarian of a very large college, is that the first duty of the conscientious librarian is to preserve the books. Oh! Carol repented her. Oh! Miss Belay stiffened and attacked. It may be all very well in cities where they have unlimited funds to let nasty children ruin books and just deliberately tear them up, and fresh young men take more books out than they are entitled by the regulations, but I'm never going to permit it in this library. What if some children are destructive? They learn to read. Books are cheaper than mines. Nothing is cheaper than the minds of some of these children that come in and bother me simply because their mothers don't keep them home where they belong. Some librarians may choose to be so wishy-washy and turn their libraries into nursing homes and kindergartens, but as long as I'm in charge, the Gopher Prairie Library is going to be quiet and decent and the books well kept. Carol saw that the others were listening waiting for her to be objectionable. She flinched before the dislike. 
she hastened to smile in agreement with Miss Villay, to glance publicly at her wristwatch, to warble that it was so late, have to hurry home, husband, such nice party, maybe you were right about maids, prejudiced because be so nice, such perfectly divine angel's food cake. Mrs. Haydock must give me the recipe. Goodbye, such happy party. She walked home. She reflected. It was my fault. I was touchy, and I opposed them so much, only... I can't. I can't be one of them if I must damn all the maids toiling in filthy kitchens, all the ragged, hungry children, and these women ought to be my arbiters the rest of my life. She ignored B's call from the kitchen. She ran upstairs to the unfrequented guest room. She wept in terror, her body a pale arc as she knelt beside a cumbrous black walnut bed, beside a puffy mattress covered with a red quilt in a shuttered and airless room. The End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Don't I, in looking for things to do, show that I'm not attentive enough to Will? Am I impressed enough by his work? I will be. Oh, I will be. If I can't be one of the town, if I must be an outcast. When Kennicott came home, she bustled. Dear, you must tell me a lot more about your cases. I want to know. I, I want to understand. Sure, you bet. And he went down to fix the furnace. At supper, she asked, For instance, what did you do today? Do today? Uh, how do you mean? Medically. I want to understand. Today? Oh, well, there wasn't much of anything. A couple of chumps with belly aches and a sprained wrist and a fool woman that thinks she wants to kill herself because her husband doesn't like her and, uh, well, just routine work. But the unhappy woman doesn't sound routine. Her? Just case of nerves. You can't do much with these marriage mix-ups. But, dear, please, will you tell me about the next case that you do think is interesting? Sure, you bet. Tell you about anything that... Say, that's pretty good salmon. Get it at Howland's? Four days after the Jolly Seventeen debacle, Vida Sherwin called and casually blew Carol's world to pieces. "'May I come in and gossip a while?' she said, with such excess of bright innocence that Carol was uneasy. Vida took off her furs with a bounce, and she sat down as though it were a gymnasium exercise she flung out. "'Feels disgracefully good, this weather. Raymond Wotherspoon says if he had my energy he'd be a grand opera singer.' I always think this climate is the finest in the world, and my friends are the dearest people in the world, and my work is the most essential thing in the world. Probably I fool myself, but I know one thing for certain. You're the pluckiest little idiot in the world. And so you're about to flay me alive. Carol was cheerful about it. Am I? Perhaps. I've been wondering. I know that the third party to a squabble is often the most to blame, the one who runs between A and B, having a beautiful time telling each of them what the other has said. "'but I want you to take a big part in vitalizing Gopher Prairie, "'and so, such a very unique opportunity, and am I silly? "'I know what you mean. "'I was too abrupt at the Jolly Seventeen. "'My dear, I always feel as though I walked around in a cloud "'looking out at others but not being seen. "'I feel so inconspicuous and so normal, "'so normal that there's nothing about me to discuss. "'I can't realize that Mr. and Mrs. Haydock must gossip about me.' Carol was working up a small passion of distaste. And I don't think like it. It makes me crawly to think of their daring to talk over all I do and say, pawing me over. I resent it. I hate... Wait, child. Perhaps they resent some things in you. I want you to try and be impersonal. They'd paw over anybody who came in new. Didn't you, with newcomers in college? Yes. Well, then, will you be impersonal? I'm paying you the compliment of supposing that you can be. I want you to be big enough to help me make this town worthwhile. I'll be as impersonal as cold-boiled potatoes. Not that I shall ever be able to help you make the town worthwhile. What do they say about me? Really, I want to know. Of course, the illiterate ones resent your references to anything farther away than Minneapolis. They're so suspicious. That's it, suspicious. And some think you dress too well. Oh, they do, do they? Shall I dress in gunny sacking to suit them? Please, are you going to be a baby? I'll be good, sulkily. You certainly will, or I won't tell you one single thing. You must understand this. I'm not asking you to change yourself, just want you to know what they think. You must do that, no matter how absurd their prejudices are, if you're going to handle them. Is it your ambition to make this a better town, or isn't it? I don't know whether it is or not. Why, why, oh, tut-tut, now, of course it is. Why, I depend on you. You're a born reformer. I am not. 
not anymore. Of course you are. Oh, if I really could help. So they think I'm affected? My lamb, they do. Now, don't say they're nervy. After all, Gopher Prairie standards are as reasonable to Gopher Prairie as Lakeshore Drive standards are to Chicago. And there's more Gopher Prairies than there are Chicago's or London's. And I'll tell you the whole story. They think you're showing off when you say American instead of American. They think you're too frivolous. Life's so serious to them that they can't imagine any kind of laughter except Juanita's snortling. Ethel Villay was sure you were patronizing her when... Oh, I was not. You talked about encouraging reading. And Mrs. Elder thought you were patronizing when you said she had such a pretty little car. And she thinks it's an enormous car. And some of the merchants say you're too flip when you talk to them in the store. And poor me when I was trying to be friendly. Every housewife in town is doubtful about your being so chummy with your bee... All right to be kind, but they say you act as though she were your cousin. Wait now, there's plenty more, and they think you are eccentric in furnishing this room. They think the broad couch and that Japanese dingus are absurd. Wait, I, I know they're silly, and I guess I've heard a dozen criticize you because you don't go to church oftener, and I can't stand it. I can't bear to realize that they've been saying all these things while I've been going about so happily and liking them. I wonder if you ought to have told me. It will make me self-conscious." I wonder the same thing. Only answer I can get is the old saw about knowledge being power. And some day you'll see how absorbing it is to have power, even here, to control the town. Oh, I'm a crank. But I do like to see things moving. It hurts. It makes these people seem so beastly and treacherous when I've been perfectly natural with them. But let's have it all. What do they say about my Chinese housewarming party? Why, um, go on or I'll make up worse things than anything you can tell me. They did enjoy it, but I guess some of them felt you were showing off, pretending that your husband is richer than he is. I can't... Their meanness of mind is beyond any horrors I could imagine. They really thought that I... And you want to reform people like that when dynamite is so cheap? Who dared to say that, the rich or the poor? Fairly well assorted. Can't they at least understand me well enough to see that Though I might be affected and culturine, at least I simply couldn't commit that other kind of vulgarity. If they must know, you may tell them with my compliments that Will makes about 4000 a year and the party cost half of what they probably thought it did. Chinese things are not very expensive, and I made my own costume. Stop it. Stop beating me. I know all that. What they meant was they felt you were starting dangerous competition by giving a party such as most people here can't afford. 4000 is a pretty big income for this town. I never thought of starting competition. Will you believe that it was in all love and friendliness that I tried to give them the gayest party I could? It was foolish. It was childish and noisy. But I did mean it so well. I know, of course, and it certainly is unfair of them to make fun of your having that Chinese food. Chow men, was it? Uh, and to laugh about your wearing those pretty trousers. Carol sprang up, whimpering. Oh, they didn't do that. They didn't poke fun at my feast that I ordered so carefully for them and my little Chinese costume that I was so happy making, I made it secretly to surprise them. And they've been ridiculing it all this while? She was huddled on the couch. Vida was stroking her hair, muttering, I shouldn't... Shrouded in shame, Carol did not know when Vida slipped away. The clock's bell at half-past five aroused her. I must get hold of myself before Will comes. I hope he never knows what a fool his wife is. Frozen, sneering, horrible hearts... Like a very small, very lonely girl, she trudged upstairs, slow, step by step, her feet dragging, her hand on the rail. It was not her husband to whom she wanted to run for protection. It was her father, her smiling, understanding father, dead these twelve years. Kennicott was yawning, stretched in the largest chair between the radiator and a small kerosene stove. Cautiously. Will, dear... I wonder if the people here don't criticize me sometimes. They must. I mean, if they ever do, you mustn't let it bother you. Criticize you? Uh, Lord, I should say not. They all keep telling me you're the swellest girl they ever saw. Well, I've just fancied. The merchants probably think I'm too fussy about shopping. I'm afraid I bore Mr. Dashaway and Mr. Howland and Mr. Lulumeyer. I can tell you how that is. I didn't want to speak of it, but since you brought it up, Chet Dashway probably resents the fact that you got this new furniture down in the cities instead of here. 
I didn't want to raise any objections at the time, but after all, I make my money here, and they naturally expect me to spend it here. If Mr. Dashway will kindly tell me how any civilized person can furnish a room out of the mortuary pieces that he calls... She remembered. She said meekly, But I understand. And Howland and Lulumire, oh, you've probably handed them a few roasts for the bum stocks they carry when you just meant to jolly them. But rats, what do we care? This is an independent town, not like these eastern holes where you have to watch your step all the time and live up to full demands and social customs, and a lot of old tabbies always busy criticizing. Everybody's free here to do what he wants to. He said it with a flourish, and Carol perceived that he believed it. She turned her breath of fury into a yawn. By the way, Carrie, while we're talking of this, of course, I like to keep independent, and I don't believe in this business of binding yourself to trade with the man that trades with you, unless you really want to. But, same time, I'd be just as happy if you dealt with Jensen or Ludelmeyer as much as you can, instead of Howland and Gould, who go to Dr. Gould every last time, and the whole tribe of them the same way. I don't see why I should be paying out my good money for groceries and having them pass it on to Terry Gould. I've gone to Howland and Gould because they're better and cleaner. I know. Uh, I don't mean to cut them out entirely. Of course, Jensen is tricky, give you short weight, and Ludelmeyer is a shiftless old Dutch hog. But same time, I mean, let's keep the trade in the family whenever it is convenient. See how I mean? I see. Well, I uh, guess it's about time to turn in. He yawned, went out to look at the thermometer, slammed the door, patted her head, unbuttoned his waistcoat, yawned, wound the clock, went down to look at the furnace, yawned, and clumped upstairs to bed, casually scratching his thick woolen undershirt. Till he bawled, "'Aren't you ever coming up to bed?' she sat, unmoving. The End of Chapter 8 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 9 she had tripped into the meadow to teach the lambs a pretty educational dance and found that the lambs were wolves. There was no way out between their pressing gray shoulders. She was surrounded by fangs and sneering eyes. She could not go on enduring the hidden derision. She wanted to flee. She wanted to hide in the generous indifference of cities. She practiced saying to Kennicott, Think perhaps I'll run down to St. Paul for a few days. But she could not trust herself to say it carelessly, could not abide his certain questioning. Reform the town. All she wanted was to be tolerated. She could not look directly at people. She flushed and winced before citizens who a week ago had been amusing objects of study, and in their good mornings she heard a cruel sniggering. She encountered Juanita Haydock at Ole Jensen's grocery. She besought, Oh, how do you do? Heavens, what beautiful celery that is. Yes, doesn't it look fresh? Harry simply has to have his celery on Sunday, drat the man. Carol hastened out of the shop exulting. She didn't make fun of me, did she? In a week she had recovered from consciousness of insecurity, of shame and whispering notoriety, but she kept her habit of avoiding people. She walked the streets with her head down. When she spied Mrs. McGannum or Mrs. Dyer ahead, she crossed over with an elaborate pretense of looking at a billboard. Always she was acting for the benefit of everyone she saw, and for the benefit of the ambushed, leering eyes which she did not see. She perceived that Vida Sherwin had told the truth. Whether she entered a store or swept the back porch, or stood at the bay window in the living room, the village peeped at her. Once she had swung along the street, triumphant in making a home. Now she glanced at each house and felt, when she was safely home, that she had won past a thousand enemies armed with ridicule. She told herself that her sensitiveness was preposterous, but daily she was thrown into panic. She saw a curtain slide back into innocent smoothness. Old women who had been entering their houses slipped out again to stare at her. In the wintry quiet, she could hear them tiptoeing on their porches. When she had for a blessed hour forgotten the searchlight, when she was scampering through a chill dusk, happy in yellow windows against gray night, her heart checked as she realized that a head covered with a shawl was thrust up over a snow-tipped bush to watch her. She admitted that she was taking herself too seriously, that villagers gape at everyone. She became placid and thought well of her philosophy. But next morning she had a shock of shame as she entered Ludelmeyer's. The grocer, his clerk, and neurotic Mrs. Dave Dyer had been giggling about something. They halted, looked embarrassed, babbled about onions. Carol felt guilty. That evening when Kennicott took her to call on the crotchety Lyman Casses, their hosts seemed flustered at their arrival. Kennicott jovially hooted, "'What makes you so hangdog, Lim?' The Casses tittered feebly. 
Except Dave Dyer, Sam Clark, and Ramey Wotherspoon, there were no merchants of whose welcome Carol was certain. She knew that she read mockery into greetings, but she could not control her suspicion, could not rise from her psychic collapse. She alternately raged and flinched at the superiority of the merchants. They did not know that they were being rude, but they meant to have it understood that they were prosperous and not scared of no doctor's wife. They often said, one man's as good as another and a darn sight better. This motto, however, they did not commend to farmer customers who had crop failures. The Yankee merchants were crabbed, and Ole Jensen, Lulumeyer, and Gus Dahl from the old country wished to be taken for Yankees. James Madison Howland, born in New Hampshire, and Ole Jensen, born in Sweden, both proved that they were free American citizens by grunting, I don't know whether I got any or not. Or, well, you can't expect me to get it delivered by noon. It was good form for the customers to fight back. Juanita Haydock cheerfully jabbered, You have it there by twelve, or I'll snatch that fresh delivery boy bald-headed. But Carol had never been able to play the game of friendly rudeness, and now she was certain that she never would learn it. She formed the cowardly habit of going to Axel Eggs. Axel was not respectable and rude. He was still a foreigner, and he expected to remain one. His manner was heavy and uninterrogative. His establishment was more fantastic than any crossroads store. No one save Axel himself could find anything. A part of the assortment of children's stockings was under a blanket on a shelf, a part in a tin ginger snap box, the rest heaped like a nest of black cotton snakes upon a flour barrel which was surrounded by brooms, Norwegian Bibles, dried cod for ludfisk, boxes of apricots, and a pair and a half of lumberman's rubber-footed boots. The place was crowded with Scandinavian farm wives, standing aloof in shawls and ancient fawn-colored leg of mutton jackets, awaiting the return of their lords. They spoke Norwegian or Swedish, and looked at Carol uncomprehendingly. They were a relief to her. They were not whispering that she was a poseur. But what she told herself was that Axel Eggs was so picturesque and romantic. It was in the matter of clothes that she was most self-conscious. When she dared to go shopping in her new checked suit with the black embroidered sulfur collar, she had as good as invited all of Gopher Prairie, which interested itself in nothing so intimately as in new clothes and the cost thereof, to investigate her. It was a smart suit with lines unfamiliar to the dragging yellow and pink frocks of the town. The widow Bogart's stare from her porch indicated, Well, I never saw anything like that before. Mrs. Beganham stopped Carol at the notions shop to hint, My, that's a nice suit. Wasn't it terribly expensive? The gang of boys in front of the store commented, Hey, Pudgy, play a game of checkers on that dress. Carol could not endure it. She drew her fur coat over the suit and hastily fastened the buttons while the boys snickered. No group angered her quite so much as these staring young roués. She had tried to convince herself that the village, with its fresh air, its lakes for fishing and swimming, was healthier than the artificial city. But she was sickened by glimpses of the gang of boys from fourteen to twenty who loafed before Dyer's drugstore, smoking cigarettes, displaying fancy shoes and purple ties and coats of diamond-shaped buttons, whistling the hoochie-coochie and catcalling, Oh, you baby doll, at every passing girl. She saw them playing pool in the stinking room behind Del Snafflin's barbershop and shaking dice in the smokehouse, and gathered in a snickering knot to listen to the juicy stories of Bert Tybee, the bartender of the Minnie Mashie house. She heard them smacking moist lips over every love scene at the Rosebud Movie Palace. At the counter of the Greek confectionery parlor, while they ate dreadful messes of decayed bananas, acid cherries, whipped cream, and gelatinous ice cream, they screamed to one another, Hey, let me alone. Quit, doggone. You. Hey, look uh, what you went and done. You almost spilled my glass swatter. Like hell I did. Hey, gall down your hide. Don't you go sticking your coffin nail in my ice cream. Oh, you batty. How'd you like dancing with Tilly McGuire last night? Some squeezing, huh, kid? By diligent consultation of American fiction, she discovered that this was the only virile and amusing manner in which boys could function that boys who were not compounded of the gutter and the mining camp were mollycoddles and unhappy. She had taken this for granted. She had studied the boys pityingly, but impersonally. It had not occurred to her that they might touch her. Now she was aware that they knew all about her, that they were waiting for some affectation over which they could guffaw. No schoolgirl passed their observation posts more flushingly than did Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. In shame, she knew that they glanced appraisingly at her snowy overshoes, speculating about her legs. Theirs were not young eyes. There was no youth in all the town, she agonized. They were born old, grim, 
and old, and spying, and old, and censorious. She cried again that their youth was senile and cruel on the day when she overheard Cy Bogart and Earl Haydock. Cyrus N. Bogart, son of the righteous widow who lived across the alley, was at this time a boy of fourteen or fifteen. Carol had already seen quite enough of Cy Bogart. On her first evening in Gopher Prairie, Cy had appeared at the head of a chivalry, banging immensely upon a discarded automobile fender. His companions were yelping in imitation of coyotes. Kennicott had felt rather complimented, had gone out and distributed a dollar. But Cy was a capitalist in chivalries. He returned with an entirely new group, and this time there were three automobile fenders and a carnival rattle. When Kennicott again interrupted his shaving, Cy piped, "'Nah, you gotta give us two dollars,' and he got it. A week later, Cy rigged a tic-tac to a window of the living room, and the tattoo out of the darkness frightened Carol into screaming. Since then, in four months, she had beheld Cy hanging a cat, stealing melons, throwing tomatoes at the Kennicott house, and making ski tracks across the lawn, and had heard him explaining the mysteries of generation with great audibility and dismaying knowledge. He was, in fact, a museum specimen of what a small town, a well-disciplined public school, a tradition of hearty humor, and a pious mother could produce from the material of a courageous and ingenious mind. Carol was afraid of him. Far from protesting when he set his mongrel on a kitten, she worked hard at not seeing him. The Kennicott garage was a shed littered with paint cans, tools, a lawnmower, and ancient wisps of hay. Above it was a loft which Cy Bogart and Earl Haydock, young brother of Harry, used as a den for smoking, hiding from whippings, and planning secret societies. They climbed to it by a ladder on the alley side of the shed. This morning of late January, two or three weeks after Vida's revelations, Carol had gone into the stable garage to find a hammer. Snow softened her step. She heard voices in the loft above her. Ah, oh, gee, Les. Oh, let's go down the lake and swipe some mush rats out of somebody's traps. Sigh was yawning. And get our ears beat off, grumbled Earl Haydock. Gosh, these cigarettes are dandy. Remember when we were just kids and used to smoke corn silk and hayseed? Yep, gosh. Spit. Silence. Say, Earl, Ma says if you chew tobacco, you get consumption. Ah, oh, rats, your old lady is a crank. Yeah, that's so. Pause. But she says she knows the fellow that did. Ah, oh, gee whiz, didn't Doc Kennicott used to chew tobacco all the time before he married this here girl from the cities? He used to spit. Gee, some shot. He could hit a tree ten feet off. This was news to the girl from the cities. Say, how is she? continued Earl. Huh? How's who? You know who I mean. Smarty. A tussle. A thumping of loose boards. Silence. Weary narration from Cy. Mrs. Kennicott? Well, she's all right, I guess. Relief to Carol below. She gave me a hunk of cake one time, but Ma says she's stuck up as hell. Ma's always talking about her. Ma says if Mrs. Kennicott thought as much about the doc as she does about her clothes, the doc wouldn't look so peaked. Spit. Silence. Yeah, Juanita's always talking about her, too. From Earl. She says Mrs. Kennicott thinks she knows it all. Juanita says she has to laugh till she almost busts every time she sees Mrs. Kennicott parading along the street with that take-a-look-I'm-a-swell skirt way she's got. But gosh, I don't pay no attention to Juanita. She's meaner than a crab. Ma was telling somebody that she heard that Mrs. Kennicott claimed she made forty dollars a week when she was on some job in the cities, and Ma says she knows positively that she never made but eighteen a week. Ma says that when she's lived here a while, she won't go around making a fool of herself pulling that big-headed stuff on folks that know a whole lot more than she does. They're all laughing up their sleeves at her. Say, did you ever notice how Mrs. Kennicott fusses around the house? Other evening, when I was coming over here, she'd forgot to pull down the curtain, and I watched her for ten minutes. Jeez, you'd have died of laughing. She was there all alone, and she must have spent five minutes getting the picture straight. It was funny as hell the way she'd stick out her finger to straighten the picture. Deedle dee See my ton of little finger? Oh, my, ain't I cute? What a fine long tail my cat's got. But say, Earl, she's some good looker, just the same. And, oh, Ignatz, the glad rags she must have bought for her wedding. Did you ever notice these low-cut dresses and these thin shimmy shirts she wears? I had a good squint at them when they were out on the line with the wash. And some ankles she's got, huh? Then Carol fled. In her innocence, she had not known that the whole town could discuss even her garments, her body. She felt that she was being dragged naked down Main Street. The moment it was dusk, she pulled down the window shades, all the shades flush with the sill, but beyond them she felt moist, 
fleering eyes. She remembered and tried to forget, and remembered more sharply, the vulgar detail of her husband's having observed the ancient customs of the land by chewing tobacco. She would have preferred a prettier vice, gambling or a mistress. For these she might have found a luxury of forgiveness. She could not remember any fascinatingly wicked hero of fiction who chewed tobacco. She asserted that it proved him to be a man of the bold free West. She tried to align him with the hairy-chested heroes of the motion pictures. She curled on the couch, a pallid softness in the twilight, and fought herself, and lost the battle. Spitting did not identify him with rangers riding the buttes. It merely bound him to go for prairie, to Nat Hicks the tailor and Bert Tybee the bartender. But he gave it up for me. Oh, what does it matter? We're all filthy in some things. I think of myself as so superior, but I do eat and digest. I do wash my dirty paws and scratch. I'm not a cool, slim goddess on a column. There aren't any. He gave it up for me. He stands by me, believing that everyone loves me. He's the rock of ages in a storm of meanness that's driving me mad. It will drive me mad. All evening she sang Scotch ballads to Kennicott, and when she noticed that he was chewing an unlighted cigar, she smiled maternally at his secret. She could not escape asking, in the exact words and mental intonations which a thousand million women, dairy wenches and mischief-making queens, had used before her, and which a million million women will know hereafter. Was it all a horrible mistake, my marrying him? She quieted the doubt without answering it. Kennicott had taken her north to Lac Rimer in the big woods. It was the entrance to a Chippewa Indian reservation, a sandy settlement among Norway pines on the shore of a huge, snow-glaring lake. She had her first sight of his mother, except the glimpse at the wedding. Mrs. Kennicott had a hushed and delicate breeding which dignified her woodeny, overscrubbed cottage with its worn, hard cushions and heavy rockers. She had never lost the child's miraculous power of wonder. She asked questions about books and cities. She murmured, "'Will is a dear, hard-working boy, but he's inclined to be too serious, and you've taught him how to play. Last night I heard you both laughing about the old Indian basket-seller, and I just lay in bed and enjoyed your happiness.' Carol forgot her misery hunting in this solidarity of family life. She could depend upon them. She was not battling alone. Watching Mrs. Kennicott flit about the kitchen, she was better able to translate Kennicott himself. He was matter-of-fact, yes, and incurably mature. He didn't really play. He let Carol play with him. But he had his mother's genius for trusting, her disdain for prying, her sure integrity. From the two days at Lac Rimer, Carol drew confidence in herself, and she returned to Gopher Prairie in a throbbing calm like those golden-drugged seconds when, because he is for an instant free from pain, a sick man revels in living. A bright hot winter day, the wind shrill, black and silver clouds booming across the sky, everything in panicky motion during the brief light. They struggled against the surf of wind through deep snow. Kennicott was cheerful. He held Lauren Wheeler. "'Behave yourself while I've been away!' The editor bellowed, "'But gosh, you stayed so long that all your patients have got well!' and importantly took notes for the Dauntless about their journey. Jackson Elder cried, "'Hey, folks, how's tricks up north?' Mrs. McGannum waved to them from her porch. "'They're glad to see us. We mean something here. These people are satisfied. Why can't I be? But can I sit back all my life and be satisfied with, "'Hey, folks, they want shouts on Main Street, and I want violins in a paneled room. Why?' Vida Sherwin ran in after school a dozen times. She was tactful, torrentially anecdotal. She had scuttled about town and plucked compliments. Mrs. Dr. Westlake had pronounced Carol a very sweet, bright, cultured young woman, and Brad Bemis, the tinsmith at Clark's hardware store, had declared that she was easy to work for and awfully easy to look at. But Carol could not yet take her in. She resented this outsider's knowledge of her shame. Vida was not too long tolerant. She hinted, "'You're a great brooder, child. Buck up now. "'The town's quit criticizing you almost entirely. "'Come with me to the Thanatopsis Club. "'They have some of the best papers and current events discussions. "'So interesting.' "'In Vida's demands, Carol felt a compulsion, "'but she was too listless to obey. "'It was B. Sorensen who was really her confidant. "'However charitable toward the lower classes she may have thought herself, "'Carol had been reared to assume that servants belonged "'to a distinct and inferior species.' but she discovered that B was extraordinarily like girls she had loved in college, and as a companion altogether superior to the young matrons of the Jolly Seventeen. Daily, 
they became, more frankly, two girls playing at housework. B. artlessly considered Carol the most beautiful and accomplished lady in the country. She was always shrieking, My, that's a swell hat! Or, I think all these ladies just die when they see how elegant you do your hair. But it was not the humbleness of a servant, nor the hypocrisy of a slave. It was the admiration of freshmen for junior. They made out the day's menus together. Though they began with propriety, Carol sitting by the kitchen table and B at the sink or blacking the stove, the conference was likely to end with both of them by the table while B gurgled over the ice man's attempt to kiss her, or Carol admitted, Everybody knows that the doctor is lots more clever than Dr. McGannum. When Carol came in from marketing, B plunged into the hall to take off her coat, rub her frosted hands, and ask, Was there lots of folks uptown today? This was the welcome upon which Carol depended. Through her weeks of cowering, there was no change in her surface life. No one save Vida was aware of her agonizing. On her most despairing days, she chatted to women on the street, in stores. But without the protection of Kennicott's presence, she did not go to the Jolly Seventeen. She delivered herself to the judgment of the town only when she went shopping, and on the ritualistic occasions of formal afternoon calls, when Mrs. Lyman Cass or Mrs. George Edwin Mott, with clean gloves and minute handkerchiefs and sealskin card cases and countenances of frozen approbation, sat on the edges of chairs and inquired, "'Do you find Gopher Prairie pleasing?' When they spent evenings of social profit and loss at the Haydocks or the Dyers, she hid behind Kennicott, playing the simple bride. Now she was unprotected. Kennicott had taken a patient to Rochester for an operation. He would be away for two or three days. She had not minded. She would loosen the matrimonial tension and be a fanciful girl for a time. But now that he was gone, the house was listeningly empty. B was out this afternoon, presumably drinking coffee and talking about fellows with her cousin Tina. It was the day for the monthly supper and evening bridge of the Jolly Seventeen. But Carol dared not go. She sat alone. The end of chapter 9. Chapter 10. The house was haunted long before evening. Shadows slipped down the walls and waited behind every chair. Did that door move? No. She wouldn't go to the Jolly Seventeen. She hadn't energy enough to caper before them to smile blandly at Juanita's rudeness. Not today. But she did want a party. Now. If someone would come in this afternoon, someone who liked her, Vida, or Mrs. Sam Clark, or old Mrs. Champ Perry, or gentle Mrs. Dr. Westlake, or Guy Pollock, she'd telephone... No, that wouldn't be it. They must come of themselves. Perhaps they would. Why not? She'd have tea ready anyway. If they came, splendid. If not, what did she care? She wasn't going to yield to the village and let down. She was going to keep up a belief in the right of tea, to which she had always looked forward to as the symbol of a leisurely, fine existence. And it would be just as much fun, even if it was so babyish, to have tea by herself and pretend that she was entertaining clever men. It would. She turned the shining thought into action. She bustled to the kitchen, stoked the wood range, sang Schumann while she boiled the kettle, warmed up raisin cookies on a newspaper spread on the rack in the oven. She scampered upstairs to bring down her filmiest tea cloth. She arranged a silver tray. She proudly carried it into the living room and set it on the long cherrywood table, pushing aside a hoop of embroidery, a volume of Conrad from the library, copies of the Saturday Evening Post, the Literary Digest, and Kennicott's National Geographic magazine. She moved the tray back and forth and regarded the effect. She shook her head. She busily unfolded the sewing table, set it in the bay window, patted the tea cloth to smoothness, moved the tray. "'Sometime I'll have a mahogany tea-table,' she said happily. She had brought in two cups, two plates, for herself a straight chair, but for the guest the big wing chair, which she pantingly tugged to the table. She had finished all the preparations she could think of. She sat and waited. She listened for the doorbell, the telephone. Her eagerness was stilled. Her hands drooped. Surely Vida Sherwin would hear the summons. She glanced through the bay window. Snow was sifting over the ridge of the Howland house like sprays of water from a hose. The wide yards across the street were grey with moving eddies. The black trees shivered. The roadway was gashed with ruts of ice. She looked at the extra cup and plate. She looked at the wing chair. It was so empty. The tea was cold in the pot. With wearily dipping fingertip, she tested it. Yes, quite cold. She couldn't wait any longer. The cup across from her was icily clean, glisteningly empty. 
Simply absurd to wait. She poured her own cup of tea. She sat and stared at it. What was it she was going to do now? Oh, yes, how idiotic. Take a lump of sugar. She didn't want the beastly tea. She was springing up. She was on the couch, sobbing. She was thinking more sharply than she had for weeks. She reverted to her resolution to change the town, awaken it, prod it, reform it. What if they were wolves instead of lambs? They'd eat her all the sooner if she was meek to them, fight or be eaten. It was easier to change the town completely than to conciliate it. She could not take their point of view. It was a negative thing, an intellectual squalor, a swamp of prejudices and fears. She would have to make them take hers. She was not a Vincent de Paul to govern and mold a people. What of that? The tiniest change in their distrust of beauty would be the beginning of the end, a seed to sprout and some day with thickening roots to crack their wall of mediocrity. If she could not, as she desired, do a great thing nobly and with laughter, yet she need not be content with village nothingness. She would plant one seed in the blank wall. Was she just? Was it merely a blank wall, this town, which to three thousand more people was the center of the universe? Hadn't she, returning from Laquimere, felt the heartiness of the greetings? No. The ten thousand gopher prairies had no monopoly of greetings and friendly hands. Sam Clark was no more loyal than girl librarians she knew in St. Paul, the people she had met in Chicago. And those others had so much that Gopher Prairie complacently lacked, the world of gaiety and adventure of music and the integrity of bronze, of remembered mists from tropic isles and Paris nights and the walls of Baghdad, of industrial justice and a god who spake not in doggerel hymns. One seed. Which seed it was did not matter. All knowledge and freedom were one. But she had delayed so long in finding that seed. Could she do something with this Thanatopsis club? Or should she make her house so charming that it would be an influence? She'd make Kennicott like poetry. That was it, for a beginning. She conceived so clear a picture of their bending over large, fair pages by the fire, in a non-existent fireplace, that the spectral presences slipped away. Doors no longer moved. Curtains were not creeping shadows, but lovely, dark masses in the dusk. And when B came home, Carol was singing at the piano, which she had not touched for many days. Their supper was the feast of two girls. Carol was in the dining room in a frock of black satin edged with gold, and B in blue gingham and an apron dined in the kitchen. But the door was open between, and Carol was inquiring, "'Did you see any ducks in Doll's window?' And B chanting, "'No, ma'am. Say, we have a swell time this afternoon.' Tina, she have coffee and knucklebrod, and the fellow was there, and we just laughed and laughed, and the fellow say he was president, and he going to make me queen of Finland, and I stick a feather in my hair and say I been going to go to war. Oh, we was so foolish, and we laugh so. When Carol sat at the piano again, she did not think of her husband, but of the book-drugged hermit Guy Pollock. She wished that Pollock would come calling. If a girl really kissed him, he'd creep out of his den and be human. If Will were as literate as Guy, or Guy were as executive as Will, I think I could endure even Gopher Prairie. It's so hard to mother Will. I could be maternal with Guy. Is that what I want, something to mother, a man, or a baby, or a town? I will have a baby. Some day. But to have him isolated here all his receptive years. And so to bed. Have I found my real level in B and kitchen gossip? Oh, I do miss you, Will. But it will be pleasant to turn over in bed as often as I want to without worrying about waking you up. Am I really this settled thing called a married woman? I feel so unmarried tonight, so free, to think that there was once a Mrs. Kennicott who let herself worry over a town called Gopher Prairie when there was a whole world outside it. Of course, Will is going to like poetry. A black... February day. Clouds, hewn of ponderous timber, weighing down on the earth, an irresolute dropping of snow specks upon the trampled wastes. Gloom, but no veiling of angularity. The lines of roofs and sidewalks, sharp and inescapable. The second day of Kennicott's absence. She fled from the creepy house for a walk. It was thirty below zero, too cold to exhilarate her. In the spaces between houses the wind caught her. It stung. It gnawed at nose and ears and aching cheeks, and she hastened from shelter to shelter, catching her breath in the lee of a barn, grateful for the protection of a billboard covered with ragged posters showing layer under layer of paste-smeared green and streaky red. The grove of oaks at the end of the street suggested Indians hunting, 
snowshoes, and she struggled past the earth-banked cottages to the open country to a farm in a low hill corrugated with hard snow. In her loose nutria coat, sealed toque, virginal cheeks unmarked by lines of village jealousies, she was as out of place on this dreary hillside as a scarlet tanager on a nice flow. She looked down on Gopher Prairie. The snow, stretching without break from street to devouring prairie beyond, wiped out the town's pretense of being a shelter. The houses were black specks on a white sheet. Her heart shivered with that still loneliness as her body shivered with the wind. She ran back into the huddle of streets, all the while protesting that she wanted a city's yellow glare of shop windows and restaurants, or the primitive forest with hooded furs and a rifle, or a barnyard warm and steamy, noisy with hens and cattle. Certainly not these dun houses, these yards choked with winter ash piles, these roads of dirty snow and clotted, frozen mud. The zest of winter was gone. Three months more till May, the cold might drag on with the snow even filthier, the weakened body less resistant. She wondered why the good citizens insisted on adding the chill of prejudice, why they did not make the houses of their spirits more warm and frivolous, like the wise chatterers of Stockholm and Moscow. She circled the outskirts of the town and viewed the slum of Swede Hollow. Wherever as many as three houses are gathered, there will be a slum of at least one house. In Gopher Prairie, the Sam Clarks boasted, "'You don't get any of this poverty that you find in cities. Always plenty of work. No need of charity.' Man got to be blamed shiftless if he don't get ahead. But now that the summer mask of leaves and grass was gone, Carol discovered misery and dead hope. In a shack of thin boards covered with tar paper, she saw the washerwoman, Mrs. Steinoff, working in gray steam. Outside, her six-year-old boy chopped wood. He had a torn jacket, muffler of a blue-like skimmed milk. His hands were covered with red mittens, through which protruded his chapped raw knuckles. He halted to blow on them. "'to cry disinterestedly. "'A family of recently arrived Finns "'were camped in an abandoned stable. "'A man of eighty was picking up lumps of coal "'along the railroad. "'She did not know what to do about it. "'She felt that these independent citizens "'who had been taught that they belonged to a democracy "'would resent her trying to play Lady Bountiful. "'She lost her loneliness in the activity of the village industries. "'The railroad yards with a freight train switching the wheat elevator, oil tanks, a slaughterhouse with blood marks on the snow, the creamery with the sleds of farmers and piles of milk cans, an unexplained stone hut labeled Danger, powder stored here. The jolly tombstone yard, where a utilitarian sculptor in a red calfskin overcoat whistled as he hammered the shiniest of granite headstones. Jackson Elder's small planing mill, with the smell of fresh pine shavings and the burr of circular saws. Most important, the Gopher Prairie Flour and Milling Company. Lyman Cass, president. Its windows were blanketed with flower dust, but it was the most stirring spot in town. Workmen were wheeling barrels of flour into a boxcar. A farmer sitting on sacks of wheat in a bobsled argued with the wheat buyer. Machinery within the mill boomed and whined. Water gurgled in the ice-freed mill race. The clatter was a relief to Carol after months of smug houses. She wished that she could work in the mill, that she did not belong to the caste of professional man's wife. She started for home through the small slum. Before a tar-paper shack at a gateless gate, a man in rough brown dogskin coat and black plush cap with lappets was watching her. His square face was confident. His foxy mustache was picaresque. He stood erect, his hands in his side pockets, his pipe puffing slowly. He was forty-five or six, perhaps. "'How do, Mrs. Kennicott?' he drawled. She recalled him, the town handyman who had repaired their furnace at the beginning of winter. "'Oh, how do you do?' she fluttered. "'My name's Bjornstam, the Red Swede, they call me, remember? "'Always thought I'd kind of like to say howdy to you again.' Ye "'Yes, I've been exploring the outskirts of town.' "'Yup, fine mess. "'No sewage, no street cleaning, "'and the Lutheran minister and the priest "'represent the arts and sciences. "'Well, Thunder, we submerged tenth down here in Sweet Hollow "'are no worse off than you folks.' Thank God we don't have to go and purr at one at the haydock at the jolly old seventeen. The Carol, who regarded herself as completely adaptable, was uncomfortable at being chosen as comrade by a pipe-reeking odd-job man. Probably he was one of her husband's patients, but she must keep her dignity. Yes, even the jolly seventeen isn't always so exciting. It's very cold again today, isn't it? Well, Bjornstam was not respectfully valedictory. He showed no signs of pulling a forelock. His eyebrows moved as though they had a life of their own. With a subgrin, he went on. 
Maybe I hadn't ought to talk about Mrs. Haydock and her solemn collie seventeen in that fresh way. I suppose I'd be tickled to death if I was invited to sit in with that gang. I'm what they call a pariah, I guess. I'm the town bad man, Mrs. Kennicott, town atheist, and I suppose I must be an anarchist, too. Everybody who doesn't love the bankers and the grand old Republican Party is an anarchist. Carol had unconsciously slipped from her attitude of departure into an attitude of listening, her face full toward him, her muff lowered. She fumbled. Yes, I suppose so. Her own grudges came in a flood. I don't see why you shouldn't criticize the Jolly Seventeen if you want to. They aren't sacred. Oh, yes, they are. The dollar sign has chased the crucifix clean off the map, but then I've got no kick. I do what I please, and suppose I ought to let them do the same. What do you mean by saying you're a pariah? I'm poor, and yet I don't decently envy the rich. I'm an old batch. I make enough money for a stake, and then I sit round by myself and shake hands with myself, and have a smoke, and read history, and I don't contribute to the wealth of Brother Elder or Daddy Cass. You... I fancy you read a good deal. Yep, in the hit or miss way. I'll tell you, I'm a lone wolf. I trade horses and saw wood and work in lumber camps. I'm a first-rate swamper. Always wished I could go to college, though I suppose I'd find it pretty slow and they'd probably kick me out. You really are a curious person, Mr. Uh, Bjornstam, Miles Bjornstam, half Yank and half Swede, usually known as that damn lazy big mouth calamity howler that ain't satisfied with the way we run things. No, I ain't curious, whatever you mean by that. I'm just a bookworm. Probably too much reading for the amount of digestion I've got. Probably half-baked. I'm going to get in half-baked first and beat you to it, because it's dead sure to be handed to a radical that wears jeans. They grinned together. She demanded, You say that the Jolly Seventeen is stupid. What makes you think so? Oh, thrust us borers into the foundation to know about your leisure class. Fact, Mrs. Kennicott, I'll say that, far as I can make out, the only people in this man's town that do have any brains, I don't mean ledger-keeping brains or duck-hunting brains or baby-spanking brains, but real imaginative brains, are you and me and Guy Pollock and the foreman at the flour mill. He's a socialist, the foreman. Uh, don't tell Lim Cass that. Lim would fire a socialist quicker than he would a horse thief. Oh, indeed, no. I, I shan't tell him. This foreman and I have some great set-tos. He's a regular old-line party member, too dogmatic, expects to reform everything from deforestation to nosebleed by saying phrases like surplus value, like reading the prayer book. But same time, he's a Plato J. Aristotle compared with people like Ezri Stobody or Professor Mott or Julius Fleckerbaugh. It's interesting to hear about him. He dug his toe into a drift like a schoolboy. Rats, you mean I talk too much? Well, I do. When I get hold of somebody like you, you probably want to run along and keep your nose from freezing. Yes, I must go, I suppose. But tell me, why did you leave Miss Sherwin of the high school out of your list of the town intelligentsia? I guess maybe she does belong in it. From all I can hear, she's in everything and behind everything that looks like a reform, a lot more than most folks realize. She lets Mrs. Reverend Warren, the president of this here stand at Topps's club, think she's running the works, but Miss Sherwin is the secret boss and nags all the easy-going dames into doing something. But the way I figure it out, uh, you see, I'm not interested in these dinky reforms. Miss Sherwin's trying to repair the holes in this barnacle-covered ship of a town by keeping busy bailing out the water, and Pollock tries to repair it by reading poetry to the crew. Me, I want to yank it up on the ways and fire the poor bum of a shoemaker that built it so it sails crooked and have it rebuilt right from the keel up. Yes, that, that would be better. But I must run home. My poor nose is nearly frozen. Say, you'd better come in and get warm and see what an old batch's shack is like. She looked doubtfully at him, at the low shanty, the yard that was littered with cordwood, moldy planks, a hoopless wash tub. She was disquieted, but Bjornstam did not give her the opportunity to be delicate. He flung out his hand in a welcoming gesture which assumed that she was her own counsellor, that she was not a respectable married woman, but fully a human being. With a shaky... Well, just a moment to warm my nose. She glanced down the street to make sure that she was not spied on and bolted toward the shanty. She remained for one hour, and never had she known a more considerate host than the Red Swede. He had but one room, 
bare pine floor, small workbench, wall bunk with amazingly neat bed, frying pan and ash dippled coffee pot on the shelf behind the pot-bellied cannonball stove, backwards chairs, one constructed from half a barrel, one from a tilted plank, and a row of books incredibly assorted, Byron and Tennyson and Stevenson, a manual of gas engines, a book by Thorstein Veblen, and a spotty treatise on the care, feeding, diseases, and breeding of poultry and cattle. There was but one picture, a magazine-colored plate of a steep-roofed village in the Hartz Mountains, which suggested kobolds and maidens with golden hair. Bjornstam did not fuss over her. He suggested, "'Might throw open your coat and put your feet up on the box in front of the stove.' He tossed his dogskin coat into the bunk, lowered himself into the barrel chair, and droned on. "'Yeah, I'm probably a yahoo, but by gum I do keep my independence by doing odd jobs, and that's more than these polite cusses like the clerks in the banks do.' When I'm rude to some slob, it may be partly because I don't know better, and God knows I'm not no authority on trick forks and what pants you wear with a Prince Albert, but mostly it's because I mean something. I'm about the only man in Johnson County that remembers the joker in the Declaration of Independence about Americans being supposed to have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I meet old Ezra Stowbody on the street. He looks at me like he wants me to remember he's a high muck-a-muck and worth two hundred thousand dollars, and he says, Uh, Bjorn Quist. Bjorn stems my name, Ezra, I says. He knows my name all righty. Well, whatever your name is, he says, I understand you have a gasoline saw. I want you to come around and saw up four cords of maple for me. So you like my looks, eh? I says, kind of innocent. What difference does that make? "'Want you to saw that wood before Saturday,' he says, real sharp. "'Common workmen going and getting fresh with a fifth of a million dollars "'all walking round in a hand-me-down fur coat. "'Here's the difference it makes,' I says, just to devil him. "'How do you know I like your looks?' "'Maybe he didn't look sore. "'Nope,' I says, thinking it all over. "'I don't like your application for a loan. "'Take it to another bank, only there ain't any,' I says. "'And I walks off on him. "'Sure, probably I was surly and foolish,' but I figured there had to be one man in town independent enough to sass the banker. He hitched out of his chair, made coffee, gave Carol a cup and talked on, half defiant and half apologetic, half wistful for friendliness and half amused by her surprise at the discovery that there was a proletarian philosophy. At the door she hinted, Mr. Bjornstam, if you were I, would you worry when people thought you were affected? Huh? Kick him in the face. Say, if I were a seagull, and all over silver, think I'd care what the pack of dirty seals thought about my flying. It was not the wind at her back. It was the thrust of Bjornstam's scorn which carried her through town. She faced Juanita Haydock, cocked her head at Maud Dyer's brief nod, and came home to be radiant. She telephoned Vida Sherwin to run over this evening. She lustily played Tchaikovsky, the virile chords and echo of the red laughing philosopher of the tar paper shack. When she hinted to Vida, isn't there a man here who amuses himself by being irreverent to the village gods? Uh, Bjornstam, some such name? The reform leader said, Bjornstam? Oh, yes, uh, fixes things. He's awfully impertinent. Kennicott had returned at midnight. At breakfast he said four times that he had missed her every moment. On her way to market, Sam Clark hailed her. The top of the morning, day is. Going to stop and pass the time of day, met Sam O'Warmer, eh? What the doc's thermometer say it was? Say, you folks better come round and visit with us one of these evenings. Don't be so doggone proud stand by yourselves. Champ Perry, the pioneer wheat buyer at the elevator, stopped her in the post office, held her hand in his withered paws, peered at her with faded eyes, and chuckled. You are so fresh and blooming, my dear. Mother was saying the other day that a sight of you was better than a dose of medicine. In the Bonton store she found Guy Pollock tentatively buying a modest gray scarf. "'We haven't seen you for so long,' she said. "'Wouldn't you like to come in and play cribbage some evening?' As though he meant it, Pollock begged. "'May I? Really?' While she was purchasing two yards of malines, the vocal Ramey Wotherspoon tiptoed up to her, his long, sallow face bobbing, and he besought, "'You've just got to come back to my department and see a pair of patent leather slippers I set aside for you.' In a manner of more than sacerdotal reverence, he unlaced her boots— tucked her skirt about her ankles, slid on the slippers. She took them. "'You're a good salesman,' she said. "'Oh, I'm not a salesman at all, eh? Just like elegant things. All this is so inartistic. 
he indicated with a forlornly waving hand, the shelves of shoe boxes, the seat of thin wood perforated in rosettes, the display of shoe trees and tin boxes of blacking, the lithograph of a smirking young woman with cheery cheeks who proclaimed in the exalted poetry of advertising, My tootsies never got hep to what pedal perfection was till I got a pair of clever, classy Cleopatra shoes. But sometimes, Ramy sighed, there is a pair of dainty little shoes like these, and I set them aside for someone who will appreciate. When I saw these, I said right away, Wouldn't it be nice if they fitted Mrs. Kennicott, and I meant to speak to you first chance I had. I haven't forgotten our jolly talks at Mrs. Gurry's. That evening Guy Pollock came in, and, though Kennicott instantly impressed him into a cribbage game, Carol was happy again. She did not, in recovering something of her buoyancy, forget her determination to begin the liberalizing of Gopher Prairie by the easy and agreeable propaganda of teaching Kennicott to enjoy reading poetry in the lamplight. The campaign was delayed. Twice he suggested that they call on neighbors, once he was in the country. The fourth evening he yawned, pleasantly, stretched and inquired, "'Well, what do we do tonight? Shall we go to the movies?' "'I know exactly what we're going to do. Now, don't ask questions. Come and sit down by the table. There. Are you comfy? Lean back and forget you're a practical man, and listen to me.' It may be that she had been influenced by the managerial Vita Sherwin. Certainly she sounded as though she was selling culture. But she dropped it when she sat on the couch, her chin in her hands, a volume of Yeats on her knees, and read aloud. Instantly she was released from the homely comfort of a prairie town. She was in the world of lonely things, the flutter of twilight linnets, the aching call of gulls along a shore to which the netted foam crept out of darkness, the island of Angus, and the elder gods, and the eternal glories that never were, tall kings and women girdled with crusted gold, the woeful incessant chanting, and the... <laughs> coughed Dr. Kennicott. She stopped. She remembered that he was the sort of person who chewed tobacco. She glared while he uneasily petitioned. Uh, that's great stuff. Study it in college? I like poetry fine. James Whitcomb Riley and some of Longfellow, this uh, Hiawatha. Gosh, I wish I could appreciate that highbrow art stuff, but I guess I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks. With pity for his bewilderment and a certain desire to giggle, she consoled him. Then let's try some Tennyson. You've read him. Tennyson? Uh, you bet. Read him in school. Uh, there's that. Uh, uh, let there be no... Uh, Oh, what is it? A farewell when I put out to sea, but let the... Well, I, I don't remember all of it, but... Oh, sure. And there's that I met a little country boy who... Uh... Gee, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but uh, the chorus ends up, we are seven. Yes. Uh, well, uh, shall we try the idols of the king? They're so full of color. Go to it. Shoot. But he hastened to shelter himself behind a cigar. She was not transported to Camelot. She read with an eye cocked on him, and when she saw how much he was suffering, she ran to him, kissed his forehead, cried, "'You poor, forced tubros that wants to be a decent turnip. Now look here now, that ain't. Anyway, I shan't torture you any longer.' She could not quite give up. She read Kipling with a great deal of emphasis. "'There's a regiment a-coming down the Grand Trunk Road.' He tapped his foot to the rhythm. He looked normal and reassured, but when he complimented her, that was fine. I don't know but what you can elocute just as good as Ella Stowbody. She banged the book and suggested that they were not too late for the nine o'clock show at the movies. This was her last effort to harvest the April wind, to teach divine unhappiness by a correspondence course, to buy the lilies of Avalon and the sunsets of cocaine in tin cans at Ollie Jensen's grocery. But the fact is that at the motion pictures she discovered herself laughing as heartily as Kennicott at the humor of an actor who stuffed spaghetti down a woman's evening frock. For a second she loathed her laughter, mourned for the day when on her hill by the Mississippi she had walked the battlements with queens. But the celebrated cinema jester's conceit of dropping toads into a soup plate flung her into unwilling tittering, and the afterglow faded, the dead queens fled through darkness. She went to the Jolly Seventeen's afternoon bridge. She had learned the elements of the game from the Sam Clarks. She played quietly and reasonably badly. She had no opinions on anything more polemic than woolen union suits, a topic on which Mrs. Howland discoursed for five minutes. She smiled frequently and was the complete canary bird in her manner of thanking the hostess, Mrs. Dave Dyer. 
Her only anxious period was during the conference on husbands. The young matrons discussed the intimacies of domesticity with a frankness and a minuteness which dismayed Carol. Juanita Haydock communicated Harry's method of shaving and his interest in deer-shooting. Mrs. Gaugerling reported fully and with some irritation her husband's inappreciation of liver and bacon. Maud Dyer chronicled Dave's digestive disorders, quoted a recent bedtime controversy with him in regard to Christian science, socks, and the sewing of buttons upon vests, announced that she simply wasn't going to stand his always pawing girls when he went and got crazy jealous if a man just danced with her, and rather more than sketched Dave's variety of kisses. So meekly did Carol give attention, so obviously was she at last desirous of being one of them, that they looked on her fondly, and encouraged her to give such details of her honeymoon as might be of interest. She was embarrassed rather than resentful. She deliberately misunderstood. She talked of Kennicott's overshoes and medical ideals till they were thoroughly bored. They regarded her as agreeable, but green. Till the end she labored to satisfy the Inquisition. She bubbled at Juanita, the president of the club, that she wanted to entertain them. Only, she said, I don't know that I can give you any refreshments as nice as Mrs. Dyer's salad, or that simply delicious angel's food we had at your house, dear. Oh, fine. We need a hostess for the 17th of March. Wouldn't it be awfully original if you made it a St. Patrick's Day bridge? I'll be tickled to death to help you with it. I'm glad you've learned to play bridge. At first I didn't hardly know if you were going to like Gopher Prairie. Isn't it dandy that you've settled down to being homey with us? Maybe we aren't as highbrow as the cities, but we do have the daisiest times, and, oh, we go swimming in summer, and dances, and, oh, lots of good times. If folks will just take us as we are, I think we're a pretty good bunch. I'm sure of it. Thank you so much for the idea about having a St. Patrick's Day bridge. Oh, that's nothing. I always think the Jolly Seventeen are so good at original ideas. If you knew these other towns, uh, Wakamin and uh, Geralamon and all, you'd find out and realize that G.P. is the liveliest, smartest town in the state. Did you know that Percy Bresnahan, the famous auto manufacturer, came from here? And, yes, I think that a St. Patrick's Day party would be awfully cunning and original, and yet not too queer or freaky or anything. The end of chapter 10 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 11 She had often been invited to the weekly meetings of the Thanatopsis, the women's study club, but she had put it off. The Thanatopsis was, Vida Sherwin, promised. Such a cozy group, and yet it puts you in touch with all the intellectual thoughts that are going on everywhere. Early in March, Mrs. Westlake, wife of the veteran physician, marched into Carol's living room like an amiable old pussy, and suggested, "'My dear, you really must come to the Thanatopsis this afternoon. Mrs. Dawson is going to be leader, and the poor soul is frightened to death. She wanted me to get you to come. She says she's sure you will brighten up the meeting with your knowledge of books and writings. English poetry is our topic today, so shoo, uh, put on your coat.' "'English poetry? Really?' I'd love to go. I didn't realize you were reading poetry. Oh, we're not so slow. Mrs. Luke Dawson, wife of the richest man in town, gaped at them piteously when they appeared. Her expensive frock of beaver-colored satin with rows, plasters, and pendants of solemn brown beads was intended for a woman twice her size. She stood wringing her hands in front of nineteen folding chairs in her front parlor with its faded photograph of Minnehaha Falls in 1890, its colored enlargement of Mr. Dawson, its bulbous lamp painted with sepia cows and mountains, and standing on a mortuary marble column. She creaked. Oh, Mrs. Kennicott, I'm in such a fix, I'm supposed to lead the discussion, and I wondered, would you come and help? What poet do you take up today? demanded Carol in her library tone of... What book do you wish to take out? Why, the English ones. Not all of them. Why, yes. We're learning all of European literature this year. The club gets such a nice magazine, Culture Hints, and we follow its programs. Last year our subject was men and women of the Bible, and next year we'll probably take up furnishings and China. My, it does make a body hustle to keep up with all these new culture subjects, but it is improving, so will you help us with the discussion today? On her way over, Carol had decided to use the Thanatopsis as the tool with which to liberalize the town. She had immediately conceived enormous enthusiasm. She had chanted, These are the real people. When the housewives who bear the burdens are interested in poetry, it means something. I'll work with them, for them, anything. 
Her enthusiasm had become watery even before thirteen women resolutely removed their overshoes, sat down meatily, ate peppermints, dusted their fingers, folded their hands, composed their lower thoughts, and invited the naked muse of poetry to deliver her most improving message. They had greeted Carol affectionately, and she tried to be a daughter to them, but she felt insecure. Her chair was out in the open, exposed to their gaze, and it was a hard, slatted, quivery, slippery church parlor chair, likely to collapse publicly and without warning. It was impossible to sit on it without folding the hands and listening piously. She wanted to kick the chair and run. It would make a magnificent clatter. She saw that Vida Sherwin was watching her. She pinched her wrist as though she were a noisy child in church, and when she was decent and cramped again, she listened. Mrs. Dawson opened the meeting by sighing, "'I'm sure I'm glad to see you all here today, and I understand that the ladies have prepared a number of very interesting papers. This is such an interesting subject. The poets, they have been an inspiration for higher thought. In fact, wasn't it Reverend Benlick who said that some of the poets have been as much an inspiration as a good many of the ministers, and so we shall be glad to hear?' The poor lady smiled neurologically, panted with fright scrabbled about the small oak table to find her eyeglasses, and continued, "'We will first have the pleasure of hearing Mrs. Jensen on the subject, Shakespeare and Milton.' Mrs. Ollie Jensen said that Shakespeare was born in 1564 and died 1616. He lived in London, England, and in Stratford-on-Avon, which many American tourists loved to visit, a lovely town with many curios and old houses well worth examination.' Many people believe that Shakespeare was the greatest playwright who ever lived, also a fine poet. Not much was known about his life, but after all, that did not really make so much difference, because they loved to read his numerous plays, several of the best known of which she would now criticize. Perhaps the best known of his plays was The Merchant of Venice, having a beautiful love story and a fine appreciation of a woman's brains, which a woman's club, even those who do not care to commit themselves on the question of suffrage, ought to appreciate. Laughter. Mrs. Jensen was sure that she, for one, would love to be like Portia. The play was about a Jew named Shylock, and he didn't want his daughter to marry a Venice gentleman named Antonio. Mrs. Leonard Warren, a slender, grey, nervous woman, president of the Thanatopsis, and wife of the congregational pastor, reported the birth and death dates of Byron, Scott, Moore, Burns, and wound up Burns was quite a poor boy, and he did not enjoy the advantages we enjoy today, except for the advantages of the fine old Scotch Kirk, where he heard the word of God preached more fearlessly than even in the finest big brick churches in the big and so-called advanced cities of today. But he did not have our educational advantages, and Latin and the other treasures of the mind so richly strewn before the, alas, too oft times inattentive feet of our youth, who do not always sufficiently appreciate the privileges freely granted to every American boy, rich or poor. Burns had to work hard, and was sometimes led by evil companionship into low habits, but it is morally instructive to know that he was a good student and educated himself in striking contrast to the loose ways and so-called aristocratic society life of Lord Byron, on which I have just spoken. And certainly, though the lords and earls of his day may have looked down upon Burns as a humble person, many of us have greatly enjoyed his pieces about the mouse and other rustic subjects with their message of humble beauty. I am so sorry I have not got the time to quote some of them. Mrs. George Edwin Mott gave ten minutes to Tennyson and Browning. Mrs. Nat Hicks, a wry-faced, curiously sweet woman, so awed by her betters that Carol wanted to kiss her, completed the day's grim task by a paper on other poets. The other poets worthy of consideration were Coleridge, Wordsworth, Shelley, Gray, Mrs. Hemans, and Kipling. Miss Ella Stowbody obliged with a recital of The Recessional and extracts from Lala Rook. By request, she gave an old sweetheart of mine as an encore. Gopher Prairie had finished the poets. It was ready for the next week's labor, English fiction and essays. Mrs. Dawson besought, Now we will have a discussion of the papers, and I am sure we shall all enjoy hearing from one who we hope to have as a new member, Mrs. Kennicott, who 
with her splendid literary training and all should be able to give us many pointers and many uh, helpful pointers. Carol had warned herself not to be so beastly supercilious. She had insisted that in the belated quest of these work-stained women was an aspiration which ought to stir her tears. But they're so self-satisfied. They think they're doing Burns a favor. They don't believe they have a belated quest. They're sure that they have a culture salted and hung up. It was out of this stupor of doubt that Mrs. Dawson's summons roused her. She was in a panic. How could she speak without hurting them? Mrs. Champ Perry leaned over to stroke her hand and whisper, You look tired, dearie. Don't you talk unless you want to. Affection flooded Carol. She was on her feet searching for words and courtesies. The only thing in the way of suggestion, I know you are following a definite program, but I do wish that now you've had such a splendid introduction, instead of going on with some other subject next year, you could return and take up the poets more in detail, especially actual quotations, even though their lives are so interesting and, as Mrs. Warren said, so morally instructive. And perhaps there are several poets not mentioned today whom it might be worthwhile considering. Keats, for instance, and Matthew Arnold, and Rossetti, and Swinburne. Now, Swinburne would be such a, well, that is, such a contrast to life as we all enjoy it in our beautiful Middle West. She saw that Mrs. Leonard Warren was not with her. She captured her by innocently continuing. Unless, perhaps, Swinburne tends to be, um, more outspoken than you, than we'd really like. What do you think, Mrs. Warren? The pastor's wife decided. Why, you've caught my very thoughts, Mrs. Kennicott. Of course, I have never read, uh, Swinburne, but years ago, when he was in vogue, I remember Mr. Warren saying that Swinburne, or was it Oscar Wilde? Oh, but anyway, he said that though many so-called intellectual people posed and pretended to find beauty in Swinburne, there can never be genuine beauty without the message from the heart. But at the same time, I do think you have an excellent idea, and though we have talked about furnishings and China as the probable subject for next year, I believe that it would be nice if the program committee would try to work in another day devoted entirely to English poetry. In fact, Madam Chairman, I so move you. When Mrs. Dawson's coffee and angel's food had helped them to recover from the depression caused by thoughts of Shakespeare's death, they all told Carol that it was a pleasure to have her with them. The membership committee retired to the sitting room for three minutes and elected her a member. And she stopped being patronizing. She wanted to be one of them. They were so loyal and kind. It was they who would carry out her aspiration. Her campaign against village sloth was actually begun. On what specific reform should she first lose her army? During the gossip after the meeting, Mrs. George Edwin Mott remarked that the city hall seemed inadequate for the splendid modern Gopher Prairie. Mrs. Nat Hicks timidly wished that the young people could have free dances there. The lodge dances were so exclusive. The city hall, that was it. Carol hurried home. She had not realized that Gopher Prairie was a city. From Kennicott, she discovered that it was legally organized with a mayor and city council and wards. She was delighted by the simplicity of voting oneself a metropolis. Why not? She was a proud and patriotic citizen all evening. She examined the city hall next morning. She had remembered it only as a bleak, inconspicuousness. She found it a liver-colored frame coop half a block from Main Street. The front was an unrelieved wall of clapboards and dirty windows. It had an unobstructed view of a vacant lot and Nat Hicks' tailor shop. It was larger than the carpenter shop beside it, but not so well built. No one was about. She walked into the corridor. On one side was the municipal court, like a country school. On the other, the room of the volunteer fire company, with a Ford hose cart and the ornamental helmets used in parades at the end of the hall. A filthy two-cell jail, now empty, but smelling of ammonia and ancient sweat. The whole second story was a large, unfinished room littered with piles of folding chairs, a lime-crusted mortar mixing box, and the skeletons of Fourth of July floats covered with decomposing plaster shields and faded red, white, and blue bunting. At the end was an abortive stage, the room was large enough for the community dances which Mrs. Nat Hicks advocated, 
but Carol was after something bigger than dances. In the afternoon, she scampered to the public library. The library was open three afternoons and four evenings a week. It was housed in an old dwelling, sufficient but unattractive. Carol caught herself picturing pleasanter reading rooms, chairs for children, an art collection, a librarian young enough to experiment. She berated herself. Stop this fever of reforming everything. I will be satisfied with the library. The city hall is enough for a beginning, and it's really an excellent library. It's... it isn't so bad. Is it possible that I am to find dishonesties and stupidity in every human activity I encounter? In schools, in business, and government, and everything? Is there never any contentment, never any rest? She shook her head as though she were shaking off water, and hastened into the library, a young, light, amiable presence, modest in unbuttoned fur coat, blue suit, fresh organdy collar, and tan boots roughened from scuffling snow. Miss Fillet stared at her, and Carol purred, I was so sorry not to see you at the Thanatopsis yesterday. Vida said you might come. Oh, you went to the Thanatopsis? Did you enjoy it? So much! Such good papers on the poets! Carol lied resolutely. But I did think they should have had you give one of the papers on poetry. Well, of course, I'm not one of the bunch that seem to have the time to take and run the club, and if they prefer to have papers on literature by other ladies who have no literary training, after all, why should I complain? What am I but a city employee? You're not. You're the one person that does, uh, that does, oh, you do so much. Uh, tell me, is there, um, who are the people who control the club? Miss Villette emphatically stamped a date in the front of Frank on the lower Mississippi for a small flaxen boy, glowered at him as though she were stamping a warning on his brain, and sighed. I wouldn't put myself forward or criticize anyone for the world, and Vida is one of my best friends, and such a splendid teacher, and there is no one in town more advanced and interested in all movements, but I must say that no matter who the president or the committees are, Vida Sherwin seems to be behind them all the time, and though she is always telling me about what she is pleased to call my fine work in the library, I notice that I'm not often called on for papers, though Mrs. Lyman Cass once volunteered and told me that she thought my paper on the cathedrals of England was the most interesting paper we had, the year we took up English and French travel and architecture. But, and of course, uh, Mrs. Martin and Mrs. Warren are very important in the club, as you might expect of the wives of the superintendent of schools and the congregational pastor, and indeed they are both very cultured, but... No, you may regard me as entirely unimportant. I'm sure what I say doesn't matter a bit. You're much too modest, and I'm going to tell Vida so, and, uh, I wonder if you can give me just a teeny bit of your time and show me where the magazine files are kept. She had won. She was profusely escorted to a room like a grandmother's attic, where she discovered periodicals devoted to house decoration and town planning with a six-year file of the National Geographic. Miss Villet blessedly left her alone. Humming, fluttering pages with delighted fingers, Carol sat cross-legged on the floor, the magazines in heaps about her. She found pictures of New England streets, the dignity of Falmouth, the charm of Concord, Stockbridge, and Farmington and Hillhouse Avenue the ferry-book suburb of Forest Hills on Long Island, Devonshire cottages and Essex manors and a Yorkshire high street and Port Sunlight, the Arab village of Jeddah, and intricately chased jewel box, a town in California which had changed itself from the barren brick fronts and slatternly frame sheds of a main street to a way which led the eye down a vista of arcades and gardens. Assured that she was not quite mad in her belief that a small American town might be lovely as well as useful in buying wheat and selling plows, she sat brooding, her thin fingers playing a tattoo on her cheeks. She saw in Gopher Prairie a Georgian city hall, warm brick walls with white shutters, a fanlight, a wide hall and curving stair. She saw at the common home an inspiration not only of the town, but of the country about. It should contain the courtroom, she couldn't get herself to put in a jail, public library, a collection of excellent prints, rest room, and model kitchen for farm wives, theater, lecture room, free community ballroom, farm bureau, gymnasium, 
Forming about it and influenced by it, as medieval villagers gathered about the castle, she saw a new Georgian town as graceful and beloved as Annapolis or that bowery Alexandria to which Washington rode. All this the Thanatopsis Club was to accomplish with no difficulty whatever, since its several husbands were the controllers of business and politics. She was proud of herself for this practical view. She had taken only half an hour to change a wire-fenced potato plot into a walled rose garden. She hurried out to apprise Mrs. Leonard Warren, as president of the Thanatopsis, of the miracle which had been worked. At a quarter to three, Carol had left home. At half past four, she had created the Georgian town. At a quarter to five, she was in the dignified poverty of the congregational parsonage, her enthusiasm pattering upon Mrs. Leonard Warren like summer rain upon an old grey roof. At two minutes to five, a town of demure courtyards and welcoming dormer windows had been erected, and at two minutes past five, the entire town was as flat as Babylon. Erect in a black William and Mary chair against grey and speckly brown volumes of sermons and biblical commentaries and Palestine geographies upon long pine shelves, her neat black shoes firm on a rag rug, herself as correct and low-toned as her background, Mrs. Warren listened without comment till Carol was quite through, then answered delicately, "'Yes, uh, I think you draw a very nice picture of what might easily come to pass some day. I have no doubt that such villages will be found on the prairie some day, but if I might make just the least little criticism, it seems to me that you are wrong in supposing either that the city hall would be the proper start, or that the Thanatopsis would be the right instrument. After all—' "'It's the churches, isn't it, that are the real heart of the community. "'As you may possibly know, my husband is prominent in congregational circles all through the state "'for his advocacy of church union. "'He hopes to see all the evangelical denominations join in one strong body, "'opposing Catholicism and Christian science, "'and properly guiding all movements that make for morality and prohibition.' Here the combined churches could afford a splendid clubhouse, maybe a stucco and half-timber building with gargoyles and all sorts of pleasing decorations on it, which it seems to me would be lots better to impress the ordinary class of people than just a plain old-fashioned colonial house such as you describe, and that would be the proper centre for all educational and pleasurable activities instead of letting them fall into the hands of the politicians.' "'I don't suppose it will take more than thirty or forty years for the churches to get together?' Carol said innocently. "'Oh, hardly that long, even. Things are moving so rapidly, so it would be a mistake to make any other plans.' Carol did not recover her zeal, till two days after, when she tried Mrs. George Edwin Mott, wife of the superintendent of schools. Mrs. Mott commented, "'Personally, I am terribly busy with dressmaking "'and having the seamstress in the house and all, "'but it would be splendid to have the other members "'of the Thanatopsis take up the question. "'Except for one thing. First and foremost, we must have a new school building. "'Mr. Mott says they are terribly cramped.' "'Carol went to view the old building. "'The grades in the high school were combined "'in a damp yellow brick structure "'with the narrow windows of an antiquated jail, a hulk, which expressed hatred and compulsory training. She conceded Mrs. Mott's demand so violently that for two days she dropped her own campaign. Then she built the school and city hall together as the center of the reborn town. She ventured to the lead-colored dwelling of Mrs. Dave Dyer. Behind the mask of winter-stripped vines and a wide porch only a foot above the ground, the cottage was so impersonal that Carol could never visualize it, nor could she remember anything that was inside it but Mrs. Dyer was personal enough. With Carol, Mrs. Howland, Mrs. McGannum, and Vida Sherwin, she was a link between the Jolly Seventeen and the serious Thanatopsis, in contrast to Juanita Haydock, who unnecessarily boasted of being a lowbrow and publicly stated that she would see herself in jail before she'd write any darned old club papers. Mrs. Dyer was super feminine in the kimono in which she received Carol. Her skin was fine, pale, soft, suggesting a weak voluptuousness. At afternoon coffees she had been rude, but now she addressed Carol as dear, and insisted on being called Maud. Carol did not quite know why she was uncomfortable in this talcum-powder atmosphere, but she hastened to get into the fresh air of her plans. Maud Dyer granted that the city hall wasn't so very nice, yet 
As Dave said, there was no use doing anything about it till they received an appropriation from the state and combined a new city hall with a National Guard armory. Dave had given verdict. What these mouthy youngsters that hang around the pool room need is universal military training. Make men of them. Mrs. Dyer removed the new school building from the city hall. Oh, so Mrs. Mott has got you going on her school craze. She's been dinging at that till everybody's sick and tired. What she really wants is a big office for her dear bald-headed gorge to sit around and look important in. Of course, I admire Mrs. Mott, and I'm very fond of her. She's so brainy, even if she does try to butt in and run the Thanatopsis. But I must say, we're sick of her nagging. The old building was good enough for us when we were kids. I hate these would-be women politicians, don't you? The first week of March had given promise of spring and stirred Carol with a thousand desires for lakes and fields and roads. The snow was gone except for filthy woolly patches under trees. The thermometer leaped in a day from wind-bitten chill to itchy warmth. As soon as Carol was convinced that even in this imprisoned north spring could exist again, the snow came down as abruptly as a paper storm in a theatre. The northwest gale flung it up in a half-blizzard, and with her hope of a glorified town went hope of summer meadows. But a week later, though the snow was everywhere in slushy heaps, the promise was unmistakable. By the invisible hints in air and sky and earth which had aroused her every year through ten thousand generations, she knew that spring was coming. It was not a scorching, hard, dusty day like the treacherous intruder of a week before, but soaked with languor, softened with a milky light. Rivulets were hurrying in each alley. A calling robin appeared by magic on the crab-apple tree in the Howland's yard. Everybody chuckled, "'Looks like winter is going," and "'This'll bring the frost out of the roads. Have the autos out pretty soon now. Wonder what kind of bass fishing we'll get this summer. Ought to be good crops this year.'" Each evening Kennicott repeated, "'We better not take off our heavy underwear or the storm windows too soon. Might be another spell of cold. Got to be careful about catching cold. Wonder if the cold will last through.'" The expanding forces of life within her choked the desire for reforming. She trotted through the house, planning the spring cleaning with Bee. When she attended her second meeting of the Thanatopsis, she said nothing about remaking the town. She listened respectably to statistics on Dickens, Thackeray, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Scott, Hardy, Lamb, De Quincey, and Mrs. Humphrey Ward, who, it seemed, constituted the writers of English fiction and essays. Not till she inspected the restroom did she again become a fanatic. She had often glanced at the store building which had been turned into a refuge in which farm wives could wait while their husbands transacted business. She had heard Vida Sherwin and Mrs. Warren caress the virtue of the Thanatopsis in establishing the restroom and in sharing with the city council the expense of maintaining it, but she had never entered it till this March day. She went in impulsively, nodded at the matron, a plump, worthy widow named Nodalquist, and at a couple of farm women who were meekly rocking. The rest room resembled a second-hand store. It was furnished with discarded patent rockers, lopsided reed chairs, a scratched pine table, a gritty straw mat, old steel engravings of milkmaids being morally amorous under willow trees, faded chromos of roses and fish, and a kerosene stove for warming lunches. The front window was darkened by torn net curtains and by a mound of geraniums and rubber plants. While she was listening to Mrs. Nodalquist's account of how many thousands of farmers' wives used the restroom every year, and how much they appreciated the kindness of the ladies in providing them with this lovely place, and all free, she thought, kindness nothing, the kind ladies' husbands get the farmers' trade, this is mere commercial accommodation, and it's horrible. It ought to be the most charming room in town to comfort women sick of prairie kitchens. Certainly it ought to have a clear window so that they can see the metropolitan life go by. Some day I'm going to make a better restroom, a club room. Why, I've already planned that as part of my Georgian town hall. So it chanced that she was plotting against the peace of the Thanatopsis at her third meeting, which covered Scandinavian, Russian, and Polish literature, with remarks by Mrs. Leonard Warren on the sinful paganism of the Russian so-called church. Even before the entrance of the coffee and hot rolls, Carol seized on Mrs. Champ Perry, the kind and ample-bosomed pioneer woman who gave historic dignity to the modern matrons of the Thanatopsis. She poured out her plans. Mrs. Perry nodded and stroked Carol's hand, but at the end she sighed, "'I wish I could agree with you, dearie. 
I am sure you're one of the Lord's anointed, even if we don't see you at the Baptist church as often as we'd like to. But I'm afraid you're too tender-hearted. When Champ and I came here, we teamed it with an ox cart from Sock Center to Gopher Prairie, and there was nothing here then but a stockade and a few soldiers and some log cabins. When we wanted salt pork and gunpowder, we sent out a man on horseback, and probably he was shot dead by the Indians before he got back. We ladies, uh, of course, we were all farmers at first. We didn't expect any restroom in those days. My, we'd have thought the one they have now was simply elegant. My house was roofed with hay, and it leaked something terrible when it rained. Only dry place was under a shelf. And when the town grew up, we thought the new city hall was real fine. And I don't see any need for dance halls. Dancing isn't what it was, anyway. We used to dance modest, and we had just as much fun as all these young folks do now with their terrible turkey trots and hugging and all. But if they must neglect the Lord's injunction that young girls ought to be modest, then I guess they manage pretty well at the K.P. Hall and the Odd Fellows, even if some of the lodges don't always welcome a lot of these foreigners and hired help to all their dances. And I certainly don't see any need of a farm bureau or this domestic science demonstration you talk about. In my day the boys learned to farm by honest sweating, and every gal could cook, or her ma learned her how across her knee. Besides, ain't there a county agent at uh, Wakamin? He comes here once a fortnight, maybe. That's enough monkeying around with this scientific farming. Champ says there's nothing to it anyway. And as for a lecture hall, haven't we got the churches? Good deal better to listen to a good old-fashioned sermon than a lot of geography and books and things that nobody needs to know. More than enough heathen learning right here in the Thanatopsis. And as for trying to make a whole town in this colonial architecture you talk about, huh. Oh, I do love nice things. Uh, to this day, I run ribbons into my petticoats, even if Champ Perry does laugh at me, the old villain. But just the same, I don't believe any of us old-timers would like to see the town that we worked so hard to build being torn down to make a place that wouldn't look nothing but some Dutch storybook and not a bit like the place we loved. And don't you think it's sweet now, all the trees and lawns and such comfy houses and hot water heat and electric lights and telephones and cement walks and everything? Why... I thought everybody from the Twin Cities always said it was such a beautiful town. Carol forswore herself, declared that Gopher Prairie had the color of Algiers and the gaiety of Mardi Gras. Yet the next afternoon she was pouncing on Mrs. Lyman Cass, the hook-nosed consort of the owner of the flour mill. Mrs. Cass's parlor belonged to the crammed Victorian school, as Mrs. Luke Dawson's belonged to the bare Victorian, it was furnished on two principles. First, everything must resemble something else. A rocker had a back like a lyre, a near leather seat imitating tufted cloth, and arms like Scotch Presbyterian lions, with knobs, scrolls, shields, and spear points on unexpected portions of the chair. The second principle of the crammed Victorian school was that every inch of the interior must be filled with useless objects. The walls of Mrs. Cass's parlor were plastered with hand-painted pictures, Buckeye pictures of birch trees, newsboys, puppies, and church steeples on Christmas Eve, with a plaque depicting the exposition building in Minneapolis, burnt wood portraits of Indian chiefs of no tribe in particular, a pansy-decked poetic motto, a yard of roses, and the banners of the educational institutions attended by the Cass's two sons, Chicopee Falls Business College and McGillicuddy University. One small square table contained a card receiver of painted china with a rim of wrought and gilded lead, a family Bible, Grant's memoirs, the latest novel by Mrs. Jean Stratton Porter, a wooden model of a Swiss chalet which was also a bank for dimes, a polished abalone shell holding one black-headed pin and one empty spool, a velvet pincushion in a gilded metal slipper with souvenir of Troy, New York, stamped on the toe, and an unexplained red glass dish which had warts. Mrs. Cass's first remark was, I must show you all my pretty things and art objects. She piped after Carol's appeal. I see. You think the New England villages and colonial houses are so much more cunning than these Midwestern towns. I'm glad you feel that way. You'll be interested to know I was born in Vermont. And don't you think we ought to try to make go for prep? Oh, my gracious, no. We can't afford it. Taxes are much too high as it is. We ought to retrench and not let the city council spend another cent. Um, don't you think that was a grand paper Mrs. Westlake read about Tolstoy? 
I was so glad she pointed out how all his silly socialistic ideas failed. What Mrs. Cass said was what Kennicott said that evening. Not in twenty years would the council propose or go for Prairie vote the funds for a new city hall. Carol had avoided exposing her plans to Vida Sherwin. She was shy of the big sister manner. Vida would either laugh at her or snatch the idea and change it to suit herself. But there was no other hope. When Vida came in to tea, Carol sketched her utopia. Vida was soothing, but decisive. My dear, you're all off. I would like to see it, a real gardeny place to shut out the gales, but it can't be done. What could the club women accomplish? Their husbands are the most important men in town. They are the town. But the town as a separate unit is not the husband of the Thanatopsis. If you knew the trouble we had in getting the city council to spend the money and cover the pumping station with vines, whatever you may think of Gopher Prairie women, they're twice as progressive as the men. But can't the men see the ugliness? They don't think it's ugly. And how can you prove it? Matter of taste. Why should they like what a Boston architect likes? What they like is to sell prunes. Well, why not? Anyway, the point is that you have to work from the inside with what we have, rather than from the outside with foreign ideas. The shell ought not to be forced on the spirit. It can't be. The bright shell has to grow out of the spirit and express it. That means waiting. If we keep after the city council for another ten years, they may vote the bonds for a new school. I refuse to believe that if they saw it, the big men would be too tight-fisted to spend a few dollars each for a building. Think! Dancing and lectures and plays all done cooperatively. You mention the word cooperative to the merchants and they'll lynch you. The one thing they fear more than mail-order houses is that farmers' cooperative movements may get started. The secret trails that lead to scared pocketbooks, always in everything, and I don't have any of the fine melodrama of fiction, the dictographs and speeches by torchlight. I'm merely blocked by stupidity. Oh, I know I'm a fool. I dream of Venice and I live in Archangel and scold because the northern seas aren't tender-colored, but at least they shan't keep me from loving Venice, and sometimes I'll run away. All right? No more. She flung out her hands in a gesture of renunciation. Early May. Wheat springing up in blades like grass. Corn and potatoes being planted, the land humming. For two days there had been steady rain. Even in town the roads were a furrowed welter of mud, hideous to view and difficult to cross. Main Street was a black swamp from curb to curb. On residence streets the grass parking beside the walks oozed grey water. It was prickly hot, yet the town was barren under the bleak sky. Softened neither by snow nor by waving boughs, the houses squatted and scowled, revealed in their unkempt harshness. As she dragged homeward, Carol looked with distaste at her clay-loaded rubbers, the smeared hem of her skirt. She passed Lyman Cass's pinnacled, dark-red, hulking house. She waded a streaky yellow pool. This morass was not her home, she insisted. Her home and her beautiful town existed in her mind. They had already been created. The task was done. What she really had been questing was someone to share them with her. Vida would not. Kennicott would not. Someone to share her refuge. Suddenly, she was thinking of Guy Pollock. She dismissed him. He was too cautious. She needed a spirit as young and unreasonable as her own, and she would never find it. Youth would never come singing. She was beaten. Yet, that same evening, she had an idea which solved the rebuilding of Gopher Prairie. Within ten minutes, she was jerking the old-fashioned bell pool of Luke Dawson. Mrs. Dawson opened the door and peered doubtfully about the edge of it. Carol kissed her cheek and frisked into the lugubrious sitting-room. "'Well, well, you're a sight for sore eyes,' chuckled Mr. Dawson, dropping his newspaper, pushing his spectacles back on his forehead. "'You seem so excited,' sighed Mrs. Dawson. "'I am. Mr. Dawson, aren't you a millionaire?' He cocked his head and purred. "'Well, I guess if I cashed in on all my securities and farm holdings and my interests in iron on the Masabi and in northern timber and cutover lands, I could push two million dollars pretty close.' and I've made every cent of it by hard work and having the sense to not go out and spend every... I think I want most of it from you. The Dawsons glanced at each other in appreciation of the jest, and he chirped, You're worse than Reverend Benlick. He don't hardly ever strike me for more than ten dollars at a time. I'm not joking. I mean it. Your children in the cities are grown up and well-to-do. You don't want to die and leave your name unknown. 
Why not do a big original thing? Why not rebuild the whole town, get a great architect, and have him plan a town that would be suitable to the prairie? Perhaps he'd create some entirely new form of architecture, then tear down all these shambling buildings. Mr. Dawson had decided that she really did mean it. He wailed, Why, that would cost at least three or four million dollars. But you alone, just one man, have two of those millions. Me? Spend all my hard-earned cash on building houses for a lot of shiftless beggars that never had the sense to save their money? Not that I've ever been mean. Mama could always have a hired girl to do the work when we could find one. But her and I have worked our fingers to the bone and spent it on a lot of these rascals. Please, don't be angry. I just mean... I mean... Oh, not spend all of it, of course. But if you let off the list and the others came in, and if they heard you talk about a more attractive town... Why, now, child, you've got a lot of notions. Besides, what's the matter with the town? Looks good to me. I've had people that have traveled all over the world tell me time and again that Gopher Prairie is the prettiest place in the Middle West. Good enough for anybody. Certainly good enough for Mama and me. Besides, Mama and me are planning to go out to Pasadena and buy a bungalow and live there. She had met Miles Bajornstam on the street. For the second of welcome encounters, this workman with the bandit mustache and the muddy overalls seemed nearer than anyone else to the credulous youth which she was seeking to fight beside her, and she told him as a cheerful anecdote a little of her story. He grunted. Never thought I'd be agreeing with old man Dawson, the penny-pinching old land thief, and a fine briber he is too, but you got the wrong slant. You aren't one of the people yet. You want to do something for the town. I don't. I want the town to do something for itself. We don't want old Dawson's money, not if it's a gift, with a string. We'll take it away from him, because it belongs to us. You got to get more iron and cussedness into you. Come join us cheerful bums, and some day, when we educate ourselves and quit being bums, we'll take things and run them straight. He had changed from her friend to a cynical man in overalls. She could not relish the autocracy of cheerful bums. She forgot him as she tramped the outskirts of town. She had replaced the City Hall project by an entirely new and highly exhilarating thought of how little was done for these unpicturesque poor. The spring of the plains is not a reluctant virgin, but brazen, and soon away. The mud roads of a few days ago are powdery dust, and the puddles beside them have hardened into lozenges of black, sleek earth like cracked patent leather. Carol was panting as she crept to the meeting of the Thanatopsis Program Committee, which was to decide the subject for next fall and winter. Madam Chairman, Miss Ella Stowbody, in an oyster-colored blouse, asked if there was any new business. Carol rose. She suggested that the Thanatopsis ought to help the poor of the town. She was ever so correct and modern. She did not, she said, want charity for them, but a chance of self-help, an employment bureau, direction in washing babies and making pleasing stews, possibly a municipal fund for home-building. What do you think of my plans, Mrs. Warren? She concluded. Speaking judiciously as one related to the church by marriage, Mrs. Warren gave verdict. I am sure we're all heartily in accord with Mrs. Kennicott in feeling that whatever genuine poverty is encountered, it is not only noblesse oblige, but a joy to fulfill our duty to the less fortunate ones, but I must say, it seems to me we should lose the whole point of the thing by not regarding it as charity. Why, that's the chief adornment of the true Christian and the Church. The Bible has laid it down for our guidance, faith, hope, and charity, it says, and the poor ye have with ye always, which indicates that there never can be anything to these so-called scientific schemes for abolishing charity. Never! And isn't it better so? I should hate to think of a world in which we were deprived of all the pleasure of giving. Besides, if these shiftless folks realize they're getting charity, and not something to which they have a right, they're so much more grateful. Besides, snorted Miss Ella Stowbody, they've been fooling you, Mrs. Kennicott. There isn't any real poverty here. Take that Mrs. Steinoff you speak of. I send her our washing whenever there's too much for our hired girl. I must have sent her ten dollars worth the past year alone. I'm sure Papa would never approve of a city home-building fund. Papa says these folks are fakers, especially all these tenant farmers that pretend they have so much trouble getting seed and machinery. Papa says they simply won't pay their debts. 
He says he sure he hates to foreclose mortgages, but it's the only way to make them respect the law. And then think of all the clothes we give these people, said Mrs. Jackson Elder. Carol intruded again. Oh, yes, the clothes. I was going to speak of that. Don't you think that when we give clothes to the poor, if we do get them old ones, we ought to mend them first and make them as presentable as we can? Next Christmas, when the Thanatopsis makes its distribution, wouldn't it be jolly if we got together and sewed on the clothes and trimmed hats and made them? Heavens and earth, they have more time than we have. They ought to be mighty good and grateful to get anything, no matter what shape it's in. I know I'm not going to sit and sew for that lazy Mrs. Bopney with all I've got to do, snapped Ella Stowbody. They were glaring at Carol. She reflected that Mrs. Vopney, whose husband had been killed by a train, had ten children. But Mrs. Mary Ellen Wilkes was smiling. Mrs. Wilkes was the proprietor of Ye Art Shop and Magazine and Bookstore and the reader of the small Christian Science Church. She made it all clear. If this class of people had an understanding of science and that we are the children of God and nothing can harm us, they wouldn't be in error and poverty. Mrs. Jackson Elder confirmed. Besides, it strikes me the club is already doing enough with tree planting and the anti-fly campaign and the responsibility for the restroom to say nothing of the fact that we've talked of trying to get the railroad to put in a park at the station. I think so, too, said Madam Chairman. She glanced uneasily at Miss Sherwin. But what do you think, Vida? Vida smiled tactfully at each of the committee and announced, Well... I don't believe we'd better start anything more right now. But it's been a privilege to hear Carol's dear, generous ideas, hasn't it? Oh, uh, there is one thing we must decide on at once. We must get together and oppose any move on the part of the Minneapolis clubs to elect another state federation president from the Twin Cities. And this Mrs. Edgar Potbury they're putting forward. I know there are people who think she's a bright, interesting speaker, but I regard her as very shallow. What do you say to my writing to the Lake Ojibawasha Club, telling them that if their district will support Mrs. Warren for second vice president, we'll support their Mrs. Hagleton, and such a dear, lovely, cultivated woman, too, for president? Yes, we ought to show up those Minneapolis folks, Ella Stowbody said acidly. And, oh, by the way, we must oppose this movement of Mrs. Potbury's to have the state clubs come out definitely in favor of woman suffrage. Women haven't any place in politics. They would lose all their daintiness and charm if they became involved in these horrid plots and log-rolling and all this awful political stuff about scandal and personalities and so on. All, save one, nodded. They interrupted the formal business meeting to discuss Mrs. Edgar Potbury's husband, Mrs. Potbury's income, Mrs. Potbury's sedan, Mrs. Potbury's residence, Mrs. Potbury's oratorical style, Mrs. Potbury's mandarin evening coat, Mrs. Potbury's coiffure, and Mrs. Potbury's altogether reprehensible influence on the State Federation of Women's Clubs. Before the program committee adjourned, they took three minutes to decide which of the subjects suggested by the magazine Culture Hints, Furnishings in China, or The Bible as Literature, would be better for the coming year. There was one annoying incident. Mrs. Dr. Kennicott interfered and showed off again. She commented, Don't you think that we already get enough of the Bible in our churches and Sunday schools? Mrs. Leonard Warren, somewhat out of order but much more out of temper, cried, Well, upon my word, I didn't suppose there was anyone who felt that we could get enough of the Bible. I guess if the grand old book has withstood the attacks of infidels for these two thousand years, it is worth our slight consideration. Oh, I, I didn't mean, Carol begged, inasmuch as she did mean, it was hard to be extremely lucid, but I wish instead of limiting ourselves either to the Bible or to anecdotes about the brothers Adam's wigs, which Culture Hints seems to regard as the significant point about furniture, we could study some of the really stirring ideas that are springing up today, whether it's chemistry or anthropology or labor problems, the things that are going to mean so terribly much. Everybody cleared her polite throat. Madam Chairman inquired, Is there any other discussion? Will someone make a motion to adopt the suggestion of Vida Sherwin to take up furnishings and china? It was adopted unanimously. Checkmate, murmured Carol as she held up her hand. Had she actually believed that she could plant a seed of liberalism in the blank wall of mediocrity? 
How had she fallen into the folly of trying to plant anything whatever in a wall so smooth and sun-glazed and so satisfying to the happy sleepers within? The End of Chapter 11 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 12 One Week of Authentic Spring One Rare Sweet Week of May One Tranquil Moment Between the Blast of Winter and the Charge of Summer Daily, Carol walked from town into flashing country hysteric with new life. One enchanted hour when she returned to youth and a belief in the possibility of beauty. She had walked northward toward the upper shore of Plover Lake, taking to the railroad track whose directness and dryness made it the natural highway for pedestrians on the plains. She stepped from tie to tie in long strides. At each road crossing, she had to crawl over a cattle guard of sharpened timbers. She walked the rails, balancing with arms extended, cautious, heel before toe. As she lost her balance, bent over, her arms revolved wildly, and when she toppled, she laughed aloud. The thick grass beside the track, coarse and prickly with many burnings, hid canary-yellow buttercups and the mauve petals and woolly sage-green coats of the pasque flowers. The branches of the kinnikinick brush were red and smooth as lacquer on a sake bowl. She ran down the gravelly embankment, smiled at children gathering flowers in a little basket, thrust a handful of the soft pasque flowers into the bosom of her white blouse. Fields of springing wheat drew her from the straight propriety of the railroad, and she crawled through the rusty barbed wire fence. She followed a furrow between low wheat blades and a field of rye which showed silver lights as it flowed before the wind. She found a pasture by the lake. So sprinkled was the pasture with rag-baby blossoms and the cottony herb of Indian tobacco that it spread out like a rare old Persian carpet of cream and rose and delicate green. Under her feet the rough grass made a pleasant crunching. Sweet winds blew from the sunny lake beside her, and small waves sputtered on the meadowy shore. She leaped a tiny creek, bowered in pussy-willow buds. She was nearing a frivolous grove of birch and poplar and wild plum trees. The poplar foliage had the downiness of a corot arbor. The green and silver trunks were as candid as the birches, as slender and lustrous as the limbs of a perot. The cloudy white blossoms of the plum trees filled the grove with a springtime mistiness which gave an illusion of distance. She ran into the wood, crying out for joy of freedom regained after winter. Chokecherry blossoms lured her from the outer sun-warmed spaces to depths of green stillness where a submarine light came through the young leaves. She walked pensively along an abandoned road, she found a moccasin flower beside a lichen-covered log. At the end of the road she saw the open acres, dipping rolling fields bright with wheat. I believe the woodland gods still live, and out there the great land, it's beautiful as the mountains. What do I care for Thanatopsis's? She came out on the prairie, spacious under an arch of boldly cut clouds. Small pools glittered. Above a marsh red-winged blackbirds chased a crow in a swift melodrama of the air. On a hill was silhouetted a man following a drag. His horse bent its neck and plodded, content. A path took her to the Corinth Road leading back to town. Dandelions glowed in patches amidst the wild grass by the way. A stream galloped through a concrete culvert beneath the road. She trudged in healthy weariness. A man in a bumping ford rattled up beside her, hailed, "'Give you a lift, Mrs. Kennicott. "'Thank you. It's, it's awfully good of you, but I'm enjoying the walk.' Great day, by golly. I seen some wheat that must have been five inches high. Well, so long. She hadn't the dimmest notion who he was, but his greeting warmed her. This countryman gave her a companionship which she had never, whether by her fault or theirs or neither, been able to find in the matrons and commercial lords of the town. Half a mile from town, in a hollow between hazelnut bushes and a brook, she discovered a gypsy encampment, a covered wagon, a tent, a bunch of pegged-out horses— a broad-shouldered man was squatting on his heels, holding a frying pan over a campfire. He looked toward her. He was Miles Bjornstam. "'Well, well, what are you doing out here?' he roared. "'Come, have a hunk of bacon. Pete! Hey, Pete!' A tussled person came from behind the covered wagon. "'Pete, here's the one honest-to-God lady in my bum town. Come on, crawl in and set a couple of minutes, Mrs. Kennicott. I'm hiking off for all summer.' The red Swede staggered up, rubbed his cramped knees, lumbered to the wire fence, held the strands apart for her. She unconsciously smiled at him as she went through. Her skirt caught on a barb. He carefully freed it. Beside this man in a blue flannel shirt, 
baggy khaki trousers, uneven suspenders, and vile felt hat, she was small and exquisite. The surly Pete set out an upturned bucket for her. She lounged on it, her elbows on her knees. "'Where are you going?' she asked. "'Just starting off for the summer, horse trading,' Bjornstam chuckled. His red mustache caught the sun. "'Regular hobos and public benefactors we are. Take a hike like this every once in a while, sharks on horses, buy them from farmers and sell them to others. We're honest, frequently. Great time, camp along the road. I was wishing I had a chance to say goodbye to you before I ducked out, but, say, you'd better come along with us.' I'd like to. While you're playing mumbly peg with Mrs. Lim Cash, Pete and me will be rumbling across Dakota, through the Badlands, into the Butte country, and when fall comes, we'll be crossing over a pass of the Bighorn Mountains, maybe, and camp in a snowstorm, quarter of a mile, right straight up above a lake. Then in the morning, we'll lie snug in our blankets and look up through the pines at an eagle. How'd it strike you, huh? Eagle, soaring and soaring all day, big wide sky. Don't, or I will go with you and I'm afraid there might be some slight scandal. Perhaps some day I'll do it. Goodbye. Her hand disappeared in his blackened leather glove. From the turn in the road she waved at him. She walked on more soberly now, and she was lonely. But the wheat and grass were sleek velvet under the sunset, the prairie clouds were tawny gold, and she swung happily into Main Street. Through the first days of June she drove with Kennicott on his calls. She identified him with the virile land, she admired him as she saw with what respect the farmers obeyed him. She was out in the early chill after a hasty cup of coffee, reaching open country as the fresh sun came up in that unspoiled world. Meadowlarks called from the tops of thin, split fence posts. The wild roses smelled clean. As they returned in late afternoon, the low sun was a solemnity of radial bands, like a heavenly fan of beaten gold. The limitless circle of the grain was a green sea rimmed with fog, and the willow windbreaks were palmy isles. Before July, the close heat blanketed them. The tortured earth cracked. Farmers panted through cornfields behind cultivators and the sweating flanks of horses. While she waited for Kennicott in the car before a farmhouse, the seat burned her fingers, and her head ached with the glare on fenders and hood. A black thunder shower was followed by a dust storm which turned the sky yellow with the hint of a coming tornado. Impalpable black dust, far borne from Dakota, covered the inner sills of the closed windows. The July heat was even more stifling. They crawled along Main Street by day. They found it hard to sleep at night. They brought mattresses down to the living room and thrashed and turned by the open window. Ten times a night they talked of going out to soak themselves with the hose and wade through the dew, but they were too listless to take the trouble. On cool evenings when they tried to go walking, the gnats appeared in swarms which peppered their faces and caught in their throats. She wanted the northern pines, the eastern sea, but Kennicott declared that it would be kind of hard to get away just now. The Health and Improvement Committee of the Thanatopsis asked her to take part in the anti-fly campaign, and she toiled about town persuading householders to use the fly traps furnished by the club, or giving out money prizes to fly-swatting children. She was loyal enough, but not ardent, and without ever quite intending to, she began to neglect the task as heat sucked at her strength. Kennicott and she motored north and spent a week with his mother, that is, Carol spent it with his mother while he fished for bass. The great event was their purchase of a summer cottage down on Lake Minimashi. Perhaps the most amiable feature of life in Gopher Prairie was the summer cottages. They were merely two-room shanties with a seepage of broken-down chairs, peeling veneered tables, chromos pasted on wooden walls, and inefficient kerosene stoves. They were so thin-walled and so close together that you could— and did hear a baby being spanked in the fifth cottage off. But they were set among elms and lindens on a bluff which looked across the lake to fields of ripened wheat sloping up to green woods. Here the matrons forgot social jealousies and sat gossiping in gingham, or in old bathing suits surrounded by hysterical children, they paddled for hours. Carol joined them. She ducked shrieking small boys and helped babies construct sand basins for unfortunate minnows. She liked Juanita Haydock and Maud Dyer when she helped them make picnic supper for the men who came motoring out from town each evening. She was easier and more natural with them. In the debate as to whether there should be veal loaf or poached egg on hash, she had no chance to be heretical and oversensitive. They danced sometimes in the evening. They had a minstrel show, with Kennicott surprisingly good as Enman. Always they were encircled by children wise in the lore of woodchucks and gophers and rafts and willow whistles.
If they could have continued this normal, barbaric life, Carol would have been the most enthusiastic citizen of Gopher Prairie. She was relieved to be assured that she did not want bookish conversation alone, that she did not expect the town to become a bohemia. She was content now. She did not criticize. But in September, when the year was at its richest, custom dictated that it was time to return to town to remove the children from the waste occupation of learning the earth and send them back to lessons about the number of potatoes which, in a delightful world untroubled by commission houses or shortages in freight cars, William sold to John. The women who had cheerfully gone bathing all summer looked doubtful when Carol begged, "'Let's keep up an outdoor life this winter. Let's slide and skate.' Their hearts shut again till spring, and the nine months of clicks and radiators and dainty refreshments began all over. Carol had started a salon. Since Kennicott, Vida Sherwin, and Guy Pollock were her only lions, and since Kennicott would have preferred Sam Clark to all the poets and radicals in the entire world— her private and self-defensive clique did not get beyond one evening dinner for Vida and Guy on her first wedding anniversary, and that dinner did not get beyond a controversy regarding Ramey Wotherspoon's yearnings. Guy Pollock was the gentlest person she had found here. He spoke of her new jade and cream frock naturally, not jocosely. He held her chair for her as they sat down to dinner, and he did not, like Kennicott, interrupt her to shout, "'Ah, oh, say, speaking of that, I heard a good story today.' But Guy was incurably hermit. He sat late and talked hard and did not come again. Then she met Champ Perry in the post office and decided that in the history of the pioneers was the panacea for Gopher Prairie for all of America. We have lost their sturdiness, she told herself. We must restore the last of the veterans to power and follow them on the backward path to the integrity of Lincoln, to the gaiety of settlers dancing in a sawmill. She read in the records of the Minnesota Territorial Pioneers that only sixty years ago, not so far back as the birth of her own father, four cabins had composed Gopher Prairie. The log stockade, which Mrs. Champ Perry was to find when she trekked in, was built afterward by the soldiers as a defense against the Sioux. The four cabins were inhabited by Maine Yankees who had come up the Mississippi to St. Paul and driven north over Virgin Prairie into Virgin Woods. They ground their own corn. The menfolk shot ducks and pigeons and prairie chickens, the new breakings yielded the turnip-like rutabakas, which they ate raw and boiled and baked and raw again. For treat, they had wild plums and crab apples and tiny wild strawberries. Grasshoppers came darkening the sky, and in an hour ate the farm wife's garden and the farmer's coat. Precious horses, painfully brought from Illinois, were drowned in bogs or stampeded by the fear of blizzards. Snow blew through the chinks of new-made cabins, and eastern children with flowery muslin dresses shivered all winter and in summer were red and black with mosquito bites. Indians were everywhere. They camped in dooryards, stalked into kitchens to demand doughnuts, came with rifles across their backs into schoolhouses, and begged to see the pictures in the geographies. Packs of timber wolves treed the children, and the settlers found dens of rattlesnakes, killed fifty, a hundred, in a day. Yet it was a buoyant life. Carol read enviously in the admirable Minnesota chronicles called Old Rail Fence Corners the reminiscence of Mrs. Malon Black, who settled in Stillwater in 1848. There was nothing to parade over in those days. We took it as it came and had happy lives. We would all gather together and in about two minutes would be having a good time, playing cards or dancing. We used to waltz and dance contra-dances. None of these new jigs, and not wear any clothes to speak of. We covered our hides in those days, no tight skirts like now. You could take three or four steps inside your skirts, and then not reach the edge. One of the boys would fiddle a while, and then someone would spell him, and he could get a dance. Sometimes they would dance and fiddle too. She reflected that, if she could not have ballrooms of grey and rose and crystal, she wanted to be swinging across a puncheon floor with a dancing fiddler. This smug in-between town, which had exchanged money musk for phonographs grinding out ragtime, it was neither the heroic old nor the sophisticated new. Couldn't she somehow, some yet unimagined how, turn it back to simplicity? She herself knew two of the pioneers, the Perrys. Champ Perry was the buyer at the grain elevator. He weighed wagons of wheat on a rough platform scale, in the cracks of which the kernels sprouted every spring. Between times he napped in the dusty piece of his office. She called on the Perrys at their rooms above Howland and Gould's grocery. When they were already old, they had lost the money which they had invested in an elevator. They had given up their beloved yellow brick house and moved into these rooms over a store which were the Gopher Prairie equivalent of a flat. 
A broad stairway led from the street to the upper hall, along which were the doors of a lawyer's office, a dentist's, a photographer's studio, the lodge rooms of the affiliated order of Spartans, and at the back, the Perry's apartment. They received her, their first caller in a month, with aged, fluttering tenderness. Mrs. Perry confided, "'My, it's a shame we got to entertain you in such a cramped place, "'and there ain't any water except that old iron sink outside in the hall, "'but still, as I say to champ, beggars can't be choosers. "'Sides, the brick house was too big for me to sweep, and it was way out, "'and it's nice to be living down here among folks. "'Yes, we're glad to be here, but some day maybe we can have a house of our own again. "'We're saving up. Oh, dear, if we could have our own home.' "'But these rooms are real nice, ain't they?' "'As old people will the world over, "'they had moved as much as possible of their familiar furniture "'into this small space. "'Carol had none of the superiority she felt toward Mrs. Lyman Cass's "'plutocratic parlour. "'She was at home here. "'She noted with tenderness all the makeshifts, "'the darned chair-arms, the patent rocker covered with sleazy creton, "'the pasted strips of paper mending the birch-bark napkin rings "'labeled Papa and Mama.' She hinted of her new enthusiasm, to find one of the young folks who took them seriously heartened the Perrys, and she easily drew from them the principles by which Gopher Prairie should be born again, should again become amusing to live in. This was their philosophy complete in the era of aeroplanes and syndicalism. The Baptist Church, and somewhat less the Methodist, Congregational, and Presbyterian churches, is the perfect, the divinely ordained standard in music, oratory, philanthropy, and ethics. We don't need all this new-fangled science or this terrible higher criticism that's ruining our young men in colleges. What we need is to get back to the true word of God and a good sound belief in hell like we used to have it preached to us. The Republican Party, the grand old party of Blaine and McKinley as the agent of the Lord and of the Baptist Church in temporal affairs. All socialists ought to be hanged. Harold Bell Wright is a lovely writer and... Uh, he teaches such good morals in his novels, and folks say he's made pretty near a million dollars out of them. People who make more than 10,000 a year or less than 800 are wicked. Europeans are still wickeder. It doesn't hurt any to drink a glass of beer on a warm day, but anybody who touches wine is headed straight for hell. Virgins are not so virginal as they used to be. Nobody needs drugstore ice cream. Pie is good enough for anybody. The farmers want too much for their wheat. The owners of the elevator company expect too much for the salaries they pay. There would be no more trouble or discontent in the world if everybody worked as hard as Pa did when he cleared our first farm. Carol's hero worship dwindled to polite nodding, and the nodding dwindled to a desire to escape, and she went home with a headache. Next day, she saw Miles Bjornstam on the street. Just back from Montana. Great summer. Bumped my lungs chuck full of Rocky Mountain air. Now for another whirl at sassing the bosses of Gopher Prairie. She smiled at him, and the Perrys faded, the pioneers faded, till they were but daguerreotypes in a black walnut cupboard. The end of chapter 12 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 13. She tried, more from loyalty than from desire, to call upon the Perrys on a November evening when Kennicott was away. They were not at home. Like a child who has no one to play with, she loitered through the dark hall. She saw a light under an office door. She knocked. To the person who opened, she murmured, Do you happen to know where the Perrys are? She realized that it was Guy Pollock. I am awfully sorry, Mrs. Kennicott, but I don't know. Won't you come in and wait for them? Why, she observed, as she reflected, that in Gopher Prairie it is not decent to call on a man, as she decided that, no, really, she wouldn't go in, and as she went in. I didn't know your office was up here. Yes, uh, office, townhouse, and chateau in Picardy. But you can see the chateau and townhouse next to the Duke of Sutherland's. They're beyond that inner door. They are a cot and a washstand and my other suit and the blue crepe tie you said you liked. You remember my saying that? Of course, I always shall. Please, uh, try this chair. She glanced about the rusty office. Gaunt stove. Shelves of tan law books, desk chair filled with newspapers so long sat upon that they were in holes and smudged to grayness. There were only two things which suggested Guy Pollock. On the green felt of the table desk between legal blanks and a clotted inkwell was a cloisonne vase. On a swing shelf was a row of books unfamiliar to Gopher Prairie. 
Mosher editions of the poets, black and red German novels, a Charles Lamb in crushed Levant. Guy did not sit down. He quartered the office, a greyhound on the scent, a greyhound with glasses tilted forward on his thin nose and a silky indecisive brown mustache. He had a golf jacket of jersey, worn through with the creases in the sleeves. She noted that he did not apologize for it, as Kennicott would have done. He made conversation. I didn't know you were a bosom friend of the Perrys. Champ is the salt of the earth, but somehow I can't imagine him joining you in symbolic dancing or making improvements on the diesel engine. No, he's a dear soul, bless him, but he belongs in the National Museum, uh, along with General Grant's sword, and I'm... Oh, I suppose I'm seeking for a gospel that will evangelize Gopher Prairie. Really? Evangelize it to what? To anything that's definite. Seriousness or frivolousness or both. I wouldn't care whether it was a laboratory or a carnival, but it's merely safe. Tell me, Mr. Pollock, what is the matter with Gopher Prairie? Is anything the matter with it? Isn't there perhaps something the matter with you and me? May I join you in the honor of having something the matter? Yes, thanks. No, I, I think it's the town. Because they enjoy skating more than biology? But I'm not only more interested in biology than the Jolly Seventeen. But I'm not only more interested in biology than the Jolly Seventeen, but also in skating. I'll skate with them, or slide, or throw snowballs just as gladly as talk with you. Oh, no. Yes, uh, but they want to stay home and embroider. Perhaps I'm not defending the town. It's merely I'm a confirmed doubter of myself. Probably I'm conceited about my lack of conceit. Anyway, Gopher Prairie isn't particularly bad. It's like all villages in all countries. Most places that have lost the smell of earth but not yet acquired the smell of patchouli or of factory smoke are just as suspicious and righteous. I wonder if the small town isn't, with some lovely exceptions, a social appendix. Some day these dull market towns may be as obsolete as monasteries. I can imagine the farmer and his local store manager going by monorail at the end of the day into a city more charming than any William Morris utopia. Music, a university, clubs for loafers like me. Lord, how I'd like to have a real club. She asked impulsively, Why do you stay here? I have the village virus. It sounds dangerous. It is. More dangerous than the cancer that will certainly get me at fifty unless I stop this smoking. The village virus is the germ which... It's extraordinarily like the hookworm. It infects ambitious people who stay too long in the provinces. You'll find it epidemic among lawyers and doctors and ministers and college-bred merchants. All these people who have had a glimpse of the world that thinks and laughs but have returned to their swamp. I'm a perfect example, but I shan't pester you with my dollars. You won't. And do sit down so I can see you. He dropped into the shrieking desk chair. He looked squarely at her. She was conscious of the pupils of his eyes, of the fact that he was a man and lonely. They were embarrassed. They elaborately glanced away and were relieved as he went on. The diagnosis of my village virus is simple enough. I was born in an Ohio town about the same size as Gopher Prairie and much less friendly. It had had more generations in which to form an oligarchy of respectability. Here, a stranger is taken in if he is correct, if he likes hunting and motoring and God and our senator. There, we didn't take in even our own till we had contemptuously got used to them. It was a red brick Ohio town, and the trees made it damp, and it smelled of rotten apples. The country wasn't like our lakes and prairie. There were small, stuffy cornfields and brickyards and greasy oil wells. I went to a denominational college and learned that since dictating the Bible and hiring a perfect race of ministers to explain it, God has never done much but creep around and try to catch us disobeying it. From college I went to New York to the Columbia Law School, and for four years I lived. Oh, I, I won't rhapsodize about New York. It was dirty and noisy and breathless and ghastly expensive. But compared with the moldy academy in which I had been smothered, oh, I went to symphonies twice a week. I saw Irving and Terry and Dews and Bernhardt from the top gallery. I walked in Gramercy Park, and I read, oh, everything. Through a cousin I learned that Julius Flickerball was sick and needed a partner. I came here. Uh, Julius got well. He didn't like my way of loafing five hours and then doing my work. Really not so badly, in one. Uh, we parted. When I first came here I swore I'd keep up my interests. Very lofty. I read Browning and went to Minneapolis for the theaters. I thought I was keeping up. But I guess the village virus had me already. 
I was reading four copies of cheap fiction magazines to one poem. I'd put off the Minneapolis trips till I simply had to go there on a lot of legal matters. A few years ago I was talking to a patent lawyer from Chicago, and I realized that I'd always felt so superior to people like Julius Flickerbaugh, but I saw that I was as provincial and behind the times as Julius. Worse. Julius plows through the Literary Digest and the Outlook faithfully while I'm turning over pages of a book by Charles Flandrau that I already know by heart. I decided to leave here. Stern resolution. Grasp the world. Then I found that the village virus had me absolute. I didn't want to face new streets and younger men, real competition. It was too easy to go on making out conveyances and arguing ditching cases. So... That's all of the biography of a living dead man, except the diverting last chapter, the lies about my having been a tower of strength and legal wisdom, which some day a preacher will spin over my lean, dry body. He looked down at his table desk, fingering the starry enameled vase. She could not comment. She pictured herself running across the room to pat his hair. She saw that his lips were firm under his soft, faded mustache. She sat still and maundered. I know. The village virus. Perhaps it will get me. Some day I'm going... Oh, no matter. At least I am making you talk. Usually you have to be polite to my garrulousness, but now I'm sitting at your feet. It would be rather nice to have you literally sitting at my feet by a fire. Would you have a fireplace for me? Naturally. Please don't snub me now. Let the old man rave. How old are you, Carol? Twenty-six, Guy. Twenty-six. I was just leaving New York at twenty-six. I heard Patty sing at twenty-six, and now I'm forty-seven. I feel like a child, yet I'm old enough to be your father, so it's decently paternal to imagine you curled at my feet. Of course, I hope it isn't, but we'll reflect the morals of Gopher Prairie by officially announcing that it is. These standards that you and I live up to, huh? There's one thing that's the matter with Gopher Prairie, at least with the ruling class. There is a ruling class, despite all our professions of democracy. And the penalty we tribal rulers pay is that our subjects watch us every minute. We can't get wholesomely drunk and relax. We have to be so correct about sex morals and inconspicuous clothes and doing our commercial trickery only in the traditional ways that none of us can live up to it. And we become horribly hypocritical, unavoidably. The widow robbing deacon of fiction can't help being hypocritical. The widows themselves demand it. They admire his unctuousness, and look at me. Suppose I did dare to make love to some exquisite married woman. I wouldn't admit it to myself. I giggle with the most revolting salaciousness over la vie parisienne when I get hold of one in Chicago, yet I shouldn't even try to hold your hand. I'm broken. It's the historical Anglo-Saxon way of making life miserable. Oh, my dear, I haven't talked to anybody about myself and all ourselves for years. Guy... "'Can't we do something with the town? Really?' "'No, we can't.' He disposed of it like a judge, ruling out an improper objection, returned to matters less uncomfortably energetic. "'Curious. Most troubles are unnecessary. We have nature beaten. We can make her grow wheat. We can keep warm when she sends blizzards. So we raise the devil just for pleasure. Wars, politics, race hatreds, labor disputes—' Here in Gopher Prairie we've cleared the fields and become soft, so we make ourselves unhappy artificially, at great expense and exertion. Methodists disliking Episcopalians, the man with the Hudson laughing at the man with the flipper. The worst is the commercial hatred, the grocer feeling that any man who doesn't deal with him is robbing him. What hurts me is that it applies to lawyers and doctors, and decidedly to their wives, as much as to grocers. The doctors, you know about that about how your husband and Westlake and Gould dislike one another. No, I won't admit it. He grinned. Oh, maybe once or twice, when Will has positively known of a case where Dr. Well, where one of the others has continued to call on patients longer than necessary, he has laughed about it, but... He still grinned. No, really. And when you say the wives of the doctors share these jealousies... Mrs. McGannum and I haven't any particular crush on each other. She's so stolid. But her mother, Mrs. Westlake, nobody could be sweeter. Yes, I'm sure she's very bland. But I wouldn't tell her my heart's secrets if I were you, my dear. I insist that there's only one professional man's wife in this town who doesn't plot, and that is you, you blessed credulous outsider. I won't be cajoled. 
I won't believe that medicine, the priesthood of healing, can be turned into a penny-picking business. See here, hasn't Kennicott ever hinted to you that you'd better be nice to some old woman because she tells her friends which doctor to call on? But I oughtn't to. She remembered certain remarks which Kennicott had offered regarding the widow Bogart. She flinched, looked at Guy beseechingly. He sprang up, strode to her with a nervous step, smoothed her hand. She wondered if she ought to be offended by his caress. Then she wondered if he liked her hat, the new oriental turban of rose and silver brocade. He dropped her hand. His elbow brushed her shoulder. He flitted over to the desk chair, his thin back stooped. He picked up the cloison vase. Across it he peered at her with such loneliness that she was startled. But his eyes faded into impersonality as he talked of the jealousies of Gopher Prairie. He stopped himself with a sharp, "'Good Lord, Carol, you're not a jury. You are within your legal rights in refusing to be subjected to this summing up. I'm a tedious old fool analyzing the obvious while you're the spirit of rebellion. Tell me your side. What is Gopher Prairie to you?' "'A bore. Can I help?' "'How could you?' "'I don't know. Perhaps by listening.' I haven't done that tonight, but normally. Can't I be the confidant of the old French plays, the tiring maid with a mirror and the loyal ears? Oh, what is there to confide? The people are savorless and proud of it, and even if I liked you tremendously, I couldn't talk to you without twenty old hexes watching, whispering. But you will come to talk to me once in a while? I'm not sure that I shall. I'm trying to develop my own large capacity for dullness and contentment. I failed at every positive thing I've tried. I'd better settle down, as they call it, and be satisfied to be nothing. Don't be cynical. It hurts me and you. It's like blood on the wing of a hummingbird. I'm not a hummingbird. I'm a hawk, a tiny leashed hawk pecked to death by these large, white, flabby, wormy hens. But I am grateful to you for confirming me in the faith, and I'm going home. Please stay and have some coffee with me. I'd like to, but they've succeeded in terrorizing me. I'm afraid of what people might say. I'm not afraid of that. I'm only afraid of what you might say. He stalked to her, took her unresponsive hand. Carol, you have been happy here tonight. Yes, I'm begging. She squeezed his hand quickly, then snatched hers away. She had but little of the curiosity of the flirt, and none of the intriguance, joy, and furtiveness. If she was the naive girl, Guy Pollock was the clumsy boy. He raced about the office. He rammed his fists into his pocket. He stammered, I, 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 oh, the devil. Why do I awaken from smooth dustiness to this jagged rawness? I'll make I'm going to trot down the hall and bring in the Dillons, and we'll all have coffee or something. The Dillons? Uh, yes, uh, really quite a decent young pair, Harvey Dillon and his wife. He's a dentist, just come to town. They live in a room behind his office, uh, same as I do here. They don't know much of anybody. I've heard of them, and I've never thought to call. Oh, I'm horribly ashamed. Do bring them. She stopped for no very clear reason, but his expression said, her faltering admitted, that they wished they had never mentioned the Dillons. With spurious enthusiasm, he said, Splendid! I will! From the door he glanced at her, curled in the peeled leather chair. He slipped out, came back with Doctor and Mrs. Dillon. The four of them drank rather bad coffee, which Pollock made on a kerosene burner. They laughed and spoke of Minneapolis, and were tremendously tactful, and Carol started for home through the November wind. The End of Chapter 13 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 14 She was marching home. No, I couldn't fall in love with him. I like him very much. But he's too much of a recluse. Could I kiss him? No. No. Guy Pollock at 26, I could have kissed him then, maybe, even if I were married to someone else, and probably I'd have been glib in persuading myself that it wasn't really wrong. The amazing thing is that I'm not more amazed at myself. I, the virtuous young matron, am I to be trusted? If the Prince Charming came, a gopher prairie housewife married a year and yearning for a Prince Charming like a batch fish of sixteen. They say that marriage is a magic change, but I'm not changed, but... No, I wouldn't want to fall in love, even if the Prince did come. I wouldn't want to hurt Will. I am fond of Will. I am. He doesn't stir me, not any longer, but I depend on him. 
He is home. And children. I wonder when we will begin to have children. I do want them. I wonder whether I remember to tell B to have hominy tomorrow instead of oatmeal. She will have gone to bed by now. Uh, perhaps I'll be up early enough. Ever so fond of Will, I wouldn't hurt him, even if I had to lose the mad love. If the prince came, I'd look once at him and run, darn fast. Oh, Carol, you're not heroic, nor fine. You are the immutable, vulgar young female. But I'm not the faithless wife who enjoys confiding that she's misunderstood. Oh, I'm not, I'm not. Am I? At least... I didn't whisper to Guy about Will's faults and his blindness to my remarkable soul. I didn't. Matter of fact, Will probably understands me perfectly. If only... If he would just back me up in rousing the town. How many... How incredibly many wives there must be who tingle over the first Guy Pollock who smiles at them. No. I will not be one of that herd of yearners, the coy virgin brides. Yet probably if the prince were young and dared to face life... I'm not half as well oriented as that Mrs. Dillon, so obviously adoring her dentist and seeing Guy only as an eccentric fogey. They weren't silk, Mrs. Dillon's stockings. They were lyle. Her legs are nice and slim, but no nicer than mine. I hate cotton tops on silk stockings. Are my ankles getting fat? I will not have fat ankles. No. I am fond of Will. His work, one farmer he pulled through diphtheria, is worth all my yammering for a castle in Spain, a castle with baths. Oh, this hat is so tight, I, I must stretch it. Guy liked it. There's the house. I'm awfully chilly. Time to get out the fur coat. I wonder if I'll ever have a beaver coat. Nutria is not the same thing. Beaver glossy. like to run my fingers over it. Guy's mustache like beaver. How utterly absurd. I am, I am fond of Will, and can I ever find another word than fond? He's home. He'll think I was out late. Why can't he ever remember to pull down the shades, Cy Bogart and all the beastly boys peeping in? But the poor dear, he's absent-minded about minute, minute, oh, whatever the word is. He has so much worry and work, while I do nothing but jabber to be. I mustn't forget the harmony. She was flying into the hall. Kennicott looked up from the Journal of the American Medical Society. "'Hello. What time did you get back?' she cried. "'About nine. You been gadding? Here it is, past eleven. Good-natured, yet not quite approving. Did it feel neglected? Well, you didn't remember to close the lower draft in the furnace. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I don't often forget things like that, do I?' She dropped into his lap, and, after he had jerked back his head to save his eyeglasses and removed the glasses and settled her in a position less cramping to his legs and casually cleared his throat, <coughs> he kissed her amiably and remarked, "'Nope. I must say you're fairly good about things like that. I wasn't kicking. I just meant I wouldn't want the fire to go out on us. Leave that draft open and the fire might burn up and go out on us. And the nights are beginning to get pretty cold again, pretty cold on my drive.' I put the side curtains up. It was so chilly. But the generator is working all right now. Yes, it is chilly. But I feel fine after my walk. Go walking? I went up to see the Perrys. By a definite act of will, she added the truth. They weren't in. And I saw a guy, Pollock, dropped into his office. Why, you haven't been sitting and chinning with him till eleven o'clock. Oh, of course, there were some other people there, and... Will... What do you think of Dr. Westlake? Westlake, why? Oh, I noticed him on the street today. Was he limping? If the poor fish would have his teeth x-rayed, I'll bet nine and a half cents he'd find an abscess there. Rheumatism, he calls it. Rheumatism, hell. He's behind the times. Wonder he doesn't bleed himself. Well, a profound and serious yawn. I hate to break up the party, but it's getting late, and a doctor never knows when he'll get routed out before morning. She remembered that he had given this explanation in these words not less than thirty times in the year. I guess we'd better be trotting up to bed. I've wound the clock and looked at the furnace. Did you lock the front door when you came in? They trailed upstairs after he had turned out the lights and twice tested the front door to make sure it was fast. While they talked, they were preparing for bed. Carol still sought to maintain privacy by undressing behind the screen of the closet door. Kennicott was not so reticent. 
Tonight, as every night, she was irritated by having to push the old plush chair out of the way before she could open the closet door. Every time she opened the door, she shoved the chair. Ten times an hour. But Kennicott liked to have the chair in the room, and there was no place for it except in front of the closet. She pushed it, felt angry, hid her anger. Kennicott was yawning, more portentously. The room smelled stale. She shrugged and became chatty. "'You were speaking of Dr. Westlake. Tell me, you've never summed him up. Is he really a good doctor?' "'Oh, yes. He's a wise old coot.' "'There. You see, there is no medical rivalry, not in my house,' she said triumphantly to Guy Pollock. She hung her silk petticoat on a closet hook and went on. "'Dr. Westlake is so gentle and scholarly.' "'Well, I don't know as I'd say he was such a whale of a scholar. "'I've always had a suspicion he did a good deal of foreflushing about that. "'He likes to have people think he keeps up his French and Greek and Lord knows what all, "'and he's always got an old Dago book lying around the sitting room. "'But I've got a hunch he reads detective stories about like the rest of us, "'and I don't know where he'd ever learned so doggone many languages anyway. "'He kind of lets people assume he went to Harvard or Berlin or Oxford or somewhere.' But I looked him up in the medical register, and he graduated from a Hick College in Pennsylvania, way back in 1861. But this is an important thing. Is he an honest doctor? How do you mean honest? Depends on what you mean. Well, suppose you were sick. Would you call him in? Would you let me call him in? Not if I were well enough to cuss and bite, I wouldn't. No, sir. I wouldn't have the old fake in the house. Makes me tired, his everlasting palavering and soft soaping. Oh, he's all right for an ordinary bellyache or holding some fool woman's hand. But I wouldn't call him in for an honest-to-God illness. Not much I wouldn't, no, sir. You know, I don't do much backbiting, but same time. I'll tell you, Carrie. I've never got over being sore at Westlake for the way he treated Mrs. Jonderquist. Nothing the matter with her. What she really needed was a rest. But Westlake kept calling on her and calling on her for weeks, almost every day. And they sent her a good, big, fat bill, too, you can bet. I never did forgive him for that. Nice, decent, hard-working people like the Jonderquists. In her Batiste nightgown, she was standing at the bureau, engaged in the invariable rites of wishing that she had a real dressing table with a triple mirror of bending toward the streaky glass and raising her chin to inspect a pinhead mole on her throat and, finally, of brushing her hair. In rhythm to the strokes, she went on. But, Will, there isn't any of what you might call financial rivalry between you and the partners— Westlake and McGannum, is there? He flipped into bed with a solemn back somersault and a ludicrous kick of his heels as he tucked his legs under the blankets. He snorted. Lord, no. I never begrudge any man a nickel. He can get away from me, fairly. But is Westlake fair? Isn't he sly? Sly is the word. He's a fox, that boy. She saw Guy Pollock's grin in the mirror. She flushed. Kennicott, with his arms behind his head, was yawning. Yep. He's too smooth. <gasps> too smooth. But I bet I make pretty near as much as Westlake and McGann both together, though I've never wanted to grab more than my just share. If anybody wants to go to the partners instead of to me, that's his business. Though I must say it makes me tired when Westlake gets hold of the Dawsons. Here, Luke Dawson had been coming to me for every toe ache and headache and a lot of little things that just wasted my time. And then, when his grandchild was here last summer and had summer complaint, I... "'Suppose, or something like that, probably. "'You know, uh, the time you and I drove up to Lac Chimere? "'Why, Westlake got hold of Maud Dawson and scared her to death. It "'Made her think the kid had appendicitis. "'And by golly, if he and McGannum didn't operate "'and haul their heads off about the terrible adhesions they found "'and what a regular Charlie and Will Mayo they were for classy surgery. "'They let on that if they'd waited two hours more, "'the kid would have developed peritonitis and God knows what all. "'And then they collected a nice fat hundred and fifty dollars.' and probably they'd have charged three hundred if they hadn't been afraid of me. I'm no hog, but I certainly do hate to give old Luke ten dollars worth of advice for a dollar and a half, and then see a hundred and fifty go glimmering, and if I can't do a better pendectomy than either Westlake or McGannum, I'll eat my hat. As she crept into bed, she was dazzled by Guy's blazing grin. She experimented. But Westlake is cleverer than his son-in-law, don't you think? Yes. Westlake may be old-fashioned and all that, but he's got a certain amount of intuition, while McGannum goes into everything bull-headed and butts his way through like a damn yahoo, and tries to argue his patients into having whatever he diagnoses them as having. About the best thing Mac can do is to stick to baby-snatching. 
He's just about on a par with this bone-pounding chiropractor female, Mrs. Maddie Gooch. Mrs. Westlake and Mrs. McGannum, though, they're nice. They've been awfully cordial to me. Well, no reason why they shouldn't be, is there? Oh, they're nice enough, though you can bet your bottom dollar they're both plugging for their husbands all the time trying to get the business. And I don't know as I call it so damn cordial in Mrs. McGannum when I holler at her on the street and she nods back like she had a sore neck. Still, uh, she's all right. It's Ma Westlake that makes the mischief pussyfooting around all the time. But I wouldn't trust any Westlake out of the whole lot. And while Mrs. McGannum seems square enough, you don't never want to forget that she's Westlake's daughter, you bet. What about Dr. Gould? Don't you think he's worse than either Westlake or McGannum? He's so cheap, drinking and playing pool and always smoking cigars in such a cocky way. Oh, that's all right now. Terry Gould is a good deal of a tinhorn sport, but he knows a lot about medicine, and don't you forget it for one second. She stared down Guy's grin and asked more cheerfully, Is he honest, too? Oh, gosh, I'm sleepy. He burrowed beneath the bedclothes in a luxurious stretch and came up like a diver, shaking his head as he complained. Uh, how's that? Who? Terry Gould, honest. <laughs> Don't start me laughing. I'm too nice and sleepy. I didn't say he was honest. I said he had savvy enough to find the index in Gray's Anatomy, which is more than McGannum can do. But I didn't say anything about his being honest. He isn't. Terry is crooked as a dog's hind leg. He's done me more than one dirty trick. He told Mrs. Glorbach, 17 miles out, that I wasn't up to date in obstetrics. Fat lot of good it did him. She came right in and told me. And Terry's lazy. He'd let a pneumonia patient choke rather than interrupt a poker game. Oh, no. I can't believe... Well, now I'm telling you. Does he play much poker? Dr. Dillon told me that Dr. Gould wanted him to play. Dillon told you what? Where'd you meet Dillon? He's just come to town. Uh, he and his wife were at Mr. Pollock's tonight. Say, uh, what'd you think of them? Didn't Dillon strike you as pretty light-waisted? Why, no. He seemed intelligent. I'm sure he's much more wide awake than our dentist. Well, now, the old man is a good dentist. He knows his business. And Dillon? I wouldn't cuddle up to the Dillons too close if I were you. All right for Pollock, and that's none of our business, but we... Well, I, I think I'd just give the Dillons the glad hand and pass him up. But why? He is an arrival. That's all right. Kennicott was aggressively awake now. He'll work right in with Westlake and McGannum. Matter of fact, I suspect they were largely responsible for his locating here. They'll be sending him patients, and he'll send all that he can get hold of to them. I don't trust anybody that's too much hand in glove with Westlake. You give Dylan a shot at some fellow that's just bought a farm here and drifts into town to get his teeth looked at, and after Dylan gets through with him... You'll see him edging around to Westlake and McGannum every time. Carol reached for her blouse, which hung on a chair by the bed. She draped it about her shoulders and sat up studying Kennicott, her chin in her hands. In the gray light from the small electric bulb down the hall, she could see that he was frowning. Well, this is... I must get this straight. Someone said to me the other day that in... Towns like this, even more than in cities, all the doctors hate each other because of the money. Who said that? It doesn't matter. I'll bet a hat it was your Vida Sherwin. She's a brainy woman, but she'd be a damn sight brainier if she kept her mouth shut and didn't let so much of her brains ooze out that way. Well, oh, Will, that's horrible. Aside from the vulgarity, some ways Vida is my best friend. Even if she had said it, which, as a matter of fact, she didn't. He reared up his thick shoulders in absurd pink and green flannelette pajamas. He sat straight and irritatingly snapped his fingers and growled. Well, if she didn't say it, let's forget her. Doesn't make any difference who said it anyway. The point is that you believe it. God, to think you don't understand me any better than that. Money. This is the first real quarrel we've ever had, she was agonizing. He thrust out his long arm and snatched his wrinkly vest from a chair. He took out a cigar, a match. He tossed the vest on the floor. He lighted the cigar and puffed savagely. He broke up the match and snapped the fragments at the footboard. She suddenly saw the footboard of the bed as the footstone of the grave of love. The room was drab-colored and ill-ventilated. Kennicott did not believe in opening the windows so darn wide that you heat all outdoors. The stale air seemed never to change. 
In the light from the hall, they were two lumps of bedclothes, with shoulders and tousled heads attached. She begged. I didn't mean to wake you up, dear. And please, don't smoke. You've been smoking so much. Please go back to sleep. I'm sorry. Being sorry's all right, but I'm going to tell you one or two things. This fallen for anybody say so about medical jealousy and competition is simply part and parcel of your usual willingness to think the worst you possibly can of us poor dubs in Gopher Prairie. Trouble with women like you is you always want to argue. Can't take things the way they are. Got to argue. Well, I'm not going to argue about this in any way, shape, manner, or form. Trouble with you is you don't make any effort to appreciate us. You're so damn superior and think the city is such a hell of a lot finer place and you want us to do what you want all the time. That's not true. It's I who make the effort. It's they. It's you who stand back and criticize. I have to come over to the town's opinion. I have to devote myself to their interests. They can't even see my interests to say nothing of adopting them. I get ever so excited about their old Lake Minnie Mashie and the cottages, but they simply guffaw in that lovely, friendly way you advertise so much if I speak of wanting to see Teormina also. Sure. Tormina, whatever that is, some nice, expensive millionaire colony, I suppose. Sure, that's the idea. Champagne taste and beer income. And make sure that we never will have more than a beer income, too. Are you by any chance implying that I am not economical? Well, I hadn't intended to, but since you bring it up yourself, I don't mind saying the grocery bills are about twice what they ought to be. Yes, they probably are. I'm not economical. I can't be, thanks to you. Where do you get that thanks to you? Please don't be so colloquial, or shall I say vulgar? I'll be as damn colloquial as I want to. How do you get that thanks to you? Here about a year ago you jumped me for not remembering to give you money. Well, I'm reasonable. I didn't blame you, and I said I was to blame. But have I ever forgotten it since, practically? No, you haven't, practically. But that isn't it. I ought to have an allowance. I will, too. I must have an agreement for a regular stated amount every month. Fine idea. Of course, a doctor gets a regular stated amount. Sure, a thousand one month, and lucky if he makes a hundred the next. Very well, then. A percentage, or something else. No matter how much you vary, you can make a rough average for... But what's the idea? What are you trying to get at? Mean to say I'm unreasonable? Think I'm so unreliable and tightwad that you've got to tie me down with a contract? By God, that hurts. I thought I'd been pretty generous and decent, and I took a lot of pleasure... Thinks I, she'll be tickled when I hand her over this twenty or fifty or whatever it was, and now seems you've been wanting to make it a kind of alimony. Me, like a poor fool, thinking I was liberal all the while, and you... Oh, please stop pitying yourself. You're having a beautiful time feeling injured. I admit all you say. Certainly. You've given me money, both freely and amiably, quite as if I were your mistress. Carrie. I mean it. What was a magnificent spectacle of generosity to you was humiliation to me. You gave me money, gave it to your mistress if she was complacent, and then you... Carrie, don't interrupt me. Then you felt you discharge all obligation. Well, hereafter I'll refuse your money as a gift. Either I'm your partner in charge of the household department of our business with a regular budget for it, or else I'm nothing. If I'm to be a mistress, I shall choose my lovers. Oh, I hate it. I hate it, this smirking and hoping for money, and then not even spending it on jewels as a mistress has a right to, but spending it on double boilers and socks for you. Yes, indeed. You're generous. You give me a dollar right out. The only proviso is that I must spend it on a tie for you, and you give it when and as you wish. How can I be anything but uneconomical? Oh, well, of course. Looking at it that way, I can't shop around. Can't buy in large quantities, have to stick to stores where I have a charge account, good deal of the time, can't plan because I don't know how much money I can depend on. That's what I pay for your charming sentimentalities about giving so generously. You make me... Wait, wait, you know you're exaggerating. You never thought about that mistress stuff till just this minute. Matter of fact, you never have smirked and hoped for money. But all the same, you may be right. You ought to run the household as a business. I'll... Figure out a definite plan tomorrow, and hereafter you'll be on a regular amount or percentage with your own checking account. Oh, that is decent of you. She turned toward him, trying to be affectionate. But his eyes were pink and unlovely in the flare of the match with which he lighted his dead and malodorous cigar. His head drooped, and a ridge of flesh scattered with pale, small bristles bulged out under his chin. She sat in abeyance till he croaked. No. "'Tisn't especially decent. It's just fair. And God knows I want to be fair. 
but I expect others to be fair, too. And you're so high and mighty about people. Take Sam Clark, best soul that ever lived, honest and loyal and a damn good fellow. Yes, and a good shot at ducks, don't forget that. Well, uh, and he is a good shot, too. Sam drops around in the evening to sit and visit, and by golly, just because he takes a dry smoke and rolls his cigar around in his mouth and maybe spits a few times, you look at him as if he was a hog. Oh, you didn't know I was on to you, and I certainly hope Sam hasn't noticed it, but I never miss it. I have felt that way, spitting. Ugh. But I'm sorry you caught my thoughts. I tried to be nice. I tried to hide them. Maybe I catch a whole lot more than you think I do. Yes, perhaps you do. And do you know why Sam doesn't light his cigar when he's here? Why? He's so darn afraid you'll be offended if he smokes. You scare him. Every time he speaks of the weather, you jump him because he ain't talking about poetry or Gerda or, or some other highbrow junk. Yeah, you've got him so leery he scarcely dares to come here. Oh, I am sorry, though I'm sure it's you who are exaggerating now. Well, now I don't know as I am, and I can tell you one thing. If you keep on, you'll manage to drive away every friend I've got. Well, that would be horrible of me. You know I don't mean to, Will. What is it about me that frightens Sam, if I do frighten him? Oh, you do all right. Instead of putting his legs up on another chair and unbuttoning his vest and telling a good story or maybe kidding me about something, he sits on the edge of his chair and tries to make conversation about politics, and he doesn't even cuss, and Sam's never real comfortable unless he can cuss a little. In other words, he isn't comfortable unless he can behave like a peasant in a mud hut. Now that'll be enough of that. You want to know how you scare him? First, you deliberately fire some question at him that you know darn well he can't answer. Any fool could see you were experimenting with him. And then you shock him by talking of mistresses or something like you were doing just now. Well, of course, the pure Samuel never speaks of such erring ladies in his private conversations. Not when there's ladies around. You can bet your life on that. So the impurity lies in failing to pretend that now nah, we won't go into all that eugenics or whatever damn fad you choose to call it. As I say, first you shock him, and then you become so darn flighty that nobody can follow you. Either you want to dance, or you bang the piano, or, or else you get moody as the devil and don't want to talk, or anything else. If you must be temperamental, why can't you be that way by yourself? My dear man, there's nothing I'd like better than to be by myself occasionally, to have a room of my own. I suppose you expect me to sit here and dream delicately and satisfy my temper of mentality while you wander in from the bathroom with lather all over your face and shout, Seen my brown pants? Ha! Huh. He did not sound impressed. He made no answer. He turned out of bed, his feet making one solid thud on the floor. He marched from the room, a grotesque figure in baggy union pajamas. She heard him drawing a drink of water at the bathroom tap. She was furious at the contemptuousness of his exit. She snuggled down in bed and looked away from him as he returned. He ignored her. As he flumped into bed, he yawned and casually stated, Well, you'll have plenty of privacy when we build a new house. When? Oh, I'll build it all right, don't you fret. But, of course, I don't expect any credit for it. Now, it was she who grunted, huh, and ignored him, and felt independent and masterful as she shot up out of bed, turned her back on him, fished a lone and petrified chocolate out of her glove box in the top right-hand drawer of the bureau, gnawed at it, found that it had coconut filling, said, damn, wished that she had not said it so that she might be superior to his colloquialism, and hurled the chocolate into the wastebasket where it made an evil and mocking clatter among the debris of torn linen collars and toothpaste box. Then, in great dignity and self-dramatization, she returned to bed. All this time he had been talking on, embroidering his assertion that he didn't expect any credit. She was reflecting that he was a rustic, that she hated him, that she had been insane to marry him, that she had married him only because she was tired of work, that she must get her long gloves cleaned, that she would never do anything more for him, that she mustn't forget his hominy for breakfast. She was roused to attention by his storming. I'm a fool to think about a new house. By the time I get it built, you'll probably have succeeded in your plan to get me completely in touch with every friend and every patient I've got. She sat up with a bounce. She said coldly, Thank you very much for revealing your real opinion of me. If that's the way you feel, if I'm such a hindrance to you, I can't stay under this roof another minute, and I am perfectly well able to earn my own living. I will go at once, and you may get a divorce at your pleasure. What you want is a nice sweet cow of a woman who will enjoy having your dear friends talk about the weather and spit on the floor. Ah, oh, tut, don't be a fool. 
You will soon, very soon, find out whether I'm a fool or not. I mean it. Do you think I'd stay here one second after I found out that I was injuring you? At least I have enough sense of justice not to do that. Please stop flying off at tangents, Carrie. This tangents, tangents, let me tell you, isn't a theater play. It's a serious effort to have us get together on fundamentals. We've both been cranky and said a lot of things we didn't mean. I wish we were a couple of blooming poets and just talked about roses and moonshine, but we're human. All right, let's cut out jabbing at each other. Let's admit... We both do fool things. Now, see here. You know you feel superior to folks. You're not as bad as I say, but you're not as good as you say, not by a long shot. What's the reason you're so superior? Why can't you take folks as they are? Her preparations for stalking out of the doll's house were not yet visible. She mused. I think perhaps it's my childhood. She halted. When she went on, her voice had an artificial sound, her words the bookish quality of emotional meditation. My father was the tenderest man in the world, but he did feel superior to ordinary people. Well, he was, and the Minnesota Valley. I used to sit there on the cliffs above Mankato for hours at a time, my chin in my hand, looking way down the valley, wanting to write poems. The shiny, tilted roofs below me, and the river, and beyond it the level fields in the mist, and the rim of palisades across. It held my thoughts in. I lived in the valley. But the prairie, all my thoughts go flying off into the big space. Do you think it might be that? Ah, uh, well, maybe, but... Carrie, you always talk so much about getting all you can out of life and not letting the year slip by, and here you deliberately go and deprive yourself of a lot of real good home pleasure by not enjoying people unless they wear frock coats and trot out. Morning clothes. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. To a lot of tea parties. Take Jack Elder. You think Jack hasn't got any ideas about anything but manufacturing and the tariff on lumber. But you know that Jack is nutty about music? He'll put a grand opera record on the phonograph and sit and listen to it and close his eyes. Or, or you take Lim Cass. Ever realize what a well-informed man he is? But is he? Gopher Prairie calls anybody well-informed who's been through the state capitol and heard about Gladstone. Now, I'm telling you, Lim reads a lot, solid stuff, history. Or take Mart Mahoney, the garageman. He's got a lot of Perry prints of famous pictures in his office. Or old Bingham Playfair that died here about a year ago lived seven miles out. He was a captain in the Civil War and knew General Sherman. And they say he was a miner in Nevada right alongside of Mark Twain. You'll find these characters in all these small towns and a pile of savvy in every single one of them if you just dig for it. I know, and I do love them, especially people like Champ Perry, but I can't be so very enthusiastic over the smug sits like Jack Elder. Then I'm a smug sit too, whatever that is. No, you're a scientist. Oh, oh I will try and get the music out of Mr. Elder, only... Why can't he let it come out instead of being ashamed of it and always talking about hunting dogs? But I will try. Is it all right now? Sure. But there's one other thing. You might give me some attention, too. That's unjust. You have everything I am. No, I haven't. You think you respect me. You always hand out some spiel about my being so useful. But you never think of me as having ambitions just as much as you have. Perhaps not. I, I think of you as being perfectly satisfied. Well, I'm not. Not by a long shot. I don't want to be a plug general practitioner all my life like Westlake and die in harness because I can't get out of it and have him say, Oh, he was a good fellow, but he couldn't save a cent. Not that I care a whoop what they say after I've kicked in and can't hear him. But I want to put enough money away so you and I can be independent someday and not have to work unless I feel like it. And I want to have a good house. By golly, I'll have as good a house as anybody in this town. And if we want to travel and see your Tormino or whatever it is, why, we can do it with enough money in our genes so we won't have to take anything off anybody or fret about our old age. You never worry about what might happen if we got sick and didn't have a good fat wad sold away, do you? I don't suppose I do. Well, then I have to do it for you. And if you think, for one moment, I want to be stuck in this burg all my life and not have a chance to travel and see the different points of interest and all that, then you simply don't get me. I want to have a squint at the world, much as you do. Only I'm practical about it. 
first place, I'm going to make the money. Uh, I'm investing in good, safe farmlands. Do you understand why now? Yes. Will you try and see if you can't think of me as something more than just a dollar-chasing roughneck? Oh, my dear, I, I haven't been just. I am difficult, and I won't call on the Dillons, and if Dr. Dilling is working for Westlake and McGannum, I, I hate him. The End of Chapter 14 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 15 That December she was in love with her husband. She romanticized herself not as a great reformer, but as the wife of a country physician. The realities of the doctor's household were colored by her pride. Late at night, a step on the wooden porch, heard through her confusion of sleep, the storm door opened, fumbling over the inner door panels, the buzz of the electric bell, Kennicott muttering, God darn it, but patiently creeping out of bed, remembering to draw the covers up to keep her warm, feeling for slippers and bathrobe, clumping downstairs. From below, half heard in her drowsiness, a colloquy in the pidgin German of the farmers who have forgotten the old country language without learning the new. Hallo, Barney, was willst du? Morgen, Doctor. Die Frau ist ja awful sick. All night she been having an awful pain in the belly. How long has she been this way? We lang, eh? I don't know, maybe two days. Why didn't you come for me yesterday instead of waking me up out of a sound sleep? Here it is, two o'clock. So, uh, spot warm, huh? No, never. I know it, but she got such a lot worse last evening. I, I thought maybe all the time it go away, but it got a lot worse. Any fever? Well, yeah, uh, I think she got fever. Which side is the pain on? Huh? Uh, dal schmerz, Uh, which side is it on? Here? So, right here it is. Any rigidity there? Huh? Is it rigid, stiff? I mean, does the belly feel hard to the fingers? I don't know. She ain't said yet. What's she been eating? Well, I, I think about what the allers eat. Maybe some uh, corned beef, cabbage, sausage, and so well, huh? Uh, Doc, uh, she want Emma all the time. She holler like hell. I, I wish you come. All right, but you call me earlier next time. Look here, Barney, you better install a phone. Telephone, Hobbin. Uh, some of you Dutchmen will be dying one of these days before you can fetch the doctor. The door closing. Barney's wagon, the wheels silent in the snow, but the wagon body rattling. Kennicott clicking the receiver hook to rouse the night telephone operator, giving a number, waiting... Cursing mildly, waiting again, and at last growling. Hello, Gus, this is the doctor. Say, uh, uh, send me up a team. Guess snow's too thick for a machine. Going eight miles south. All right, huh? The hell I will. Uh, don't you go back to sleep, huh? Well, that's all right now. Uh, you didn't wait so very darn long. All right, Gus, shoot her along. Bye. He stepped on the stairs, his quiet moving about the frigid room while he dressed his abstracted and meaningless cough. She was supposed to be asleep. She was too exquisitely drowsy to break the charm by speaking. On a slip of paper laid on the bureau, she could hear the pencil grinding against the marble slab. He wrote his destination. He went out, hungry, chilly, unprotesting, and she, before she fell asleep again, loved him for his sturdiness and saw the drama of his riding by night to the frightened household on the distant farm, pictured children standing at a window waiting for him. He suddenly had in her eyes the heroism of a wireless operator on a ship in a collision, of an explorer, fever-clawed, deserted by his bearers, but going on in the jungle, going. At six, when the light faltered in, as through ground glass and bleakly identified the chairs as gray rectangles, she heard his step on the porch, heard him at the furnace, the rattle of shaking the grate, the slow grinding removal of ashes, the shovel thrust into the coal bin, the abrupt clatter of the coal as it flew into the firebox, the fussy regulation of drafts, the daily sounds of a gopher prairie life, now first appealing to her as something brave and enduring, many-colored and free. She visioned the firebox, 
flames turned to lemon and metallic gold as the coal dust sifted over them, thin, twisty flutters of purple, ghost flames which gave no light slipping up between the dark banked coals. It was luxurious in bed, and the house would be warm for her when she rose, she reflected. What a worthless cat she was! What were her aspirations besides his capability? She woke again as he dropped into bed. Seems like just a few minutes ago that you started out. I've been away for four hours. I've operated on a woman for appendicitis in a Dutch kitchen. Came awful close to losing her, too. But I pulled her through all right. Close squeak. Barney says he shot ten rabbits last Sunday. He was instantly asleep. One hour of rest before he had to be up and ready for the farmers who came in early. She marveled that, in what was to her but a night-blurred moment, he should have been in a distant place, have taken charge of a strange house, have slashed a woman, saved a life. What wonder he detested the lazy Westlake and McGannum. How could the easy Guy Pollock understand this skill and endurance? Then Canicut was grumbling. Seven fifteen. Aren't you ever going to get up for breakfast? And he was not a hero scientist, but a rather irritable and commonplace man who needed a shave. They had coffee, griddle cakes, and sausages, and talked about Mrs. McGannum's atrocious alligator hide belt. Night witchery and morning disillusion were alike forgotten in the march of realities and days. Familiar to the doctor's wife was the man with an injured leg driven in from the country on a Sunday afternoon and brought to the house. He sat in a rocker in the back of a lumber wagon, his face pale from the anguish of the jolting. His leg was thrust out before him, resting on a starch box and covered with a leather-bound horse blanket. His drab, courageous wife drove the wagon, and she helped Kennicott support him as he hobbled up the steps into the house. Fella cut his leg with an axe. Pretty bad gash. Uh, Halver Nelson, nine miles out, Kennicott observed. Carol fluttered at the back of the room, childishly excited when she was sent to fetch towels and a basin of water. Kennicott lifted the farmer into a chair and chuckled. There we are, Halver. We'll have you out fixing fences and drinking aquavit in a month. The farm wife sat on the couch, expressionless, bulky in a man's dogskin coat and unplumbed layers of jackets. The flowery silk handkerchief which she had worn over her head now hung about her seamed neck. Her white wool gloves lay in her lap. Kennicott drew from the injured leg the thick red German sock, the numerous other socks of gray and white wool, then the spiral bandage. The leg was of an unwholesome dead white, with the black hairs feeble and thin and flattened, and the scar a puckered line of crimson. Surely, Carol shuddered, this was not human flesh, the rosy, shining tissue of the amorous poets. Kennicott examined the scar, smiled at Howler, and his wife chanted, Fine be gosh, couldn't be better. The Nelsons looked deprecating. The farmer nodded a cue to his wife, and she mourned. Well, how much we going to owe you, doctor? I guess it'll be, uh, let's see, uh, one drive out and uh, two calls. I guess it'll be about eleven dollars in all, Lena. I don't know if we can pay you just a little while, doctor. Kennicott lumbered over to her, patted her shoulder, roared. Why, Lord love you, sister. I won't worry if I never get it. You pay me next fall when you get your crop. Carrie, suppose you or B could shake up a cup of coffee and some cold lamb for the Nelsons? They got a long, cold drive ahead. He had been gone since morning. Her eyes ached with reading. Vida Sherwin could not come to tea. She wandered through the house, empty as the bleary street without. The problem of, will the doctor be home in time for supper, or shall I sit down without him, was important in the household. Six was the rigid the canonical supper hour, but at half-past six he had not come. Much speculation with B. Had the obstetrical case taken longer than he had expected? Had he been called somewhere else? Was the snow much heavier out in the country so that he shouldn't have taken a buggy or even a cutter instead of the car? Here in town it had melted a lot, but still... A honking, a shout. The motor engine raced before it was shut off. She hurried to the window. The car was a monster at rest after furious adventures. The headlights blazed on the clots of ice in the road so that the tiniest lumps gave mountainous shadows, and the taillight cast a circle of ruby on the snow behind. Kennicott was opening the door, crying, Here we are, old girl. Got stuck a couple of times, but we made it, by golly. We made it. And here we be. Come on.
food, Eaton's. She rushed to him, patted his fur coat, the long hair smooth but chilly to her fingers. She joyously summoned B. All right, he's here. We'll sit right down. There were, to inform the doctor's wife of his successes, no clapping audiences, nor book reviews, nor honorary degrees. But there was a letter written by a German farmer recently moved from Minnesota to Saskatchewan. Dear sir, as you have been threading me for a few weeks this summer and seen what is wrong with me so in regarding to that, I want to thank you. The doctor air say what shot big wrong with me and they give me some mad sin, but it didn't help me like what you did. Now they claim that I won't need any medicine at all, what you think? Well, I haven't been taking anything for about one and a half month, but I don't get better, so I like to hear what you think about it. I feel like this, this confabble feeling round the stomach after eating, and that pain around head and down arm, and about three to three and a half hour after eating, I feel weak-like and dizzy and a dull headache. Uh, now you just let me know what you think about me. I do what you say. She encountered Guy Pollock at the drugstore. He looked at her as though he had a right to. He spoke softly. I haven't seen you for the last few days. No, I've been out in the country with Will several times. He's so... Do you know that people like you and me can never understand people like him? We're a pair of hypercritical loafers, you and I, while he quietly goes and does things. She nodded and smiled and was very busy about purchasing boric acid. He stared after her and slipped away. When she found that he was gone, she was slightly disconcerted. She could at times agree with Kennicott that the shaving and corset's familiarity of married life was not very vulgarity, but a wholesome frankness, that artificial reticences might merely be irritating. She was not much disturbed when for hours he sat about the living room in his honest socks, but she would not listen to his theory that all this romance stuff is simply moonshine, elegant when you're courting, but no use busting yourself keeping it up all your life. She thought of surprises, games to vary the days, she knitted an astounding purple scarf, which she hid under a supper plate. When he discovered it, he looked embarrassed and gasped. Is today an anniversary or something? Uh, gosh, I'd forgotten it. Once, she filled a thermos bottle with hot coffee, a cornflakes box with cookies, just baked by B, and hustled to his office at three in the afternoon. She hid her bundles in the hall and peeped in. The office was shabby. Kennicott had inherited it from a medical predecessor and changed it only by adding a white enameled operating table, a sterilizer, a wrench and ray apparatus, and a small portable typewriter. It was a suite of two rooms, a waiting room with straight chairs, shaky pine table, and those coverless and unknown magazines which are found only in the offices of dentists and doctors. The room beyond, looking on Main Street, was a business office, consulting room, operating room, and, in an alcove, bacteriological and chemical laboratory. The wooden floors of both rooms were bare. The furniture was brown and scaly. Waiting for the doctor were two women, as still as though they were paralyzed, and a man in a railroad brakeman's uniform, holding his bandaged right hand with his tanned left. They stared at Carol. She sat modestly in a stiff chair, feeling frivolous and out of place. Kennicott appeared at the inner door, ushering out a bleached man with a trickle of wan beard and consoling him. All right, Dad, be careful about the sugar, and mind the diet I gave you. Get the prescription filled and come in and see me next week. Say, uh, better, better not drink too much beer, all right, Dad? His voice was artificially hearty. He looked absently at Carol. He was a medical machine now, not a domestic machine. What is it, Carrie? he droned. No hurry, just wanted to say hello. Well, self-pity because he did not divine that this was a surprise party rendered her satin interesting to herself, and she had the pleasure of the martyrs in saying bravely to him, It's nothing special. If you're busy long, I'll trot home. While she waited, she ceased to pity and began to mock herself. For the first time, she observed the waiting room. Oh, yes, the doctor's family had to have OB panels and a wide couch and an electric percolator, 
but any hole was good enough for sick, tired common people who were nothing but the one means and excuse for the doctor's existing. No. She couldn't blame Kennicott. He was satisfied by the shabby chairs. He put up with them as his patients did. It was her neglected province, she who had been going about talking of rebuilding the whole town. When the patients were gone, she brought in her bundles. What's those? wondered Kennicott. Turn your back. Look out of the window. He obeyed, not very much bored. When she cried, Now! A feast of cookies and small hard candies and hot coffee was spread on the roll-top desk in the inner room. His broad face lightened. That's a new one on me. Never was more surprised in my life, and by golly, I believe I am hungry. Say, this is fine. When the first exhilaration of the surprise had declined, she demanded, Will, I'm going to refurnish your waiting room. What's the matter with it? It's all right. It is not. It's hideous. We can afford to give your patients a better place, and it would be good business. She felt tremendously politic. Rats, I don't worry about the business. Now, you look here now. As I told you, uh, just because I like to tuck a few dollars away, I'll be switched if I'll stand for your thinking I'm nothing but a dollar chasing. Oh, stop it quick. I'm not hurting your feelings. I'm not criticizing. I'm the adoring least one of thy harem. I just mean... Two days later, with pictures, wicker chairs, a rug, she had made the waiting room habitable, and Kennicott admitted, Does look a lot better. Never thought much about it. Guess I, I need being bullied. She was convinced that she was gloriously content in her career as a doctor's wife. She tried to free herself from the speculation and disillusionment which had been twitching at her, sought to dismiss all the opinionation of an insurgent era. She wanted to shine upon the veal-faced, bristly-bearded Lyman Cass as much as upon Miles Bjornstam or Guy Pollock. She gave a reception for the Thanatopsis Club. But her real acquiring of merit was in calling upon that Mrs. Bogart, whose gossipy good opinion was so valuable to a doctor. Though the Bogart house was next door, she had entered it but three times. Now she put on her new moleskin cap, which made her face small and innocent. She rubbed off the traces of a lipstick and fled across the alley before her admirable resolution should sneak away. The age of houses, like the age of men, has small relation to their years. The dull green cottage of the good widow Bogart was twenty years old, but it had the antiquity of Cheops and the smell of mummy dust. Its neatness rebuked the street. The two stones by the path were painted yellow. The outhouse was so over-modestly masked with vines and lattice that it was not concealed at all. The last iron dog remaining in Gopher Prairie stood among whitewashed conch shells upon the lawn. The hallway was dismayingly scrubbed. The kitchen was an exercise in mathematics, and problems were worked out in equidistant chairs. The parlor was kept for visitors, Carol suggested. Let's sit in the kitchen. Please don't trouble to light the parlor stove. Oh, no trouble at all. Oh, my gracious, and you coming so seldom and all, and the kitchen is a perfect sight. I, I try to keep it clean, but Sai will track mud all over it. I've spoken to him about it a hundred times if I've spoken once. No, uh, you sit right there, dearie, and I'll, I'll make a fire. No trouble at all. Uh, practically no trouble at all. Mrs. Bogart groaned, rubbed her joints, and repeatedly dusted her hands while she made the fire. And when Carol tried to help, she lamented, Oh, it doesn't matter. "'Guess I ain't good for much but toil and workin' anyway. Uh, "'Seems as though that's what a lot of folks think.' "'The parlor was distinguished by an expansive rag carpet, "'from which, as they entered, Mrs. Bogart hastily picked one sad dead fly. "'In the center of the carpet was a rug depicting a red Newfoundland dog "'reclining in a green and yellow daisy field and labeled Our Friend. "'The parlor organ, tall and thin, was adorned with a mirror partly circular, partly square.' and partly diamond-shaped, and with brackets holding a pot of geraniums, a mouth-organ, and a copy of the old-time hymnal. On the center table was a Sears Roebuck mail-order catalog, a silver frame with photographs of the Baptist church, and of an elderly clergyman, and an aluminum tray containing a rattlesnake's rattle and a broken spectacle lens. Mrs. Bogart spoke of the eloquence of the Reverend Mr. Zittrell, the coldness of cold days, the price of poplar wood, Dave Dyer's new haircut, and Cy Bogart's essential piety. 
As I said to his Sunday school teacher, Sai may be a little wild, but that's because he's got so much better brains than a lot of these boys, and this farmer that claims he caught Sai stealing beggies is a liar, and I ought to have the law on him. Mrs. Bogart went thoroughly into the rumor that the girl waiter at Billy's lunch was not all she might be, or rather was quite all she might be. My lands! What can you expect when everybody knows what her mother was? And if these traveling salesmen would let her alone, she would be all right, though I certainly don't believe she ought to be allowed to think she can pull the wool over our eyes. The sooner she's sent to the school for incorrigible girls down at Sock Center, the better for all, and... Oh, won't you just have a cup of coffee, Carol, dearie? I, I'm sure you won't mind old Auntie Bogart calling you by your first name when you think how long I've known Will, and, and I was such a friend of his dear, lovely mother when she lived here, and... Uh, oh, was that fur cap expensive? Uh, uh, but uh, don't you think it's awful the way folks talk in this town? Mrs. Bogart hitched her chair nearer. Her large face, with its disturbing collection of moles and lone black hairs, wrinkled cunningly. She showed her decayed teeth in a reproving smile, and in the confidential voice of one who sensed stale bedroom scandal, she breathed, "'I just don't see how folks can talk and act like they do. You don't know the things that go on under cover. This town, oh, why, it's only the religious training I've given Si that's kept him so innocent of uh, uh, things. Well, just the other day.' I never pay no attention to stories, but I heard it mighty good and straight that Harry Haydock is carrying on with a girl that clerks in a store down in Minneapolis, and poor Juanita not knowing anything about it, though maybe it's the judgment of God, because before she married Harry, she acted up with more than one boy. Well, I don't like to say it, and I maybe ain't up to date like Cy says, but I always believed a lady shouldn't even give names to all sorts of dreadful things, but just the same, I know there was at least one case where Juanita and a boy, well, they were just dreadful, and and then there's that Ole Jensen, the grocer, that thinks he's so plaguey smart, and I know he made up to a farmer's wife, and, oh, and this awful man, Jornstam, that does chores, and, and Nat Hicks, and... There was, it seemed, no person in town who was not living a life of shame except Mrs. Bogart, and naturally she resented it. She knew. She'd always happened to be there. Once, she whispered, she was going by when an indiscreet window shade had been left up a couple of inches. Once, she had noticed a man and woman holding hands and right at a Methodist sociable. Another thing. Oh, heaven knows I, I never want to start trouble, but I can't help what I see from my back steps. And I notice your hired girl B carrying on with the grocery boys and all. Mrs. Bogart, I'd trust B as I would myself. Oh, dearie, uh, uh, you don't understand me. Uh, I'm sure she's a good girl. I, I mean, she's green. And I hope that none of these horrid young men that there are around town will get her into trouble. It's their parents' fault. "'letting them run wild and hear evil things. "'Or if I had my way, there wouldn't be none of them, "'not boys, nor girls neither, "'allowed to know anything about, well, about things, uh, "'till they was married. "'It's terrible, the bald way that some folks talk. "'It just shows and gives away what awful thoughts they got inside them, "'and there's nothing can kill them except coming right to God "'and kneeling down like I do at prayer meeting every Wednesday evening "'and saying, Oh, God!' I would be a miserable sinner except for thy grace. I'd make every last one of these brats go to Sunday school and learn to think about nice things, instead of about cigarettes and goings on. And these dances they have at the lodges are the worst thing that ever happened to this town. A lot of young men squeezing girls and finding out, oh, oh, it's dreadful. I've told the mayor he ought to put a stop to them, and, oh, there was one boy in this town... I don't want to be suspicious or uncharitable, but... It was half an hour before Carol escaped. She stopped on her own porch and thought viciously. If that woman is on the side of the angels, then I have no choice. I must be on the side of the devil. But isn't she like me? She too wants to reform the town. She too criticizes everybody. She too thinks the men are vulgar and limited. Am I like her? This is ghastly. That evening, she did not merely consent to play cribbage with Kennicott. 
She urged him to play, and she worked up a hectic interest in land deals and Sam Clark. In courtship days, Kennicott had shown her a photograph of Nels Erdstrom's baby in Log Cabin, but she had never seen the Erdstroms. They had become merely patients of the doctor. Kennicott telephoned her on a mid-December afternoon. "'Want to throw your coat on and drive out to Erdstrom's with me? Fairly warm. Nels got the jaundice.' "'Oh, yes.' She hastened to put on her woolen stockings, high boots, sweater, muffler, cap, and mittens. The snow was too thick and the ruts frozen too hard for the motor. They drove out in a clumsy high carriage. Tucked over them was a blue woolen cover, prickly to her wrists, and outside of it a buffalo robe, humble and moth-eaten now, used ever since the bison herds had streaked the prairie a few miles to the west. The scattered houses between which they passed in town were small and desolate in contrast to the expanse of huge snowy yards and wide street. They crossed the railroad tracks and instantly were in the farm country. The big piebald horses snorted clouds of steam and started to trot. The carriage squeaked in rhythm. Kennicott drove with clucks of, "'There, boy, take it easy.' He was thinking. He paid no attention to Carol. Yet it was he who commented, "'Pretty nice over there,' as they approached an oak grove where shifty winter sunlight quivered in the hollow between two snowdrifts. They drove from the natural prairie to a clear district which twenty years ago had been forest. The country seemed to stretch unchanging to the North Pole, low hill, brush, scraggly bottom, reedy creek, muskrat mound, fields with frozen brown clods thrust up through the snow. Her ears and nose were pinched, her breath frosted her collar, her fingers ached. Getting colder, she said. Yep. That was all their conversation for three miles, yet she was happy. They reached Nels Erdstrom's at four, and, with a throb, she recognized the courageous venture which had lured her to Gopher Prairie. The cleared fields, furrows among stumps, a log cabin chinked with mud and roofed with dry hay. But Nels had prospered. He used the log cabin as a barn, and a new house reared up a proud, unwise Gopher Prairie house, the more naked and ungraceful in its glossy white paint and pink trimmings. Every tree had been cut down. The house was so unsheltered, so battered by the wind, so bleakly thrust out into the harsh clearing that Carol shivered. But they were welcomed warmly enough in the kitchen with its crisp new plaster, its blackened nickel range, its cream separator in a corner. Mrs. Erdstrom begged her to sit in the parlor where there was a phonograph and an oaken leather davenport, the prairie farmer's proofs of social progress. But she dropped down by the kitchen stove and insisted, Oh, please, don't mind me. When Mrs. Erdstrom had followed the doctor out of the room, Carol glanced in a friendly way at the grained pine cupboard, the framed Lutheran confirmations attest, the traces of fried eggs and sausages on the dining table against the wall, and a jewel among calendars presenting not only a lithographic young woman with cherry lips and a Swedish advertisement of Axel Egg's grocery, but also a thermometer and a match holder. She saw that a boy of four or five was staring at her from the hall, a boy in gingham shirt and faded corduroy trousers, but large-eyed, firm-mouthed, wide-browed. He vanished, then peeped in again, biting his knuckles, turning his shoulder toward her in shyness. Didn't she remember, what was it, a Kennicott sitting beside her at Fort Snelling urging? See how scared that baby is? Needs some woman like you. Magic had fluttered about her then, magic of sunset and cool air and the curiosity of lovers. She held out her hands as much to that sanctity as to the boy. He edged into the room, doubtfully sucking his thumb. "'Hello,' she said. "'What's your name?' <laughs> "'Oh, you're quite right. I agree with you. Silly people like me always ask children their names.' <laughs> "'Oh, come here, and I'll tell you the story of—well, I don't know what it will be about, but it will have a slim heroine and a Prince Charming.' He stood stoically while she spun nonsense. His giggling ceased. She was winning him. Then the telephone bell. Two long rings, one short. Mrs. Erdstrom galloped into the room, shrieked into the transmitter. Well? Yes, yes, this is Erdstrom's place, eh? Oh, you want the doctor? Kennicott appeared, growled into the telephone. Well, what do you want? Oh, hello, Dave. Uh, what do you want? Which Morgan Roths? Adolph's? All right. Amputation. Yeah, I see. 
Say, Dave, get Gus to harness up and take my surgical kit down there and have him take some chloroform. I'll go straight down from here. I uh, may not get home tonight. You can get me at Adolph's, huh? No, uh, uh, Carrie can give the anesthetic, I guess. Goodbye, huh? No, uh, tell me about that tomorrow. Too damn many people always listening in on this farmer's line. He turned to Carol. Adolf Morganroth, farmer, ten miles southwest of town, got his arm crushed fixing his cow shed and a post caved in on him. Smashed him up pretty bad. May have to amputate. Dave Dyer says, uh, afraid we'll have to go right from here. Darn sorry to drag you clear down there with me. Oh, please do. Don't mind me a bit. Think you could uh, give the anesthetic? Usually have my driver do it. If you'll tell me how. All right. Say, did you hear me putting one over on these goats that are always rubbering in on party lines? I hope they heard me. Well, now, Bessie, don't you worry about Nels. He's getting along all right. Tomorrow, you or one of the neighbors drive in and get this prescription filled at Dyer's. Uh, give him a teaspoonful every four hours. Goodbye. Oh, hello, here's the little fellow. My Lord, Bessie, it ain't possible this is the fellow that used to be so sickly. Why, say, he's a great big strap and Svenska now, huh? Going to be bigger than his daddy. Kennicott's bluffness made the child squirm with a delight which Carol could not evoke. It was a humble wife who followed the busy doctor out to the carriage, and her ambition was not to play at Rachmaninoff better, nor to build town halls, but to chuckle at babies. The sunset was merely a flush of rose on a dome of silver, with oak twigs and thin poplar branches against it. But a silo on the horizon changed from a red tank to a tower of violet misted over with grey. The purple road vanished, and without lights in the darkness of a world destroyed, they swayed on toward nothing. It was a bumpy, cold way to the Morganroth farm, and she was asleep when they arrived. Here was no glaring new house with a proud phonograph, but a low, whitewashed kitchen smelling of cream and cabbage. Adolf Morganroth was lying on a couch in the rarely used dining room. His heavy, work-scarred wife was shaking her hands in anxiety. Carol felt that Kennicott would do something magnificent and startling. But he was casual. He greeted the man. Well, well, Adolf, have to fix you up, huh? Quietly to the wife. Had the drugstore my schwarze bag here geschickt? So, son, wem file? Urist scheiben? Nun lassen uns ein wenig supper zest haben. Got any of that uh, good beer left? Uh, gibt's noch beer? He had supped in four minutes. His coat off, his sleeves rolled up. He was scrubbing his hands in a tin basin in the sink, using the bar of yellow kitchen soap. Carol had not dared to look into the farther room while she labored over the supper of beer, rye bread, moist corned beef and cabbage, set on the kitchen table. The man in there was groaning. In her one glance she had seen that his blue flannel shirt was open at a corded tobacco-brown neck, the hollows of which were sprinkled with thin black and gray hairs. He was covered with a sheet like a corpse, and outside the sheet was his right arm, wrapped in towels, stained with blood. But Kennicott strode into the other room gaily, and she followed him. With surprising delicacy in his large fingers, he unwrapped the towels and revealed an arm which, below the elbow, was a mass of blood and raw flesh. The man bellowed. The room grew thick about her. She was very seasick. She fled to a chair in the kitchen. Through the haze of nausea, she heard Kennicott grumbling. "'Afraid it will have to come off, Adolf. What did you do?' Fall on a reaper blade? Uh, we'll fix it right up. Carrie. Carol! She couldn't. She couldn't get up. Then she was up, her knees like water, her stomach revolving a thousand times a second, her eyes filmed, her ears full of roaring. She couldn't reach the dining room. She was going to faint. Then she was in the dining room, leaning against the wall, uh, trying to smile, flushing hot and cold along her chest and sides, while Kennicott mumbled, uh, say, help Mrs. Morganroth and me carry him in on the kitchen table. No, uh, first go out and shove those two tables together and put a blanket on them and a clean sheet. It was salvation to push the heavy tables, to scrub them, to be exact in placing the sheet. Her head cleared. She was able to look calmly in at her husband and the farm wife while they undressed the wailing man, got him into a clean nightgown, and washed his arm. Kennicott came to lay out his instruments. She realized that, with no hospital facilities, yet with no worry about it, her husband, her husband, was going to perform a surgical operation, that miraculous boldness of which one read in stories about famous surgeons. She helped them to move Adolf into the kitchen. 
The man was in such a funk that he would not use his legs. He was heavy and smelled of sweat and the stable. But she put her arm about his waist, her sleek head by his chest, and tugged at him. She clicked her tongue in imitation of Kennicott's cheerful tones. When Adolf was on the table, Kennicott laid a hemispheric steel and cotton frame on his face, suggested to Carol, Now, uh, you sit here at his head and keep the ether dripping about this fast, see? I'll watch his breathing. Look who's here. Real anesthetist. Ochsner hasn't got a better one. Class, eh? Uh, now, now, Adolf, take it easy. This won't hurt you a bit. But you're all nice and asleep, and it won't hurt a bit. Schweigmal. Bodschlaft the man grit by in kind. So, so. Bod gets besser. And she let the ether drip, nervously trying to keep the rhythm that Kennicott had indicated. Carol stared at her husband with the abandon of hero worship. He shook his head. Bad light, bad light. Here, uh, Mrs. Morganroth, you stand right here and hold this lamp. Here, und dieses, dieses lamp halten, so. By that streaky glimmer he worked, swiftly, at ease. The room was still. Carol tried to look at him, yet not look at the seeping blood, the crimson slash, the vicious scalpel. The ether fumes were sweet, choking. Her head seemed to be floating away from her body. Her arm was feeble. It was not the blood, but the grating of the surgical saw on the living bone that broke her, and she knew that she had been fighting off nausea, that she was beaten. She was lost in dizziness. She heard Kennicott's voice. Sick? Trot outdoors a couple of minutes. Adolf will stay under now. She was fumbling at a doorknob which whirled in insulting circles. She was on the stoop, gasping, forcing air into her chest, her head clearing. As she returned, she caught the scene as a whole, the cavernous kitchen, two milk cans, a leaden patch by the wall, hams dangling from a beam, bats of light at the storm door, and in the center, illuminated by a small glass lamp held by a frightened stout woman, Dr. Kennicott bending over a body which was humped under a sheet, the surgeon, his bare hands daubed with blood, his hands in pale yellow rubber gloves, loosening the tourniquet, his face without emotion, save when he threw up his head and clucked at the farm wife. Hold that light steady, just a second more. Not bloss Eisenwernig. He speaks a vulgar, common, incorrect German of life and death and birth in the soil. I read the French and German of sentimental lovers and Christmas garlands, and I thought that it was I who had the culture. She worshipped as she returned to her place. After time he snapped, That's enough. Uh, don't give him any more ether. He was concentrated on tying an artery. His gruffness seemed heroic to her. As he shaped the flap of flesh, she murmured, Oh, you are wonderful. He was surprised. Why, this is a cinch. Now, if it had been like last week, uh, get me some more water. Now, last week I had a case with a news in the peritoneal cavity, and by golly, if it wasn't a stomach ulcer that I hadn't suspected in... Uh, there. Say, I certainly am sleepy. Let's turn in here. Too late to drive home, and taste to me like a storm coming. They slept on a feather bed with their fur coats over them. In the morning they broke ice in the pitcher, the vast, flowered, and gilt pitcher. Connecticut's storm had not come. When they set out, it was hazy and growing warmer. After a mile, she saw that he was studying a dark cloud in the north. He urged the horses to the run. But she forgot his unusual haste in wonder at the tragic landscape. The pale snow, the prickles of old stubble, and the clumps of ragged brush faded into a gray obscurity. Under the hillocks were cold shadows. The willows about a farmhouse were agitated by the rising wind, and the patches of bare wood where the bark had peeled away were white as the flesh of a leper. The snowy sloughs were of a harsh flatness. The whole land was cruel, and a climbing cloud of slate-edged blackness dominated the sky. "'Guess we're about in for a blizzard,' speculated Kennicott. "'We can make Ben McGonagall's anyway.' "'Blizzard? Really? Why—' "'But still, we used to think they were fun when I was a girl. "'Daddy had to stay home from court, and we'd stand at the window and watch the snow. "'Not much fun on the prairie. Get lost, freeze to death. "'Take no chances,' he chirped at the horses. "'They were flying now, the carriage rocking on the hard ruts. "'The whole air suddenly crystallized into large, damp flakes. "'The horses and the buffalo robe were covered with snow.' Her face was wet. The thin butt of the whip held a white ridge. 
The air became colder. The snowflakes were harder. They shot in level lines, clawing at her face. She could not see a hundred feet ahead. Kennicott was stern. He bent forward, the reins firm in his coonskin gauntlets. She was certain that he would get through. He always got through things. Save for his presence, the world and all normal living disappeared. They were lost in the boiling snow. He leaned close to Ball. Letting the horses have their heads. They'll get us home. With a terrifying bump, they were off the road, slanting with two wheels in the ditch. But instantly they were jerked back as the horses fled on. She gasped. She tried to and did not feel brave as she pulled the woolen robe up about her chin. They were passing something like a dark wall on the right. I know that barn, he yelped. He pulled at the reins. Peeping from the cover, she saw his teeth pinch his lower lip, saw him scowl as he slackened and sawed and jerked sharply again at the racing horses. They stopped. Farmhouse, there. Put robe around you and come on, he cried. It was like diving into icy water to climb out of the carriage. But on the ground she smiled at him, her face little and childish and pink above the buffalo robe over her shoulders. In a swirl of flakes which scratched at their eyes like a maniac darkness, he unbuckled the harness. He turned and plodded back a ponderous, furry figure, holding the horse's bridles, Carol's hand dragging at his sleeve. They came to the cloudy bulk of a barn whose outer wall was directly upon the road. Filling along it, he found a gate, led them into a yard, into the barn. The interior was warm. It stunned them with its languid quiet. He carefully drove the horses into stalls. Her toes were coals of pain. Let's run for the house, she said. Can't. Not yet. Might never find it. Might get lost ten feet away from it. Sit over in this stall near the horses. We'll rush for the house when the blizzard lifts. I'm so stiff. I can't walk. He carried her into the stall, stripped off her overshoes and boots, stopped to blow on his purple fingers as he fumbled at her laces. He rubbed her feet and covered her with the buffalo robe and horse blankets from the pile on the feed box. She was drowsy, hemmed in by the storm. She sighed. You're so strong, and yet so skillful, and not afraid of blood or storm or... Used to it. Only thing that's bothered me was the chance the ether fumes might explode last night. I don't understand. Why, Dave, the darn fool, sent me ether instead of chloroform like I told him. And you know ether fumes are mighty inflammable, especially with that lamp right by the table. But I had to operate, of course. Wound chuck full of barnyard filth that way. You knew all the time that both you and I might have been blown up? You knew it while you were operating? Sure. Didn't you? Why? What's the matter? The End of Chapter 15 Chapter 16 Kennicott was heavily pleased by her Christmas presents, and he gave her a diamond bar pin. But she could not persuade herself that he was much interested in the rites of the morning, in the tree she had decorated, the three stockings she had hung, the ribbons and gilt seals and hidden messengers. He said only, Nice way to fix things, all right. What do you say we go down to Jack Elder's and have a game of 500 this afternoon? She remembered her father's Christmas fantasies, the sacred old rag doll at the top of the tree, the score of cheap presents, the punch and carols, the roast chestnuts by the fire, and the gravity with which the judge opened the children's scrawly notes and took cognizance of demands for sled rides, for opinions upon the existence of Santa Claus. She remembered him reading out a long indictment of himself for being a sentimentalist against the peace and dignity of the state of Minnesota. She remembered his thin legs twinkling before their sled. She muttered unsteadily, "'Must run up and put on my shoes. Slippers so cold.' In the not very romantic solitude of the locked bathroom, she sat on the slippery edge of the tub and wept. Kennicott had five hobbies, medicine, land investment, carol, motoring, and hunting. It is not certain in what order he preferred them. Solid though his enthusiasms were in the matter of medicine, his admiration of this city surgeon, his condemnation of that for tricky ways of persuading country practitioners to bring in surgical patients, his indignation about fee-splitting, his pride in a new X-ray apparatus. None of these beatified him as did motoring. He nursed his two-year-old Buick even in winter when it was stored in the stable garage behind the house. He filled the grease cups, varnished a fender, removed from beneath the back seat the debris of gloves, copper washers, crumbled maps, dust, and greasy rags. Winter noons he wandered out and stared owlishly at the car. 
he became excited over a fabulous trip we might take next summer. He galloped to the station, brought home railway maps, and traced motor routes from Gopher Prairie to Winnipeg, or Des Moines, or Grand Marais, thinking aloud and expecting her to be effusive about such academic questions as, Now I wonder if we could stop at Baraboo and break the jump from La Crosse to Chicago. To him motoring was a faith not to be questioned, a high church cult, with electric sparks for candles and piston rings possessing the sanctity of altar vessels. His liturgy was composed of intoned and metrical road comments. They say there's a pretty good hike from Duluth to International Falls. Hunting was equally a devotion, full of metaphysical concepts veiled from Carol. All winter he read sporting catalogues and thought about remarkable past shots. Remember that time when I got two ducks on a long chance just at sunset? At least once a month he drew his favorite repeating shotgun, his pump gun, from its wrapper of greased canton flannel. He oiled the trigger and spent silent, ecstatic moments aiming at the ceiling. Sunday mornings Carol heard him trudging up to the attic, and there, an hour later, she found him turning over boots, wooden duck decoys, lunch boxes, or reflectively squinting at old shells, rubbing their brass caps with his sleeve, and shaking his head as he thought about their uselessness. He kept the loading tools he had used as a boy, a capper for shotgun shells, a mold for lead bullets. When once, in a housewifely frenzy for getting rid of things, she raged, Why don't you give these away? He solemnly defended them. Well, you can't tell. Uh, they might come in handy some day. She flushed. She wondered if he was thinking of the child they would have when, as he put it, they were sure they could afford one. Mysteriously aching, nebulously sad, she slipped away, half convinced, but only half convinced, that it was horrible and unnatural, this postponement of release of mother affection, this sacrifice to her opinionation and to his cautious desire for prosperity. But it would be worse if he were like Sam Clark, insisted on having children, she considered. Then, if Will were the prince, wouldn't I demand his child? Kennicott's land deals were both financial advancement and favorite game. Driving through the country, he noticed which farms had good crops. He heard the news about the restless farmer who was thinking about selling out here and pulling his freight for Alberta. He asked the veterinarian about the value of different breeds of stock. He inquired of Lyman Cass whether or not Einar Geidelson really had had a yield of 40 bushels of wheat to the acre. He was always consulting Julius Flickerbaugh, who handled more real estate than law, and more law than justice. He studied township maps and read notices of auctions. Thus, he was able to buy a quarter section of land for $150 an acre and sell it in a year or two, after installing a cement floor in the barn and running water in the house, for 180 or even 200 He spoke of these details to Sam Clark, rather often. In all his games, cars and guns and land, he expected Carol to take an interest. But he did not give her the facts which might have created interest. He talked only of the obvious and tedious aspects, never of his aspirations in finance, nor of the mechanical principles of motors. This month of romance she was eager to understand his hobbies. She shivered in the garage while he spent half an hour in deciding whether to put alcohol or patent non-freezing liquid into the radiator, or to drain out the water entirely. Oh no, then I wouldn't want to take her out if she turned warm. Still, uh, of course, I could fill the radiator again. Wouldn't take so awful long. Just take a few pails of water. Still, if it turned cold on me again before I drained it, uh, of course, there's some people that put in kerosene, but they say it rots the hose connections and, uh, or say, where did I put that lug wrench? It was at this point that she gave up being a motorist and retired to the house. In their new intimacy, he was more communicative about his practice. He informed her, with the invariable warning not to tell, that Mrs. Sunderquist had another baby coming, that the hired girl at Howland's was in trouble. But when she asked technical questions, he did not know how to answer when she inquired, Exactly what is the method of taking out the tonsils? He yawned. A tonsillectomy? Why, you just... Well, uh, if there's pus, you operate. Uh, just take them out. Uh, seen the newspaper? What the devil did B do with it again? She did not try again. They had gone to the movies. The movies were almost as vital to Kennicott and the other solid citizens of Gopher Prairie as land speculation and guns and automobiles. The feature film portrayed a brave young Yankee who conquered a South American republic. 
He turned the natives from their barbarous habits of singing and laughing to the vigorous sanity, the pep and punch and go of the North. He taught them to work in factories, to wear classy college clothes, and to shout, Oh, you baby doll, watch me gather in the Mazuma. He changed nature itself. A mountain which had borne nothing but lilies and cedars and loafing clouds was, by his hustle, so inspirited that it broke out in long wooden sheds and piles of iron ore to be converted into steamers to carry iron ore to be converted into steamers to carry iron ore. The intellectual tension induced by the master film was relieved by a livelier, more lyric, and less philosophical drama. Mac Schnarken and the Bathing Suit Babes in a comedy of manners entitled Right on the Cocoa. Mr. Schnarken was at various high moments a cook, a lifeguard, a burlesque actor, and a sculptor. There was a hotel hallway up which policemen charged, only to be stunned by plaster busts hurled upon them from the numerous doors. If the plot lacked lucidity, the dual motive of legs and pie was clear and sure. Bathing and modeling were equally sound occasions for legs. The wedding scene was but an approach to the thunderous climax when Mr. Schnarken slipped a piece of custard pie into the clergyman's rear pocket. The audience in the Rosebud Movie Palace squealed and wiped their eyes. They scrambled under the seats for overshoes, mittens, and mufflers, while the screen announced that next week Mr. Schnarken might be seen in a new, rip-roaring, extra-special super-feature of the Clean Comedy Corporation entitled Under Molly's Bed. I'm glad, said Carol to Kennicott as they stooped before the northwest gale which was torturing the barren street, that this is a moral country. We don't allow any of those beastly frank novels. Yep. A vice society and postal department won't stand for them. The American people don't like filth. Yes. It's fine. I'm glad we have such dainty romances as Right on the Cocoa instead. Say, what in heck do you think you're trying to do? Kid me? He was silent. She awaited his anger. She meditated upon his gutter patois, the Boeotian dialectic characteristic of Gopher Prairie. He laughed puzzlingly. When they came into the glow of the house, he laughed again. He condescended. I've got to hand it to you. You're consistent, all right. I'd have thought that after getting this look in at a lot of good, decent farmers, you'd get over this high art stuff. But you hang right on. Well, to herself, he takes advantage of my trying to be good. Tell you, Carrie, there's just three classes of people. Folks that haven't got any ideas at all, and cranks that kick about everything, and regular guys. The fellows with stick to attentiveness that boost and get the world's work done. Then I'm probably a crank, she smiled negligently. No, I won't admit it. You do like to talk, but at a showdown you'd prefer Sam Clark to any damn long-haired artist. Oh, well. Oh, well, mockingly. My, we're just going to change everything, aren't we? Going to tell fellows that have been making movies for ten years how to direct them and tell architects how to build towns and make the magazines publish nothing but a lot of highbrow stories about old maids and about wives that don't know what they want. Oh, you're a terror. Come on now, Carrie. Come out of it. Wake up. You've got a fine nerve kicking about a movie because it shows a few legs. Why, you're always touting these Greek dancers or whatever they are that uh, don't even wear a shimmy. But, dear, the trouble with that film... Uh, it wasn't that it got in so many legs, but that it giggled coyly and promised to show more of them and then didn't keep the promise. It was Peeping Tom's idea of humor. I don't get you. I'll look here now. She lay awake while he rumbled with sleep. I must go on. My crank ideas, he calls them. I thought that adoring him, watching him operate, would be enough. It isn't. Not after the first thrill. I... Don't want to hurt him, but I must go on. It isn't enough to stand by while he fills an automobile radiator and chucks me bits of information. If I stood by and admired him long enough, I would be content. I would become a nice little woman, the village virus. Already, I'm not reading anything. I haven't touched the piano for a week. I'm letting the days drown in worship of a good deal, ten plunks more per acre. I won't. I won't succumb. How? I've failed at everything. The Thanatopsis, Parties, Pioneers, City Hall, Guy, and Vida. But it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to reform the town now. I'm, I'm not trying to organize browning clubs and sit in clean white kids yearning up at lecturers with ribbony eyeglasses. I'm trying to save my soul. 
Will Kennicott asleep there, trusting me, thinking he holds me, and I'm leaving him. All of me left him when he laughed at me. It wasn't enough for him that I admired him. I must change myself and grow like him. He takes advantage. No more. It's finished. I will go on. Her violin lay on top of the upright piano. She picked it up. Since she had last touched it, the dried strings had snapped, and upon it lay a gold and crimson cigar band. She longed to see Guy Pollock for the confirming of the brethren in the faith. But Kennicott's dominance was heavy upon her. She could not determine whether she was checked by fear, or him, or by inertia, by dislike of the emotional labor of the scenes which would be involved in asserting independence. She was like the revolutionist at fifty, not afraid of death, but bored by the probability of bad stakes and bad breaths and sitting up all night on windy barricades. The second evening, after the movies, she impulsively summoned Vida Sherwin and Guy to the house for popcorn and cider. In the living room, Vida and Kennicott debated the value of manual training in grades below the eighth, while Carol sat beside Guy at the dining table buttering popcorn. She was quickened by the speculation in his eyes. She murmured, Guy, do you want to help me? My dear, how? I don't know. He waited. I think... I think I want you to help me find out what has made the darkness of the women. Gray darkness and shadowy trees. We're all in it. Ten million women. Young, married women with good, prosperous husbands and business women in linen collars and grandmothers that gad out to tease and wives of underpaid miners and farm wives who really like to make butter and go to church. What is it we want and need? Will Kennicott there would say that we need lots of children and hard work, but it isn't that. There's the same discontented women with eight children and one more coming. Always one more coming. And you find it in stenographers and wives who scrub just as much as in girl college graduates who wonder how they can escape their kind parents. What do we want? Essentially, I think you're like myself, Carol. You want to go back to an age of tranquility and charming manners. You want to enthrone good taste again. Just good taste? Fastidious people? Oh, oh no. I believe all of us want the same things. We're all together. The industrial workers and the women and the farmers and the Negro race and the Asiatic colonies and even a few of the respectables. It, it's all the same revolt in all the classes that have waited and taken advice. I think perhaps we want a more conscious life. We're tired of drudging and sleeping and, and dying. We're tired of seeing just a few people able to be individualists. We're tired of always deferring hope till the next generation. We're tired of hearing the politicians and priests and cautious reformers and the husbands coax us, be calm, be patient, wait. We have the plans for a utopia already made. Just give us a bit more time and we'll produce it. Trust us. We're wiser than you. For 10,000 years they've said that. We want our utopia now, and we're going to try our hands at it. All we want is everything, for all of us, for every housewife and every longshoreman and every Hindu nationalist and every teacher. We want everything. We shan't get it, so we shan't ever be content. She wondered why he was wincing. He broke in. Uh, see here, my dear, I certainly hope you don't class yourself with a lot of troublemaking labor leaders. Democracy is all right, theoretically, and I'll admit there are industrial injustices, but I'd rather have them than see the world reduced to a dead level of mediocrity. I refuse to believe that you have anything in common with a lot of laboring men rowing for bigger wages so that they can buy wretched flivers and hideous player pianos and... At this second in Buenos Aires, a newspaper editor broke his routine of being bored by exchanges to a certain... Any injustice is better than seeing the world reduced to a gray level of scientific dullness. At this second, a clerk standing at the bar of a New York saloon stopped milling his secret fear of his nagging office manager long enough to growl at the chauffeur beside him, Ah, you socialists make me sick. I'm an individualist. I ain't going to be nagged by no bureaus and take orders off labor leaders and mean to say a hobo's as good as you and me. At this second... Carol realized that for all Guy's love of dead elegances, his timidity was as depressing to her as the bulkiness of Sam Clark. She realized that he was not a mystery, as she had excitedly believed, not a romantic messenger from the world outside on whom she could count for escape. He belonged to Gopher Prairie, absolutely. She was snatched back from a dream of far countries and found herself 
on Main Street. He was completing his protest. You don't want to be mixed up in all this orgy of meaningless discontent. She soothed him. No, I, I don't. I'm not heroic. I'm scared by all the fighting that's going on in the world. I want nobility and adventure, but perhaps I want still more to curl on the hearth with someone I love. Would you? He did not finish it. He picked up a handful of popcorn, let it run through his fingers, looked at her wistfully. With the loneliness of one who has put away a possible love, Carol saw that he was a stranger. She saw that he had never been anything but a frame on which she had hung shining garments. If she had let him diffidently make love to her, it was not because she cared, but because she did not care, because it did not matter. She smiled at him with the exasperating tactfulness of a woman checking a flirtation, a smile like an airy pat on the arm. She sighed, "'You're a dear to let me tell you my imaginary troubles.' She bounced up and trilled, "'Shall we take the popcorn into them now?' Guy looked after her desolately. While she teased Vida in Kennicott, she was repeating, "'I must go on.' Miles Bjornstam, the pariah red Swede, had brought his circular saw and portable gasoline engine to the house to cut the cords of poplar for the kitchen range. Kennicott had given the order. Carol knew nothing of it till she heard the ringing of the saw and glanced out to see Jornstam in black leather jacket and enormous ragged purple mittens pressing sticks against the willing blade and flinging the stove lengths to one side. The red irritable motor kept up a red irritable tip 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 the whine of the saw rose till it simulated the shriek of a fire alarm whistle at night, but always at the end it gave a lively metallic clang, and in the stillness she heard the flump of the stick falling on the pile. She threw a motor robe over her, ran out. Jornstam welcomed her. Well, 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 here's old Miles, fresh as ever. Well, say, that's all right. He ain't even begun to be cheeky yet. Next summer he's going to take you out on his horse treading trip. Clear into Idaho. Yes. And I may go. How's tricks? Crazy about the town yet? No. But I probably shall be some day. Don't let them get you. Kick him in the face. He shouted at her while he worked. The pile of stove wood grew astonishingly. The pale bark of the poplar sticks was mottled with lichens of sage green and dusty gray. The newly sawed ends were fresh-colored with the agreeable roughness of a woolen muffler. To the sterile winter air, the wood gave a scent of March sap. Kennicott telephoned that he was going into the country. Jornstam had not finished his work at noon, and she invited him to have dinner with Bee in the kitchen. She wished that she were independent enough to dine with these her guests. She considered their friendliness, she sneered at social distinctions, she raged at her own taboos, and she continued to regard them as retainers and herself as a lady. She sat in the dining room and listened through the door to Bjornstam's booming and Bee's giggles. She was the more absurd to herself in that, after the rite of dining alone, she could go out to the kitchen, lean against the sink, and talk to them. They were attracted to each other, a Swedish Otello and Desdemona, more useful and amiable than their prototypes. Bjornstam told his scapes, uh, selling horses in a Montana mining camp, breaking a uh, log jam, being impertinent to a two-fisted millionaire lumberman. B gurgled, oh my, and kept his coffee cup filled. It took a long time to finish the wood. He had frequently to go into the kitchen to get warm. Carol heard him confiding to B. You're a darn nice, sweet girl. I guess if I had a woman like you, I wouldn't be such a sorehead. Gosh, your kitchen is clean. Makes an old batch feel sloppy. Say, that's nice hair you got. Huh? Me? Fresh? Say, girl, if I ever do get fresh, you'll know it. Why, I could pick you up with one finger and hold you in the air long enough to read Robert J. Ingersoll clean through. Ingersoll? Oh. Oh, he's a religious writer. Sure, you'd like him fine. When he drove off, he waved to B, and Carol, lonely at the window above, was envious of their pastoral. And I... but I will go on. The end of Chapter 16 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 17 They were driving down the lake to the cottages that moonlit January night, twenty of them, in the bobsled. 
They sang Toyland and Seeing Nelly Home. They leaped from the low back of the sled to race over the slippery snow ruts, and when they were tired they climbed on the runners for a lift. The moon-tipped flakes kicked up by the horses settled over the revelers and dripped down their necks, but they laughed, yelped, beat their leather mittens against their chests. The harness rattled, the sleigh bells were frantic, Jack Elder's setter sprang beside the horses barking. For a time Carol raced with them. The cold air gave fictive power. She felt that she could run on all night, leap twenty feet at a stride. But the excess of energy tired her, and she was glad to snuggle under the comforters which covered the hay in the sled box. In the midst of the babble she found enchanted quietude. Along the road the shadows from oak branches were inked on the snow like bars of music. Then the sled came out on the surface of Lake Minimashi. Across the thick ice was a veritable road, a shortcut for farmers. On the glaring expanse of the lake, levels of hard crust, flashes of green ice blown clear, chains of drifts ribbed like the sea beach. The moonlight was overwhelming. It stormed on the snow. It turned the woods ashore into crystals of fire. The night was tropical and voluptuous. In that drugged magic there was no difference between heavy heat and insinuating cold. Carol was dream strayed. The turbulent voices, even Guy Pollock being connotative beside her, were nothing. She repeated, Deep on the convent roof the snows are sparkling to the moon. The words and the light blurred into one vast indefinite happiness, and she believed that some great thing was coming to her. She withdrew from the clamor into a worship of incomprehensible gods. The night expanded. She was conscious of the universe, and all mysteries stooped down to her. She was jarred out of her ecstasy as the bobsled bumped up the steep road to the bluff where stood the cottages. They dismounted at Jack Elder's shack. The interior walls of unpainted boards, which had been grateful in August, were forbidding in the chill. In fur coats and mufflers tied over caps, they were a strange company, bears and walruses talking. Jack Elder lighted the shavings waiting in the belly of a cast-iron stove, which was like an enlarged bean pot. They piled their wraps high on a rocker, and cheered the rocker as it solemnly tipped over backward. Mrs. Elder and Mrs. Sam Clark made coffee in an enormous blackened tin pot. Vida Sherwin and Mrs. McGannum unpacked doughnuts and gingerbread. Mrs. Dave Dyer warmed up hot dogs, frankfurters and rolls. Dr. Terry Gould, after announcing, Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to be shocked. Shock line forms on the right, produced a bottle of bourbon whiskey. The others danced, muttering, Ouch! as their frosted feet struck the pine planks. Carol had lost her dream. Harry Haydock lifted her by the waist and swung her. She laughed. The gravity of the people who stood apart and talked made her the more impatient for frolic. Kennicott, Sam Clark, Jackson Elder, young Dr. McGannum, and James Madison Howland, teetering on their toes near the stove, conversed with the sedate pomposity of the commercialist. In details the men were unlike, yet they said the same things in the same hearty, monotonous voices. You had to look at them to see which was speaking. "'Well, we made pretty good time coming up,' from one, anyone. "'Yep, uh... We hit it up after we struck the good going on the lake. Seems kind of slow, though, after driving an auto. Yep, it does at that. Say, uh, how'd you make out with that Sphinx tire you got? Seems to hold out fine. Uh, still, I don't know as I like it any better than the road eater cord. Yep, nothing better than a road eater, especially the cord. The cord's lots better than the fabric. Yep, you said something. Road eater's a good tire. Say, how'd you come out with uh, Pete Garsheim on his payments? He's paying up pretty good. Uh, that's a nice piece of land he's got. Yep, that's a dandy farm. Yep, uh, Pete's got a good place there. They glided from these serious topics into the jocose insults which are the wit of Main Street. Sam Clark was particularly apt at them. What's this wild-eyed sale of summer caps you think you're trying to pull off? He clamored at Harry Haydock. Did you steal them, or are you just overcharging us as usual? Oh, say, speaking about caps, uh, did I ever tell you the good one I got on Will? The doc thinks he's a pretty good driver. In fact, thinks he's got almost human intelligence. But one time he had his machine out in the rain and the poor fish he hadn't put on chains and thinks I... Carol had heard the story rather often. She fled back to the dancers, and at Dave Dyer's masterstroke of dropping an icicle down Mrs. McGannum's back, she applauded hysterically. They sat on the floor, devouring the food. The men giggled amiably as they passed the whiskey bottle and laughed. There's a real sport, when Juanita Haydock took a sip. Carol tried to follow. 
She believed that she desired to be drunk and riotous, but the whiskey choked her, and as she saw Kennicott frown, she handed the bottle on repentantly. Somewhat too late, she remembered that she had given up domesticity and repentance. "'Let's play charades,' said Ramy Wotherspood. "'Oh, yes, do let us,' said Ella Stowbody. "'That's the caper,' sanctioned Harry Haydock. They interpreted the word making as may and king. The crown was a red flannel mitten cocked on Sam Clark's broad, pink bald head. They forgot they were respectable. They made believe. Carol was stimulated to cry, "'Let's form a dramatic club and give a play, shall we? It's been so much fun tonight.' They looked affable. "'Sure,' observed Sam Clark loyally. "'Oh, do let us. I think it would be lovely to present Romeo and Juliet,' yearned Ella Stowbody. "'Be a well of a lot of fun,' Dr. Terry Gould granted. Uh, "'But if we did,' Carol cautioned, "'it would be awfully silly to have amateur theatricals. "'We ought to paint our own scenery and everything and, and really do something fine. "'There'd be a lot of hard work. Would you—' Would we all be punctual at rehearsals, do you suppose? You bet. Sure. That's the idea. Fellow ought to be prompt at rehearsals. They all agreed. <laughs> then let's meet next week and form the Gopher Prairie Dramatic Association, Carol sang. She drove home loving these friends who raced through moonlit snow, had bohemian parties, and were about to create beauty in the theater. Everything was solved. She would be an authentic part of the town, yet escape the coma of the village virus. She would be free of Kennicott again without hurting him, without his knowing. She had triumphed. The moon was small and high now, and unheeding. Though they had all been certain that they longed for the privilege of attending committee meetings and rehearsals, the dramatic association, as definitely formed, consisted only of Kennicott, Carol, Guy Pollock, Vida Sherwin, Ella Stowbody, the Harry Haydocks, the Dave Dyers, Ramey Wotherspoon, Dr. Terry Gould, and four new candidates, flirtatious Rita Simons, Dr. and Mrs. Harvey Dillon, and Myrtle Cass, an uncomely but intense girl of nineteen. Of these, fifteen, only seven, came to the first meeting. The rest telephoned their unparalleled regrets and engagements and illnesses and announced that they would be present at all other meetings through eternity. Carol was made president and director. She had added the Dillons, despite Kennicott's apprehension, the dentist and his wife had not been taken up by the Westlakes, but had remained as definitely outside, really smart society as Willis Woodford, who was teller, bookkeeper, and janitor in Stowbody's bank. Carol had noted Mrs. Dillon, dragging past the house during a bridge of the Jolly Seventeen, looking in with pathetic lips at the splendor of the accepted. She impulsively invited the Dillons to the Dramatic Association meeting, and when Kennicott was brusque to them, she was unusually cordial and felt virtuous. That self-approval balanced her disappointment at the smallness of the meeting and her embarrassment during Ramey Wotherspoon's repetitions of, The stage needs uplifting, and I believe that there are great lessons in some plays. Ella Stowbody, who was a professional, having studied elocution in Milwaukee, disapproved of Carol's enthusiasm for recent plays. Miss Stowbody expressed the fundamental principle of the American drama. The only way to be artistic is to present Shakespeare. As no one listened to her, she sat back and looked like Lady Macbeth. The little theaters, which were to give piquancy to American drama three or four years later, were only in embroil. But of this fast-coming revolt, Carol had premonitions. She knew from some lost magazine article that in Dublin were innovators called the Irish Players. She knew confusedly that a man named Gordon Craig had painted scenery, or had he written plays. She felt that in the turbulence of the drama, she was discovering a history more important than the commonplace chronicles which dealt with senators and their pompous puerilities. She had a sensation of familiarity, a dream of sitting in a Brussels cafe and going afterward to a tiny gay theater under a cathedral wall. The advertisement in the Minneapolis paper leaped from the page to her eyes. The Cosmos School of Music, Oratory, and Dramatic Art announces a program of four one-act plays by Schnitzler, Shaw, Yeats, and Lord Dunsany. She had to be there. She begged Kennicott to run down to the cities with her. Well, I don't know. Be fun to take in a show, but why the deuce do you want to see those darn foreign plays given by a lot of amateurs? Why don't you wait for a regular play later on? There's going to be some corkers coming, Lottie of Two-Gun Rancho and Cops and Crooks, real Broadway stuff with the New York casts. What's this junk you want to see?
Hmm. How he lied to her husband. That doesn't listen so bad. Uh, sounds racy, and, uh, well, I, I could go to the motor show, I suppose. I'd like to see this new Hup Roadster. Well, she never knew which attraction made him decide. She had four days of delightful worry over the hole in her one good silk petticoat, the loss of a string of beads from her chiffon and brown velvet frock, the catsup stain on her best georgette crepe blouse. She wailed, I haven't a single solitary thing that's fit to be seen in, and enjoyed herself very much indeed. Kennicott went about casually letting people know that he was going to run down to the cities and see some shows. As the train plodded through the gray prairie on a windless day with the smoke from the engine clinging to the fields in giant cotton rolls in a low and writhing wall which shut off the snowy fields, she did not look out of the window. She closed her eyes and hummed, and did not know that she was humming. She was the young poet attacking fame and Paris. In the Minneapolis station, the crowd of lumberjacks, farmers, and Swedish families with their numerous children and grandparents and paper parcels, their foggy crowding and their clamor, confused her. She felt rustic in this once familiar city after a year and a half of Gopher Prairie. She was certain that Kennicott was taking the wrong trolley car. By dusk, the liquor warehouses, Hebraic clothing shops, and lodging houses on Lower Hennepin Avenue were smoky, hideous, ill-tempered. She was battered by the noise and shuttling of the rush hour traffic. When a clerk in an overcoat too closely fitted at the waist stared at her, she moved closer to Kennicott's arm. The clerk was flippant and urban. He was a superior person, used to this tumult. Was he laughing at her? For a moment, she wanted the secure quiet of Gopher Prairie. In the hotel lobby, she was self-conscious. She was not used to hotels. She remembered with jealousy how often Juanita Haydock talked of the famous hotels in Chicago. She could not face the traveling salesman, baronial in large leather chairs. She wanted people to believe that her husband and she were accustomed to luxury and chill elegance. She was faintly angry at him for the vulgar way in which, after signing the register, Dr. W. P. Kennicott and wife, he bellowed at the clerk, "'Got a nice room with a bath for us, old man?' She gazed about haughtily, but as she discovered that no one was interested in her, she felt foolish and ashamed of her irritation. She asserted, "'This silly lobby is too florid,' and simultaneously she admired it, the onyx columns with gilt capitals. The crown embroidered velvet curtains at the restaurant door. The silk-roped alcove where pretty girls perpetually waited for mysterious men. The two-pound boxes of candy and the variety of magazines at the newsstand. The hidden orchestra was lively. She saw a man who looked like a European diplomat in a loose topcoat and a Homburg hat. A woman with a broad-tailed coat, a heavy lace veil, pearl earrings, and a close black hat entered the restaurant. Heavens! That's the first really smart woman I've seen in a year. Carol exulted. She felt metropolitan. But as she followed Kennicott to the elevator, the coat check girl, a confident young woman with cheeks powdered like lime, and a blouse low and thin and furiously crimson inspected her, and under that supercilious glance Carol was shy again. She unconsciously waited for the bellboy to precede her into the elevator. When he snorted, Go ahead. She was mortified. He thought she was a hayseed, she worried. The moment she was in their room, with the bellboy safely out of the way, she looked critically at Kennicott. For the first time in months, she really saw him. His clothes were too heavy and provincial. His decent gray suit made by Nat Hicks of Gopher Prairie might have been of sheet iron. It had no distinction of cut, no easy grace like the diplomat's Burberry. His black shoes were blunt and not well polished. His scarf was a stupid brown. He needed a shave. But she forgot her doubt as she realized the ingenuities of the room. She ran about, turning on the taps of the bathtub, which gushed instead of dribbling like the taps at home, snatching the new wash rag out of its envelope of oiled paper, trying the rose-shaded light between the twin beds, pulling out the drawers of the kidney-shaped walnut desk to examine the engraved stationery, planning to write on it to everyone she knew, admiring the claret-colored velvet armchair and the blue rug, testing the ice-water tap, and squealing happily when the water really did come out cold. She flung her arms about Kennicott, kissed him. Like it, old lady? It's adorable. It's so amusing. I love you for bringing me. You really are a dear. He looked blankly indulgent, and yawned and condescended. Oh, that's a pretty slick arrangement on the radiator, so you can adjust it at any temperature you want. Must take a big furnace to run this place. Gosh, 
I hope B remembers to turn off the drafts tonight. Under the glass cover of the dressing table was a menu with the most enchanting dishes, breast of guinea hen, David Tre, pomme de terre à la russe, meringue chantilly, et gâteau Bruxelles. Oh, let's... I'm going to have a hot bath and put on my new hat with the wool flowers, and let's go down and eat for hours, and we'll have a cocktail, she chanted. While Kennicott labored over ordering, it was annoying to see him permit the waiter to be impertinent. But as the cocktail elevated her to a bridge among colored stars, as the oysters came in, not canned oysters in the gopher prairie fashion, but on the half shell, she cried, If you only knew how wonderful it is not to have had to plan this dinner and order it at the butcher's and fuss and think about it and then watch B cook it. I feel so free. And to have new kinds of food and different patterns of dishes and linen and not worry about whether the pudding is being spoiled. Oh, this is a great moment for me. They had all the experiences of provincials in a metropolis. After breakfast, Carol bustled to a hairdresser's bought gloves and a blouse, and importantly met Kennicott in front of an optician's in accordance with plans laid down, revised, and verified. They admired the diamonds and furs and frosty silverware and mahogany chairs and polished Morocco sewing boxes and shop windows, and were abashed by the throngs in the department stores, and were bullied by a clerk into buying too many shirts for Kennicott, and gaped at the clever novelty perfumes just in from New York. Carol got three books on the theater and spent an exultant hour in warning herself that she could not afford this Raja silk frock in thinking how envious it would make Juanita Haydock in closing her eyes and buying it. Kennicott went from shop to shop, earnestly hunting down a felt-covered device to keep the windshield of his car clear of rain. They dined extravagantly at their hotel that night and next morning sneaked round the corner to economize at a child's restaurant. They were tired by three in the afternoon and dozed at the motion pictures and said they wished they were back in Gopher Prairie. And by eleven in the evening they were again so lively that they went to a Chinese restaurant that was frequented by clerks and their sweethearts on paydays. They sat at a teak and marble table eating eggs foo young and listened to a brassy automatic piano and were altogether cosmopolitan. On the street they met people from home, the McGannums. They laughed, shook hands repeatedly and exclaimed, well, this is quite a coincidence. They asked when the McGannums had come down and begged for news of the town they had left two days before. Whatever the McGannums were at home, here, they stood out as so superior to all the undistinguishable strangers absurdly hurrying past that the Kennicutts held them as long as they could. The McGannums said goodbye as though they were going to Tibet instead of to the station to catch number seven north. They explored Minneapolis. Kennicott was conversational and technical regarding gluten and cockle cylinders and number one hard when they were shown through the grey stone hulks and new cement elevators of the largest flour mills in the world. They looked across Loring Park and the parade to the towers of St. Mark's and the pro-cathedral and the red roofs of houses climbing Kedwin Hill. They drove about the chain of garden-circled lakes and viewed the houses of the millers and lumbermen and real estate peers, the potentates of the expanding city. They surveyed the small eccentric bungalows with pergolas, the houses of pebble dash and tapestry brick with sleeping porches above sun parlors, and one vast incredible chateau fronting the Lake of the Isles. They tramped through a shining new section of apartment houses, not the tall, bleak apartments of eastern cities, but low structures of cheerful yellow brick in which each flat had its glass-enclosed porch with swinging couch and scarlet cushions and Russian brass bowls. Between a waste of tracks and a raw, gouged hill, they found poverty in staggering shanties. They saw miles of the city which they had never known in their days of absorption in college. They were distinguished explorers, and they remarked in great mutual esteem, I bet Harry Haydock's never seen the city like this. Why, he'd never have sense enough to study the machinery in the mills or go through all these outlying districts. Wonder folks in Gopher Prairie wouldn't use their legs and explore the way we do. They had two meals with Carol's sister, and were bored, and felt that intimacy which beatifies married people when they suddenly admit that they equally dislike a relative of either of them. So it was with affection, but also with weariness, that they approached the evening on which Carol was to see the plays at the dramatic school. Kennicott suggested not going. So darn tired from all this walking, don't know but what we had better turn in early and get rested up. 
It was only from duty that Carol dragged him and herself out of the warm hotel into a stinking trolley up the brownstone steps of the converted residence which lugubriously housed the dramatic school. They were in a long, whitewashed hall with a clumsy, drawn curtain across the front. The folding chairs were filled with people who looked washed and ironed, parents of the pupils, girl students, dutiful teachers. Strikes me it's going to be punk. If the first play isn't good, let's beat it said Kennicott hopefully. All right, she yawned. With hazy eyes, she tried to read the list of characters which were hidden among lifeless advertisements of pianos, music dealers, restaurants, candy. She regarded the Schnitzler play with no vast interest. The actors moved and spoke stiffly. Just as its cynicism was beginning to rouse her village dulled frivolity, it was over. Don't think a whale of a lot of that. How about taking a sneak? petitioned Kennicott. Oh, let's try the next one. How he lied to her husband. The Shaw conceit amused her and perplexed Kennicott. Strikes me it's darn fresh. Thought it would be racy. Don't know as I think much of a play where a husband actually claims he wants a fellow to make love to his wife. No husband ever did that. Shall we shake a leg? I want to see this Yeats thing, Land of Heart's Desire. I used to love it in college. She was awake now and urgent. I know you didn't care so much for Yeats when I read him aloud to you, but you just see if you don't adore him on the stage. Most of the cast were as unwieldy as oak chairs marching, and the setting was an arty arrangement of batik scarfs and heavy tables. But Maya Bruin was slim as Carol and larger-eyed, and her voice was a morning bell. In her, Carol lived, and on her lifting voice was transported from this sleepy small-town husband and all the rows of polite parents to the stilly loft of a thatched cottage were in a green dimness beside a window caressed by linden branches, she bent over a chronicle of twilight women and the ancient gods. "'Well, gosh, a nice kid played that girl, good looker,' said Kennicott. "'Want to stay for the last piece, huh?' She shivered. She did not answer. The curtain was again drawn aside. On the stage they saw nothing but long green curtains and a leather chair. Two young men in brown robes, like furniture covers, were gesturing vacuously and droning cryptic sentences full of repetitions. It was Carol's first hearing of Dunsany. She sympathized with the restless Kennicott as he felt in his pocket for a cigar and unhappily put it back. Without understanding when or how, without a tangible change in the stilted intoning of the stage puppets, she was conscious of another time and place. Stately and aloof among vainglorious, tiring maids, a queen in robes that murmured on the marble floor, she trod the gallery of a crumbling palace. In the courtyard elephants trumpeted, and swart men with beards dyed crimson stood with blood-stained hands folded upon their hilts, guarding the caravan from El Sharnak, the camels with Tyrian stuffs of topaz and cinnabar. Beyond the turrets of the outer wall the jungle glared and shrieked, and the sun was furious above drenched orchids. A youth came striding through the steel-bossed doors, the sword-bitten doors that were higher than ten tall men. He was inflexible male, and under the rim of his planished morion were amorous curls. His hand was out to her. Before she touched it, she could feel its warmth. "'Gosh, all hemlock! What the dickens is all this stuff about, Carrie?' She was no Syrian queen. She was Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. She fell with a jolt into a whitewashed hall and sat looking at two scared girls and a young man in wrinkled tights. Kennicott fondly rambled as they left the hall. What the deuce did that last spiel mean? Couldn't make head or tail of it. If that's highbrow drama, give me a cowpuncher movie every time. Thank God that's over and we can get to bed. Wonder if we uh, wouldn't make time by walking over to Nicolette to take a car. One thing I will say for that dumb, they had it warm enough. Must have a big hot air furnace, I guess. Wonder how much coal it takes to run him through the winter. In the car he affectionately patted her knee, and he was for a second the striding youth in armor. Then he was Doc Kennicott of Gopher Prairie, and she was recaptured by Main Street. Never, not all her life, would she behold jungles and the tombs of kings. There were strange things in the world. They really existed, but she would never see them. She would recreate them in plays, she would make the dramatic association understand her aspiration. They would. Surely they would. She looked doubtfully at the impenetrable reality of yawning trolley conductor and sleepy passengers and placards advertising soap and underwear. 
the end of chapter 17 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 18 She hurried to the first meeting of the play-reading committee. Her jungle romance had faded, but she retained a religious fervor, a surge of half-formed thought about the creation of beauty by suggestion. A Dunsany play would be too difficult for the Gopher Prairie Association. She would let them compromise on Shaw, on Androcles and the Lion, which had just been published. The committee was composed of Carol, Vida Sherwin, Guy Pollock, Remy Wotherspoon, and Juanita Haydock. They were exalted by the picture of themselves as being simultaneously businesslike and artistic. They were entertained by Vida in the parlor of Mrs. Alicia Curry's boarding house with its steel engraving of Grant at Appomattox, its basket of stereoscopic views, and its mysterious stains on the gritty carpet. Vida was an advocate of culture buying and deficiency systems. She hinted that they ought to have, as at the committee meeting of the Thanatopsis, a regular order of business and the reading of the minutes. But as there were no minutes to read, and as no one knew exactly what was the regular order of the business of being literary, they had to give up efficiency. Carol, as chairman, said politely, Have you any ideas about what play we'd better give first? She waited for them to look abashed and vacant so that she might suggest Androcles. Guy Pollock answered with disconcerting readiness. I'll tell you, since we're going to try to do something artistic and not simply fool around, I believe we ought to give something classic. How about the School for Scandal? Why, don't you think that has been done a good deal? Uh, yes, uh, well, perhaps it has. Carol was ready to say, How about Bernard Shaw, when he treacherously went on? How would it be then to give a Greek drama, say, uh, Oedipus Tyrannus? Why, I don't believe... Vida Sherwin intruded. I'm sure that would be too hard for us. Now, I brought something that I think would be awfully jolly. She held out, and Carol incredulously took a thin gray pamphlet entitled McGinnerty's Mother-in-Law. It was the sort of farce which is advertised in school entertainment catalogs as rip roar and knock out fun. Five males, three females, time two hours, interior set, popular with churches and all high-class occasions. Carol glanced from the scabrous object to Vida and realized that she was not joking. But this is... this is... why... It's it's just a... Well, Vida, I thought you appreciated... Well, appreciated art. Vida snorted. Oh, uh, uh, art. <laughs> oh, yes, I do like art. It's very nice. But after all, what does it matter what kind of play we give as long as we get the association started? The thing that matters is something that none of you have spoken of. That is, what are we going to do with the money if we make any? Uh, I think it would be awfully nice if we presented the high school with a full set of Stoddard's travel lectures. Carol moaned. Oh, but Vida, dear, do forgive me, but this farce, now, what I'd like us to give is, is something distinguished. Say Shaw's uh, Androcles. Uh, have any of you read it? Yes, good play, said Guy Pollock. Then Ramy Wotherspoon astoundingly spoke up. So have I. I read through all the plays in the public library so as to be ready for this meeting, and well, uh, but I don't believe you grasp the irreligious ideas in this Androcles, Mrs. Canicott. Uh, I guess the feminine mind is too innocent to understand all these immoral writers. I'm sure I don't want to criticize Bernard uh, Shaw. I understand he is very popular with the highbrows of Minneapolis, but just the same. As far as I can make out, he's downright improper. The things he says, well, it would be a very risky thing for our young folks to see. It seems to me that a play that doesn't leave a nice taste in the mouth and that hasn't any message is nothing but... Uh, nothing but... Well, whatever it may be, it is an art. So, um, I've uh, found a play that is clean, and uh, there's some awfully funny scenes in it, too. Uh, I laughed out loud reading it. It's called His Mother's Heart, and it's about a young man in college who gets in with a lot of uh, free thinkers and boozers and everything, but in the end his mother's influence... Juanita Haydock broke in with a derisive, Ah, rats, Ramey. Can the mother's influence. I say, let's give something with some class to it. I bet we could get the rights to The Girl from Kankakee, and that's a real show. It ran for 11 months in New York. That would be lots of fun if it wouldn't cost too much, reflected Vida. Carol's was the only vote cast against The Girl from Kankakee. 
She disliked the girl from Kankakee even more than she had expected. It narrated the success of a farm lassie in clearing her brother of a charge of forgery. She became secretary to a New York millionaire and social counselor to his wife, and after a well-conceived speech on the discomfort of having money, she married his son. There was also a humorous office boy. Carol discerned that both Juanita Haydock and Ella Stowbody wanted the lead. She let Juanita have it. Juanita kissed her, and in the exuberant manner of a new star, presented to the executive committee her theory. What we want in a play is humor and pep. That's where American playwrights put it all over those darn European glooms. As selected by Carol and confirmed by the committee, the persons of the play were John Grimm, a millionaire, Guy Pollock, his wife, Miss Vida Sherwin, his son, Dr. Harvey Dillon, his business rival, Raymond T. Wotherspoon, friend of Mrs. Grimm, Miss Ella Stowbody, the girl from Kankakee, Mrs. Harold C. Haydock, her brother, Dr. Terence Gould, her mother, Mrs. David Dyer, stenographer, Miss Rita Simons, office boy, Miss Myrtle Cass, maid in the Grimm's home, Mrs. W.P. Kennicott, direction of Mrs. Kennicott. Among the minor lamentations was Maud Dyer's, well, of course, I suppose I look old enough to be Juanita's mother, even if Juanita is eight months older than I am, but I don't know as I care to have everybody noticing it, and... Carol pleaded, Oh, my dear, you two look exactly the same age. I chose you because you have such a darling complexion, and you know, with powder and a white wig, anybody looks twice her age, and I want the mother to be sweet, no matter who else is. Ella Stowbody, the professional, perceiving that it was because of a conspiracy of jealousy that she had been given a small part, alternated between lofty amusement and Christian patience. Carol hinted that the play would be improved by cutting, but as every actor except Vida and Guy and herself wailed at the loss of a single line, she was defeated. She told herself that, after all, a great deal could be done with direction and settings. Sam Clark had boastfully written about the Dramatic Association to his schoolmate, Percy Bresnahan, president of the Velvet Motor Company of Boston. Bresnahan sent a check for a hundred dollars. Sam added twenty-five and brought the fund to Carol, fondly crying, There, that'll give you a start for putting the thing across swell. She rented the second floor of the city hall for two months. All through the spring, the association thrilled to its own talent in that dismal room. They cleared out the bunting, ballot boxes, handbills, legless chairs. They attacked the stage. It was a simple-minded stage. It was raised above the floor, and it did have a movable curtain, painted with the advertisement of a druggist dead these ten years. But otherwise, it might not have been recognized as a stage. There were two dressing rooms, one for men, one for women, on either side. The dressing room doors were also the stage entrances opening from the house, and many a citizen of Gopher Prairie had, for his first glimpse of romance, the bare shoulders of the leading woman. There were three sets of scenery, a woodland, a poor interior, and a rich interior, the last also useful for railway stations, offices, and as a background for the Swedish quartet from Chicago. There were three gradations of lighting, full on, half on, and entirely off. This was the only theater in Gopher Prairie. It was known as the Opera House. Once, strolling companies had used it for performances of The Two Orphans and Nellie the Beautiful Cloak Model and Otello, with specialties between acts, but now the motion pictures had ousted the gypsy drama. Carol intended to be furiously martyred in constructing the office set, the drawing room for Mr. Grimm, and the humble home near Kankakee. It was the first time that anyone in Gopher Prairie had been so revolutionary as to use enclosed scenes with continuous sidewalls. The rooms in the opera house sets had separate wing pieces for sides, which simplified dramaturgy as the villain could always get out of the hero's way by walking out through the wall. The inhabitants of the humble home were supposed to be amiable and intelligent. Carol planned for them a simple set with warm color. She could see the beginnings of the play, all dark, save the high settles and the solid wooden table between them, which were to be illuminated by a ray from off stage. The highlight was a polished copper pot filled with primroses. Less clearly, she sketched the grim drawing room as a series of cool, high, white arches. As to how she was to produce these effects, she had no notion. She discovered that, despite the enthusiastic young writers, the drama was not half so native and close to the soil as motor cars and telephones. She discovered that simple arts require sophisticated training. She discovered that to produce one perfect stage picture would be as difficult as to turn all of Gopher Prairie into a Georgian garden. 
She read all she could find regarding staging. She bought paint and light wood. She borrowed furniture and drapes unscrupulously. She made Kennicott turn carpenter. She collided with the problem of lighting. Against the protest of Kennicott and Vida, she mortgaged the association by sending to Minneapolis for a baby spotlight, a strip light, a dimming device, and blue and amber bulbs, and with the gloating rapture of a born painter first turned loose among colors, she spent absorbed evenings in grouping, dimming, painting with lights. Only Kennicott, Guy, and Vida helped her. They speculated as to how flats could be lashed together to form a wall. They hung crocus yellow curtains at the windows. They blacked the sheet iron stove. They put on aprons and swept. The rest of the association dropped into the theater every evening and were literary and superior. They had borrowed Carol's manuals of play production and had become extremely stagey in vocabulary. Juanita Haydock, Rita Simons, and Ramey Wotherspoon sat on a sawhorse watching Carol try to get the right position for a picture on the wall in the first scene. I don't want to hand myself anything, but I believe I'll give a swell performance in this first act, confided Juanita. I wish Carol wasn't so bossy, though. She doesn't understand clothes. I want to wear, oh, a dandy dress I have, all scarlet, and I said to her, when I enter, wouldn't it knock their eyes out if I just stood there at the door in this straight scarlet thing? But she wouldn't let me. Young Rita agreed. She's so much taken up with her old details and carpentering and everything that she can't see the picture as a whole. Now... I thought it would be lovely if we had an office scene, like the one in Little, but oh my, because I saw that in Duluth, but she simply wouldn't listen at all. Juanita sighed. I wanted to give one speech like Ethel Barrymore would, if she was in a play like this. Harry and I heard her one time in Minneapolis. We had dandy seats in the orchestra. I just know I could imitate her. Carol didn't pay any attention to my suggestion. I don't want to criticize, but I guess Ethel knows more about acting than Carol does. Say... Do you think Carol has the right dope about using a strip light behind the fireplace in the second act? I told her I thought we ought to use a bunch, offered Ramey, and I suggested it would be lovely if we used a cyclorama outside the window in the first act, and what do you think she said? Yes, and it would be lovely to have Eleonora Deuce play the lead, she said, and aside from the fact that it's evening in the first act, you're a great technician, she said. I must say, I think she was pretty sarcastic. I've been reading up, and I know I could build a cyclorama if she didn't want to run everything. Yes, and another thing. I think the entrance in the first act ought to be left up E, not left three E, from Juanita. And why does she just use plain white tormentors? What's a tormentor? blurted Rita Simons. The savants stared at her ignorance. Carol did not resent their criticisms. She didn't very much resent their sudden knowledge, so long as they let her make pictures. It was at rehearsals that the quarrels broke. No one understood that rehearsals were as real engagements as bridge games or sociables at the Episcopal Church. They gaily came in half an hour late, or they vociferously came in ten minutes early, and they were so hurt that they whispered about resigning when Carol protested. They telephoned. I don't think I'd better come out, afraid the dampness might start my toothache. Or, guess, I can't make it tonight. Dave wants me to sit in on a poker game. When after a month of labor, as many as nine-elevenths of the cast were often present at a rehearsal, when most of them had learned their parts, and some of them spoke like human beings, Carol had a new shock in the realization that Guy Pollock and herself were very bad actors, and that Ramey Wotherspoon was a surprisingly good one. For all her visions, she could not control her voice, and she was bored by the fiftieth repetition of her few lines as made. Guy pulled his soft mustache, looked self-conscious, and turned Mr. Grimm into a limp dummy. But Ramey, as the villain, had no repressions— the tilt of his head was full of character. His draw was admirably vicious. There was an evening when Carol hoped she was going to make a play, a rehearsal during which Guy stopped looking abashed. From that evening the play declined. They were weary. "'We know our parts well enough now. What's the use of getting sick of them?' they complained. They began to skylark, to play with the sacred lights, to giggle when Carol was trying to make the sentimental Myrtle Cass into a humorous office boy, to act everything but the girl from Kankakee. After loafing through his proper part, Dr. Terry Gould had great applause for his burlesque of Hamlet. Even Ramey lost his simple faith and tried to show that he could do a vaudeville shuffle. Carol turned on the company. See here, I want this nonsense to stop. We've simply got to get down to work. Juanita Haydock led the mutiny. Look here, Carol, don't be so bossy. After all, we're doing this play principally for the fun of it, and if we have fun out of a lot of monkey shines, why then... Yes feebly. 
You said one time that folks in GP didn't get enough fun out of life, and now we're having a circus and you want us to stop. Carol answered slowly. I wonder if I can explain what I mean. It's the difference between looking at the comic page and looking at Manet. I want fun out of this, of course, only I don't think it would be less fun, but more to produce as perfect a play as we can. She was curiously exalted. Her voice was strained. She stared not at the company, but at the grotesques scrawled on the backs of wing pieces by forgotten stagehands. I wonder if you can understand the fun of making a beautiful thing, the pride and satisfaction of it, and the holiness. The company glanced doubtfully at one another. In Gopher Prairie it is not good form to be holy except at a church between 10.30 and 12 on Sunday. But if we want to do it, we've got to work. We must have self-discipline. They were at once amused and embarrassed. They did not want to affront this madwoman. They backed off and tried to rehearse. Carol did not hear Juanita in front protesting to Maud Dyer. If she calls it fun and holiness to sweat over her darned old play, well, I don't. Carol attended the only professional play which came to Gopher Prairie that spring. It was a tent show, presenting snappy new dramas under canvas. The hard-working actors doubled in brass and took tickets, and between acts sang about the moon in June and sold Dr. Wintergreen's surefire tonic for ills of the heart, lungs, kidney, and bowels. They presented Sunbonnet Nell, a dramatic comedy of the Ozarks, with J. Witherby Boothby ringing the soul by his resonant, "'You ain't done right by my little girl, Mr. City Man!' But you're a-going to find that back in these here hills there's honest folks and good shots. The audience, on planks beneath the patched tent, admired Mr. Boothby's beard and long rifle, stamped their feet in the dust at the spectacle of his heroism, shouted when the comedian aped the city lady's use of a lognon by looking through a doughnut stuck on a fork, wept visibly over Mr. Boothby's little gal Nell, who was also Mr. Boothby's legal wife Pearl, and when the curtain went down, listened respectfully to Mr. Boothby's lecture on Dr. Wintergreen's tonic as a cure for tapeworms, which he illustrated by horrible, pallid objects curled in bottles of yellowing alcohol. Carol shook her head. Juanita is right. I'm a fool. Holiness of the drama. Bernard Shaw. The only trouble with the girl from Kankakee is that it's too subtle for Gopher Prairie. She sought faith in spacious, banal phrases taken from books. The instinctive nobility of simple souls needed only the opportunity to appreciate fine things and sturdy exponents of democracy. But these optimisms did not sound so loud as the laughter of the audience at the funny man's line, Yes, by Hecklum, I'm a smart feller. She wanted to give up the play, the dramatic association, the town. As she came out of the tent and walked with Kennicott down the dusty spring street, she peered at this struggling wooden village and felt that she could not possibly stay here through all of tomorrow. It was Miles Bjornstam who gave her strength, he and the fact that every seat for the girl from Kankakee had been sold. Bjornstam was keeping company with B. Every night he was sitting on the back steps. Once when Carol appeared, he grumbled, Hope you're going to give this burg one good show. If you don't, reckon nobody ever will. It was the great night. It was the night of the play. The two dressing rooms were swelling with actors, panting, twitchy, pale. Del Snafflin, the barber, who was as much a professional as Ella, having once gone on in a mob scene at a stock company performance in Minneapolis, was making them up and showing his scorn for amateurs with, Stand still, for the love of Mike! How do you expect me to get your eyelids dark if you keep a-wiggling? The actors were beseeching. Hey, Dell, put some red in my nostrils. Uh, you put some in Rita's. Gee, you didn't hardly do anything to my face. They were enormously theatric. They examined Dell's makeup box. They sniffed the scent of grease paint. Every minute they ran out to peep through the hole in the curtain. They came back to inspect their wigs and costumes. They read on the whitewashed walls of the dressing rooms the pencil inscriptions, The Flora Flanders Comedy Company, and This is a Bum Theater, and felt that they were companions of these vanished troopers. Carol, smart in maid's uniform, coaxed the temporary stagehands to finish setting the first act. We ordered Kennicott, the electrician. Now, for heaven's sake, remember the change in cue for the Ambers in Act Two. Slipped out to ask Dave Dyer, the ticket-taker, if he could get some more chairs. Warned the frightened Myrtle Cash to be sure to upset the wastebasket when John Grimm called, Here, are you ready? Del Snafflin's orchestra of piano, violin, and cornet began to tune up, and everyone behind the magic line of the prosenic arch was frightened into paralysis. 
Carol wavered to the hole in the curtain. There were so many people out there, staring so hard. In the second row, she saw Miles Bjornstam, not with B, but alone. He really wanted to see the play. It was a good omen. Who could tell? Perhaps this evening would convert Gopher Prairie to conscious beauty. She darted into the woman's dressing room, roused Maud Dyer from her fainting panic, pushed her to the wings, and ordered the curtain up. It rose, doubtfully. It staggered and trembled, but it did get up without catching, this time. Then she realized that Kennicott had forgotten to turn off the house lights. Someone out front was giggling. She galloped round to the left wing, herself pulled the switch, looked so ferociously at Kennicott that he quaked and fled back. Mrs. Dyer was creeping out on the half-darkened stage. The play was begun. And with that instant, Carol realized that it was a bad play abominably acted. Encouraging them with lying smiles, she watched her work go to pieces. The setting seemed flimsy, the lighting commonplace. She watched Guy Pollock stammer and twist his mustache when he should have been a bullying magnet. Vida Sherwin as Grimm's timid wife chatter at the audience as though they were her class in high school English. Juanita in the leading role defy Mr. Grimm as though she were repeating a list of things she had to buy at the grocery this morning. Ella Stobody remark, I'd like a cup of tea, as though she were reciting curfew shall not ring tonight. And Dr. Gould making love to Rita Simon squeak, My, 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 you are a wonderful girl. Myrtle Cass, as the office boy, was so much pleased by the applause of her relatives, then so much agitated by the remarks of Cy Bogart in the back row in reference to her wearing trousers, that she could hardly be got off the stage. Only Ramey was so unsociable as to devote himself entirely to acting. That she was right in her opinion of the play, Carol was certain, when Miles Bjornstam went out after the first act and did not come back. Between the second and third acts, she called the company together and supplicated. I want to know something before we have a chance to separate. Whether we're doing well or badly tonight, it is a beginning. But will we take it as merely a beginning? How many of you will pledge yourselves to start in with me right away, tomorrow, and plan for another play to be given in September? They stared at her. They nodded at Juanita's protest. I think one's enough for a while. It's going elegant tonight, but another play, who? Seems to me it'll be time enough to talk about that next fall. Carol, I, I hope you don't mean to hint and suggest we're not doing fine tonight. I'm sure the applause shows the audience thinks it's just dandy. Then Carol knew how completely she had failed. As the audience seeped out, she heard B.J. goggling the banker say to Howlin' the grocer, Well, I think the folks did splendid, just as good as professionals. Uh, but I don't care much for these plays. What I like is a good movie with auto accidents and hold-ups and some get to it, not all this talky talk. Then Carol knew how certain she was to fail again. But wearily, she did not blame them, company or audience. Herself, she blamed for trying to carve intaglios in good, wholesome Jack Pine. It's the worst defeat of all. I'm beaten by Main Street. I must go on. But I can't. She was not vastly encouraged by the Gopher Prairie Dauntless would be impossible to distinguish among the actors when all gave such fine account of themselves in difficult roles of this well-known New York stage play. Guy Pollock as the old millionaire could not have been bettered for his fine impersonation of the gruff old millionaire. Mrs. Harry Haydock as the young lady from the West who so easily showed the New York four flushers where they got off was a vision of loveliness and with fine stage presence. Miss Vida Sherwin, the ever-popular teacher in our high school, pleased as Mrs. Grimm. Dr. Gould was well-suited in the role of young lover. Girls, you better look out. Remember, the doc is a bachelor. The local 400 also report that he is a great hand at shaking the light fantastic tootsies in the dance. As the stenographer, Rita Simons, was pretty as a picture, and Miss Alistobody's long and intensive study of the drama and kindred arts in eastern schools was seen in the fine finish of her part. To no one is greater credit to be given than to Mrs. Will Kennicott, on whose capable shoulders fell the burden of directing. So kindly... Carol mused, so well meant, so neighborly, and so confoundedly untrue. Is it really my failure or theirs? She sought to be sensible. She elaborately explained to herself that it was hysterical to condemn Gopher Prairie because it did not foam over the drama. Its justification was in its service as a market town for farmers. 
how bravely and generously it did its work forwarding the bread of the world, feeding and healing the farmers. Then, on the corner below her husband's office, she heard a farmer holding forth. Sure, of course I was beaten. The shipper and the grocers here wouldn't pass a decent price for our potatoes, even though folks in the cities were howling for them. So he says, well, we'll get a truck and ship them right down to Minneapolis. But the commission merchants there were in cahoots with the local shipper here, and they said they wouldn't pay us a cent more than he would, nor even if they was nearer to the market. Well, we found we could get higher prices in Chicago, but when we tried to get freight cars to ship there, the railroads wouldn't let us have them, even though they had cars standing empty right here in the yards. There, you got it. Good market, and these towns keeping us from it. Gus, that's the way these towns work all the time. They pay what they want to for our wheat, but we pay what they want us to for their clothes. Stowbody and Dawson foreclose every mortgage they can and put in tenant farmers. The dauntless lies to us about the nonpartisan league. The lawyers sting us. The machinery dealers hate to carry us over bad years. And then their daughters put on swell dresses and look at us as if we're a bunch of hobos. Man, I'd like to burn this town. Kenny could observed. There's that old crank Wes Brannigan shooting off his mouth again. Gosh, but he loves to hear himself talk. They ought to run that fellow out of town. She felt old and detached through high school commencement week, which is the feat of youth in Gopher Prairie. Through baccalaureate sermon, senior parade, junior entertainment, commencement addressed by an Iowa clergyman who asserted that he believed in the virtue of virtuousness, and the procession of Decoration Day, when the few Civil War veterans followed Champ Perry in his rusty forage cap along the spring-powdered road to the cemetery. She met Guy. She found that she had nothing to say to him. Her head ached in an aimless way. When Kennicott rejoiced, We'll have a great time this summer. Move down to the lake early and wear old clothes and act natural. She smiled, but her smile creaked. In the prairie heat she trudged along unchanging ways, talked about nothing to tepid people, and reflected that she might never escape from them. She was startled to find that she was using the word escape. Then, for three years which passed like one curt paragraph, she ceased to find anything interesting save the Bjornstams and her baby. The End of Chapter 18 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 19 In three years of exile from herself, Carol had certain experiences chronicled as important by the Dauntless or discussed by the Jolly Seventeen, but the event unchronicled, undiscussed, and supremely controlling was the slow admission of longing to find her own people. B. and Miles Bjornstam were married in June, a month after the girl from Kankakee. Miles had turned respectable. He had renounced his criticisms of state and society. He had given up roving as horse trader and wearing red mackinaws in lumber camps. He had gone to work as engineer in Jackson Elder's planing mill. He was to be seen upon the streets endeavoring to be neighborly with suspicious men whom he had taunted for years. Carol was the patroness and manager of the wedding. Juanita Haydock mocked, "'You're a chum to let a good hired girl like B go. Besides, how do you know it's a good thing, her marrying a sassy bum like this awful red Swede person? Get wise. Chase the man off with a mop and hold on to your Svenska while the holding's good. Huh. Me? Go to their Scandahoofian wedding? Not a chance. The other matrons echoed Juanita. Carol was dismayed by the casualness of their cruelty, but she persisted. Miles had exclaimed to her, Jack Elder says maybe he'll come to the wedding. Gee, it would be nice to have B meet the boss as a regular married lady. Some day I'll be so well off that B can play with Mrs. Elder and you. Watch us. There was an uneasy knot of only nine guests at the service in the unpainted Lutheran church. Carol, Kennicott, Guy Pollock, and the Champ Perrys, all brought by Carol. B's frightened rustic parents, her cousin Tina, and Pete, Miles's ex-partner in horse trading, a surly, hairy man who had bought a black suit and come twelve hundred miles from Spokane for the event. Miles continuously glanced back at the church door. Jackson Elder did not appear. The door did not open once after the awkward entrance of the first guests. Miles' hand closed on B's arm. He had, with Carol's help, made his shanty over into a cottage with white curtains and a canary and a chintz chair. Carol coaxed the powerful matrons to call on B. They half scoffed, half promised to go. 
B's successor was the oldish, broad, silent Oscarina, who was suspicious of her frivolous mistress for a month, so that Juanita Haydock was able to crow, "'There, yeah, smarty, I told you you'd run into the domestic problem.' But Oscarina adopted Carol as a daughter, and with her as faithful to the kitchen as B had been, there was nothing changed in Carol's life. She was unexpectedly appointed to the town library board by Ole Jensen, the new mayor. The other members were Dr. Westlake, Lyman Cass, Julius Flickerbaugh, the attorney, Guy Pollock, and Martin Mahoney, former livery stable keeper and now owner of a garage. She was delighted. She went to the first meeting rather condescendingly, regarding herself as the only one besides Guy who knew anything about books or library methods. She was planning to revolutionize the whole system. Her condescension was ruined, and her humility wholesomely increased when she found the board in the shabby room on the second floor of the house, which had been converted into the library, not discussing the weather and longing to play checkers, but talking about books. She discovered that amiable old Dr. Westlake read everything in verse and light fiction, that Lyman Cass, the veal-faced, bristly, bearded owner of the mill, had tramped through Gibbon, Hume, Grote, Prescott, and the other thick historians, that he could repeat pages from them, and did. When Dr. Westlake whispered to her, Yes, Lim is a very well-informed man, but he's modest about it. She felt uninformed and immodest, and scolded at herself that she had missed the human potentialities in this vast gopher prairie. When Dr. Westlake quoted the Paradiso, Don Quixote, Wilhelm Meister, and the Koran, she reflected that no one she knew, not even her father, had read all four. She came diffidently to the second meeting of the board. She did not plan to revolutionize anything. She hoped that the wise elders might be so tolerant as to listen to her suggestions about changing the shelving of the juveniles. Yet, after four sessions of the library board, she was where she had been before the first session. She had found that, for all their pride in being reading men, Westlake and Cass, and even Guy, had no conception of making the library familiar to the whole town. They used it, they passed resolutions about it, and... They left it as dead as Moses. Only the Henty books and the Elsie books and the latest optimisms by moral female novelists and virile clergymen were in general demand, and the board themselves were interested only in old, stilted volumes. They had no tenderness for the noisiness of youth discovering great literature. If she was egotistic about her tiny learning, they were at least as much so regarding theirs, and for all their talk of the need of additional library tax, none of them was willing to risk censure by battling for it though they now had so small a fund that, after paying for rent, heat, light, and Miss Villet's salary, they had only a hundred dollars a year for the purchase of books. The incident of the seventeen cents killed her none to enduring interest. She had come to the board meeting singing with a plan. She had made a list of thirty European novels of the past ten years, with twenty important books on psychology, education, and economics, which the library lacked. She had made Kennicott promise to give fifteen dollars, if each of the board would contribute it the same, they could have the books. Lim Cass looked alarmed, scratched himself, and protested, I think it would be a bad precedent for the board members to contribute money. Um, uh, not that I mind, but, well, it wouldn't be fair. Establish precedent, gracious. Uh, they don't pay us a cent for our services. Certainly they can't expect us to pay for the privilege of serving. Only Guy looked sympathetic, and he stroked the pine table and said nothing. The rest of the meeting they gave to a bellicose investigation of the fact that there was seventeen cents less than there should be in the fund. Miss Fillet was summoned. She spent half an hour in explosively defending herself. The seventeen cents were gnawed over, penny by penny, and Carol, glancing at the carefully inscribed list which had been so lovely and exciting an hour before, was silent, and sorry for Miss Fillet and sorry for herself. She was reasonably regular in attendance till her two years were up and Vida Sherwin was appointed to the board in her place, but she did not try to be revolutionary. In the plodding course of her life, there was nothing changed and nothing new. Kennicott made an excellent land deal, but as he told her none of the details, she was not greatly exalted or agitated. What did agitate her was his announcement, half-whispered and half-blurted, half-tender and half-coldly medical, that they ought to have a baby, now they could afford it. They had so long agreed that perhaps it would be just as well not to have any children for a while yet that childlessness had come to be natural. Now she feared and longed and did not know. She hesitatingly assented and wished that she had not assented. As there appeared no change in their drowsy relations, she forgot all about it, and life was planless.
I'd ling on the porch of their summer cottage at the lake on afternoons when Kennicott was in town, when the water was glazed and the whole air languid. She pictured a hundred escapes, Fifth Avenue in a snowstorm with limousines, golden shops, a cathedral spire, a reed hut on fantastic piles above the mud of a jungle river, a suite in Paris, immense high grave rooms with lambrequins and a balcony, the enchanted mesa, an ancient stone mill in Maryland at the turn of the road between rocky brook and abrupt hills, an upland moor of sheep and flitting cool sunlight, a clanging dock where steel cranes unloaded steamers from Buenos Aires and Sing Tao, a Munich concert hall and a famous cellist playing, playing to her. One scene had a persistent witchery. She stood on a terrace overlooking a boulevard by the warm sea. She was certain, though she had no reason for it, that the place was Mentone. Along the drive below her swept barouches with a mechanical tlot, 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 and great cars with polished black hoods and engines quiet as the sigh of an old man. In them were women erect, slender, enameled, and expressionless as marionettes, their small hands upon parasols, their unchanging eyes always forward, ignoring the men beside them, tall men with gray hair and distinguished faces. Beyond the drive were painted sea and painted sands and blue and yellow pavilions. Nothing moved except the gliding carriages, and the people were small and wooden, spots in a picture drenched with gold and hard bright blues. There was no sound of sea or winds, no softness of whispers, nor of falling petals, nothing but yellow and cobalt and staring light, and the never-changing tlot, 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 tlot. She startled. She whimpered. It was the rapid ticking of the clock which had hypnotized her into hearing the steady hoofs. No aching color of the sea and pride of supercilious people, but the reality of a round-bellied nickel alarm clock on a shelf against a fuzzy, unplaned pine wall, with a stiff gray wash rag hanging above it and a kerosene stove standing below. A thousand dreams, governed by the fiction she had read, drawn from the pictures she had envied, absorbed her drowsy lake afternoons. But always in the midst of them, Kennicott came out from town, drew on khaki trousers which were plastered with dry fish scales, asked, "'Enjoying yourself?' and did not listen to her answer. And nothing was changed, and there was no reason to believe that there ever would be change. Trains At the lake cottage she missed the passing of the trains. She realized that in town she had depended upon them for assurance that there remained a world beyond. The railroad was more than a means of transportation to go for prairie. It was a new god, a monster of steel limbs, oak ribs, flesh of gravel, and a stupendous hunger for freight, a deity created by man that he might keep himself respectful to property, as elsewhere he had elevated and served as tribal gods the mines, cotton mills, motor factories, colleges, army. The East remembered generations when there had been no railroad and had no awe of it. But here, the railroads had been before time was. The towns had been staked out on barren prairie as convenient points for future train halts, and back in 1860 and 1870 there had been much profit, much opportunity to found aristocratic families in the possession of advanced knowledge as to where the towns would arise. If a town was in disfavor, the railroad could ignore it, cut it off from commerce slay it. To go for prairie, the tracks were eternal verities, and boards of railroad directors an omnipotence. The smallest boy, or the most secluded grand dame, could tell you whether number 32 had a hot box last Tuesday, whether number 7 was going to put on an extra day coach, and the name of the president of the road was familiar to every breakfast table. Even in this new era of motors, the citizens went down to the station to see the trains go through. It was their romance, their only mystery besides Mass at the Catholic Church, and from the trains came lords of the outer world, traveling salesmen with piping on their westcoats, and visiting cousins from Milwaukee. Gopher Prairie had once been a division point. The round house and repair shops were gone, but two conductors still retained residence, and they were persons of distinction, men who traveled and talked to strangers, who wore uniforms with brass buttons, and knew all about these crooked games of con men. They were a special caste, neither above nor below the haydocks, but apart, artists and adventurers. The night telegraph operator at the railroad station was the most melodramatic figure in town. Awake at three in the morning, alone in a room hectic with clatter of the telegraph key, all night he talked to operators twenty, fifty, a hundred miles away. 
It was always to be expected that he would be held up by robbers. He never was, but round him was a suggestion of masked faces at the windows, revolvers, cords binding him to a chair, his struggle to crawl to the key before he fainted. During blizzards, everything about the railroad was melodramatic. There were days when the town was completely shut off, when they had no mail, no express, no fresh meat, no newspapers. At last the rotary snow plow came through, bucking the drifts, sending up a geyser, and the way to the outside was open again. The brakemen in mufflers and fur caps running along the tops of ice-coated freight cars, the engineers scratching frost from the cab windows and looking out, inscrutable, self-contained, pilots of the prairie sea, they were heroism. They were to Carol the daring of the quest in a world of groceries and sermons. To the small boys the railroad was a familiar playground. They climbed the iron ladders on the sides of the box cars, built fires behind piles of old ties, waved to favorite brakemen. But to Carol it was magic. She was motoring with Kennicott, the car lumping through darkness, the lights showing mud puddles and ragged weeds by the road. A train coming, a rapid chuck a chuck chuck a chuck chuck a chuck chuck a chuck it was hurtling past. The Pacific Flyer, an arrow of golden flame. Light from the firebox splashed the underside of the trailing smoke. Instantly, the vision was gone. Carol was back in the long darkness, and Kennicott was giving his version of that fire and wonder. Number 19 must be about ten minutes late. In town, she listened from bed to the express whistling in the cut a mile north. Ooh! Ooh! Faint, nervous. Distraught, horn of the free night riders journeying to the small towns, which were laughter and banners and the sound of bells. Hoo! Hoo! The world going by. Hoo! Fainter, more wistful, gone. Down here there were no trains. The stillness was very great. The prairie encircled the lake, lay round her raw, dusty, thick. Only the train could cut it. Some day she would take a train, and that would be a great taking. She turned to the Chautauqua as she had turned to the Dramatic Association, to the library board. Besides the permanent mother Chautauqua in New York, there are, all over these states, commercial Chautauqua companies which send out to every smallest town troops of lecturers and entertainers to give a week of culture under canvas. Living in Minneapolis, Carol had never encountered the ambulant Chautauqua, and the announcement of its coming to Gopher Prairie gave her hope that others might be doing the vague things which she had attempted. She pictured a condensed university course brought to the people. Mornings when she came in from the lake with Kennicott, she saw placards in every shop window and strung on a cord across Main Street, a line of pennants alternately worded, The Bolin Chautauqua Coming! and A Solid Week of Inspiration and Enjoyment. But she was disappointed when she saw the program. It did not seem to be a tabloid university. It did not seem to be any kind of a university. It seemed to be a combination of a vaudeville performance, YMCA lecture, and the graduation exercises of an elocution class. She took her doubt to Kennicott. He insisted, Well, maybe it won't be so awful darned intellectual the way you and I might like it, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. Vida Sherwin added, they have some splendid speakers. If the people don't carry off so much actual information, they do get a lot of new ideas, and that's what counts. During the Chautauqua, Carol attended three evening meetings, two afternoon meetings, and one in the morning. She was impressed by the audience, the sallow women in skirts and blouses, eager to be made to think, the men in vests and shirt sleeves, eager to be allowed to laugh, and the wriggling children, eager to sneak away. She liked the plain benches, the portable stage under its red marquee, the great tent overall, shadowy above strings of incandescent bulbs at night and by day casting an amber radiance on the patient crowd. The scent of dust and trampled grass and sun-baked wood gave her an illusion of Syrian caravans. She forgot the speakers while she listened to noises outside the tent. Two farmers talking hoarsely, a wagon creaking down Main Street, the crow of a rooster. She was content but it was the contentment of the lost hunter stopping to rest. For from the Chautauqua itself she got nothing but wind and chaff and heavy laughter, the laughter of yokels at old jokes, a mirthless and primitive sound like the cries of beasts on a farm. These were the several instructors in the condensed university's seven-day course. Nine lecturers, four of them ex-ministers and one ex-congressman, all of them delivering inspirational addresses. The only facts or opinions which Carol derived from them were 
Lincoln was a celebrated president of the United States, but in his youth extremely poor. James J. Hill was the best-known railroad man of the West, and in his youth extremely poor. Honesty and courtesy in business are preferable to boorishness and exposed trickery, but this is not to be taken personally, since all persons in Gopher Prairie are known to be honest and courteous. London is a large city. A distinguished statesman once taught Sunday school. For entertainers who told Jewish stories, Irish stories, German stories, Chinese stories, and Tennessee Mountaineer stories, most of which Carol had heard. A lady elocutionist who recited Kipling and imitated children. A lecturer with motion pictures of an Andean exploration, excellent pictures, and a halting narrative. Three brass bands, a company of six opera singers, a Hawaiian sextet, and four youths who played saxophones and guitars disguised as washboards. The most applauded pieces were those such as the Lucia, Inevitability, which the audience had heard most often. The local superintendent, who remained through the week while the other enlighteners went on to other Chautauquas for their daily performances. The superintendent was a bookish, underfed man who worked hard at rousing artificial enthusiasm, at trying to make the audience cheer by dividing them into competitive squads and telling them that they were intelligent and made splendid communal noises. He gave most of the morning lectures, droning with equal unhappy facility about poetry, the Holy Land, and the injustice to employers in any system of profit-sharing. The final item was a man who neither lectured, inspired, nor entertained, a plain little man with his hands in his pockets. All the other speakers had confessed, I cannot keep from telling the citizens of your beautiful city that none of the talent on this circuit have found a more charming spot or more enterprising and hospitable people. But the little man suggested that the architecture of Gopher Prairie was haphazard, and that it was sottish to let the lakefront be monopolized by the cinder-heaped wall of the railroad embankment. Afterward, the audience grumbled, Maybe that guy's got the right dope, but what's the use of looking on the dark side of things all the time? New ideas are first-rate, but not all this criticism. Enough troubles in life without looking for it. Thus, the Chautauqua, as Carol saw it. After it, the town felt proud and educated. Two weeks later, the Great War smote Europe. For a month, Gopher Prairie had the delight of shuddering. Then, as the war settled down to a business of trench fighting, they forgot. When Carol talked about the Balkans and the possibility of a German revolution, Kennicott yawned. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, it's a great old scrap, but it's none of our business. Folks out here are too busy growing corn to monkey with any fool war that these foreigners want to get themselves into. It was Miles Bjornstam who said, I can't figure it out. I'm opposed to wars, but still, seems like Germany has got to be licked because them Junkers stands in the way of progress. She was calling on Miles and B. early in autumn. They had received her with cries, with dusting of chairs and a running to fetch water for coffee. Miles stood and beamed at her. He fell often and joyously into his old irreverence about the Lords of Gopher Prairie, but always, with a certain difficulty, he added something decorous and appreciative. Lots of people have come to see you, haven't they? Carol hinted. Why, B.'s cousin Tina comes in right along, and the foreman at the mill, and... Oh, we have good times. Say, take a look at that bee. Uh, wouldn't you think she was a canary bird to listen to her and uh, see that scandahoofian towhead of hers? But say, know what she is? She's a mother hen. Way she fusses over me. Way she makes old Miles wear a necktie. Hate to spoil her by letting her hear it. But she's one pretty darn nice, nice hell. Oh, uh, what do we care if none of the dirty snobs come and call? We've got each other. Carrie worried about their struggle. She forgot it in the stress of sickness and fear. For that autumn, she knew that a baby was coming, that at last life promised to be interesting in the peril of the great change. The End of Chapter 19 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis